For the final time in 2024, we welcome you to Winter Series Sunday here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. It's round six of the Gielic Racing Winter Series package. The GTs, the Formula cars, the prototypes, and first out on track, the GT4s, all about to put on a fabulous show across something like seven races today. Myself, Adam Weller, joined in the commentary box by Andy McEwen, and Andy is also going to be running to the podium, which is a complicated logistical matter, but he reckons he can do it, so he's pulling double duty. We've also got Izzy Browning uh, in the pit lane as well. A full house on the broadcast front, a full house in terms of grid entries as well for this, the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. 4.657 kilometers, 14 turns, a circuit that uh, holds that uh, all-important I am an F1 circuit card, and that uh, always brings drivers into the fray. We've got over 30 taking the start in the GT Winter Series. We've got expanded grids in the GT4s and the prototypes, and of course the formulas have been over 35 cars all year long. So it's a good, strong set of entries, and for today, the weather is looking far better as well. If you joined us yesterday, you'll know that the weather really did turn against us. Uh, we didn't get much racing in at all, ultimately. Uh, but today, we have less concerns over that. The circuit's still looking a little bit greasy, as you can see. We're debating whether or not we're going to see slick tyres uh, or treaded tyres over the course of the 30-minute GT4 Winter Series Sprint Race that will kick off the day. Uh, but in general, Andy, I think we can say that today is looking a little more positive from uh, up in the clouds. 
Certainly so. If anything, I'm, I'm a bit too warm this morning, ah. Adam, as I've been dashing here, there and everywhere. You know, if the temperature could just be dialed down a degree or so, that would make it more comfortable. But uh, I shan't complain because yesterday was... Uh, Fairly horrific, let's be honest. It did not stop raining from the moment we woke up in the morning, really, till the moment we left the circuit, at which point it started to look like a fairly pleasant evening, which is sort of typical, really, isn't it? But yes, today we've got mostly clear skies, starting to cloud over a little. Uh, but that track is interesting me, because looking out of our commentary box window on the start finish straight, it looks very dry, but from some of the early pictures we're seeing elsewhere around the circuit, as you said, st still quite damp and, and not even really much of a dry racing line. Here at uh, Turn 4, it looks more or less OK, but uh, in the early stages, should the drivers be on slick tyres, which I suspect they will be, they might just have to, uh, to mind their P's and Q's. Just take it a little bit easy. Cold tyres at the best of times can be a challenge, especially on a slightly damp circuit. Absolutely right, and uh, before we really focus in on the GT4 cars that are heading out onto pre-grid now, just to quickly touch base, uh, even though we didn't get much racing yesterday, we did have a lot of uh, important uh, updates to the point standings. Uh, the prototype wind series didn't run at all yesterday, therefore uh, no first race will only have race two of the weekend for them effectively uh, later on in the day that means that no one can outscore conrad motorsports danny sufi he is the inaugural prototype winter series champion in the gt winter series we did get enough laps in to score half points kenneth Heyer and jmo hartling have done enough to win the 2024 gt winter series overall uh, and in the gt4 class Mikey Porter and Jamie Day with the SETI Motorsport have won both the overall and the team's championship. Uh, some of the classes are still up for grabs. I think Max Huber is just about one AM. Uh, Charles Dawson and Emil Yerdrum have definitely won the Pro-Am class. Uh, Cayman Trophy similarly has gone to Mikhail Sander at this point. Uh, but, funny enough, the Pro class is the one that's still up in the air. Joel Mesh. Um, if he gets a particularly good Sunday in and my Jamie Day and Mikey Porter struggle on their last day of the season, uh, then perhaps Joe Armesh, rather paradoxically, walks away with second in the overall championship and the win in the pro class, uh, which would be odd. <laughs> yeah, a little bizarre, isn't it? But hey, they will take any opportunity to try and uh, walk away with a, with a championship crown, having missed out on the big one, so to speak. Uh, they're definitely going to be going to be keen to try and end their season on a high. But this was the car that really we were focused on yesterday. The Mikey Porter, Jamie Day shared machine, which uh, survived the conditions, did just enough third place in the end, enough, as you said, to seal the deal in the championship. Uh, but we are getting our first proper look here at the track conditions. They're not as bad as I thought they'd be actually pretty much bone dry out there slick tires all around I would imagine but you can really see the work that goes into warming up the rubber on the way out to the grid drivers really really wrestling the cars to make sure they're fully prepared for the race ahead and the race ahead is only a few minutes away they get very quick with the five minute board once they pull up to the grid and with no further ado we will throw properly into GT4 Wind Series race number two of the weekend. Welcome down to the grid for the first time today. I'm very pleased to report that it is much, much drier than yesterday. We've got our GT4s coming onto the grid now. We're just waiting for our pole sitter, the Elite McLaren, to roll in behind us, and then we'll get chatting to some drivers. As Adam and Andy have already alluded to, much drier day today for our, for our drivers, so we're hoping to get a lot more running than we saw yesterday. And yeah, as they've already said as well, we've got the Forsetti boys who were crowned champion yesterday, so we're really focusing in on that that P2 fight between the Elite McLaren and the Schnitzlam guys. So, with any luck, we should be having some of our drivers coming in now. So, like I said, we've got the Elite McLaren of Tom Leban starting on pole position, and we've also got a Pro-Am driver starting alongside. Now, just to tell you about some of the conditions down here, it's dry where I'm standing right now, but I do understand that there are some damp conditions uh, around the circuit. So, some drivers may be choosing to put on those wet tires a lot of the teams have taken the wet tires to the grid so we shall see and i'm hoping because it's a little bit drier that some of our drivers will want to speak to us so if i may can i get the door open today let's just pull that one up 
and I'll come in here with Tom. Hello. Tom, best place to start the race and best place to uh, get some nice running in today. So how are we feeling ahead of, ahead of this race? Uh, pretty good to be honest, obviously starting in the best place we can. Uh, we normally go well in these conditions, sort of the drying track. It may look dry, but from the outlap then, I don't think it is. Um, but yeah, we'll see how we get on. Hopefully you can bring it home in one piece and uh, hopefully on the top spot. Where, uh, whereabouts in the circuit is it looking the, the wettest right now? To be honest, everywhere. It's just super greasy and super slippery. There's a few dry patches coming in the last sector, but um, we'll just see how it goes, really. And you've got that, uh, you're fighting for P2 in the championship with the Schnitzelalm guys who are starting directly behind you. So a uh, little bit of pressure in, in your rear view, but uh, I think we can we can take it. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't even pay attention they were starting behind. I sort of just keep myself to myself and do my own race and uh, finish the best position we can. All right, we wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. There's our pole sitter and his uh, co-driver, I think, is going to jump in there and uh, talk to him about the conditions. So he didn't even realise that the uh, Schnitzel Lamb guys were starting behind him. So hopefully I haven't put too much pressure on his shoulders. But here is that number 11 car of Joel Mesh will be in there. Spoke to Joel a lot yesterday, but we'll grab a quick word anyway. Joel, you've got your rivals right in front of you. So that's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. I'll have a look at the start, how it goes, but I think overtaken in these conditions is just going to be an absolute horrible kind of scenario. <laughs> yeah, we were just speaking to Tom and he said that um, it's pretty pretty wet still around there. So is that is that something you're worried about? Um, being honest, I am, yeah. Because uh, after the start, it's most probably just going to be like... Uh, racing behind each other like an estuary and uh, no overtaking maneuvers done just because of the ideal line next to it all everything being wet but it's a pretty long run down to turn one so how do you fancy your chances in this car compared to the elite mclaren i don't know yet i'll just have a look i'll decide on the situation all right, well, we'll wait and find out. Good luck. Best of luck for the race. There's our Joel Mesh on the second row. So we will really be focusing on that fight. As most of the teams are clearing off the grid, we're going to carry on down the grid because just behind me on the right is the number 19 car. That's the Forsetti. And Jamie Day is going to be in that car today. They obviously were crowned champions yesterday. Just speaking to the, some, some of the team, they are particularly proud of those boys. And now it's time for an advert break. And then we're going to go to the race. So then in just a couple of minutes time, we will have the cars rolling. Three lights on the gantry means the three minute board is more than likely uh, going to be put out in just a few moments. Uh, hearing that most of the parties out there on circuit are on dry tyres, I think that is probably going to prove to be the correct call. We have seen uh, what has happened the opposite way uh, when uh, we've been on the wrong tyres at back at Jerez. I think everyone may have made the right call. So then, as these cars get ready to roll, let's talk you through the grid in full. Tom Levin is your pole sitter for this race alongside Josef Knopp. He is the pro driver of that Pro-Am lineup in the number 31 WNS Motorsport Porsche. Watch out for him. He's going to be a big one to watch. He's already won this year, of course. Joao Mesh and Raphael Renhofer start on row number two. The Schnitzel and Mercedes looking to try and best Tom Levin in this race to preserve the lead in second in the overall championship. Renhofer making his debut for Vimvert Motorsport in at the GT4 Winter Series. Jamie Day starting from fifth position. He has had a brilliant record of sprint race victories in the 2024 GT4 Winter Series season. He's going to have to work hard from P5. Alex Papadopoulos starts from sixth place. 
Moving on to row four of the grid, Wilhelm Kuhner in the first of the Cayman Trophy cars starts alongside Max Huber, your leading AM, and uh, already crowned, or at least very soon to be crowned, AM class champion. Alex Connor is next in ninth place alongside Dennis Bunn, Alberto Di Martin in P11, and Emil Yerdrum starting from 12th. Expect him to climb up through the order quite quickly. Nicholas Malloy in 13th place in the number 24 car alongside Franz Linden, Tim Neuser, and Leo Pischler should be at the back of the order. However, we did see that resume more than racing. Porter, of course, slammed into the wall yesterday by Daniel Drexel. Sure enough, that number 77 car is not at the back of the grid. So that uh, seemingly confirms the end of the weekend for resume more than racing in the GT4s at least. Not particularly surprised by that, but a shame to lose Leo Pischler, who again is another driver who took uh, an overall win earlier in the season. Uh, so one less competitive driver out there to uh, try and fight through the sharp end, but it is a very strong grid here in the GT4 Winter Series. Uh, indeed it is, and, and on that point, of course, we saw the the issue yesterday for Daniel Drexel was caused by running out onto those red and white uh, painted curbs. And I just spotted, I think it was Alex Papadopoulos in the NM racing car, deliberately driving out onto the curb, going into turn four to try and just sort of scope out how much grip there is out there, because if they're saying the track is a little greasy, you'd have to imagine the painted uh, curbs are going to be even more slippery. So you drivers very much using this uh, formation lap as an exploratory lap uh, to see exactly how much of the of the track they're going to be able to use. Because what you don't want to do, uh, as we saw yesterday, is drift out onto something painted if it's even slightly damp. And if it comes to these greasy, slightly damp conditions we're talking about, Tom Leban might have something of an experience advantage back at Estoril uh, in the endurance race, the third race of the weekend at, uh, at the Circuit of Estoril. Uh, Leban and Meekin were the only team to go on to slick tyres at the start of the race. They proceeded to stay on them for the entire hour. It never really went into slick conditions. It stayed a lot wetter for a lot longer than everyone expected, and that worked against them. But they did keep the car uh, on the track for the entire hour, despite being on the complete wrong tires. And uh, that means that in these greasy conditions, there should be a good amount of um, left foot or right foot data for Tom Leban to go off from previous experiences. We'll see how Tom Leban performs then in this race. Of course, he has the mantle to pick up from Zach Meekin. Meekin taking the race win yesterday, much interrupted by safety cars. Let's see how this race unfolds then. The GT4 Winter Series always one of the most spectacular parts of the Gielik Racing Winter Series package. Their final sprint race of the 2024 season is about to get underway. Josef Knopp will be getting to, looking to get a good run into the first corner. Usually at the end of those long straights, the Porsches maybe have a kilometre of an hour or two. So if he can anticipate the start, that might work in his favour. The green lights go out. We are going racing in the GT4 Winter Series. Who will lead? In to the first corner. Will it be Levin? Will it be Knopp? Will it be one of the cars from further back? It looks like Raphael Renhofer got a good start in the Vivavert Porsche from row two as well. Jamie Day for Facetti oh. taking the centre of the track. Oh, and Tom Levin just not getting oh. the car stopped. The 22 also in a spin. Renhofer having a moment. It does look like it's greasy out there, doesn't it? Straight on goes Tom Levin, though. He falls to the rear. That car just didn't want to stop. Uh, because he was on the inside line, which is off the racing line. We have had one qualifying session for the Formula Winter Series today. That sort of dried up the racing line. But on the inside of the track, there was absolutely nothing. And down into turn four, I think a similar problem further back. There's a clattering of Mercedes AMGs. The 84 car on the receiving end of that then. Getting bounced out wide. That was Alex Connor. Uh, being very much assaulted. People getting aggressive on the opening lap. But if you go offline, Adam, there ain't much grip. Yeah, it was a battle of the Alexes there because it was Alex Papadopoulos trying to get up his inside as well. Of course, the order rather shuffled up by everyone trying to avoid each other on the first lap. Uh, it is Josef Knopp and Joel, Joel Mesh that lead the way at the front of the pack then. There you can see Tom Levin's elite McLaren just trying to make up some positions. Is already ahead of three of the Porsches. Renhofer and uh, the 24 car, both of the uh, cars from Vimmerwerk Motorsport, 
uh, have had a poor start there at the back of the order. Rather surprisingly, two very strong lineups. Uh, but Josef not under a lot of pressure here from Joel Mesh with Tom Leban at the back of the order. This is a golden opportunity for Joel Mesh to secure, solidify that second place finish in the overall championship. And if he can finish ahead of Jamie Day, then maybe the battle for the pro class honours can also extend out into race number three. As it stands, with Jamie Day there in third place, I think the Pro Class Championship would end up going to Jamie at the end of this race, along with Mikey Porter and Forsetti Motorsport. Josef Knopp trying to break the slipstream then from Joel Mesh as they run down towards turn one for the second time. Now Knopp saw what happened to Levin a lap ago, still goes a little bit to the inside, but thankfully gets the car stopped. But uh, great observation there, Andy. Uh, offline, still looking very, very greasy. Yeah, nearly caught out. Josef knocked down at turn 10, half a lap or so ago. He had a big moment there for Alex Connor. I think that was going into turn one. They're all really struggling for grip. What a start, by the way, for Emil Geerdrum. As I say that, he goes off the track going out of turn three. But he started 12th on the grid, the white and blue Mercedes. And he has picked his way through into P4. So a fantastic opening lap uh, of this race for him. And he's now chasing down Jamie Day, who himself has picked up a position or two. Uh, they drop down the hill then through turn number five and everybody now just starting to get into the rhythm. Josef Knopp seems to have withstood the initial pressure uh, from Jörl Mesh who was all over him through the opening half a lap or so but things now just starting to settle down. Yeah, Knopp has proven already that he has the pace to uh, disappear up the road if given the opportunity. Great start though from Emil Erdrim. As you say, nine places gained on that first lap. I did say I thought he'd go through the order. I didn't expect <laughs> it to quite go quite so quickly, but he was in the right place at the right time as everyone scattered to avoid Tom Levin. Uh, just hope that he made up all those places on the track rather than cutting to uh, avoid everything. Uh, where is Tom Levin now, incidentally? He's in ninth place, so he's got a lot of work to do. Renhofer also coming back through the order from P12, or at the moment, so obviously started in the second row of the grid, but uh, another car that spun or struggled at turn number one. Now, Jamie Day has historically dominated these sprint races. The only time he hasn't won a sprint race this season, he actually did win it on the road and got a penalty retroactively. Uh, he has been brilliant in the solo sprints this season uh, for Facetti Motorsport, so he's still very much one to watch out for here from third position. We ride on board with him at the moment. You can see there some of the standing water as well on the curves on the inside of some of those sausage curves as well. There is still some uh, water puddling up, I think. Oh, Emil Yerdrum stopping. El Emil Yerdrum with a puncture by the looks of it. Uh, oh, is that Yerdrum or is that the uh, 84 perhaps? Which remember what ah. that was uh, Alex Connor, wasn't it? He? he was on the receiving end of some contact lap one and I suspect that's maybe caused a slow puncture on the right front. So that's such a shame. Yerdrum still going strong in fourth place, albeit dropping away from the top three. Uh, but yes, very similarly liveried car there that yes. clearly is struggling. I suspect we're going to see here, Adam, some damage to the right front. Yes, it doesn't look like the tyre is down, but it certainly looks like the car is struggling. You can see that the uh, front end is low. I think maybe that... Uh, is it a puncture? Yeah. Yes, it is a puncture. OK. Uh, so the carcass is still there, but the tyre is down. It's a huge shame for Alex Connor. The 84 team didn't have the best of runs either on their series debut uh, at Aragon last week either. Slightly different driver lineup this week. Uh, but uh, a misfortune then for CV performance. They'll now have all of their eggs in the basket uh, with uh, Emil Yerdrum then, who is hunting down the top three. The top three who are line astern as they go running through turns 12 and 13. You can see that on picture in picture. Renhofer looking for a way past Alberto Di Martin. Di Martin in the AM class. Uh, Renhofer a pro driver. Renhofer makes that look fairly easy around the outside. Di Martin uh, will maybe try and uh, latch on to the rear and chase down his closest adversary in AM, that being Dennis Bunn in the Team Surg Rensport uh, Porsche. Here comes the top three then, down the main straight for the third time or fourth time in this race. Josef Knopp again just struggling, under braking a little bit. The top three covered by three quarters of a second. And Jamie Day looks like he's got good pace here. He's got a lot of confidence as well, taking those sausage curves as uh, slippery as we suspect they might be. He seems to think he's got traction underneath him. Well, he certainly seems to because he was half a second quicker than the leader on that previous lap, comfortably the fastest lap of the race so far. 
151.9, the only driver thus far into the 1 minute 51. So Jamie Day is absolutely flying. Catching, though, as they say, is one thing, passing very much another, especially on a track that is limited really to one very grippy racing line right now. To get past these two, he's going to have to get adventurous, perhaps try and uh, force the mistake out of the two drivers ahead, or hope that they get so distracted battling each other that that opens the door, and it could happen, because yes, if not, didn't get a great run through the chicane there. They head up to the top end of the circuit, and Yoel Mesh is starting to look racier and racier in his mirrors. And look at Max Huber as well, the AM class leader running in fifth place. I've made wink, 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 nudge, nudge jokes to him about having to make sure he remains an AM. He's going very, very fast out there right now. Josef Knopp uh, just carrying uh, the momentum through turn 10 nicely there. Thought again, he's going defensive in the places where it makes me a little bit worried for him, but he's just about finding the traction he needs to get the car stopped. Uh, Josef, with an out, um, outsized level of experience for a 19-year-old driver, has done a lot of GT4 racing, be it in ADAC GT4, uh, the GTC race category, also based in Germany, or indeed with us in the Winter Series paddock. Joel Mesh has got a mighty run out of the final corner, though. It's a drag race down to turn one. The Porsche, again, seems to just be a little bit quicker towards the end of the straight with a smaller silhouette punching a hole through the air. And he does, so long as he gets it stopped, hold on to the lead. Does look rather the twitchier of these three cars, though, doesn't it? The Porsche under braking, as you mentioned. He does seem to be struggling a little bit uh, to keep the car settled, keep it going in a straight line. There, meanwhile, is Tom Levin. So he's now onto the tail of Alex Papadopoulos. So that would be the battle for sixth place, but they're 10 seconds behind this sort of leading group. So uh, it may well be that sixth is as good as it will get for Levin. The more fighting there is at the front, though, the more chance there is that he may yet catch them. And again, Josef Knopp assists him in this, in a way, by going defensive down the hill. That slows him down on the apex, and he drifts wide on corner exit. This is your Mesh's chance, but no, the Porsche just managing to hang on. And now, Jamie Day, very much part of the fight, too. Yeah, Josef Knopp, uh, I think, is rather the cork in the bottle here. Uh, 1 minute 50.8, the fastest race lap from Tom Levin. Everyone else in the high 51s to the 52s. Levin is past Papadopoulos, and if this continues on at the front as it does, perhaps we could see Levin challenging for an overall podium before the end of the race. Josef Knopp, for now, uh, is putting on a great defensive drive, but it is costing the others time. Of course, he is a pro in entry, but he has every right to fight against the uh, the blue marked on your uh, graphics pro cars. Emil Yerdrum, of course, will be really hoping that uh, Mesh and Jamie Day bully him out of the way to try and challenge for that uh, Pro-Am lead. Now, let's see how they differ through the final corner. It looked like Mesh had the better run through last time. He takes a lot more of the outside curb on corner entry. Looks like he takes a bit more of the exit curb as well. But again, that Porsche, we saw it at, at Aragon as well, just at the end of the straight, seems to have one or two kilometers an hour more. Less torque coming out of the corner, but more pace by the end of it. Again, a nasty wiggle under braking going into the first corner. But again, he just about holds on. Fascinating dynamic between these three cars as well. Porsche, Mercedes, Aston Martin. The Mercedes and the Aston Martin, relatively similar in design. Front engine uh, GT4 cars, but the Porsche generating its speed in different areas of the circuit. Challenge on in towards turn number four. Again, a late defensive move by the race leader. Uh, but so far, it is proving successful. He's withstood 10 minutes of this pressure. <laughs> that still leaves nearly 20 minutes to go. And you just have to say, eventually, this pressure is going to tell. Right around the outside, maybe, for Joel Mesh. That is a very brave move. Out onto the curbs. He's going to rejoin the circuit ahead and drives clean around the outside of the Porsche. Yes, if not down to second. And Jamie Day knows now that he's got to get a move on. Otherwise, it may be that Joel Mesh has got the pace to pull away. Yeah, once Josef Knopp was on the inside, Inside there, I had a feeling it was going to go to Joel. I think Josef is really struggling to get the car rotated through some of the slower corners. Once he had a car on his outside in that, ma in that manner, he couldn't use enough of the curb, enough of the track to actually get through the corner at any speed. It doesn't quite look like it's turning sweetly for Josef Knopp. Joel Mesh then has a great opportunity to disappear up the road, but Jamie Day uh, will be looking to try and get past Josef Knopp as quickly as possible to try and pursue him of course the pro class championship not affected really by jamie day's chances 
of uh, getting past the car in second overall. Uh, as it stands, it would still be Jamie Day securing the Pro Class Championship for he and Mikey Porter in this race to go with the overall and team's titles as things stand. Josef not providing a bit of a slipstream here to Jamie Day, but towards the end of the straight, does the Porsche start to edge away? Well, no, but the closing does cease even in the slipstream by the end of the straight. Jamie Day clearly, as with Joel Mesh, has more pace than Josef, but uh, Josef knows about holding on to a position. As he proved for the first 10 minutes or so of the race, but I don't think it's going to take long here for Jamie Day to uh, begin forcing the issue. Is there an opportunity under the bridge towards turn four? The answer for now uh, appears to be no. Uh, Tom Levin, check by the way, still sick, but he just did a 1 minute 50.6. That was 1.3 seconds quicker than the race leader. Now, granted, the leader was busy battling for much of the previous lap, uh, but that is still a very impressive pace being set by the driver of car number 78. Battle for second, though, winds its way downhill towards mid part of the lap, approaching half race distance. And Jamie Day now starting to grow in frustration. I think he can see Joel Nesh uh, gapping this group out in front. He gets a terrific run out through the chicane, dives to the inside line, heading up the hill. And this surely will be Jamie Day's move to second place. Great move there from Jamie Day, carried the momentum fabulously over the curbs at turn eight, moves up into second place. Will Josef not try and retaliate, or will Emil Yerdrum may mean he has to defend? Knopp goes to the inside line, and Yerdrum, of course, now fighting him for the Pro-Am lead. Max Huber at dizzy highs. We've seen this a few times now, fighting for overall top five. Uh, Max Huber, a historic and modern racer, is a experience under his belt in cars such as AC Cobras so he knows about uh, holding a car in some slightly slip conditions um, so we should expect him to be good in this weather and that's exactly what we're seeing in this one now Emil Yerdrum would love a Pro-Am victory they've already secured the championship per what I know of the Pro-Am standings uh, but uh, victory is all the sweeter. It's been an up and down year for Yerdrum and Charles Dawson. A Priam win here against someone the calibre of Josef Knopp would give Yerdrum great momentum going into his summer campaign. This is going to be a very compelling scrap. He goes to the inside at turn two, really fighting the car every inch of the way. Uh, heart palpitations all round down at the uh, CP performance group, I'm sure. Uh, Emil, though, doesn't need a second uh, chance. Ooh. Oh, goodness me, very wide. And you can see there the spray, can't you? Still offline. Yeah, that is a dangerous place to be going, Emil. I would stay clear of that uh, painted runoff area. Uh, but he really wants to try and get a move on here. As we've said, this is for uh, a class victory. It's for an outright top three. And it may well be that the team are letting him know that Tom Levin is catching them by still over a second. A lap out into the dirt goes Max Huber. That's even riskier than going onto the curbs. Uh, but luckily manages to keep control, loses some time, but does not. Uh, make his way towards the barrier which is what we like to see uh, notification on our timing screen by the way Adam well spotted of a significant uh, penalty that looked like car number 19 was that correct yes car 19 that is our uh, second place car Jamie Day with a drive through penalty for causing a collision that was on the first lap with Raphael Renhofer uh, at turn one. So he has been judged at fault for that. Oh, it's Emil Yerdrum on the paint there. Really has to fight the car. I believe the pit delta here is 22 seconds uh, from pit entry to pit exit. So that is going to be hugely costly for Jamie Day. That came through in just the last few seconds for SETI Motorsports driver with a drive through penalty. That's going to drop him potentially as far down as eighth place. Oh, what a shame that is. Jamie's been driving brilliantly and is gaining on the leader by over a second a lap at the moment. So we're going to be robbed a little bit here of a fascinating battle for the victory. What we still have, though, is this equally entertaining scrap uh, for class honours further back. Josef Knopp still somehow managing to withstand the pressure uh, from Emil Yerdrum who is quite literally climbing all over the back of the Porsche, all over the curves. There's a lapped car in the way now as well as they head through the never-ending right-hander uh, up at turn number three. How did that shake itself out? We wait with bated breath. Here they come. No sign of the back marker, thankfully, but there is very much a sign of that ominous yellow and black McLaren closing. Well, there is no more closing to be done, really, Adam. He's with them and still has nearly half the race to go. I've seen Max Huber defend before, though. I think it's going to be quite difficult for Tom Leban, uh, even with that level of pace advantage, as Emil Yerdrum tags Josef Knopp, has no fear of uh, losing that three-pointed star from his front grille uh, in the midst of 
of battle. Emil Yerdrum uncompromising pursuit of not just the Pro-Am win, but also, of course, the overall podium. Uh, that Mercedes obviously looking quicker than the Porsche. I think in particular that the Porsches seem to be struggling. Twitchy uh, mid-rear engined cars not maybe doing so well in these conditions. Yerdrum with a good run through turn nine as they approach turn ten. He goes to the outside. Can't get it done there, but there goes Levin oh. for fifth place. So Tom Levin actually makes it look much easier than I thought he would to move up to fifth overall. He will now be getting involved with this Pro-Am battle as well. Yeah, that didn't take long the end did it so 11 up into the top five looks to me adam as though joseph knopp i think that car's been set up a little bit too soft they perhaps were anticipating a wetter track uh, than they've got that would explain why the car isn't turning properly because it's it naturally becomes a bit more lethargic a bit more lazy with that softer more wet setup on the car and uh, uh, that plus the fact he's battling front engine front engine mercedes behind which always will have good turn in grip uh, is certainly meaning that he is struggling tom levin though not struggling one bit dives to the inside of Emil Yerdrom. This is for uh, fourth position. He was actually fractionally ahead at the line, and by the time they arrive at turn one, he's put the McLaren well and truly in the middle of this scrap. But we've seen that Josef Kopp is not an easy man to overtake so far today, Adam. This next overtake could be the toughest one yet for Levin. There may well be an overtake at the front as well. Welcome, <laughs> never mind. Tom Levin <laughs> immediately goes through. I was agreeing with you there. I thought we'd have a couple of laps before we would say that Tom Levin is up to third place. But that's now what he's Ooh. done. Oh, and Jamie Day going for the dive. He's got to drive through penalty, lest we forget. But he's still going to try and get the high ground in the battle for the race lead. That was very, very late breaking into turn five and indeed into turn seven. Jamie Day takes the race lead. Uh, but of course, he will have to go through the pits. Well, yes, I, I'm sure he knows that, and perhaps he's trying to prove a point, really. He wanted <laughs> to bring the car in as the race leader rather than in second place. But I hope that Yoel Mesh was aware of the penalty going Jamie Day's way because he didn't really need to get involved in that. Uh, a bit of contact could have ruined his race when there was quite literally no need for it. Here, meanwhile, comes the Pro-Am battle. Still, it is not ahead of Yerdron, but they now run fourth and fifth overall. And yet again, Josef just can't get the car to turn through the corner. Damage look on the back of uh, Emil Yerdron's car. That's new, I think, Adam. Uh, well, it's new for this race. It's not new for the season. <laughs> There's a rather infamous rear diffuser on the back of the Valcapi-backed uh, uh, CV Performance Group car. Unfortunately, they always seem to end up with a bit of rear trim hanging off the car by the end. Not quite sure what jinx there is applied to the car, but it is always the case. And uh, at least it doesn't look like anything major that's going to cost them too much time or rear grip. Uh, Josef Knopp then still holding on to that Pro-Am lead, but Emil Yerdrum fighting him every inch of the way for that. As uh, the 31 car continues on in the Pro-Am lead. The Paravan back to machine. We've got uh, a couple of Paravan representatives. I'll tell you a bit more about that company <laughs> later on because Emil Yerdrum leaving the nose in at turn three. Uh, that is not normally an overtaking opportunity, but of course he saw Tom Levin do it a lap ago. Indeed so, and again that Mercedes is turning in so well he can take those tight lines into the corner uh, without really compromising his exit speed, at least compared to uh, Josef Knopp ahead, but Josef spent enough time now with Emil right behind him. He's learned where Yerdrom is quicker than him and therefore has learned where he needs to defend, where he doesn't need to defend and exactly where to place that Porsche in order to keep the AMG behind. Uh, but this is a fascinating battle. We are two-thirds of the way through what has been a scintillating uh, second GT4 Winter Series race of the weekend. And Emil Yerdrom's definition of track limits is, <laughs> is uh, changing lap by lap and uh, perhaps not getting any further in line with the official regulations as it does so. Oh, well, we... Oh, goodness me. We just saw in the back of shot there Max Huber getting very fast and loose with the track limits as well, but not voluntarily. Yerdrum much later on the brakes by the looks of it than Josef not there. Thought he might tag the rear of the Porsche, but that's not the case. We do run a fairly... Um, uh, liberal approach to track limits versus what we're used to in the UK. We haven't had many warnings in this race. Uh, it's the outside of that uh, red and white curb that really defines the track limit. So as long as you've got something on them, you're OK. And that's what we're seeing uh, in this race. But yes, Yerdrum certainly pushing the outer limits of that <laughs> coming through the final corner as Jamie Day, as scheduled and anticipated, 
rolls through the pit lane with a penalty. That will be hugely disappointing to him, even with the overall and uh, team's championship secured. Uh, they would like to have a successful final day of the season. There's some partners from Fossetti Motorsport sponsors here this weekend. And of course, you always want to put on a show for them as you go into the summer season. Indeed so. So, Jarl Vesch now moves back into the lead of the race, but uh, for how much longer, I wonder? Tom Levin, three and a half seconds behind him uh, as they began. In fact, just, yeah, three and a half seconds behind, but on the previous lap was about half a second quicker uh, than the race leader. That's going to be nip and tuck, actually, isn't it? It might take him three or four laps to catch Yolmesh, and then he's got to try and find a way past him. So there is the race leader. And if we wait, we wait, we wait, we wait, there is the Elite Motorsport McLaren. It doesn't look like a huge gap. The rate at which Tom is going, you would put money on him catching, but how long exactly he'll have to make his move, we'll have to wait and see. Last lap was only half a second quicker for Leban, so it would be the last lap, maybe the penultimate lap, that he catches. But yes, passing will be the primary issue once he gets there to the back of Joel Mesh, who certainly uh, is one of our most feisty racers out there. Uh, you heard him say earlier on he was a bit nervous about these conditions, but he's adapted to them absolutely masterfully, as once again it does seem like the back of that uh, CV car is losing a bit more from the rear. Uh, that might become an issue. Again, the, the, the splitter, the rear diffuser, obviously does have uh, an effect, does have a reason for being there, and it doesn't look like it's quite fulfilling that purpose. Not that it seems to be slowing Ooh. Emil Erdrum particularly. Uh, no, or deterring him from continuing to push pretty hard. I uh, was worried actually earlier on in this lap that he was dropping away from Josef Knob. I suspect maybe there'd been a, a moment, a mistake somewhere for Yerdrum. Uh, he's now certainly right back at it as they head towards the uh, closing stages of the race. Seven minutes left on the clock, Adam, which means it's probably time for me to venture downstairs. I can barely <laughs> drag my, myself away from this though because this is the quality of race we've had and no, it all ends in tears at turn one. Emil Yedra went for the late move up the inside. Josef Knob, unfortunately, that time could not avoid the Mercedes AMG. And around he goes. Emil Yerdrum then tagging Josef Knop into a spin. That will provisionally decide the Pro-Am order, but uh, I imagine that will be investigated at a bare minimum. Uh, so then, Andy McEwen, we lose him to the podium for a few minutes. Good luck down there, my friend. Joel Mesh and Tom Levin, 2.8 seconds separated at the front, but you can see the damage on Emil Yerdrum's car in third place. Uh, that car now definitely walking wounded. Um, if things stay as they are, if there are no decisions made either way, one would suggest that Emil Yerdrum should win Pro-Am fairly clearly from here, uh, but we'll have to see, because Nicholas Malloy, the only other Pro-Am car still running, is uh, all the way down in 11th place. We saw him on screen a little while ago. Max Huber could sense an overall podium here, of course, uh, depending on Yerdrum's pace with the uh, bodywork damage now to the front and rear of the car. Uh, Max Huber would absolutely love that to cap off his season. He would secure the AM class championship definitively in this race, regardless with the current uh, position. And if he can get an overall podium at the same time, that would be a really significant moment for him. Jamie Day has made up two places since we've last saw him as well. Renhofer and Papadopoulos losing out to Jamie, who has been absolutely sensational all season. We're seeing more and more of that um, in these races. The confidence in the team, in the car, seems to have grown exponentially. Uh, the unit that is for SETI Motorsport uh, has been very, very impressive all year long and getting better. Frank Linden there getting his nose cut off uh, by Tom Leban. Leban now, I would suggest, it was 2.2 seconds at the line. I think it's already probably more like two seconds as they run through turns four and five. You'll be unsurprised to hear that the contact between the 31 and 85 cars, Emil Yerdrum and Josef Knopp, is under investigation. That was rather anticipated across the board. Four and a half minutes left to go in this race. A good battle further back as well between the Pro-Am entry of Nicholas Malloy and Dennis Bunn in the AM class 
Team Zerg Ren Sport Porsche. Uh, Dennis Bourne with the inside line as they run down towards turn one. Uh, track limits warnings also coming in. Third warning for Tom Leban. That could be critical for him as the 94 car of Bourne tries to get it stopped for turn one. A bit less brave on the brakes uh, than Nicholas Malloy. However, Dennis Bourne gets through into 11th place. But Leban with a third warning for track limits. That could prove to be critical uh, later on. Three warnings uh, already. The penalties will start piling up before long if he's not careful. Josef Knopp has continued on his way. Uh, so Josef Knopp is uh, still out there. And in fact, he's just ahead of Porter uh, sorry, of Jamie Day in fifth place overall. Years if not fifth, Jamie Day sixth then, as we can see there in the picture in picture. 1.4 seconds is now the gap from Joel Mesh to Tom Levin. Levin is going to be on the rear of that Mercedes before long. We are approaching the final three minutes then of this GT4 Winter Series race. You can see the lights flashing from Levin, trying to uh, let Joel Mesh know, I'm coming. Joel will be all too aware whether or not the team is feeding that information to him or not, I don't know. But he will be looking in those mirrors and seeing the yellow and black McLaren getting closer and closer each passing lap. Third place, or sorry, fifth place scrap, Josef Knopp and Jamie Day still very close as well. Jamie Day with a third place finish in pro class would still uh, end up securing the pro championship, I believe, for he and Mikey Porter. We'll have to do the maths on that uh, at some point uh, in the interim between races, but I think the pro class will go to them too. This is a scrap for fifth overall, and it goes to Jamie Day. Uh, yours if not there, I don't think defending it too hard, just wants to get the car home at this stage. Well, Jamie Day through into fifth place. What's Tom Levin doing up against Joel Mesh? Still looks like uh, about a second between them. Uh, Jamie Day, though, up into fifth place. That might be his ceiling. I don't think Max Huber is going to be close enough. This time by, we begin the final lap of the motor race then. One minute and 45 seconds left to go. 0.7 of a second between Mesh and Levin. Can Tom Levin get there? And if he does get there, can he find his way through? Emil Yerdrum has just been given a drive-through penalty for causing a collision. So the driver in third place, the driver leading in Pro-Am, has a drive-through. Now, because that's been handed to him so late in the race, that's probably going to be converted to something in the region of a 20-second penalty. So Yerdrum is going to fall down the order. He's also... Uh, going to lose the Pro-Am lead provisionally. Tom Levin is right there, though, on the back of Joe Mesh. He's got there just in the nick of time on the final lap. Can Tom Levin salvage this victory? He started on pole, made an error into the first corner, went off the line onto the damp patches and drove it wide into turn one. But he's recovered through the field magnificently, and he now has a chance to make it back to the front but it's Joel Mesh that stands in his way. Levin with a good run out of turn eight, is tempted by the inside at turn nine. Will now run down to turn 10, which could be the last golden opportunity for Levin. What kind of run did he get out of turn nine? It didn't look too bad. Is he later on the brakes into 10? He has a look to the inside, tries to get the car stopped, doesn't quite do it. And that might eventually be the deciding factor. Had to get out of it there to avoid Joel Mesh. And that's cost him a car length or so. Joel Mesh just has two more corners as they power out of turn 12 to hold on to this win. Neither of them are a particularly sharp corner either. I think Joel Mesh should just about be able to do enough here. The clock has ticked down to zero. The chequered flag will wait for Joel Mesh, who secures the win for Schnitzelalm Racing. Mesh takes the win. Levin crosses the line in second but he proved there that the pace was very much with the elite McLaren. Emil Yerdrum will cross the line for third place and a provisional Pro-Am win. However, that car is uh, 
holding a drive-through penalty over hit its head. So that means Max Huber will eventually be classified third overall. Jamie Day fifth, Josef Knopp in sixth position. Raphael Renhofer taking seventh place ahead of Tim Neuser, who wins in Cayman Trophy. Alex Papadopoulos takes ninth position overall. Uh, just behind there, Franz Linden, who crosses the line a lap down. Alberto Di Martin should be coming through the last few corners now as well. There is the number 15 car to take second place in the AM class. Great to have he and Neil Montserrat back uh, in the standings, back in the series after missing out last time. And the other two cars we wait to see across the line are Dennis Bunn in the 94 and Nicholas Malloy in the number 24. So Dennis Bunn rounding out the AM class podium, Nicholas Malloy rounding out the Pro Am class podium. And those are the final finishers uh, across the line. In fact, no Willem Kuhner. Willem Kuhner is still out there out on the circuit. He will cross the line to finish 14th overall eventually. But a win for Joel Mesh in at the GT4 Winter Series. A great result for him after struggling last week uh, in the Motorland Aragon circuit. Uh, Marcel Martovic, of course, took the race win uh, in the second race in GT4 Winter Series last week as well. Uh, Joel Mesh struggled a little bit more. Uh, third place in the first race and in the Enduro finished fourth, but that was largely down to him being very, very poorly indeed throughout the Aragon weekend. He certainly had a driving through a bit of brain fog, I think, during that race weekend. And he's bounced back. He's in good health and good spirits. And he now gets to celebrate on the top step of the podium. Uh, that will also give him a few more points uh, in the battle for second in the championship. In fact, uh, just checking that now, uh, while it's fresh in the mind, I believe Joel Mesh has done enough. Uh, has he done enough to win the second place in the championship overall? Not quite, actually. It's just uh, 16 points. It was 16 points between them. It will now be 90, uh, 16 points. Sorry, live on air maths. 23 points now uh, left between them. Uh, so, yes, the championship is still alive. The battle for second is still alive. Uh, but Joel Mesh would effectively need to not score uh, in race number three. And the elite McLaren would have to win in order for second in the championship to change hands. Joel Mesh now has a 23-point lead uh, in the championship. In the second place battle in the overall championship, I should say. Of course, Jamie Day and Mikey Porter securing the overall title yesterday. And now comfortably lead that table. But uh, for Tom Leban, he has put in an absolutely wonderful drive, one of the drives of the season there, to come up from the rear of the pack and make his way all the way to second position right on the rear boot lid of the Schnitzelau Mercedes, but Joamesh withstood the pressure from both Jamie Day and Tom Leban over the course of that race. And is a deserved winner of race number two the weekend in the GT4 Winter Series. He will maneuver his way out of the car now. We'll celebrate along with his team. Like the helmet design on that as well. Team delighted to be back in victory lane once again. They missed out on any victories in Jerez and Valencia. Got a win in Aragon. Receiving plaudits from all parties then down in the pits. And uh, of course we mentioned there that uh, there would be a drive through converted to a penalty for Emil Yerdrum and that has now come through. Uh, he has dropped down to ninth position ultimately uh, overall. Second still within Pro-Am uh, but uh, Josef Knopp will then inherit the Pro-Am win and of course Max Huber will inherit an overall podium as well 
for the NM Racing team. So that's going to be a big celebration, I'm sure, for Max Huber. Uh, we don't do an overall podium ceremony, uh, but nonetheless, uh, Huber getting into the overall top three is a big statement uh, as to what he can achieve. A very, very fast bronze driver uh, at the moment is uh, is Max Huber, much like his own team boss, Neil Montserrat, who's uh, managed to get downgraded to bronze coming into the last couple of years. Uh, two very, very quick drivers there who uh, maybe uh, would conventionally be considered worthy of a silver grade, but are running bronze. Joel Mesh, a very, very quick silver driver. One that I think we're going to see a lot more success from in future years uh, in GT racing. Joel Mesh can now give us his analysis of that race. He is with Izzy Browning. Hello, everyone. I'm down in the pit lane with our winner of that first GT4 race of the day, Joel Mesh. What a drive. That was fantastic. Were you nervous in the last couple of laps? Yes, definitely. That's exactly what I said going into the, into the weekend. Already the McLaren last year at GT4 European Series with an insane pace, and so is he now, yeah. But you managed to hold on all the way, and it was fantastic to watch. You guys have had some great battles all season and held on all the way. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really, really close. I think one lap further I wouldn't have done it, but here I am, victory. What do, what do I want more? And you said to us on the grid that you were a little bit nervous about the conditions. So how, how greasy was it out there? Um, the first braking zone, like you've seen, was really, really slippery. There were uh, the McLaren going off, a Porsche behind me somewhere. It was just a really big mess. Yeah. Were you surprised when you saw him back in your mirrors after what happened to them at the start? Um, yeah, a bit. But uh, I kind of thought so because, like I said, these guys, insane pace all over the season. And especially here in Barcelona, it's insane, yeah. And we believe that P2 in the championship does go down to the final race this afternoon. You've not quite done it yet, but you must be feeling good after this morning. Yeah, definitely feeling confident now, even more than before. And uh, so I think we can get this one. All right. Well, we wish you best of luck. Head on up to the podium and we'll see you later. Thank you very much. There's our winner, Joel Mesh, of race two. As I said, we believe that the GT4 P2 in the championship goes to the final race. So you definitely don't want to miss that. For now, we're going to go back up to commentary. Thank you very much, Izzy. Yes, I think two points uh, left uh, between them, as it were. 23 points advantage, 25 left to score. Uh, so not quite. Joe Mesh is second in the championship yet. Levin and Meekin could still do it. They're going to have to rely on misfortune from Joel Mesh. So then, the race is now in the books. And uh, in the next few moments, hopefully, we can take a look. Let's go now to the highlights. So then, the race began with slightly greasy conditions out on track. It looked fairly dry, but Tom Leban proved that it was anything but offline. Jamie Day also tagging Raphael Renhofer into a spin further back. Uh, that would ultimately, of course, cost him a drive-through penalty. All sorts of action on the first lap as uh, Alex Papadopoulos there got to the inside of Alex Connor. Connor would ultimately end up with a puncture as a result of that, ending his race, as you see there. Uh, the CV Performance Group Mercedes cars once again uh, with some misfortunes across the race distance. Alberto Di Martin getting uh, overtaken by the recovering Rafael Renhofer. Quite a few cars coming back from an out-of-position situation. One of them being Tom Leban, who was making his way up to a top-five scrum led by Josef Knopp. Josef Knopp, the Pro-Am class entry, though, would ultimately be overtaken by Joel Mesh, who went around the outside at turn five. Very tidy move from Mesh. He would then start to build a lead. Jamie Day would follow him through into second place shortly thereafter. But before long, uh, the news would come through that Jamie had a penalty hanging over his head. It was a masterful move coming out of turn eight uh, that allowed Jamie Day through at turn nine. And then uh, we would get the news of the penalty. He would still, though, be hunting down Joel Mesh. Meanwhile, Josef Knopp would be under immense pressure from Emil Yerdrum and the slightly rally-crossing Max Huber as well. 
the 31 car as wide as humanly possible uh, through turns two and three. The 31 car uh, being tagged a little bit by Emil as well as they went through turn four and five. Tom Leban would close in on all of them and find his way by as uh, the battles continued on uh, for first and second place. The pro-class car of uh, Jamie Day got through, but then had to serve that drive-through penalty. He would drop down to eighth position once the penalty was served. Josef Knott was really starting to frustrate Emil Yerdrum. He just couldn't find a way through, and the car was starting to wear some war ruins as well. And it all culminated, unfortunately, with contact at the first corner, that would lead to a drive-through penalty and more damage to Emil Yerdrum. But that drive-through came late in the race. Therefore, Yerdrum's time penalty was given out instead. So Tom Leban on the very final lap closed in on Joel Mesh. However, it was Mesh that crossed the line to win in the GT4 Winter Series. A great result for Mesh and for Tom Leban, who really did show his pace in that one, recovered to P2 from effectively the rear of the field, but nothing he could do on the final lap to get past Joel Mesh. He wins the GT4 Winter Series. Let's have a look then at the results of that race. Joel Mesh takes it by just over quarter of a second from Tom Leban. Max Huber rounds out the overall podium from the AM win in third place. Jamie Day fourth after his drive through. Josef Knott wins in Pro AM. Raphael Renhofer takes sixth place ahead of Tim Neuser, Alex Papadopoulos, Emil Yerdrum down to ninth after his penalty. Alberto Di Martin rounding out the overall top 10. Dennis Byrne, Nicholas Malloy, Franz Linden, and William. Kuna rounding out our 14 finishers after Alex Connor didn't take the flag. And so now, as we get ready for more racing down on the starting grid, uh, we will be rounding out the process of herding drivers towards the podium. Hopefully in the next few moments, we can go down there and uh, see the podiums take place. I'm sure there are going to be some big smiles. I expect Max Huber is going to have a very, very wide Cheshire Cat-esque grin after taking an overall podium in that race. He knows he's got potential. He knows he's got pace. And he really is starting to realise that here as he uh, matures across the season in at the GT4 Winter Series. Great to have NM Racing Team providing three cars as well, adding yet more depth to the GT4 Winter Series field. But uh, Joao Mesh called it, didn't he? Uh, earlier in the week, earlier in the, uh, in the broadcast as well, that McLaren looks very quick around the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia. And uh, if the race were to be one or two laps longer, I have to wonder whether Joel Mesh would have taken the flag first because Tom Leban closed in incredibly quickly and that will give Leban and Meekin and Elite Motorsport great confidence going into the hour-long enduro this afternoon for the GT4 Winter Series. Of course, there will be a mandatory driver change for those who have a second driver to change and uh, there will also... And for those who do not have a second driver, a mandatory pit stop nonetheless. So we look forward to seeing how that race goes. The dynamic of the endurance race is always very exciting to see in at the GT4s. And Andy McEwen has managed to gain our drivers from this race, which means we can now head down to him for our podium ceremonies. Thank you very much, Adam. Yes, uh, took a minute or two just to go through a few of the last minute changes, a couple of uh, penalties that were applied post race. But we do now have our drivers ready for our opening podium ceremony of the day. And we will start with our top three drivers in the pro class, starting with third place, Jamie Day. Congratulations, Jamie, who, there he is. Out he comes to uh, be greeted by a big crowd of people down below, uh, as will the charging second place finisher, Tom Leban. Tom really had his work cut out there after that early moment, fought back beautifully for second place, but ultimately could not find a way past our race winner, that being Joel Mesh. 
who quite rightly gets the biggest cheer of them all down below uh, and they will pose now atop the podium trophies being prepared behind me and uh, we've got a few special guests to present the trophies our third place trophy handed out by Sergio Fonseca a promoter from uh, Gedlish Racing second place trophies uh, by Marco Scherlich a representative from Pirelli and it is the CEO of the circuit to Barcelona Catalonia Josef uh, Santa Maria who is handing out the winners trophies uh, for our GT4 winter series so a big thank you to those for helping out with the presentation photos will be taken and drivers will very shortly disappear before they do though I want to try and have a quick chat with Tom Levin because we saw him charging through the pack in that race Tom if I could just grab you for a quick second we'll let the other two go uh, but I wanted to speak to you about what was a, a pretty challenging race it, until turn one it looked good what happened uh, to be honest, I think I just hit the white line on the way in and where it was damp and wet I just locked up and uh, went into the ABS straight away way and went straight on but recovered to p2 almost the win but um yeah it was good in the end really it looked like maybe you needed one more lap do you think that would have done it you'd have you'd have got past potentially i think we definitely had the pace advantage obviously from catching him um obviously if i didn't go off at the start it would have been a lot easier uh, we, we i think we would have got him in the end but obviously we ran out of laps well you certainly made it entertaining for us thank you very much tom for having a quick chat so tom Lebon then uh, makes his way off the podium and we now move on to the pro-am category where we did have a late change for our third place finisher. It's still Vim Averk who will be celebrating, but it is uh, our third place driver, Igor Kishin. Congratulations, Igor. Third place in the Pro Am class. Second place went the way of Emil Yerdrum. After a lively race, it has to be said, he was right in the thick of the action, as indeed was our Pro Am class winner, Josef Nalp. Out they head onto the podium steps then. And uh, yes, if not, looking very cool and calm after what was a busy race for our Pro-Am class winning driver. The trophies are ready uh, to be presented by, as I said, the same three. So Sergio Fonseca from Gedlich, Marco Scherlich from Pirelli and Josef Santa Maria, the CEO of this wonderful circuit, which is looking absolutely splendid uh, in the uh, winter sunshine. It's actually quite pleasant out here today, I have to say, certainly a far cry uh, from the challenging conditions that we had to deal with uh, on Winter Series Saturday. So our Pro-Am drivers then will head off the podium and in a moment or two we'll move on uh, to the AM class of drivers. Three more happy drivers ready and waiting to join us on the podium, beginning with our third placed AM driver, Dennis Bourne. Out he jogs onto the podium, closely followed by the first of the two NM racing drivers that we're about to see, starting with our second place finisher, Alberto De Martin. His second podium finish of the weekend. Likewise for the class winner, though, another NM racing driver, Max Huber. And what a brilliant drive it was from Max, who deservedly gets a big reception from the crowd down below. Up there fighting it out with uh, our pro and pro-am drivers. Only really in the last few moments of the race did uh, Max sort of drop away from them. But it was a brilliant effort nonetheless. And he deservedly picks up the AM class victory. So our media team on hand to commemorate the moment and the teams down below with cameras at the ready to to celebrate a podium finish in the penultimate round of the championship still one more gt4 uh, winter series race to come later on there's still one more podium to come as well we've got our final group of drivers about to head out onto the podium these of course the drivers in the cayman trophy and in third place willie coon Congratulations, third step of the podium for him. Uh, in second place for Speedworks, Franz Linden. But the victory in the Cayman Trophy goes to the SR Motorsport driver, Tim Neusser. Bit of confusion for Franz Linden, not entirely sure where he was heading, uh, but he does find his way onto the second step of the podium, followed by Tim. The final set of trophies uh, will be handed out to our top three drivers, and that will conclude our podium ceremonies from down here. Uh, and uh, we will see the GT4 drivers, as I said, one more time a little bit later on today. For now, though, you can probably see in the background cars heading out down the pit lane, ready for our second race of the day, and in a way, the first race of the weekend for the Formula Winter Series.
race two, technically speaking, for the Formula Winter Series. Race one uh, never really happened. We got about one and a half laps in, then a red flag. No points scored, no result declared. But race two is about to get underway. Then our first proper running of the weekend in competitive circumstances for the Formula Winter Series category. The uh, ever entertaining junior drivers in this class and our championship battle is right there at the sharp end as well. Uh, Griffin Peebles is set to be our pole sitter for this race, and Andres Cardenas is set to be on row number two. So that means that our uh, championship battle will be uh, right up there, front and center. Coming into this weekend, there was just five points between uh, Peebles and Cardenas in favor of Griffin Peebles and he would have got uh, an additional point for uh, securing pole uh, this morning as well in Q2. So uh, Griffin Peebles, I think, will now have a six-point lead, if I'm not mistaken, in the championship fight. Uh, and that means that, uh, realistically, Andres Cardenas needs to uh, claw some points back. Of course, 25 for a win, uh, 18 for second. So he could actually become the championship leader simply by winning this race, Andres Cardenas. And that is something he will be all too aware of and uh, all too keen to achieve uh, in this race. Uh, you can see the cars coming down to the grid. Izzy Browning is primed and ready to talk us through. So let's go down there now with her and Johnny, the cameraman. Hello, everyone. Welcome down to the grid for the first Formula Winter Series race of the day. And seeing as we didn't get any racing yesterday, first Formula Winter Series race of the weekend. So we've got Griffin Peebles, our pole sitter. We're going to go and chat to him in a minute. But one thing to note is that it has been a very quick turnaround this morning for the teams as they had qualifying to you this morning and about an hour ago, I'd say. And then they've turned around for the race right now. So we are going to head over to our championship leader and we are going to have a little chat to him. Griffin, best place to start for you, but you've got your championship rival right behind you. So how are we feeling heading into today? Uh, Q2 today was really good. We had good pace of so late red flag cost us from getting pole, but we got second fastest lap with pole. So starting on the good side, yes, I have my rival behind me, but I feel like I have really good speed and I feel like I can do really well. It's a pretty long run down to turn one here. So are you confident that you can keep the, uh, keep the others behind you? Yeah, I think I can, if I get a good start. All right, wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. There's our pole sitter, Griffin Peebles. Now, alongside him, just pulling in, is Nathan Ty. Now, Nathan didn't race with us last weekend, um, but he's back this weekend, and it, on his debut in Valencia, he did get points. So I can imagine that he's probably hoping for the same. So if I just jump in, Nathan, welcome back to the Formula Winter Series grid. It's a pretty good place for you to start. You've got points on your debut. So uh, are we thinking we can do the same again? Yeah, hopefully the same again, hopefully a few more, a few more this time, and uh, yeah, let's get it in the way. And we've got the, um, we've got the championship leader in front of you, so obviously he'll be wanting to keep a clean race for his championship. So does that mean that you're going to just kind of go for it and, uh, and see if you can take the win? Yeah, you know, it's my second race in Formula 4, so we're going to do everything we can and uh, push for the front. And it's a lot less, uh, lot less rain. Well, no rain today so far. So um, dry track. I mean, you've had obviously testing. Do you do you fancy your chances in in these kind of conditions? We seem to have good pace in uh, in both conditions. So we see now, and yeah, happy it's not raining. My suit's dry, and it smells quite nice as well. <laughs> better. So yeah, I'm excited. All right, we wish you best of luck for the race. Have a good race. Right. One thing I did want to point out is that there's a lot of long right-handers on this track, very well known for that. Um, and so that is going to beat up the left tyres. So if we just take a little look at the left tyres now, what I will try to do is after the race, um, go again and see what the tyres look like after the race, because the long right-handers really really do uh, beat up those left tires so i think we've just got enough time to speak to andres cardenas quickly andres spoke to you yesterday it's a lot drier today isn't it yeah yeah it's a lot drier and prepare for everything and you've got your championship rival ahead of you so uh, are we confident that we can we can make a move and uh, get him into turn one yeah for sure that's the objective and i'm working for it 
All right, we wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. OK, we're going to continue down the grid, but as you can see, the teams are starting to leave. We've got Jan Prozowski alongside here in the number eight car. Now, he's another one who uh, has missed a couple of rounds, but is back with us. Obviously, we've got a lot of F4 drivers making their debut in the Winter Series. And with only two races left to go, they'll definitely be trying to learn as much as possible. Um, continuing on, we've got the number seven of Maciej Gwadish. We've spoken to Maciej quite a lot. Obviously, he had that crash last weekend, but we're going to see and hope that it will be a lot cleaner for this race. So then the Formula Winter Series cars are lined up on the grid. Uh, the grid for this race formed slightly differently than usual. The second fastest times from qualifying two being used as we didn't get a qualifying one yesterday. Griffin Peebles is your pole sitter alongside Nathan Ty, who incidentally will have pole position for race number three. So Nathan in his second weekend in Formula Four with some good results potentially on the horizon. Andres Cardenas is next on row two of the grid alongside Jan Petrovsky. Ernesto Rivera sits fifth place alongside Maciej Gwadish. Row four of the grid, Jan Marco Pradel celebrating his birthday earlier in the week. He'd love to celebrate his 18th with a podium at the very least. Rene Franco is next in the 57 car. Dawid Decker and Lucas Flucher rounding out the top 10 ahead of Arthur de Rizan and Flavio Olivieri. Row seven of the grid is going to be formed by Kiko Francisco Macedo and Finn Harrison. Peter Bazinelos and Kabir Anarag in 15th and 16th place. Matthias Ferreira and Enzo Tarnvanichkel 17th and 18th. Row 10, Rene Lammers alongside Mikel Pedersen, who had a bit of a problem in qualifying too earlier. He had an incident with another car. Akshay Bora and Maxime Rehm next, ahead of Edouard Borgna and Lenny Reed. Row 13 of the grid, Ella Lloyd for Rodin, starting alongside Technicars Lorenzo Castillo, Adam Hideg and Preston Lambert on row 14. Alexander Savinkov and Keanu Alazari down in 29th and 30th. Alazari with a lot of work to do from there. Thomas Strauben, who took a race win in Motorland Aragon, he'll have some work to do from 33rd, uh, 31st. Ditto Jack Beaton in 30 seconds. Again, we have some drivers further down the order than we would anticipate. Fry, Fiorentino, Dobzanski, and Berebi rounding out your grid for this race. But that's going to be the story, I think, for most of our drivers here, uh, or rather for most of our drivers towards the back. There's quite a few out of position there. Uh, you would expect Beaton to be right up there. Of course, it was Beaton Alazari front row in Motorland Aragon. They're now all the way down in 30th and 32nd, respectively. Thomas Straubin, who was fighting with them and took the race win at Motorland Aragon, separating them in 31st. They're going to have a lot to think about and a lot to do. Meanwhile, Griffin Peebles uh, will have that pole position. He will have his main title rival, Andres Cardenas, came into this weekend with just five points between them, I believe, with Peebles on pole now. That will be six points. Uh, but Peebles and Cardenas, that's going to be the battle to watch. Nathan Ty, more than happy, though, to play spoiler. So then, the cars... Warming up the tyres, of course, so important, isn't it, to get heat into those rear tyres on the approach uh, to the grid. Uh, just to make sure you've got the best chance possible of getting a decent launch. Uh, indeed so, yes. Uh, it's a long old run down into Turn 1 as well, so plenty of opportunity to jump into somebody's slipstream and uh, try and generate a move right from the word go. And that could be important because we do see in slicks and wings single-seaters around this circuit, overtaking can be at a little bit of a premium. So at the first sort of 20 seconds or so of this race could be absolutely crucial. They certainly could. Uh, it's going to be very compelling to see who gets the best start from the front row of the grid. Can Andres Cardenas get a launch to try and challenge Ty and Peebles 
down to the first corner. They hide behind us on the crest of the hill as the revs rise. The lights go on and the lights go out. We are racing in the Formula Winter Series. Hopefully everybody's gotten away nicely there. It's Peebles with the lead. Dower de Decker going rally crossing further back in the pack in the distinctive BWT car. But it is Peebles that leads. Cardenas has got himself up into second place there ahead of Rivera. Now Nathan Ty, where is he? I think he has lost a few positions in the 48 potentially. A couple cutting Ooh. the corners and one of the Rodin cars I think that is sent into a spin. Ella Lloyd in at the 77 car there along with one of the Yenza Motorsport cars. But dramas in the first lap, a car in the gravel and beach. I do suspect this may well end up under safety car before too long. Uh, but it is Griffin Peebles that leads the way. Yes, it is. Lots of jockeying for position coming down the hill. Nathan Ty, I think it might have been that I spotted getting a really poor start. There's drama further back. That is the number nine car off the road and bouncing its way, thankfully, back out onto the circuit. That is Rene Lammers in the MP Motorsport car. Another in the gravel. That, I suspect, is Lorenzo Castillo, the Mexican. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I fancy your chances of being correct on this one, Adam. I think the safety car more than likely about to make an appearance. And, indeed, that is confirmed now after what was a fairly frenetic start. In fairness, they've been sat around waiting to go racing for an awful <laughs> lot longer than normal. They are generally very young drivers, these, full of energy uh, and perhaps not really uh, uh, fully prepared for just how little grit there might have been on cold tyres. I had this exact conversation with one of the race directors this morning, actually. <laughs> uh, we had a feeling that the youngsters might be a bit eager to go racing after sitting around uh, probably on their phones yesterday as no racing took place so yes we have indeed seen a bit of a first lap drama of course GRS will be excited to see that they've got two cars in the top 10 as well as we see there the 27 car is the machine from uh, Yenza Motorsport in the gravel so it's Edouard Borgna who found Ella Lloyd at turn one Lorenzo Castillo of course involved in that as well but that was a separate incident because Castillo actually was registered through the first sector so that must have been somewhere else out on the circuit that he had his moment uh, nonetheless Enzo Tarnvinichko also in the pit lane now he had some issues yesterday as well that led him to the pit lane you might recall uh, in the not quite race that we had uh, he came in after the first lap under safety car uh, so Tom Vinichkel again in the pit lane now is it as simple as a front wing change or is there something more uh, complex at play I can see the car down there in the pits hopefully it is nothing more uh, than a uh, wing change. Front wings and Formula 4 cars often do uh, separate from each other, so not unprecedented by any means. But Griffin Peebles is our race leader, and critically for him, as the Enzo Tarnvinichkel Red Bull-backed Campos machine heads out there onto the circuit, it is Andres Cardenas, second in the championship, who sits there second in the race as well. So our championship top two are now also your top two in the race. Ernesto Rivera third in the race. Pradell and Rene Franco in fifth place as well. Rene, who raced with us last year in FWS um, and is also, uh, of course, coming out of a season of Spanish F4, a driver with quite uh, a lot of experience behind him at this point in uh, F4 racing. He did three races actually in Spanish F4, but he did uh, have three wins in the CZ Championship, the Central European F4 Series, runner-up last year with Jenza. So we can expect him to be pacey, and he is proving to be uh, in the uh, GRS car, of course, the 57 entry that was previously uh, driven by Leah Block, who had a promising debut in F1 Academy last week. Lorenzo Castillo's car being towed from the gravel then. The recovery trucks heading towards turn one as well. Uh, so a lot of uh, work for the marshals to do. Griffin Peebles, uh, though, will be just focusing on keeping heat in those tyres, keeping himself focused. He can't afford any slip-ups with Andres Cardenas just behind. If he loses that lead uh, in the race, he will also lose the lead in the championship. 25 points to Cardenas will give him the championship lead going into the finale. 
I do like a championship finale. It seems very strange to be talking about one at the beginning of March, I have yeah. to say. But, uh, hey, that's why we like the Winter Series, right? It gets us all warmed up for some of the uh, complex mathematics that have to oh. be done come season's end. And I'm very, very grateful that Adam uh, is very much in charge of the mathematics, not me. I think we should all be grateful for that, really. Uh, but, yes, very tight indeed in the championship, exactly what we like to see. Uh, and I do think that once we go racing, we're going to see a really feisty battle at the front of the field. These are... As I said, slicks and wings single seaters, but they don't generate a huge amount of downforce. They're not particularly big. Uh, and so you can go side by side, side, even around a circuit such as Catalonia. And uh, that long drag down the main straight, which at the moment they are weaving their way down behind the safety car. That certainly provides lots of slipstreaming opportunities. So it should be an interesting battle. Uh, but Griffin Peebles did get a good start. Nathan Ty actually didn't lose as many places as I thought he would. The car just bogged down off the line. He reacted OK. And then the car just didn't really go anywhere. So uh, uh, perhaps didn't have enough revs. Perhaps uh, something else was at play but he is going to be one to watch, I think. Clearly has the single lap pace, the fastest of the many Campos racing drivers up towards the sharp end of the field. Uh, but what's his racecraft like, I guess? Hopefully, we'll find out in the next few minutes. Uh, I remember seeing him in Valencia for his uh, first ever appearance in a single-seater in FWS just a few weeks ago, and he did look like he knew what he was doing. Uh, he did look like he knew what he was doing, unlike my ability to form a <laughs> sentence, uh, in that race. He did look very, very strong indeed uh, in the kind of mid-pack battles that he was getting involved with there. Didn't have a great quali, actually, uh, in Valencia, which he's clearly cured for Barcelona. I suspect that racecraft hasn't gone anywhere since then. Peter Bazinolos out on the circuit uh, I need to I need to say thanks to Peter's godfather Tony who actually sent me a care package uh, to the commentary box midway through uh, Sunday in Aragon because I wasn't getting a lunch break um, <laughs> it came from one of our staff members it arrived from one of the staff members I assumed it was from said staff member but actually no it was uh, courtesy of Tony from uh, the MP team and Peter Bazinolos's camp so thank you to him Yes, bribing is probably the, the operative word, as the director says in my ear. Uh, but they're nice people. There are so many great young talents in this paddock, and so many of them are really great to talk to as well. It's almost unnerving how professional some of those 15-, 16-year-old racing drivers are. Um, the process of getting them kind of camera ready uh, at this stage begins very, very early. Well, it does, as it should, really, because there are lots of very rapid junior drivers who I've come across over the years who have the ability to make it all the way to the top, don't get me wrong, but a big part of what you need to be a successful racing driver is, uh, you know, an ability to talk on camera, to, to have that personality that fans of the sport will engage with, and uh, it takes a few of them longer to figure that out than others, but it's nice to see, generally speaking, uh, that these youngsters who are all in a very privileged position, let's be honest, they should be enjoying themselves. They should have a smile on their face. Uh, and it's nice to see now that they're realising that's what we want to see. So, uh, yeah, uh, nice to see that uh, that work that's going on behind the scenes is uh, doing its job. Uh, also nice to see that the marshals are doing their jobs pretty efficiently down there at the first couple of corners. They've got at least one of our problem cars out of the way. There is still one more, I think, in a different kitty litter somewhere else, though. And that is going to require at least one more lap behind the safety car. Uh, but luckily, this is a fairly lengthy race. We should still get plenty of racing in. The Nissan safety car leads them off the final corner and uh, down that long drag down the pit straight. The iconic shot here at the circuit to uh, Barcelona, Catalonia as they press the hill past the scoring pylon uh, that has a uh, live feed for our live stream on the top of it as well, which yeah. I think is a pretty uh, interesting touch. I believe that one of the camera ops down in the pit lane so fogged up was their camera yesterday. They were actually using the uh, image on the top of the totem pole to be able to see that they were filming the right <laughs> thing. It That's was a pretty grim day to be out there all round yesterday, but uh, hopefully they'll be topping up the tan today instead. Yes, no, be it uh, Izzy down in the pits, be it our videographers, photographers, our camera ops here from Alpha Live as well. Yesterday was pretty torrid stuff. Uh, thankfully, uh, today has been better so far from a weather perspective. Hopefully, it's going to be better from a racing perspective as well. It shouldn't be too long 
uh, before we get this race back under green flag conditions. No bulletin as yet as to when the safety car may come in. Uh, for Griffin Peebles, I think just having the opportunity to um, gather his thoughts, think about the safety car restart uh, and quite when he might pull the pin uh, to try and catch out Andres Cardenas might be a little bit useful for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't want to go too early, do you? Because no. it is a long drag down that pit straight, but then leaving it to the last minute, you have to get it right if you leave it to the last minute. So it always used to be easier, actually. It was the only good thing, really, about the <laughs> last sector that we used to have here with the little chicane. That made it a bit easier, because as soon as you got to the apex of the chicane, you could accelerate, and you knew you were going to gap the car behind you, because that's what was happening in race conditions. So on a restart, that definitely was going to be the case. Uh, this time around, it's going to be a bit more of a challenge. But we are about to see uh, what sort of strategy Griffin Peebles elects to go with because the safety car is headed for the pit lane. Griffin, I think, traditionally has been one to go quite early uh, on these safety car restarts. We'll have to see uh, what he can do from here. Of course, being a race leader as often as he has been is a bit of a poison chalice when it comes to the restarts because people have got a bit of a flavour for how you like to manage these things. Let's see if Andres Cardenas can correctly anticipate this. They're all still slow, and now he goes at the apex of turn 13. Looks like Cardenas anticipated that fairly well, and also Nesso Rivera behind, not quite as quick on the trigger. So that gives Cardenas uh, free will to just focus on Peebles as they come across the line. I don't think he's going to be close enough into the first corner, but of course the slipstream train weaving every which way. Jan Marco Pradell to the inside of Ernesto Rivera for third position. Rivera really didn't get the launch, and Jan Marco Pradell goes forward three, four wide. Further back there is uh, the 71 of Maxi. Reem loses it on the inside of turn one, just about keeps the car in at the right direction. It is Griffin Peebles that continues to lead the battle as the rest of the field picks their way through the first few corners. Peebles from Cardenas, now from Gianmarco Pradell as Matthias Ferreira gets to the inside there of Flavio Olivieri. And that is for 10th position. Olivieri actually getting past Ferreira there for 10th place. Uh, so Matthias losing out on that occasion. Lucas Flusha alongside Dawid Dedeca there. Flusha in the MP Motorsport car, the orange machine. Dawid uh, Dedeca in his very distinctive pink GRS car with the BWT backing. I think he almost got into the rear there uh, of Nathan Tyres, that potentially. It looks like there's one white car at the front of that queue holding everyone up. And is that Nathan Tyre? It looks like it is. Lucas Flusha got past him there at uh, turn nine, or rather, uh, sorry, uh, Dawid Dedeca got past him there Ooh. at turn nine. And yes, it is Nathan Tai who's coming under threat. He now tries to go around the outside. Us Racing's Kabir Anarag dives to the inside of Akshay Bora, and Maxime Reem gets involved as well. One car off track there as we cut away. Didn't quite see who that was, but it would have been someone from towards the front, potentially Ernesto Rivera, as Finn Harrison goes around the outside of Jack Beaton at turn 13. A great racing then on the first lap. Lots of inter-team battling as well. Lots of team managers with their heads in their hands. <laughs> uh, absolutely. They're definitely up for the fight today, aren't they? Now, that's for sure. That was some pretty ambitious outbreaking being attempted down into the hairpin. Uh, some of it more successful perhaps than others, but they're still at it now as they head down the main straight towards the braking zone at turn number one. And uh, the outside line, I think, is not going to be the place to be there. The inside of the circuit drying out quite nicely now. And that is opening up the opportunity for some overtaking the 66 there of Francisco Macedo uh, on the outside losing out and uh, he just desperately wants to try and find his way back uh, into line one of the Red Bull livery cars also having to take the long lap there through the uh, first couple of corners because they outbreak themselves they ran onto the runoff area and that is your only legal route back out onto the circuit back towards the pointy end though and this is the five for fifth position Rene Franco desperately trying to hang on to that fifth place but in defending dropping away now slightly from the group ahead Jan Pesharovsky there trying to get the power down out of uh, turn five. Pesharovsky uh, is... Uh obviously a driver who was on the front two rows of the grid so he's another one that struggled he was behind Nathan Ty so maybe got caught up in Nathan's poor start he's trying to work his way back into the top 10 there up against Flavio Olivieri hasn't got it done yet and will be conscious of the drivers behind as well goes to the outside at turn 10 has he managed to make that one work for him yes he has very nicely done the reprofiling of turn 10 has meant a quicker corner but it's also meant that Rose moves around the 
outside can be done in cars like these. Finn Harrison right behind Keanu Alazari. Keanu's made up some places. However, he also, there was a bulletin saying that he may well be investigated for overtaking under the safety car from race control. So we have to keep an eye on that too. Yeah, I suspect that's when the safety car was initially scrambled. There was a bit of uh, jostling further back. Some drivers getting the message sooner than others. Brilliant uh, stuff from Griffin Peebles at the front of the field and a late jink to the inside there. That was uh, Gladish trying to get past Rene Franco, but Rene they just got into the corner ahead of him. More squeezing going on further back. But as I was starting to say, Griffin Peebles, one and a half seconds up the road now uh, from Andres Cardenas uh, in second place. And uh, then third position, as we've said, Gianmarco Pradel started eighth on the grid. So he really benefited uh, on the opening lap. Picked his way through nicely into a podium place. But he is just struggling at the moment to keep pace with the top two. And as such, feeling pressure from Ernesto Rivera right behind him. Bit of a lock up there and out wide uh, for Filippo. Fiorentino, the Brazilian, in fact, very wide through the gravel trap he goes. Is he going to be able to keep it going? I think he will. The gravel just about compact enough uh, that he doesn't bog down, and he'll bring a lot of that gravel right back onto the racing line as well. Yes, uh, an illustration there still that offline is tricky. He went wide there into turn four. Of course, the circuit was still not quite dry at the start of the day when these guys were racing uh, their FWS Quali 2 session. Uh, so they'll know that it was a bit slippery earlier in the day. Maxime Ream to, uh, with Jack Beaton alongside him. Beaton and Alazari have been really working their way up the order in 15th and 16th respectively. Maxime Ream trying to hold on to P14 uh, up against his uh, colleague from the US Racing Stable. Alazari and Beaton side by side once again. Ooh. Last week it was for the lead. This time it's for 15th. And it is Alazari that gets through into 15th place. Keanu, who also did some LMP3 testing with Molnar Motorsport earlier in the week and won their shootout uh, to gain a Prototype Cup Germany seat. He's having a very good run through the pack here as Maciej Gwadish once again goes to the outside of Rene Franco and this time gets it done. Gwadish has been so impressive this season. They're often the fastest of our rookie drivers and he's now up in fifth place and will chase Ernesto Rivera to be the first rookie. It does seem, doesn't it, that if you want to overtake today, going around the outside is the way to do it. We saw two moves in quick succession there, perhaps a third now from uh, Jan Prozowski, who's trying to go around the outside there uh, through turn number four. That didn't really work, so instead looks to try and get the switchback. Pulls up alongside the number 10 of Mateus Ferreira, uh, who is defending as if his life depends on this, but so far managing to pick the right line and hang on to the position. But uh, a real momentum circuit, this one, no matter what car you're in. And so I think that as soon as the car in front does start defending, it is a legitimate option to just sort of send it around the outside, keep that minimum corner speed as high as possible. And that's what we saw on a couple of occasions there. Alazari around the outside of the final two corners. That is bravery, Adam. Absolutely. Matthias Ferreira that we see there in ninth place under fret here from Pucharovsky, as we see now in tenth place as he's overtaken by Pucharovsky. Uh, this is great news for Matraj Gwadish because Gwadish just five points clear of Matthias Ferreira in the battle for third in the championship. Ferreira wasn't with us last time out in Motorland Aragon. What could have been for his championship campaign had he been able to join us uh, in the third round of the season? Uh, but with Guadish up there in fifth place, with Ferreira uh, further back in the pack, almost on the verge of not scoring now, points down to tenth place, uh, that does rather solidify Guadish's uh, bid for third place if things stay as they are. Seismic if there, mind you. Uh, there is the first of the Yenza cars, Arthur Derizon having to make that car very wide indeed, as Akshay Bora goes around the outside, sets oh. himself up to the inside at turn two. That curb is clearly still slippery though he almost loses it there and Maxime Reem thought for a minute there that he might have to avoid his us racing teammate yeah that was close wasn't it that sort of bottled up the whole group behind them now so as they head towards the top end of the circuit number 45 uh, Jack Beaton dives to the inside line and I think he's going to pick up a places he wants to try and clear that other car before turn five though because now we go to a left-hander where he suddenly is no longer on the correct line he's out wide and I think he might end up losing out again now as they drop downhill so it stays as it was then the order but that was all started by the moment that you described uh, through turn
turns one and two. Again, momentum-based circuit that held everybody up. The group behind all started tripping over each other. But those are the opportunities as a racing driver, particularly mid-pack, that you are searching for. Very difficult to make something happen all by yourself. But if the cars ahead start battling, the very best drivers are the ones capable of reading that situation, anticipating what's going to happen and finding a way to benefit from it. Keanu Alazari on the back then of the 71 car of Maxime Ream again after uh, Jack Beaton tried to find his way through. Keanu looking to try and get some points out of this. Of course, he's not been with us all season. He joined the series at Motorland Aragon, so in theory, uh, he hasn't really got much of a championship stake, as it were. Griffin Peebles, 1.8 seconds clear at the front. He's building his advantage over Andres Cardenas. That's hugely important for his championship bid. Cardenas needs to try and find that pace. As we see Arthur de Riz on there, rather rudely uh, giving Akshay Bora the bare minimum space in the battle for P12. Uh, around the outside again goes Bora on the slippery curb. He goes once more, but this time he gets it done, sliding through turn two. And that's going to open the gates as well uh, for his us racing colleagues behind him. Maxime Ream gets through. MP Motorsports, Keanu Alazari also getting through as Finn Harrison goes back onto the circuit. So he's had an issue. But what's going on with that scrap further back? Keanu Alazari has gotten past uh, the... Yenza Carr and Jack Beaton uh, to the inside of Derizon as well. So, uh, well, that was a graphic illustration, wasn't it? Arthur was trying to fight to hold on to P12. He ends up down in 15th. Yeah, indeed so. So I think that might have been a penalty for Finn Harrison. I didn't see him stop at his pit stall, so I suspect that was a penalty for something. What it is, I don't know. Uh, we'll check the timing system and see if that will shed any light on it. But uh, I suspect a safety car or start infringement of some sort. Down the back straight we go then into the braking zone at the hairpin and a dive up the inside, not for the first time, by Jack Beaton. He makes the place but doesn't really make the apex. Is he going to run so wide that he hands the position back? No, just gets back to the inside line into the next corner and he has now successfully found a way around Arthur Dorizon uh, in the number 25 car who suddenly has got uh, Kabir Anurag around the outside of him. Now we've seen the outside line can work around here but not that far to the outside. There's a lot of dirt and debris and rubber marbles out there already and there just wasn't the traction in the end to make that move stick. Yeah, it's certainly uh, a bit of a mixed bag, isn't it? Oh, we've got one in the gravel. It's Gianmarco Pradell. Uh. Oh, and he holds his hands up immediately. He knows he's made an error there. Certainly doesn't look like he had any help in that one. We'll have to see. Uh, Rivera was three and a half tenths back at the line. But Gianmarco Pradell off the circuit. Didn't quite see the circumstances that led him there. Unfortunately, he is in the gravel, be it through frustration at himself or the uh, party nearby. He is off in the gravel and uh, well, with seven minutes and 50 seconds left to go, one has to wonder if again that could be a safety car or whether he can get that car rolling. Rene Lammers there recovering from uh, going off the circuit, of course, earlier on in the number nine car. Uh, the son of Jan Lammers making his debut in Formula Win Series uh, at the first round in Jerez, his first ever appearance in a junior single-seater. And one thing he's gotten used to, especially in the more recent rounds, has been safety cars. Another is declared, and that, of course, puts Andres Cardenas right back onto the gearbox of Griffin Peebles. Well, that is such a shame, though. Gianmarco Pradell, I said earlier on, came from eighth on the grid to run in third place. He was solidly running in third as well. Didn't look like he was under an enormous amount of pressure from Ernesto Rivera, but perhaps it was ultimately the pressure uh, that got to him. Whatever it is, he's a long way off the road, but still the race director deciding that the safest course of action is to release the safety car. And with just under seven minutes plus one lap of racing left, I suspect we will get back to racing, perhaps a one lap shootout uh, at the end of this one, which seems fitting, really. It's been a very frenetic race already. Uh, and I think giving them one or two laps at the end to settle it all uh, is uh, sort of the perfect way to, uh, to round this race out. But the last thing that Griffin Peebles wanted to see, because he had been getting away, he definitely looked comfortable as the race leader. And, uh, you know, he's made one solid restart already. He might need to make another. Uh, but uh, Andres Cardenas will know this is now his last chance to try and steal the race victory. Yes, uh, and by the same virtue, Ernesto Rivera uh, will now have Machai Guadish right behind him uh, in the rookie class fight, also the fight for third place. So Machai Guadish uh, could be... Uh, one to watch as well. Um, 
Andy McEwen now heads down to uh, control the podium ceremony in a little while. Uh, so Andy heads down to the paddock once again and uh, we'll see quite how many laps of racing we get at the end of this one. I think that uh, prognosis of one, maybe two laps is, is probably quite accurate uh, from Andy. And Griffin Peebles, as he alluded to, is going to be uh, a little bit frustrated that that uh, cushion he had is now gone. Cardenas, Rivera, Wadish and Franco, your top five. Uh, David Decker just behind his us racing teammate. Lucas Flusha, seventh. Jan Pesharovsky in eighth place. Ferreira and Olivieri rounding out our top ten at this juncture. Keanu Alazari. Uh, may well with the field packed together along with Jack Beaton, the two that have really been fighting their way through the order from the 30th and 32nd replace, uh, places respectively. Uh, they could yet score points in this race um, if things go their way under the safety car restart, if there's some packing together and uh, they are in an opportune part of the circuit, we may well see uh, some more moving and shaking there in favour of two of the quickest drivers on the grid who are unfortunately not uh, in a particularly high place on the grid on this occasion. So then the safety car lights are out by the looks of it and that means we are going to go racing in record time. They've managed to remove Gianmarco Pradell's car from the gravel very, very quickly indeed. So then never mind one or two laps I think we might end up with three maybe even four uh, with this race coming to a head four minutes left to go plus one lap Griffin Peebles with Andres Cardenas predicting the start again very nicely there he pulls the pin a little earlier than he did previously and Esther Rivera once again will find himself under threat this time from Machai Guadish as they head towards the first corner once more I don't think Peebles has to worry too much about Cardenas getting alongside him into the first turn, but I suspect third place may be a little more under threat. Certainly, Lucas Flusha is having a look at Dawa de Decker, and actually Guadish under pressure. Guadish under pressure from Rene Franco. Everybody else through the first turn, second turn. Looks like we haven't had too many changes. A couple of cars skittling across the runoff at turns one and two. Again, Enzo Tarvanichkal uh, getting pushed out there. He ends up taking the long loop back onto the circuit. Lucas Flusher has gotten past Dower de Decker, so Flusher is through into sixth place. Can he get into the top five? Uh, well, he's going to have to try and get past Rene Franco to do it. He's in a bit of a sandwich between the two GRS cars at the moment. Meanwhile, Matthias Ferreira there having to uh, uh, defend from Akshay Bora. Now, Bora has lost out there. He was ahead of Matthias Ferreira. Was he behind Flavio Olivieri? I can't quite remember. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's now another us racing duel. The us racing drivers do seem to find each other on a regular basis. The GRS car going defensive. Rene Franco going defensive. Pusharovsky to the inside of De Decker. Around the outside goes the 28 car as they try to, as Dedeka tries to hold on to it. Pusharovsky there with quite a nice rotation through turn 12 as he almost loses touch with the rear end of the car. That puts him through then into seventh place. Seventh place for Pusharovsky. It could yet be a top five if he continues to move through the order in that nature. Griffin Peebles and Andres Cardenas, your top two. And Esso Rivera in third place. And Cardenas will be desperate to find some pace at the end of this one to try and challenge his championship adversary. Griffin Peebles winning this race would be a huge step towards the championship for him. Oh, Dawa de Decker into the side of Matias Ferreira. Ferreira off the circuit then. Matias Ferreira in a spin. That car beached into the gravel and uh, there's a whiff of inevitability about what comes next there as those two met in the middle at turn two. Hopefully, Dedeca, well, Dedeca's lost some places there as well. Maxime Reem and Keanu Alazari have both gotten past Dedeca. Now Jack Beaton too. 
De Decker's car walking wounded and the safety car out once again. You can see there half the front wing missing on Dower De Decker's car. The safety car may well help Dower De Decker ultimately. But that is probably going to be the conclusion of the race then. Griffin Peebles continues to lead the way. The safety car is out once again. And the clock is rapidly ticking down to zero. If anything, they may even chuck the chequered flag out early. As it stands, I think we would get two more laps. So well, maybe, maybe if Matthias Ferreira's car can be uh, recovered in record time, they cross the line with 10 seconds to go. Well, maybe this race isn't over yet, actually. If they can do a quick job with Matthias Ferreira's car, they might be able to bring the safety car in uh, for a one-lap dash to the flag after all. Let's see quite how quickly we can operate on Ferreira's car. We'll take a look at the Turn 2 gravel trap to see whether or not Ferreira's car is there and uh, quite how far along they are with the recovery process. The car should be still there. It is indeed. The marshals are present, but they are yet to have started work, so I don't think... That's going to be the matter of one lap. The pickup is now moving into position, um, but I suspect my initial pessimism may prove to be correct. Now then, five second penalties have been applied to several cars out on the circuit to the 48 of Nathan Ty for track limits. He's got a five second penalty. So does Finn Harrison towards the back of the order and Maxime Ream in 10th place. So Maxime Ream sits in 10th. However, he has a five second penalty and they're under safety car, which means Keanu Alazari, even if we don't go back to green flag, will inherit a point there. And uh, Maxime Ream will fall possibly even out of the top 20 altogether uh, once all is said and done. Clock has ticked down to zero. I think the safety car is being strategically driven about as slowly as it can right now, just to see if the marshals can work their magic. Uh, there's a nice souvenir there for that particular marshal with the uh, severed front wing of Dower de Decker. Of course, Dower de Decker is going to be hoping against hope that there isn't uh, a return to racing action since his front wing is quite heavily damaged. Again, we wait for information confirmation. Uh, don't know quite how far along they are with the car being recovered down at turn one, but uh, we can see that it's still there. So I would suspect that means that uh, we are going to end this one under safety car conditions. They're doing a valiant job just moving it away now, uh, but I think it's probably going to be too little too late. Griffin Peebles then will lead them through turn 12 and 13. Now by the book, uh, we should have the plus one lap. Sometimes they scramble the chequered flag early when they know the race will not resume, but uh, we'll have to see uh, what the judgment call is there. Nonetheless, for Griffin Peebles, the safety car restarts have all been perfect. The lap speed the race pace relative to Andres Cardenas has also been strongly in his favor and uh, the live timing crew the uh, race control have just acknowledged that the race will end under safety car however the checkered flag wasn't thrown that time by so we are going to have one last lap behind the safety car which strictly means one more lap where things could go wrong if uh, something does pass uh, pass by uh, one of the drivers of mechanical issue of some sort or something of that nature. But Griffin Peebles looks like uh, he is on his way to that win. And with that win uh, will come an expanded championship advantage, 25 points uh, for pole and uh, 18 points for, uh, sorry, 25 points for a win and 18 points for second place. So Cardenas's 
deficit to the car he's chasing will double. Griffin Peebles will be uh, some, I think it would be 15 points, 14 points clear uh, at the end of this. In fact, Griffin Peebles, if I'm not mistaken, has the fastest lap of the race as well, which is an additional point. So he'll get two points for pole, uh, a point for the fastest lap and 25 points for the win. So a total of 28 points should go his way uh, in that in this race and that will give him a 15 point advantage then over Andres Cardenas nonetheless the gap is certainly expanding uh, at a rate of knots it was five points coming into this race uh, and will now be 15 with the three extra points on top of the 25 for winning. And that is a big step for Griffin Peebles. He hasn't won it yet, but he's given himself a mighty buffer uh, in the championship fight. Andres Cardenas then be unsatisfied that he didn't get the opportunity to try and chase down Griffin Peebles. But to be honest, it didn't look like the pace was in the car versus the MP Motorsport entry up ahead. Ernesto Rivera will be delighted with an overall podium. He will also win the rookie class in this race ahead of Machai Guadish. And Rene Franco will round out the top five. The last corners then of this race taken under safety car. And Griffin Peebles will cross the line as the race winner. Safety car makes way so he can get a nice picture uh, from the grandstand of the race conclusion. Hopefully nobody is silly enough to make any moves because, yes, the race is ending under safety car. And that is the end of the race then. A difficult race for some. Dower de Decker having issues there towards the end. Of course, Gianmarco Pradell spinning out of a podium position hugely unfortunate for him but uh, a fairly tidy race by some of the recent standards in fws of course in aragon we had the issue of the huge tailwind into turn 12 and 16 which made the races very high intensity uh, indeed for anyone with a stake in any of the drivers it was certainly uh, uh, something to watch through the hands griffin peebles more than doubles his championship lead going into the decider. Again, by my maths, the five-point lead will have become seven points with this pole position. He'll have gained a point for fastest lap and 25 points for the win, where Andres Cardenas only gained seven, which would move the five-point lead up to 15 going into the decider. Uh, there will also be some shifting around in the lower positions as well. Juan Cota, who isn't here this weekend, uh, and Gianmarco Pradell, who also non-scored, they were both on uh, 64 points coming into today, tied for fifth in the standings ahead of Akshay Bora. Uh, we'll see whether or not uh, Anyone else can maybe break into that top five, especially with Juan Cota absent this weekend. Machai Guadish will have uh, secured, well, not secured, but certainly uh, strengthened his claim to third in the championship as well with a fourth place finish. Uh, when Matias Ferreira not finishing in the points, not finishing the race at all, of course, uh, Machai Guadish will now be a lot further ahead uh, in the... the uh, battle for third in the championship. In fact, he'll be 20 points clear of Matias Ferreira. Ernesto Rivera then pulls up to the third step. Second step to Andres Cardenas. Griffin Peebles will celebrate another win in the Formula Winter Series. It will have felt like a long time coming after not having much in the way of success or luck. Uh, in Aragon, his first win uh, since the round at Valencia, his third win of the season. Griffin Peebles with a really solid result as we see there the GT Wind Series cars already 
uh, being rolled out. So we'll have to uh, get through those two podiums fairly quickly, won't we? Uh, since it seems like we're going to have racing in the not too distant future there. Uh, just watching in the paddock, Jan Marco Pradell's car being uh, flat bedded back into Park Ferme. Quite a few cars down at Park Ferme, unfortunately, uh, after a tricky race in the Formula Winter Series. But the big story is an expanded championship lead for Griffin Peebles. He's not yet the champion, but he's taken a huge step forward in the title fight. I can tell you that he is currently stood by Izzy Browning. He's just working to get his hands device and helmet off. So we'll hear from him in a few seconds, celebrating with his team as he should. A big, big win in the grand scheme of things in the Formula Winter Series. Our second season of action, a hugely expanded grid compared to season one, of course. And uh, Griffin Peebles now has maybe a couple of fingers on the championship trophy. He's not got the grasp on it yet, but he is closer than ever before with that race win in race number two. He's never taken two wins in the same weekend in FWS as well. Surely, in the short term, that's going to be his next target when we get to race number three. And while we... We will now go down to Izzy Browning. She has managed to catch up with Griffin. Let's go down there now. Hi everyone, welcome down to the pit lane where I've got our race winner of that Formula Winter Series race, Griffin Peebles. Griffin, you did what you needed to do in that race really, kept under control and uh, took home the win. Yeah, I think I got the most perfect start. I had a small gap and I didn't need to defend and I just focused on doing smooth lines and preserving the tires a bit because this track has very high degradation and we had two safety cars. The first one was really long and we had one just before the end and Luckily, it finished under safety car, so I didn't have to do anything else. But I'm really happy with the results. Good points for the championship, but it's still going to go down to the last race. And the guys were saying in commentary, you've had to deal with quite a few safety cars this, uh, this winter series season. So you must be getting used to that by now. Yeah, I had, a, I had maybe one in uh, Jerez and in Valencia, I had maybe five in one of the races I won. And this time it was only two or three, which was still fine by me. I'm happy to do laps under the safety car, but I had really good speed on the restarts and everything, so I'm very happy. And like you said there, obviously the championship does go down to the final race, but you have done a good enough job to put yourself in a, in a good position. So we're we feeling nervous going into that final race. Uh, I'm starting in a very good position. I'm starting P2 and Cardenas is starting, I think, P5. So I think we have enough pace to stay in front of him or stay in good points position. So I think we got this. All right. Well, we wish you best of luck and we'll see you back out there this afternoon. Thank you very much. There is our race winner, Griffin Peebles. Not quite the champion just yet, but he has put himself in a very good position. So we will have to see what happens in race three this afternoon. For now, we'll go back up to Adam. Thank you very much, Izzy. Yeah, Griffin Peebles, a lot of confidence there, wasn't there? He is feeling emboldened by his efforts in that race. We can take a look at the highlights from it now. We got underway then with Nathan Ty struggling to launch from the front row of the grid. Griffin Peebles therefore moved up into the race lead early on. He was our pole sitter. He managed to start nicely. Unfortunately, Ella Lloyd ended up being tagged there by one of the Yenza cars. That would cause an early race safety car and Rene Lammers would end up doing some rally crossing as well. Uh, that would put him down to the back of the order. Enzo Tarnvinichkel would need a new front wing. There'd be a few different delays. Lorenzo Castillo's car also uh, in the gravel. We went back to racing conditions and Ernesto Rivera lost out to Gianmarco Pradell. Machai Guadish uh, also making moves further back on Nathan Tai, who would fall through the order considerably over the course of the race and then gain a penalty. He was ultimately classified 26 at the end of the race. Lucas Flusher and Dawa De Decker getting into a scrap as well as they tried to find a way past Nathan Tai. Uh, a bit of a squirrely moment for Kabir Anarag as well as he tried to make his way by... Uh, Aksho Bora, his us racing colleague. Filippo Fiorentino had an off-track moment, one of several drivers to get caught out by the still slightly greasy outer uh, remnants of the circuit. Jack Beaton and Keanu Alazari were side by side, 
going through turn 13. The number eight car of Petrovsky uh, making his way past uh, Matthias Ferreira. This was on the fringes of the top 10. Ferreira would be fighting to try and stay in the points and would ultimately end up in the gravel. We saw there Akshay Bora trying to find his way uh, through the top 10 as well. And he was having to really fight the car on some of the slippery curbs. Jack Beaton making his way up the order from 32nd on the grid. Gianmarco Pradell unfortunately dropping a podium away at the very last several minutes of the race. Looked like he may have just made an error on his own, unfortunately. He'll come back fighting, though, in race number three. Dawa Dedeka tried to go around the outside of Yapasharovsky, but uh, Dedeka was having none of it trying to hold on there. Ferreira into the gravel. That was after contact uh, with Dedeka. Decker's front wing also bearing the brunt of that impact. Unfortunately, that last safety car came out a little bit too late. And Griffin Peebles was our race winner under safety car conditions. He's happy with a full haul of points. Pole, fastest lap, win. Perfect day so far for Griffin Peebles. Andres Cardenas takes second ahead of Ernesto Rivera. Maciej Gwadish and René Franco. Lucas Flucher finishes sixth ahead of Jan Petrovsky. Akshay Bora in eighth ahead of Flavio Olivieri. And Keanu Alazari who rounds out the top ten. Dawa Dedeka, Jack Beaton, Arthur Derizon and Mikkel Pedersen go down to 14th place. In 15th position, Kabir Anarag. Kiko Macedo in 16th, Maxime Ream in 17th, Enya Fry, Rene Lammers, and Adam Hideg round out the top 20. Peter Bizanellos in 21st place, Thomas Straubin in 22nd, Alexander Savinkov 23rd, Tom Vanichkal 24th, Fiorentino, Ty, and Lambert taking us down to P27. Lenny Reed 28th, Victor Dobzanski in 29th position, Berebi and Harrison rounding out our finishers, Matthias Ferreira and Gianmarco Pradell not reaching the flag. And of course, we lost free drivers Castillo, Borgia and Lloyd on the very first lap. So then we're unwinding now from a predictably dramatic uh, Formula Win Series race number two. The title fight is still on coming out of that race, but Griffin Peebles has gained a lot of headway in the championship. We can now go down, though, to the celebrations. Master of Ceremonies, Andy McEwen. Thank you, Adam. Yes, we've got drivers ready then for our next podium ceremony. It is the Formula Winter Series, and we will start with our top three drivers within the rookie class in third place of the rookies, Lucas Flucher. Congratulations, Lucas, out onto the third step of the podium. Second place for MP Motorsport, Bashai Gladish. But for the first of two appearances on the podium this afternoon, our rookie class winner and overall podium finisher, Ernesto Rivera. Out comes Ernesto onto the top step of the podium, and the trophies will be presented in a moment or two. Here they come now. So to hand out our third placed uh, trophy, we will have Robin Selbach of Genlich Racing, the second placed trophy by Jakub Krasek from Hankook, and uh, Josep Santa Maria once again on hand, the CEO of the Circuit de Barcelona Catalunya, to hand out the winner's trophy. So all together on the top step of the podium, the GT cars are making uh, it's a very noisy pit lane as they prepare to head out onto the circuit. We'll get to those in a moment or two. But first, it's time for the F, uh, the Formula Winter Series drivers to take centre stage. And I will very quickly have a chat with Ernesto, if that's OK. I'm definitely going to have to join you up there, Ernesto, because you're already a lot taller than me, especially up here on the top step. Congratulations, rookie class victory. Happy with how that race went? Yeah, my start was amazing. I guess the, the outside side side was more clean than the inside and then my safety car restarts were not the best but still a good race and so nice to be on the overall podium as well it's such a competitive grid you must be really happy with how you've progressed through the season yeah for sure uh, it's been a tough winter series but each race i'm learning more and more 
Excellent. Well, congratulations on the class victory. We'll let you get off the podium now. Uh, so that was Ernesto Rivera for Campos Racing, uh, the winner of the rookie category. Right then, our overall top three drivers will be out shortly. But first of all, a representative from the winning team, MP Motorsports. Out onto the podium, they will step MP Motorsport victorious in the overall race. But for third place, it was Campos Racing's Ernesto Rivera once more, who steps out onto the podium for the second time and overall top three. Now in second position, it's Campos Racing once again, this time Andres Cardenas. And brother us up position for the number 18 driver, but nobody could keep up with our race winner for MP Motorsport, Griffin Peebles who looks very pleased with himself, rightly so, after a very, very hard-fought race. Now then, time for the national anthem of the winning driver. Griffin Peebles victorious in our Formula Winter Series race here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalunya. It's now time to get the trophies out. And once again, we welcome Robin Selbeck, Jakob Prasek and Josep Santa Maria to hand over the trophies. Also a trophy, of course, for the winning team, that being MP Motorsport. Well, a fantastic race when it got going. Few too many laps behind the safety car. A shame that it ended behind the safety car, but that will not take the smile uh, from the face of Griffin Peebles, who came home as the race winner. Now, we've spoken to Griffin downstairs. Issy already has dealt with that. We've also heard uh, from Ernesto Rivera. So I will, in a moment, once the photos are done, uh, try and get a chat with our second place finisher, Andres Cardenas, uh, who uh, came home on the podium, perhaps one step f uh, further down than he would have flight uh, but uh, he will be happy I think with that result yep I think all the photos are done let's try and grab Andres uh, for a uh, quick chat <laughs> there you are Andres uh, second place uh, in that race happy with that or a little disappointed that you you couldn't catch uh, Griffin yeah of course it's a result of course it's a podium always great but yeah we want more uh, next race we'll see how it goes but we're pushing for it how did the car feel out there? Obviously, very different conditions from yesterday. Uh, even qualifying was still quite damp, wasn't it? Yeah, the car felt great. Of course, the team is mega. Just some details there in my driving that I can improve, and surely for the next race I can. Excellent. Well, congratulations on the podium then. Andres Cardenas coming home second. Griffin Peebles, though, was the race winner. And now we turn our attention back to GT Racing. The GT Winter Series cars up next. Hi everyone, welcome back down to the grid for the first GT Winter Series race of the day. Standing into uh, quite a nice day, quite a nice change from yesterday. We are just waiting for our front row to come down now. One thing I did want to say about this race is just to keep an eye out. We've got so many different cars on this grid today, which we're all very, very excited to see the different manufacturers and how, how they will fare on this track. We've got Lamborghinis, we've got Ferraris, we've got Mercedes, we've got them all. So definitely keep an eye out for that. As I said, we're just waiting for our front row to come down now um, and while we are waiting we might as well take a little bit of a walk back got lots and lots of people on this grid as I said the grid has almost tripled from last weekend so we will take a little walk backwards and one person I am keen to speak to is the number four of Finn Beeblehouse now he missed a couple of rounds he's been kind of off and on but every time he has been with us he has been dominant so I'm gonna see as they are looking like they're taping up the car if i can just squeeze in finn good to see you back again i mean last time it was a completely dominant weekend for you so how are you feeling coming back into it this weekend can you repeat it please? how are you feeling coming into this weekend ah uh, yeah quite good uh was so far let's say uh, not the perfect weekend we were expecting uh yeah the quality was quite tricky in the condition the traffic uh but yeah i'm really looking forward to the race today 
Is this a track that you have much experience with or not at all? Uh, to be honest, not at all. Uh, it's my first time here, so just learning the track and uh, maybe we can attack the uh, upper positions, but uh, let's see. Well, we've seen some pretty good racing from you so far. As I said, you were dominant in the uh, in the last weekend that we saw you. So, I think we're going to see you have some pace. I wouldn't be surprised if we see you uh, see you up there fighting for the for the win. Yeah, hopefully. Let's see how the pace goes, and uh, let's see when uh, if I can attack. Uh in the races, yeah. All right, wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. We do now have our pole sitter uh, who's come in, so we will just come quickly down. Um, our pole sitter is Piotr Vera. I spoke to him briefly yesterday in the in the uh, pit lane, but it was very, very wet, so they uh, didn't have much running. And one other thing that I'd quickly like to say is um, it was supposed to be Kenneth Hyatt in this number 11 car. It's now going to be Jamo Hartling in that car once again. So I'm going to see if I can pop around. We'll Will James speak to us or not, not this morning? Can we get a word? Yeah? Go on, Kenneth. There we go. We are going to get a word. Jamo, back in the car today. A lot less wet than yesterday. So uh, I think you're uh, probably looking forward to this one. Yeah, I'm happy. Let's try and uh, full focus, full push. And uh, we hope for good results. And you're already champions, but are we still going to see you just pushing all the way and try and take the win? Yeah, we're, we're champions, but uh, push it to, to the end and uh, the championship is not over anymore. Already we're champions, but we have already today two races and uh, bring it to an end. All right, we wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. Just get the door out my way quickly and I will continue backwards. As I said, it's going to be really interesting to see the differences in manufacturers in this race, which we will see now. So we will go to an ad break. Well, there we are, a spectacular grid of GT3 Cup and even GT2 cars out there on the circuit. Incidentally, our one GT2 car, Simon Birch in the KTM Crossbow GT2. You can see that car at the very back of the grid. He had a moment on his sighting lap and has only just arrived on the main straight. So they've directed him to start from the rear. Let's have a look then at our order for this one. Piotr Rivera starting alongside Jamo Hartling. Piotr will be thinking to himself, OK, I've got the young charger instead of Kenneth. That's going to be interesting. Finn Wiebelhaus will be looking to try and claim a sixth victory in the GT Winter Series from third. He'll start alongside Jörg Dreisov. Pierre Ellis will start from fifth position alongside the first of the Cup 2 cars. That is Dieter Sveps in the Porsche Cup car. Martin Kazmarski lining up from seventh after having his aquaplaning moment under safety car yesterday. Hubert Darmetko lining up eighth. Johannes Kapfinger and Luca Arnold rounding out the top ten. Expect both of them to move forward from there. Noah Stromstead starts from 11th alongside Stefano Marazzi on row number six. Sebastian Daum starts from 13th position. He's alongside Quanda Mokoina, another driver we can expect to move through the order. Adrian Lewandowski is the first of our Lamborghinis. He'll be looking to get into the top 10. Joachim Bolting, Almri Bonjuel, and Frank Kiewicz make our first nine rows of the grid. Igor Klaia in 19th place alongside Alfredo Hernandez. Marcel Van Berlo is next alongside Khalid Bergman. Ibrahim Badawi. He is set to be alongside Simon Birch, but I believe Birch will be starting from the rear given his issues on the way to the grid, which means a lonely car on row 12. Row 13, Tommaso Lovati in the first of the Cup 1 cars, the Ferrari 488 Challenge Evos alongside Yves Goddard. John Dillon is next alongside Mark Speaker was. Talal Shair is next alongside Alessio Ruffini, uh, Rahid El Sahali more than likely be joined there by uh, the number 
55 KTM Simon Birch who had his issue on the way in you can see the KTM GT2 at the very back of the order Simon Birch a very experienced driver and it's a bit uncharacteristic for him to have uh, an issue like that although it albeit uh, uh, experience further down the ladder was runner-up in the 2020 Rotax Max Challenge of Denmark so quite recently was he going uh, uh, kart racing moved into cars in 2021 uh, has been racing uh, saloons and GTs in his native Denmark but I think he'll be surging his way through the order in at that KTM GT2 Will any of those pesky cup cars be able to get in amongst the GT3's early doors in this race? That is going to be uh, the big question for everybody, of course. This one is going to be a rolling start as well. The cars have been left by the safety car. The lights now dictate the start, and the start has been given. Piotr Vera is on the inside as we finally go racing properly in the GT Winter Series. Looks like Noah Stromstead got a good start further back in the order, but Finn Wiebelhaus got the best start of anybody. He leads into the first corner. Everybody checking up through the first few turns further back in the pack, but it's Wiebelhaus from Vera, from Hartling, your top three. Then it's Pierre Ellett in fourth position as everyone else looks for the track space Simon Birch making up a couple of places in the early stages look at that as well Cupfinger is moving up the order Johannes Cupfinger in his first race back from collarbone injury he's got himself up to fifth place already from eighth on the grid he's working his way up nicely and Jamo Hartling gets through for second place as well I alluded to it yesterday uh, going into race one Piotr Vera uh, with the practice times being taken into account uh, for quali was uh, always going to be a little bit out of position in the kind of company he was at the sharp end and sure enough he's starting to lose back uh, lose out and fall back uh, as the race unfolds, but uh, critically for Finn Wiebelhaus, he's already a good second, maybe two seconds clear at the front of the pack. And historically, we've seen that once Wiebelhaus gets out there, it's very hard to reel him back in. Yeah, exactly so. And he was supremely confident under breaking into turn one, got the run, found the gap on the inside, committed to the move, and managed to come out the race leader. Big move there as well uh, around the outside for Kanda Makuena as they headed up the hill into the final three corners. He's gaining ground in the number three Mercedes AMG GT3 in a very close moment going into the final turn. That was Pierre Herre in the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari. Now, the last I saw of him, he was actually challenging to try and gain a position against Piotr Rivera, uh, but ended up actually almost losing one, and he may still lose one, because here comes Catfinger up the inside line, and the Ferrari driver, rather than moving forwards one position, actually drops behind the Porsche, which just got a supreme run through those final couple of corners. That final sector, the Porsche, always strong through the tight corners, off the tight corners in particular, and, uh, well, Catfinger using that already, to his advantage. Last year's champion in the GT Winter Series, Johannes Kapfinger on his return to the grid. Great to see him there in 992 GT3R that uh, he and his twin brother, Mikhail, will drive in the use of Sport Fagen Technik squad in GT Masters in the summertime. Martin Kazmarski trying to find his way back past Dieter Sveps here. Sveps the first of the Cup 2 runners sixth overall leading that train of cars and already Johannes Kapfinger is up to third place I didn't think it would take too long but I wasn't sure that he'd be in a podium position by the end of lap number two Luca Arnold similarly uh, is looking for his way up the field he's gotten past Kazmarski has he in fact no that's uh, yes you think he has gotten past Kazmarski as we ride on board with Almarie Bonjuel Kwanda Mokoena it is actually who's gotten past Luca Arnold there so it's Kazmarski from Mukawena from Arnold because Mukawena started down in 14th place he has gained some good ground as well in the sister Haupt car to that of Finn Wiebelhaus I think every grid result should be based upon a free practice session <laughs> in mixed conditions because the opening laps of this race have been very very frantic indeed drivers desperately trying to move to the front of the order before the race leaders get away there was a slow number 11 car I just saw out of the window that was Jamo Hartling Jamo Hartling going slowly uh, past the pit lane so there's an issue I fear for the SR Motorsport Mercedes the hazard lights are on. I can't see anything obvious, Adam, but clearly something amiss. It looked to me like the canvas might be coming off the uh, right rear on that car as it was coming down the straight. We'll have to see whether that's the case, but he's stopped.
stopped it oh. in a less than safe position there, unfortunately. Now, if it was just a puncture, I would think you'd just take the car yeah. out of the firing line. So maybe it's something a bit more advanced than that as we see Kwanda Mukawena go past Dieter Sveps now. So Mukawena up into the top five, into fifth overall. But the big story, Jamo Hartling, one day after securing the championship with Kenneth Ayer, unfortunately not uh, getting to the end of this race by the looks of it. Almery Bonjuel has gotten past Luca Arnold and now he's running again. Was that tyre not down then? It looked like all four corners were up. Maybe just an electrical issue or alternator or something like that for Jamo Hartling. Most irregular, also irregular, is the pace of Almery Bonjuel in a Cup 4 car. He gets past Kaz Marski and the Lamborghini Super Trofeo gets past the GT3 Mercedes. Bonjuel is a proper hot shoe in Lamborghini machinery. Mokoena to the inside of Pierre Edit for fourth place but drifts out wide and Pierre says, OK, I'll have that one back. Thank you. He's looking a lot more comfortable in the 296 this week than he did in the older Porsche 991.2 from last weekend so it looks like uh, it looks like Pierre Ellis likes this 296 he was very excited to be driving it at the start of the year uh, has a, quite the collection of racing Ferraris in his back catalogue but Juan de Mocoena, the young charger from South Africa is likely going to find his way by before long indeed so he's looking to the inside line down the main straight nothing really to choose between the two cars in a straight line you'd have to say and actually the ferrari later on the brakes does it make the apex i think it did and so pierre Eret will hang on for now kanda makuena slots in line behind i would argue they're both now slowly starting to get back onto the tail of piotr Rivera as well uh, so that could very shortly become a three-way fight for the race lead in house still leads uh, sorry for third place I should say Finn Bielbelhaus still leads uh, by now nearly 10 seconds he's getting away from Johannes Kapfinger who's up into second position all of the battling really is happening behind them and here comes Makoena once again up the inside line down the hill the Mercedes with all of that grip over the front axle rotates nicely through the corner and that was pretty much a textbook move Yes, it was. Amri Bonjuel will now take the opportunity to dive by as well. Pierre getting a bad run through turn five. Ooh. Very close quarters stuff as Bonjuel gets in amongst it with the GT3s. Uh, he goes to the inside at turn nine again. The left downforce on the cut for Lamborghini, the Super Trofeo spec car causes him to lose out through the corners, but down the straights, that thing is a rocket ship as he tries to find a way to the inside of the 115 Ferrari. No move made yet, but that thing's already proven to be an atom on the main straight. Expect to move potentially before they even get to turn one. He does, however, have to worry about Luca Arnold behind as well. Yes, he does. Through the final couple of corners, this little group comes then. Luca Arnold in the uh, green and black Mercedes. Then you've got the Porsche uh, of uh, Dieter Sveppes behind. Kazmarski, Lewandowski in this group as well. We know that Lewandowski is not usually backwards in coming forward, so he's going to be looking to try and make some progress through this group as well. Uh, has problems in the pit. Well, that is uh, Gemma Hartling, isn't it, in the number 11 car. They're looking in the, the back of the car, so that does suggest to me electrical. Place lost there was that for Eret as well, as Bonjuel is now inside the top five. Yeah, Bonjuel, uh, I had a feeling he was going to be good value for money in terms of entertainment this weekend. I do have a little bit of a role in choosing which cars get onboards, and he was at the top <laughs> of the list. He was the first one I put down. We need an onboard in that car. And Almery Bonjuel uh, is up into P5, and he might yet go uh, Piotr Rivera hunting as well. Well, Luca Arnold may yet uh, challenge Almery Bonjuel as well. Luca, uh, the youngster son of Roland Arnold, a driver who's been doing quite a lot of GT3 racing within the Schnitzelalm organization in the last uh, year or two uh, in the German GTC race category. I'd expect him to be quicker uh, than most of the cars in front of him. And look at Bonjuel's pace into turn nine. He's got the inside. Is the Mercedes still there? I hope not, because uh, Bonjuel's bouncing on the curbs. Vera would be in the gravel if he was still alongside. Bonjuel then up into fourth position. From there, I think his work uh, in terms of making up places is probably done. Uh, Wiebelhaus, Katfinger, Mokowena, uh, they should be quicker. Kazmarski losing out a little bit there by the looks of it. Both uh, Lewandowski and uh, Di Suepes have gotten through. Uh, so Martin Kazmarski looks like he is struggling a little bit in this race uh, after winning, of course, with us in Jerez. 
Indeed so. Also had a moment there for Pierre Eric. He ran wide at the same corner, so Luca Arnold's gone through. So a few people struggling to get the car stopped down at the end of the back straight. Side-by-side -side action here towards us, though. That was Arnold gaining ground. As into the pit lane, I'm afraid, comes the 147 car, uh, which we saw making that mistake. That was Martin Kazmarski. So maybe it wasn't a mistake. Maybe it was an issue that forced him out wide. We're still side-by-side -side, uh, for fifth position. And uh, Luca Arnold can't quite make that move stick. He was fractionally ahead at the line of Piotr Vera who now goes very, very, very wide, coming through to three, rejoins the circuit still ahead, but he's on the outside line, late on the brakes is Luca Arnold, and finally he makes the move stick. And I'd anticipate that Luca now has the pace to try and close in on Almery Bonjuel, but of course uh, Almery Bonjuel has that power advantage. The Lamborghini with a hefty chunk higher power than a BOP GT3 car, uh, and less aero as well, less drag down the straight. That means that Amri Bonduel will have something of an advantage coming out of the corners on Luca Arnold if Luca can get there. Uh, we have now got Pierre Ellett trying to find his way past Piotr Rivera uh, in the battle for sixth position overall. Uh, of course, uh, the cars running in classes. So this is also for GT3 positions as uh, Ellett gets to the inside of Piotr Rivera. Fairly nicely executed there. And uh, Pierre with a lot of experience, I think the more experienced of the two drivers, uh, both amateur competitors. Of course, you can go back uh, over uh, 15 years and see uh, Pierre Elliott on the podium at Le Mans uh, in the GT2 class. He's been racing Ferraris and racing GT cars in general for a long, long time and he still knows a thing or two about getting those moves done. Indeed so, and demonstrating some nice car control there as well as the uh, tail end of the new Ferrari just got a little bit loose underneath him, but he's made that move sick, and it's now the turn of uh, Lewandowski to try and do the same thing. Further back in the pack now then, the number 71 Ferrari here, looking to try and hold on to a position. That's the AF Corsa car of Ryder El Sahaili, uh, the Challenge Evo class machine, in fact a couple of them running together, and uh, that's an entry entertaining battle going on actually well outside the top 20 even but such is the strength in depth of this grid there are battles up and down the order it's not just the thoroughbred gt3 cars that take center stage there are battles through the field and there of course one of the, the other cars running in a different class the gt2 spec machine uh, and where does that find itself mid pack i think at the moment adam yeah, already up into 12th place, oh. having started from the very back of the field. Three very different cars. A 991 Cup car in the hands of junior single-seater stalwart Noah Stromstead as Simon Birch gets past uh, the uh, car of Jörg Dreisov. Dreisov, who has uh, dropped now outside of the top 10. Uh, so this is now for 10th place overall. I think uh, we're having some issues with potentially Dreisov's transponder. He's not on some of the graphics, but... Uh, Drysov is there within the battle for the top dozen, losing out, however, uh, to the GT2 car. Noah Stromstead really putting in a good account for himself here. He's uh, second of any of the Porsche Cup cars, which means all but one of the newer and much quicker 992s are actually behind him. So Noah proving what he can do uh, with a roof over his head. Yes, he is indeed, but uh, about to come under some threat, I suspect, down the pit straight, because we know that the KTM is going to have a little bit more in the way of straight line speed. Mirror, signal, and I suspect manoeuvre completed by the time they reach the braking zone here down at the end of the main straight. Well, it's not going to be quite that straightforward. The Porsche could probably brake a bit later, but ultimately you choose your battles in multi-class racing, uh, and I think that that was sensible, really, there uh, to not get too involved. Now, Stromstead loses a place overall it stays exactly where he was within his class so ticking towards half race distance then and uh, Finn Wiebelhaus 12.76 seconds up the road from Johannes Kapfinger second position uh, and then there is a full 10 seconds between Quanda Makwena and Amore Bonduel as well so it's all spreading out towards the front of the field now but Luca Arnold actually sticking with the Lamborghini for the time being yes I suspected that would be the case especially of course through this uh, most of the first sector and the middle sector where the strength should be with the GT3 car. Of course, the GT3 th theoretically a lot faster uh, than the Cup 4 Super Trofeo spec Lamborghini. However, 
Uh, that is not always how things end up working in the GT Winter Series, depending who's in the car at what time. And Almarie Bonduel alone in this car, the number 28, he was always going to be a force to be reckoned with. A drive-through penalty for car number 74, the Rosso Corsa entry, Stefano Marazzi in the 296 GT3. Drive-through for an additional reconnaissance lap. They're only allowed to do one uh, in the GT classes. Luca Arnold now looking for a slipstream down the main straight, looking for a toe. Uh, you can just imagine watching that uh, Lamborghini disappearing through the windscreen as you uh, watch it rather hopelessly. There's your Cup 1 class lead battle. Cup 1 for the Ferrari 488 Challenge spec cars. Uh, Mark Speaker was a driver with a lot of experience in the uh, Ferrari Challenge, Italian GTs, etc. Up against a similarly experienced John Dillon, the 56 car of Kalle Bergman, the young Swede racer. Uh, just recovering back onto the track as well. Quite easy to loop those uh, Porsche 992 Cup cars. They usually go uh, for slightly rearward brake bias and usually they're not running ABS unless you're in the United States either. Uh, so that is quite easy done. Uh, yeah, indeed. So in a difficult braking zone that anyway, quite bumpy usually under braking uh, into that corner, which make it easier still to snatch a brake as uh, through the first turn heads that uh, Cup 1 class leading car then the uh, AF Corsa prepared machine and behind their nearest opposition I'm afraid getting themselves all in a spin and uh, finding themselves briefly stranded right in the middle of the road that was uh, speaker best I think wasn't it uh, in his uh, number uh, 830 car and he's only now rejoining the circuit that's a really dodgy place to be rejoining but he gets it all sorted immediately jump up to race speed though which suggests that maybe he's uh, possibly just found himself in the wrong gear uh, after that quick loop that he had but another graphic indication there of how the gt3 cars are probably the easiest cars to drive <laughs> on this grid they at least have that traction control that you could dial up or down accordingly some of the other cars not quite so straightforward possibly the easiest drives uh, to drive and hardest to master when you consider uh, how big of a factor it is uh, trying to stay out of traction control and so on as we have uh, one of the cut two cars going through the gravel i can't quite tell you which one that is based on livery alone that's the 992 car of sebastian daum just coming uh, back onto the circuit ahead of mark speaker was who now seems to be back up to speed uh, Italian driver racing under a pseudonym. It's not a very Italian name, I grant you. Finn Wiebelhaus, some 13 seconds clear at the front of the order. He's already well into the top 20, putting a lap on them. And is that J.M.O. Hartling slowing again? Uh, he was actually just coming back out of the pit lane. So they've been in the pits for the last half dozen laps or so. Ooh. And now, oh, Piazza Vera and Pierre Elliott have had an issue there. That's turn four. And it looks like those two have had a coming together. They were close on the circuit. They were having a scrap uh, in the top five. And now they have an issue. Ibrahim Badawi, meanwhile, gets himself past uh, Jörg Drysov. So Badawi, the Egyptian racer who turned 18 earlier in the week, he moves up a position there. And that should put him into the top 15, that should. Yes, in fact, he's already up into 12th with that move. Yes, indeed. Nicely done there under braking. But what drama uh, up at Turn 4. Such a shame. Pierre Eret was having a really good race. Piotr Rivera had dropped a few positions, of course, from where he'd started, but was still on course for a decent result. And they've obviously tangled. Now, with two cars at either side of the road, yes, there we go, uh, the safety car always likely to be scrambled. And that is going to be the case. Now, as you just touched upon, Finn Beeblehouse has been putting a few cars a lap down. This always complicates matters now when the safety car comes out and part of the field has got a lap down. It inevitably splits a couple of the uh, lower classes up. Some of those who are still clinging on to the lead lap uh, will benefit fairly massively from all of this. But Finn Beeblehouse does not. He will lose his advantage. And Johannes Catfinger will close in. There may be a few back markers between them. I'm not really convinced that Catfinger's really got an answer for Feeble House, but if he has, uh, then he's very shortly going to have his opportunity to de demonstrate that. I think that Catfinger could make life difficult for him without traffic 
in between, I think it's that traffic buffer that's going to be the uh, the real thorn in the side for Capfinger. Um, how many cars are between Capfinger and Mokuena? I think is probably quite a, a pertinent question also, as speaker was there, looked like he might be trying to get past Vinvivalaus momentarily. Uh, Capfinger and Mokuena were effectively welded together in Valencia. Uh, race one, most of race two, and I think in race three as well, they found each other and ended up in a convoy. I don't think there are any back markers between Catfinger and Makuena, so that's going to really bunch that battle together. Just spotted that out of the window. Five lapped cars between the leaders, but yeah, I am uh, as excited as you are to see what's going to go on in that battle for second place because we've seen Makuena making some uh, pretty committed moves already <laughs> in this race, and I think now with a glimmer of hope to move one step further up the outright podium, he's not going to be backing down now. I can tell you that Piotr Rivera is back circulating around the circuit as well. So he's managed to get that car underway again. Uh, questions to be asked about Pierre Ellett, though. <laughs> uh, that's going to be more than just a uh, recovery or more than just a self recovery. They're going to have to get the uh, hooks on that one and tow it out. But it doesn't look like it's still under fire, so he might get to rejoin the race. Yeah, I didn't see any obvious damage, and he's quite close to the edge of the road, which, of course, is the problem initially. That's why we need the safety car, but it means it should be a fairly swift recovery. I think they can just push him out of there. Uh, he says never having had to push a GT3 car out of a gravel trap, but I'm sure the marshals are well-versed in such things, and they should hopefully get this car out of the way pretty swiftly. Of course, the counterpoint to that is that until the cars are all bunched together, the time to actually get a pickup there is limited, although they have already got it in the rough vicinity of the circuit as uh, they get themselves ready to go. There is actually a, a, a local garage just around the corner from the circuit in Barcelona, Catalonia, where all of these, um, these cars for the circuit are serviced. Speaking of services, J-Mo Hartling uh, back into the pit lane once again. And I think that might even be one of the, the GT4 boys that uh, just uh, stopped him at the lollipop. No, it's Tim Noiser. And yes, well, it is one of the GT4 boys, one of the older GT4 boys, the team manager, uh, Tim Noiser, uh, who, of course, won in Cayman Trophy earlier on. He heard that. I just saw him smiling. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Finn Wiebelhaus then will be leading them around. I was just going to finish that point about the uh, about the garage around the corner. Services all of the circuit cars and also goes drifting. They've got some very impressive drift machinery and some old Clio Cup cars knocking around as well. Uh, had a look there on a spare afternoon a few years ago. Uh, Finn Wiebelhaus, though, on the verge of a sixth race win here if he could get a good start and uh, continue to uh, build that gap, uh, regain that buffer with the five cars between himself and second place on the road. It is going to be five cars back, the yellow and blue Porsche, the twin bush backed U-Sport Wagen Technik car and the white out racing car of Juan de Mocoena. That is going to be the one to watch, isn't it? Coming into the last minute of this race. Hopefully, just the one more lap to be contested under safety car if all things go well. The safety car queue, the main bit of it at least, is on the main straight and Pierre Ellett's car uh, is just being recovered down at turn four. So that gives me pause for optimism, I think, uh, for the time being. Well, they've made the rather interesting decision to drag him out of the gravel facing the wrong way, uh, which means that if he is able to continue under his own steam, there'll be a bit of a three-point turn required and more gravel will be strewn across the road. But anyway, at least it's out of the gravel. That's uh, pretty good news. I don't know about this garage around the corner. I want to know, Adam, where they're refueling the safety car. I hope they've got a good deal with a local <laughs> petrol station because uh, it's done its fair share of miles this weekend, hasn't it? Spain doesn't want for any uh, Repsol petrol stations. <laughs> I'm sure there's one somewhere nearby. The 115 car getting uh, towed back to somewhat safety now. Uh, hopefully, if he is going to get the car back pointing the right way and continue, he remembers to turn off the traction control. Uh, I've seen that happen before. Forgetting to turn the traction control off, driving very sadly back into the gravel trap that you've just, uh, just been taken out of, unfortunately. Uh, of course, uh, these GT3 cars do have uh, the traction control, but the best drivers um, very scarcely graze it. Uh, it will be on. They don't usually run it fully traction control off. It does help 
Uh, but uh, the more you dip into the traction control, the more you dip into the ABS, and that can often slow you down. In the case of Tom Levin earlier on, as he said in the interview with Izzy Browning, that's actually kind of what sent him into the uh, into the runoff area at turn one in GT4, uh, lent into the ABS too much, and that was all she wrote. Yeah, absolutely, because it increases naturally the uh, braking distance, doesn't it? So uh, you don't really want to be using that if you can help it. And as you said, that's one of the big differences really between an AM driver and a pro driver in a GT car. Uh, they do have that confidence and the skill required to turn the electronic aids off and ultimately help them to find a chunk of lap time. Incident between cars 115 and 14. Investigation, not a huge surprise, and also very good news, Adam. Uh, apart from the fact I'm about to leave you for the podium, <laughs> uh, is that the safety car is also about to vacate the circuit, and we can enjoy this uh, fascinating battle, hopefully for second place. Off for the Majeri can when you come back into the paddock, just in case they need it. Finn Wiebelhaus then will lead us away as we return to action. Uh, he will pull the pin. He may actually have to worry a little bit about uh, Speaker was behind just because the Ferrari is quicker in a straight line. But actually, he's got a good couple of car lengths even before he launches away. And of course, that GT3 car also quicker uh, around the corners as well. So if he launches it between 13 and 14, he shouldn't have to worry about the cup cars behind him uh, trying to do something silly into turn one. However, he is just holding it, isn't he? As a couple of cars come into the pit lane too by the looks of it we are though now racing we're back to racing action then in the gt winter series now there's feeble house coming over the crest of the hill but watch out for cut finger and mokoena uh, the yellow and blue porsche oh stefano marazzi has stopped the 74 Ferrari 296 GT3 has stopped, but what's going on between Capfinger and Mokoena? Let's see where they are. They're just coming through turn one, now turn two, and it is Capfinger still just ahead of Mokoena. But lots of dramas. We went back to green flag there. Uh, we've also had Luca Arnold get around uh, Almery Bonjuel. I think that happened just before the safety car. Uh, came out earlier on. I don't know if we caught that, uh, if I'm forgetting about it, but uh, uh, Bonjuel has lost out to Luca Arnold. He'll try and fight back. And Quanda Mokoena has gotten past Johannes Kapfinger. And Kapfinger has lost a good few seconds there, two or three seconds between turn two and turn four. So I wonder if he had an issue of some description or had an error of some sort. I'm not quite sure how he lost out on that ultimately, but Luca Arnold is now pressuring Johannes Kapfinger as they go uphill towards turn nine. Some back markers in the uh, considerations as well then. Simon Birch, we should mention him, up in sixth position now, having started the car from the back of the order, the KTM GT2 just putting a lap on uh, Yves Goddard there. What a performance from him. He would have been devastated with the fact that the car ended up in the gravel earlier on, but uh, what a recovery drive it has been. There's your Cup 2, Cup 4 car, sorry, the Cup 4 second place machine, uh, GT3 Poland's Adrian Lewandowski. As Johannes Kapfinger is now under pressure from Luca Arnold with Quanda Mokoena disappearing off into the distance. Kapfinger then flashing the headlights at Speaker was in the Myrtle Ferrari, a lap down, of course. And Cupfinger gets through fairly ably there eventually, but uh, Schnitzelam Racing's Luca Arnold doesn't do so, and that might give Johannes Cupfinger just a little bit of a cushion. And I suspect fifth overall is going to be under contest before too long as well, as uh, Almery Bonjuel may end up being closed in on here by Simon Birch. Some great battles between the classes further back. Noah Stromstead has lost out to Ibrahim Badawi. Uh, for ninth place overall. So all of the cup class battles seemingly merging into one mega class at the moment. There is Simon Birch just getting held up at the apex there by Speaker Was. He may well be on the back of Amri Bonjuel before too long. Uh, worth noting that the top four in the Cup 1 class are all uh, towards the back of the safety car queue and in a battle as well uh, for Cup 1 honours. John Dillon is just ahead of Raid Saheli and Talal Shahir in that scrap. Two minutes and eight seconds to go in this race. Of course, uh, 
Once the clock hits zero, this race is over. As oh, Lewandowski there, maybe just woeing up in front of the 56 car a little bit too much. Uh, of course, the 56 car running at good speed. Uh, Calais is a quick driver, but he is a lap down. Calais Bergman therefore makes... Oh, we've got a big, big incident for, I think, the 220 car of Talal Shair. Talal Shair has had a major, major looking crash coming out of turn nine. And that will no doubt bring out the safety car once again. And with a minute and 25 left to go, that will be the end of the race. That looks like a big, big incident further back. Finn Wiebelhaus then, 10 seconds clear at the front of the order. He'll come across that uh, hazard very shortly, but he will do so under safety car conditions. The safety car has quite rightly been scrambled. Not that Kalle Bergman, I don't think, has quite noticed. He just realised now that the safety car is out. And indeed, the red flag's also now out on the circuit. Finn Wiebelhaus then. This race will, of course, be declared with just a minute left to go. Finn Wiebelhaus will claim his sixth win of the GT Winter Series season. Of course, has only done three rounds of the season. Hence, he's not in the championships discussions, but he has been amazing in this season. He claims yet another win, but of course for now, all concern lies with uh, Talil Shair. Hopefully he is okay. Uh, that did look like a fairly major collision with the barriers coming out of turn nine. Panda Mokowina will be delighted to have recovered to second place as well in the sister Hout Racing Team Mercedes AMG. Ten seconds back by the end of the race, but uh, he'll be feeling positive about his chances, I'm sure, in the endurance race. Race number three, of course, both Kwanda and Finn are solo drivers. Johannes Kapfinger sharing with brother Mikael Kapfinger. Two very, very rapid drivers indeed. Drivers should now be heading back into the pit lane, and they are doing so. So Finn Wiebelhaus will join them, although we do have a marshal pointing him the wrong way. That's the car we need at the podium, sir. Unfortunately, it is being uh, put into Park Ferme instead. So uh, Izzy Browning, Andy McEwen, and the team from Giedlick are going to have to work a bit harder to get our podium cars, as they've not been taken to the uh, podium properly but nonetheless Finn Wiebelhaus will be celebrating a win Jamo Hartling will be uh, hoping for better fortune than he had in the race earlier on there is uh, Talal Shayi you can see him standing there in the red and white uh, Ferrari racing suit so he is there uh, with personnel surrounding him, but he's up and out of the car. That is hugely positive to see. Great news that Talal is okay. The sheer amount of wreckage there tells the story coming out of turn nine. But of course, that means that the energy was largely dissipated from the cockpit. The front end of the car taking the brunt of the impact. And uh, that means that uh, thankfully Talal Shir can take out, get himself out of the car and uh, be okay, albeit probably a little bit sore tomorrow. But nonetheless, uh, big advancements in safety, generation on generation uh, with these GT cars, and he is largely okay. Debrief going on down in Park Ferme among our podium drivers who hopefully get the memo that they need to run. Maybe not run, but at least very swiftly walk their way towards Izzy Browning. And uh, while that is going on, I'll reiterate that Finn Wiebelhaus uh, has taken his sixth win of the season. In terms of the uh, class wins, Almery Bonjuel taking Cup 4. And the GTX class, just the one car in that. And that, of course, is Simon Birch. He wins that class in the KTM. Dieter Suepes, he'll be on the top step of the Cup 2 podium. 
he wins that class. Noah Stromstead winning Cup 3, another class that is uh, only one strong this weekend. And the Cup 1, the Ferrari Challenge cars, John Dillon coming out on top in that class. But uh, Haupt Racing Team will be taking a breather after that one. Manuel Reuter will be talking to his young protégés and feeling very, very much uh, happier than he was this morning. Maybe very much happier than he was yesterday morning when things were just completely rained out, of course. Uh, Haupt Racing Team will be very happy with that. Uh, they're still at the very far end of the uh, of the Park Ferme area. I can see that Izzy is trying to look for uh, our winners at the moment. They're at the far end of Park Ferme, our top three drivers. Um, so we'll have to see uh, whether we can try and get to uh, Finn Wiebelhaus, uh, collar him and bring him to where he needs to be. Uh, certainly this has been a, a little bit of a, obviously a scrambled post-race uh, uh, procedure because of the red flag it's happening a little bit earlier than anticipated and that meant we didn't get the cars sent where they needed to go uh, but everybody putting in the effort to try and uh, get the podium procedures and indeed our post-race interview started in due course an all GT3 podium as well uh, in this race which we haven't always seen this season um, and uh, I see that we are slowly walking Finn Wiebelhaus back to the podium so then we are just awaiting the interview as uh, Izzy I can tell you has done a very diligent job of grabbing Finn Wiebelhaus and I think they're going to do it down in Park Ferme so we will get to go down there in just a few seconds to hear from our race winner Finn Wiebelhaus he said that yesterday didn't go perfectly and that's an understatement from all aspects of uh, the non-race that we had on uh, Saturday but a much better day all round for Finn in race two for the sixth time, a GT Win Series race winner. May we've got Finn Wiebelhaus with us. We've got Finn Wiebelhaus with us, the winner of that race. Finn obviously ended under red flag, a uh, shame, but good to see that the driver we think is okay. But yeah, I mean, you were quite, quite modest on the grid. Didn't, didn't sound like you were gonna take it, but then you were flying out there. Ah, yeah, the pace was uh, quite uh, good. I have to say the start was all, also very good. I uh, got a good runoff and then uh, yeah, decided to send it into T1. Uh, worked out quite well and then I uh, decided to like push a bit and then uh, mid-race I just uh, tried to manage the gap and then uh, there was a safety car. Then the restart was quite good as well and uh, yeah, then the red flag came out. But uh, it's not like important that uh, we have a red flag. It's important that the driver's okay. It seems like he's okay. So yeah, that's important. So yeah decided to send it and send it you did so you must have a uh, lot of confidence in in your abilities and in the car yeah it was quite a good uh, dive let's say but uh, yeah of course you have to be confident at uh, one point if you see a gap you go for it and you've been mighty impressive every time we've seen you so uh, are we going to see the same again this afternoon uh hopefully let's see all right well done congratulations we'll let you get to the podium congratulations to finn v house there yeah we've come down into the park ferme to grab that interview because they sent the uh, sent the cars this way as adam said so they're gonna head off up to the podium and we're gonna head back to adam good work there izzy saw you uh, pursuing finn he was gonna have that interview regardless <laughs> of where he was shuffled uh, that then was the First proper race of the weekend for the GT Win Series race two per the record books. And it was a great race for Finn Wiebelhaus. It was a drag race between Jamo Hartling and Piotr Rivera on the first lap towards the first corner, but Finn Wiebelhaus played spoiler, got to the inside, sent it, as he said, and he was soon leading the race. Johannes Kampfinger made his way up the order early doors, getting past Pierre Ellis there, working his way towards the overall podium. Quanda Mokoena similarly fighting his way through. And 
and uh, also Amri Bonjuel doing a really good job uh, of making his way up in the eventual Cup 4 winning car. Mokoena to the inside there, Pierre Ellett, brilliant driving uh, from Mokoena. He would eventually decisively get past Pierre Ellett and shortly thereafter, he would also get by Piotr Vera. Mokoena who started outside the top 10. Of course, he would eventually get himself all the way up into P2. Almri Bonjuel also making his way up into the top five. We saw a lot of that Lamborghini making up places. Luca Arnold also having a good run. He would ultimately finish, of course, in fourth position. Pierre Ellett and Bjorka Rivera having a good little battle among themselves too. Pierre Ellett coming out on top uh, in that one, at least in that exchange. Uh, he would ultimately, though, be dropped further down the order as far as at 28th after his, of course, yeah, issue that caused a safety car. Kalle Bergman did very well to not cause a safety car after his spin. Just about managed to get the car rolling again out of turn 10. Mark Speaker was, was chasing John Dillon for Cup 1 honours and he would end up losing the rear of the car. We also had the 992 car in through the gravel as well. That was Sebastian Daum. And then the conclusion of Piotr Rivera and Pierre Ellett's scrap. Vera continued on his way and would ultimately finish well down the order. Uh, and unfortunately, Stefano Marazzi also having issues with his Ferrari 296. Pierre Ellett, of course, having issues in the gravel after that collision. And ultimately, the race ending under red flags. Lil Chayir uh, into the wall. Thankfully, he's okay. He was out of the car. But a big debris sight there down at turn 9 into turn 10. And that means the race ended a little early. Finn Beeblehouse, though, always looked likely to be the winner. And the winner he was ahead of Quanda Mokowena. Johannes Kapfinger rounding out the overall podium ahead of Luca Arnold. The first of the Cup 4 cars, Bonjuel in fifth. Simon Birch taking sixth place in the GTX class. Uh, the winner there, too. Andrea Lewandowski in seventh. Dieter Sveppes, the first of the uh, Cup 2 entries, the uh, Portra Cup cars in eighth overall. Cup 4, of course, is the Lamborghini class that Bonjuel run uh, won. Noah Gromstead finishing ninth ahead of Ibrahim Darwi. Jörg Dreisov taking 11th place. Joachim Bolting taking 12th. Hernandez and Armetko taking us down to 14th. Marcel Van Berlo uh, in 15th place, just behind Hubert Darmetko. Of course, Darmetko rounding out the class podium in Cup 2 as well. Uh, Van Berlo in 15th. John Dillon winning Cup 1 in 16th. Uh, Rahid Saheli in 17th place. Shair is classified 18th after the red flag. Lavati 19th. Khaled Bergman 20th. Yves Goddard in 21st, in 22nd, sorry. Uh, Alessia Raffini in 23rd place. Frank Kivitz, 24th. Marazzi, 25th. Vera recovering to 26th after his collision with Pierre Ellett. Sebastian Daum taking 27th. 28th goes to Pierre Ellett, ultimately. Kazmarski had issues with his Mercedes, as did J-Mo Hartling. A couple of drivers would have expected to be right up there not quite having the race to that they would have liked, but they will get the opportunity to rectify that in the 55-minute enduro that will close out our day's action here at the circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. Uh, the GT Winter Series will be the last race before the curtain falls on the Giedlick Racing Winter Series package, of course, and we already know who our champion is, Jamo Hartling and Kenneth Heyer, the SR Motorsport team, securing the championship yesterday in the GT Winter Series. And uh, they will continue to their celebrations at the end of the day, I am sure. And uh, Kenneth Heyer taking the interesting step to uh, allow Jamo into race two as well. I hope that we'll see Kenneth Heyer out there in the final race. Uh, Rakar Motorsports, uh, Leandro Martins was second in the championship points coming into uh, this race along with Dieter Suepes. And uh, those two will have extended their gap uh, in, that, uh, in that scrap. In fact, they will have cemented second in the championship by beating Hubert Darmetko within Cup 2 in that race. So congratulations to Martins and Suepes. They will be vice champions in the 2024 GT Winter Series. That is now locked in. So another exciting race in GTWS. Uh, John Dillon, I think, may well be on the verge of 
uh, securing he and Matt Griffin a top five finish in the championship as well, maybe even a top four finish. Uh, he won the Cup 1 class, of course, and he is within uh, a point of both Adrian Lewandowski in fourth overall in the standings and Joachim Bolting fifth overall in the standings. Of course, that's a Cup 4 and Cup 2 entry, respectively, uh, for Lewandowski uh, and uh, Bolting. And with John Dillon winning Cup 1 and those two not winning their respective classes, I think he might have already uh, maybe moved his, his way up to fourth in the class. So that could be something to keep an eye on too. We'll get confirmation of that uh, from timekeeping, I'm sure, before race number three. They've been doing a brilliant job, actually, of sending me uh, the statistics and the results as we, uh, as we go through the day, sending me updated point standings a little after the conclusion of each race. Of course, there is more racing to come in the not-too-distant future. The prototype wind series cars will be getting themselves ready for action before long, uh, which means that the very loud podium that we had earlier on is uh, more than likely uh, going to be uh, even louder still as the cars fire up underneath Andy McHugh, and I think we'll be going down there in the next few seconds. I think Andy is fairly confident that he's got a full quota of cars there, but we'll hopefully uh, get confirmation of that shortly and uh, get the drivers out onto the podium. Lots of podiums to deal with, of course, in the GT Winter Series. So then the uh, GT3 podium, of course, will be the first one on there. And Finn Wiebelhaus is... Uh, was uh, of course going to be on the top step once again and we can now welcome our drivers onto the podium Andy McEwen is ready to go so let's go to the podiums Thank you, Adam. Ready to go with podiums then for our GT Winter Series. And we will start with our top three in the GT3 class, starting with our third place finisher, Johannes Katzinger. Congratulations, Johannes. Ran second for much of that race, dropped down to third right at the end because a charging second place driver came past him right at the end. Congratulations, second place, Quanda Makawena. Up onto the second step of the podium, he goes to be joined by his HRT Hout Racing team teammate, the race winner in GT3, Finn Wiebelhaus. So our top three drivers within the GT3 class make their way uh, on to the podium. A brilliant battle that was for second place in particular. And I think with that in mind, once the photos are done, I'll try and have a chat with uh, Finn Wiebelhaus, uh, with uh, Quando Makawena, excuse me, our runner-up finisher, because he was the one making all of the moves in the uh, closing stages there. They pose and smile in the sunshine. Getting quite warm actually down here now, which is not a complaint, that's for sure, uh, after what we dealt with yesterday. Photos done. I do want to have a quick chat with Quando if I can, uh, because you had one of the most entertaining races there, didn't you? That safety car gave you a real chance to get second place and you took it. Yeah, fortunately, uh, it was super fun on on my side, but uh, yeah, there was a bit of standing water in uh, turn one, so I was able to capitalize a bit. I think uh, Michael got a bit uh, unlucky there, so I was I saw a, I saw a bit of opportunity going into turn three and took it. So yeah, super happy. That's interesting. Then still some damp patches out on track, and of course not a lot of rubber on the circuit either. Were you noticing that the track was low on grip? Yeah, like uh, in the beginning, I could feel the track was not as good as it was on Friday, but uh, obviously just had to make the most out of it. The guys were very. Uh, excited let me say on the first laps so i rather just stayed back uh, kept it a bit cool and then once i saw a gap went for it so. excellent well it was entertaining to watch congratulations there we'll let our top three gt3 drivers head off the podium and we'll move on very shortly to our cup one podium drivers can head back inside now go and debrief with the team after a busy race in the gt winter series so our second class of drivers to welcome onto the podium will be the cup one class starting with our third place finisher tomaso Lavati. Tommaso is here somewhere, I think. There he is, getting his coat on. He must be feeling it's a bit colder than I think it had. Out he goes, our third place finisher, Tommaso Lavati. Second place in the Cup 1 class, Raid El Sayaki. <laughs> But the race victory in Cup 1, another AF Corsa driver, the very experienced John Dillon. 
who finds his way onto the top step of the podium. And uh, John Dillon adds another trophy to his fairly sizable collection, as will uh, our other two podium finishers, Ryad Al Sahaki and Tommaso Lavati, finishing second and third in the Cup One class. So they hold their trophies aloft. Smile for the cameras. One more race to do, of course, later on for all of our GT Winter Series drivers. So this is not going to be their day done. They can't relax yet. There's no champagne to be sprayed just yet. That will come later this afternoon. But a big congratulations to our th top three. Whilst we've got time, John, let's see if I can have a quick chat with our class winner. John, uh, you've turned a few laps around this place, I'm sure, in the past. But that was a, a particularly challenging race, especially in the early stages. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we had a bit few more cars uh, for this round which is really good you know so those five six cars a couple of the other guys uh, got away at the start um, so I had to work for it but I stayed calm collective uh, one of the guys made a mistake and I took him through turn five yeah and brought it home uh, obviously the safety car helped a little bit um, and yeah here we are I overheard you saying backstage just now it's difficult sometimes to keep your cool in a race like that especially when you've got other cars in other classes around you you've got multiple safety cars uh, do you have someone on the radio sort of dialing you down a bit or is that something you've learnt now over the years boy do I have someone on the radio <laughs> Matt Griffin oh man he's he's on the radio not not to that extent but yeah you have to stay calm obviously save the tyre because the tyre is not good in terms of overdriving um, but yeah you know I get a pep talk every now and again you know uh, when I'm going into a turn or coming out of a turn which helps really helps but yeah you've got to keep calm keep calm and selective obviously working for you John another victory congratulations a cup one victory uh, for John Dillon and a one two finish for AF Corsa so we now move on to the cup two division starting with our third place finisher Hubert Darnetko a big cheer, even got the air horns out down below. That's nice to hear. I wonder whether they'll be sounding them for our second place finisher as well. Joaquin Bolting. <laughs> out he comes onto the second step of the podium. But the race victor in Cup 2 in the end was Dieter Svepes. <laughs> Up he climbs, handshakes with his fellow podium finishers, and once more the trophy parade is on. And uh, the Cup 2 class, another that seems to be getting more and more competitive. And uh, whilst we've got a bit of a delay, we're hearing maybe about a 20-minute delay uh, to the schedule for some barrier repairs. We'll take this opportunity, I think, to have a chat with our Cup 2 winner as well, Dieter Sveps, who, uh, once he's done posing, is dangerously close to falling off the back of the podium, actually. Uh, Dieter, can we have a quick word? with you whilst we've got some time congratulations on the on the race win was that a fairly straightforward one it was uh, quite a tough one i think because uh, at the end the tires were really gone uh, but i was fighting till the end and at the end we had the, the red flag so yeah we were lucky to to be on the podium on the first position were you surprised at how much the tires were wearing obviously it's not particularly hot you had a number of laps behind the safety car was it a, a higher rate of wear than you expected Yes, <laughs> it was, uh, uh, because I think the tempers are not working that well. And so we had a lot of degradation from the from the tyres at the end. Yeah. It will be tough, I think, in the endurance race then. Yeah, yeah. Well, you managed it well. Congratulations on the class victory. Dieter Sveps uh, on the top step of the Cup 2 podium. And that leaves us with two more podiums to do. We now move to Cup 4, uh, where we welcome first our third-place driver for DL Racing, Ibrahim Badawi. Out he comes to a big round of applause again. Second place, the charging Adrian Lewandowski. But it was a real starring performance in the end for our Cup 4 class winner for BDR competition, Amuri Bonduel. Out onto the top step he goes. The uh, prototype cars leaving the pit lane behind me, making their presence known. Uh, but uh, Amuri Bonduel with a fantastic performance there, racing uh, amongst much, in theory, much quicker GT3 machinery and uh, making some spectacular overtakes along the way. And uh, the same true of Adrian Lewandowski, but he started that bit further down the grid. So uh, the uh, Lamborghini driver able to make a bit more progress than his fellow Lamborghini rival and uh, Bonduel coming home the class winner 
So photos are done. We'll get the drivers off the podium. We have one more podium to conduct and actually only one driver needing to be brought out onto the circuit. It's the GTX class. And this is where we found our GT2 KTM crossbow for Razoon. It is our class winner, Simon Birch. Well done, Simon. Out he comes. And we thank him and the team for bringing the uh, spectacular uh, KTM crossbow oh, no. out onto the grid. And uh, the winner's trophy is handed out. A fairly lonely uh, podium for Simon, but he will be very, very pleased with that. So that concludes then our podium ceremony for our uh, first GT Winter Series race of the day. Uh, as I said, we had the uh, prototypes leaving the pit lane just behind me. They're making their way around to the grid and in a moment they'll be catching up with Issy Browning for our first GT uh, prototype winter series race of the day. Well, we start off with a rattle through the gravel, unfortunately, for one of the prototype Winter Series cars. That is the 42 ANS Motorsport entry of Clement Moreno, uh, along with Julian Lemoyne, of course. But it is Moreno set to be at the wheel for this race. And unfortunately, that car is well beached in the gravel trap and uh, they will need to pull that thing out. Of course, uh, Clement had some dramas in uh, the first, uh, in the second race uh, in Aragon as well, making contact, uh, or rather being pushed into a spin, really, by Kevin Rabin, his uh, ANS Motorsport teammate. But that looks more like something that he's managed to do on his own on this occasion. Some more cloud cover over the circuit as well. We were expecting clouds all day here at the circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia, and let's hope it stays at just clouds. These guys didn't get to go out onto the circuit at all on Saturday in the prototype winter series. The rain was such that they didn't even attempt to start the race. It was cancelled uh, very early on uh, in the afternoon, sadly, but uh, this is now their opportunity to go racing. And uh, for Danny Sufi, it's his opportunity to uh, just roll the sleeves up, go out there and have some fun because Sufi is already our champion with race one cancelled. No one can outscore him in the championship. So Danny Sufi, our pole sitter for this race, is also confirmed as our GT, uh, as our PT prototype winter series champion for Conrad Motorsport, I believe Franz Conrad uh, still uh, back home and recovering uh, after a bit of an accident a few weeks ago. And uh, we wish him well and we congratulate him on yet another championship trophy in the Conrad, Conrad Motorsport uh, headquarters. Uh, that must be one of the uh, biggest trophy collections uh, in what is a very trophy-laden region where Conrad Motorsport is based. Izzy Browning has a big quota of prototypes, though, rolling down towards her. She's with Johnny. Let's take a look through the grid. Hello, everyone. Welcome down to the grid once again for the first race of the weekend for the Prototype Winter Series, as Adam's already said. Only one, one race this weekend for them, and we have already crowned a champion. I'm going to catch up with him more in the lunch break if I can, but he's starting on pole, so we might as well go have a chat. Let's see if we can, uh, we can get in. He has got a couple of people just talking to him, so we might not be able to. Um, okay, looks like we might be able to. Johnny Sufi, champion already, but we haven't even had a race, so that must feel pretty good. Yeah, it feels great. I mean, uh, yesterday we would have loved to race. I mean, it would have been fun to kind of battle it out for the championship, but I think Gedlich handled it like as well as they could have. You know, we can't control weather, so um, thankful to them. And, you know, we tried to have a second race today, but it didn't work out, so. And it's nice and sunny today, so it's going to be a beautiful drive for you, hopefully. Are we just going to go out there and have some fun? Yeah, absolutely. Go out, have some fun, see if we can actually secure a good position. I think we're still in the contention for a team championship, so if, uh, if we play our cards right, we could also secure that this weekend. All right, still more to play for then. Best of luck for this race. As I said, we'll probably try and have a uh, proper champions catch up with him during the lunch break. Now, one person I did want to come and talk to, uh, if you're a single-seater fan, you might recognize him. 
is this guy here, Mr. Hadjou and David. How are you doing? Nice to uh, welcome you onto the Prototype Winter Series grid. Nice to see you. Uh, very happy to be here. It's my first race in endurance, uh, coming from single-seater. So yeah, very happy. Yeah, you, uh, you've got a nice place to start for the first race. Obviously, you'll be uh, taking, the, taking the car after the pit stop. So jumping in from single-seaters into endurance racing, how's the, uh, how's the confidence going into this one? <laughs> Well, we are confident because we did the fastest lap of the weekend so far uh, in free practice, 34.9. Uh, so the pace is really strong. I'm just a bit scared of the tire degradation. It will be my, f my first race with such a uh, heavy car. So, yeah, hopefully after the pit stop, we have uh, still some tires and we can fight until the end. And from what you've, uh, what you've managed to do so far, um, how different is this car to a single seater? <laughs> To be honest, it's quite close. It feels like uh, the Freca that I was driving in 2022 uh, with Air Race. Uh, it's quite similar in terms of lap time as well. And uh, yeah, just hopefully we will have a bit less degradation than with the Pirelli, but uh, should be fine. <laughs> All right, well, we wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. Have a fun first race. So they will be in the number 85 car starting on the second row. We are going to see. I would quite like to have a chat with our number 18 car starting alongside Danny Sue. Moritz Kranz will be driving in this car. Uh, I've gone the wrong side. That was clever. We'll go this side. One of the guys is going to uh, open the door for me if they can get it open. Thank you very much. Moritz, we're starting on the front row. This must be pretty good for you. Yeah, of course. It's always good to be out front. Yeah. Yeah, always good to be out front. Do we think we're going to... Obviously, you've got the champion alongside you, but do you think we can, uh, we can get into turn one ahead? I mean, that's the plan. Obviously, I don't want to, let's say, implicate the, the, the championship. But, uh, yeah, of course, I try my best to be up front. And you guys haven't had too much running, obviously, with the race cancelled yesterday. But is this a track that you uh, that you feel confident on? Yeah, I've been here a couple of times, GT3, LMP3 and so on. So I know the track quite well. Uh, struggling a little bit in the Thursday, Friday sessions. So uh, we have to see how it goes today. And obviously it is the only race of the weekend for you guys. So is there kind of a bit more of an attitude of uh, just going to go for it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wish you best of luck. Thanks for speaking to us. There's the number 18 Mjolnir Motorsport car. I think we have just had the three minute board. So we're going to keep walking backwards, show you some of these cars. We'll head down the grid a little bit further. So alongside me here, we've got the number three DKR engineering car of John Brownson. Now they took an overall third place last weekend. It was John Brownson's first weekend in the paddock and managed to take that overall third place. So we will see if they can do it again. They've got a, a pretty nice view down to turn one but as we've said many many times today we have got a very long run down to turn one and the other thing that Hadri and David just said to me there is tire degradation definitely something to think about obviously this is our first endurance race of the weekend so that could be a factor and obviously we've got that pit stops with the pit stop handicap system as well I believe we might just have a little bit more time to come down and show you some of the liveries we've got the number 70 car Maxime Direct and Valentino Catalano just giving us a little wave there and alongside the number 88 into Europol car I believe Sebastian Gravelin will be starting in that car and just in time for that we are going to head back to Adam after a quick ad break So then the prototype winter series cars are on the circuit and ready to go. Two formation laps, of course, in the prototype. So they will have a few minutes uh, of driving to do to get some heat into the tires. Danny Sufi will be leading them around behind the safety car. He is our pole sitter, the talented youngster, the American, the newest champion 
in LMP3 racing. He is our first ever prototype win series champion, and he starts from pole alongside the very, very potent Moritz Kranz, an LMP3 expert himself. He'll be one to watch. Fabian Michal starting from third place alongside John Brownson. Of course, John Brownson for DKR Engineering. Uh, Fabian Michal in the car that RA GP will be running. Hadrian David to take that car over. Sebastian Gravelin starts from fifth place. Another single seater convert in the Inter Europol car. He's alongside Maxime Dirks in the Gebhardt Motorsport machine. Kevin Rabin starts from row four of the grid in the first of the Nova Protos. Clement Moreno will line up alongside him. Moreno, of course, already having to be extracted from the gravel a little earlier on. Steve Parrow is next, starting from ninth place, the car that currently sits second in the championship. And then uh, the next along is Philippe Mundelot in another of the Nova NP02s. The fourth and final car from ANS Motorsport, Eco Segre, starting at the back of the order. They have replaced or repaired the engine uh, from last week. The car blew an engine in race one at Motorland Aragon, but the Ligier JSP4 is fighting fit and ready to go once again. So the prototype wind series formed of three classes, the LMP3s, the Novas, and uh, the Ligia JSP4. The Novas can reasonably be expected to get in amongst it uh, with the LMP3s. The P4s are, of course, a couple of steps further back. But the field of LMP3s for this weekend, or for the prototype win series in general, is somewhat expanded. Uh, out to 11 cars from last week's eight uh, at Aragon. And of course, these LMP3 cars always spectacular to watch and uh, arguably even more spectacular to hear, especially here at the Circuit Barcelona Catalunya. Uh, the kind of arc shape of the main grandstand means that they bounce off it. Uh, and it does feel rather as if you're being surrounded by uh, V8 buzzing hornets uh, as, you, uh, as you get uh, rather hit over the face by the sound of them on the on the pit wall two formation laps as i mentioned this is the protocol for the prototypes i think a couple of the teams made the point that yeah one lap isn't really enough time for us to get some temperature into the tires um i think it might have been astrid from rinaldi specifically who made that point and uh, uh, she uh, is quite right that's a good a good uh, a good bit of information for the in the organizers to have and it's information that they have implemented so Danny Sufi uh, and co will do two formation laps of course the race will be 50 minutes plus one lap the pit window will open with 20 minutes of the race completed and close again with half an hour of the race completed and the pit stop handicaps are a big factor in this one this is effectively a bit like what us Brits would call a handicap race um, it is going to be uh, long long stops for the likes of Sufi and Moritz Kranz they'll be expected to do 144 seconds worth of pit stop from pit in to pit out the likes of Clement Moreno and Julian Lemoyne an all bronze and very strong liner up. They only have 82 seconds. So that means that uh, Sufi and co are more than likely going to have to fight their way back up there at some point. Which is the idea, really, of the handicap system. In theory, it should always guarantee us a bit of a grandstand finish. So it's uh, going to be interesting to see how that pans out when they choose to pit as well. It's not a long pit window, only 10 minutes. Uh, so you can't hang about too much. But uh, there is a little bit of strategy to that. If you are in clean air, you've got your head down and... Uh, feel that you can keep on going quickly um, or indeed if you are the quicker of the two drivers then you'll stay out until the very end of the pit window and vice versa you may choose to come in a little bit earlier if you're getting stuck in traffic if you're stuck behind someone and you just can't overtake them on the track especially if you know that your pit stop will be shorter than theirs uh, then uh, that is a way that for you to almost perform an undercut type thing uh, to get that trap position. But I'll tell you what, Adam, I am ready for this. I'm ready for the noise as they accelerate <laughs> to the line in a moment or two. These are the loudest uh, machines on the earth. I'm convinced of it. And uh, we've got 11 of them about to go barreling off into turn one at the beginning of what should be a competitive race. Definitely should be. Moritz Kranz with a big background in 
uh, prototype racing for Molnar Motorsports. Uh, Nürburgring specialist first and foremost. I think that's still his best foot forward, but he's done a lot of LMP3 racing in Europe, in the United States. This is the young American Danny Sufi that lines up alongside him on pole position. Will it be Sufi? Will it be Kranz into the first corner? How quickly will Sebastian Gravland work his way uh, up the pack? I expect him to be a little bit quicker than uh, Mikhail and Brownson ahead. Lots of questions to be asked and hopefully answered over the course of this race. The cars are underway. We are rolling and racing in the prototype wind series for what will be the final time. Clement Moreno not there, the car that had an issue on the way to the grid. Let's hope that gets racing. But look at that from Fabian Mikal to the inside at turn one. He can't get it done, but Moritz Kranz might around the outside at turn one, side by side through turn two. The Molna Motorsport car has to concede though to Danny Sufi. Our pole sitter leads in the early going. Clement Moreno does join the race from the pit lane after his trip to the gravel on the sighting lap, but Danny Sufi just about holds on to the lead and up into third place goes Sebastian Gravland. That means three very, very rapid drivers now in the top three. Prepare for a dogfight. <laughs> I was thinking exactly the same thing. Danny Sufi is not going to have this all his own way. Moritz Kranz really signalling his intent here into every braking zone. He's ducking and diving underneath the rear wing of Sufi, who I don't think has got a huge amount of temperature in those front tyres because the car didn't want to turn then uh, into the left-hander. And he'll need to try and get that sorted out quickly because uh, Moritz is going to... Uh, jump at the first opportunity to come through, but a bit of uh, water maybe on the uh, ground there in the middle of the road as they head down the back straight and into the braking zone at the hairpin. No moves made at the front of the pack, but further back down the order, a very nice move up the inside, uh, and that was the number 70 Gebhardt Motorsport car. Uh, textbook out braking manoeuvre, and through they will go uh, up an extra place. Maxim Dirix then getting through, and uh, we saw him, of course, making his prototype win series debut along with the team, their first appearance. Uh, last weekend in Motorland, Aragon. Great to welcome the historic Gebhardt Motorsport team into Prototype Wind Series. It's another historic team at the front, though. Conrad Motorsport leading the way from Molnar's Moritz Kranz, Sebastian Graveland there in third place, and already up to fifth place as well. That's worth mentioning. Kevin Rabin, uh, the 16 year old Swiss who basically made his car racing debut with us in a 5-litre Ford V8-powered <laughs> prototype, the Nova MP02, back in Estoril. A very, very rapid youngster, and he could be uh, making a move for fourth before long as he close in, closes in on Fabian Mikal. Yep, Fabian's going to have to watch his mirrors here. Doesn't have the pace to go with the top three, it would seem. Uh, but uh, having lost already a place from where he started, he won't want to continue that downward trajectory. There is the number 71 car, really, really unique looking thing that is a very pretty uh, prototype. And clearly pretty effective as well. Closing in, where is the move going to be made then? That's going to be uh, the question. These cars will generate a bit of a slipstream down the straight, but of course they also produce quite a bit of downforce. So through these medium to high speed corners that the circuit to Barcelona, Barcelona Catalunya is renowned for, it can be a bit tricky to follow very closely to the car ahead, uh, but we'll see when they get onto the main straight whether Kevin can make his move, and then if he does, what sort of pace he's got in clean air. Yes, exactly. I suspect he might not quite be able to get involved with the top three, but maybe if he can make short work of the RS GP LMP3 car, maybe it could be on the cards. Of course, of course RS GP, a team uh, more renowned for their single-seater efforts, but stepping into LMP3s, as is Hadrian David, as we heard from uh, with Izzy on the grid. Look at that top three, though, separated by less than two seconds. Graveland uh, a little bit slower than both Sufi and Kran. Sufi, the pace setter of the three at the front, uh, some of that might be down to the dirty air, the effect of these mid-speed corners and this big aero, as you alluded to previously, Andy. Uh, but uh, again, just such a spectacle to see these cars running. That, just coming through shot, is also going to potentially be a battle. Uh, one that we've already seen uh, this month, actually. John Brownson and Steve Parro, uh, the two bronze-rated drivers in their respective lineups. They had a good little scrap at Motorland Aragon. It looks like they're uh, getting back into it again now. Yeah, clearly even on pace, aren't they? Steve with the track position to try and find at the moment. Uh, not quite within striking distance for the time being of John.
from. Uh, but uh, John Mosey can't afford to put a foot wrong here, make even the slightest of mistakes, because then the position could easily be lost. Sweeping downhill into this really tricky sort of uphill chicane. It's easy to carry a bit too much speed through the first element. That ruins your run then through the second. And then into the iconic turn nine up at the highest point of the circuit. One of the ideal circuits, really, to be driving a high downforce car at, particularly a prototype. You'd imagine there's a lot of fun around here. These long corners that seem to go on forever made for a down, high downforce prototype. And uh, they've got the power to boot as well down a couple of lengthy straights. And uh, John Brownson using all of that to the best of effect uh, to hang on to the place for now. Daniel Bjergin, our series photographer, took me to turn nine uh, while the prototypes were running uh, earlier on in the week. And it is absolutely spectacular to see those cars go through there. We've also seen at the chicane you were referencing, seven into eight. Unfortunately, the Pelin Racing Ferrari went straight into the wall there on Friday. Uh, in front of our videographer as well, so it did go up <laughs> on socials. <laughs> Emilio caught that one. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's so easy to get on the kerb and then just lose it trying to put traction down as you go over the sausage kerb. And that's exactly what we've seen countless times here over the years at Barcelona. There's Maxime Dirics then. He's closing in on Kevin Rabin, I would suggest, maybe more so than Rabin is on Fabian Michal at this point. So... Uh, Rubin is going to face some challenge from behind from Maxime Dirix at this stage. Uh, Maxime, uh, fairly new uh, to the world of uh, racing because his appearance at Motorland Aragon was his first appearance in a car. Uh, karting started for him at the age of 16. He's now 19 years old, has been doing a bit of a testing program with uh, Gebhardt Motorsport. Um, but making his first strides in car racing from a driving family as well. Both of his parents are professional drivers. I think Audi uh, and Porsche respectively. Well, his father, Johan, runs a classic Porsche workshop, and I can only imagine how lovely that is. Uh, but he's, he's come up through a, a car-centric upbringing, and uh, it does look like he's finding his feet fairly quickly. Uh, his first ever race was actually in the dark as well, because the first prototype wind series race was a night race uh, at Motorland Aragon. So uh, baptism of fire, but he seems to be coping well. Interesting, actually, coming from a family that has motorsport in its blood, that he started karting at the, the ripe old age of 16. I yeah. mean, that's uh, most karters are, are well past retirement age by that point, aren't they? I think that the story that, I, as I understand it, is that uh, Maxime's parents weren't pushing him into it, um, but he had other sporting interests prior. Uh, he then went higher karting, and uh, the, the switch... <laughs> the biological switch he would have gained from his parents suddenly went off, and uh, here he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very grateful for that, that's for sure. He's a great addition to the grid, and uh, about to start applying the pressure here to Kevin Rabin. You're absolutely right, Kevin just losing pace uh, over the last lap or so, dropping away uh, from the car ahead. And uh, Maxi Morix is going to be looking to try and find a way through. Of course, lots of similarities between the LMP3 cars out there, but this is going to be an interesting battle. Both of those cars perhaps will generate their lap time in uh, slightly different areas of the circuit. John Brownson and Steve Parrow also getting themselves closer together now too. So it's been a relatively calm opening stanza in this uh, prototype Winter Series race, but uh, some of the battle starting to bubble away quite nicely now, and still only a second and a half or so actually uh, between Danny Sufi and Moritz Kranz at the front as well. Yeah, that gap between the top three is staying fairly equidistant. Uh, to your point about the Novas, they're typically a bit quicker in the corners, but lose out a little bit in the straights at least. Uh, in PTWS, I think they are running a bit of a restrictor on the engine uh, alongside the LMP3 cars in our category. Of course, all of these cars as well on Michelin rubber. It's not like the GT Win Series where it's an open house for tyres. Uh, so the tyres are all uh, of the same uh, ilk as well. There you see John Brownson in this battle for seventh place. Uh, with Steve Parrow just behind, of course, both of these drivers have a bit of a hot shoe tucked away and waiting in the pit lane. Uh, in the case of John Brownson, it's Lawrence Herr taking over. In the case of uh, Steve Parrow, it is Daniel Kalvitz, the former ADAC GT Masters and FIA 
European GT3 champion. Two very, very quick drivers going to take that car over. And, of course, they've got shorter pit stops. Uh, 115 seconds for these two cars versus the 144 for those up ahead. Uh, that may not be enough to fully uh, close the deficit back in uh, to the leading cars by the time we're in the pit window. Uh, however, uh, it will give her and Carl uh, some grounding to work with in the second phase of the race. Indeed it will, and it'll uh, be interesting to see exactly where they can uh, find themselves come the chequered flag uh, after that, uh, as I said, relatively short pit window that they will uh, have. Down the hill they go, into seven and eight then, and uh, Brownson, uh, sorry, Parry, just starting to move around a bit now in the mirrors of uh, John Brownson, trying to force the mistake out of the driver ahead. Headlights ablaze on both of these cars, so uh, uh, Steve Paro, I thought, maybe trying to distract John with the headlights, but John uh, is deploying the same tricks as well. Not that there's anyone particularly close in front of him. Into the braking zone at turn 10. No way through yet for Steve. Although Brownson just a bit wide of the apex. You can get away with that there through 10, though. It's such a long corner, multiple uh, ways in which you can get around that turn. And ultimately, both have been doing so at more or less the same pace. Yeah, looks pretty equidistant between the two of them. Of course, they've got the same 5.6-litre mm. Nissan engine as all of these LMP3 cars do. Kevin Rabin, though, under increasing fire from Maxine Dirichs up ahead of this scrap, and uh, he's got the slight uh, pace disadvantage in a straight line. Hasn't been closed in on yet, uh, but uh, Rabin, certainly down the straights, does have to worry a little bit about the Duquesne behind. Through turn four, and uh, the battle continuing then. See Morrison having caught Kevin. Where does he make that move? That's going to be the challenge, if anything. I think he's spurring Kevin on a little bit now to close back in on uh, Fabian Mikal ahead. These three, as you said, pretty evenly spaced out now. As we tick uh, into, well, we're just under 40 minutes to go, so we're about 10 minutes away uh, from the pit lane window opening. I uh, wonder whether maybe that will be an opportunity for a couple of these drivers, maybe for Maxi Morix to come in early and uh, get some clear track position. It's obviously quite difficult to overtake, difficult to get within striking range, so you feel he must be getting held up here in the dirty air. Uh, pit strategy can sometimes be your way around that. I'm also intrigued, Adam, to see how the tyres perform over the 50-minute uh, race. Heard a couple of drivers, uh, Dieter Speps, I think it was, on the GT podium earlier, saying that tyre degradation's a lot higher at the moment than they were expecting. Now, he did say part of that was car setup, but I also suspect the fact that most of the rubber, all of the rubber, has been washed away from the track with the deluge that we had yesterday. A green race track, often quite quick, but it does take life out of the tyres. And, of course, these teams won't be changing tyres at the pit stop. Uh, so, uh, in the back end of the race, those who have looked after their rubber in the first half may be the ones coming forwards. Exactly right. And uh, we've seen, I think, that factor come into play a couple of times this season as well in the prototype winter series. Uh, great three-way battle we've got here with Papi and Mikhail. I think just being slightly um, relieved here, really, by the fact that Maxime Dirichs is behind uh, in the... Oh, as we have Steve Parrow looking to the inside there of John Brownson. Difficult to know where to look with these two battles ongoing simultaneously. Um, I think Rabin's uh, approach to Mikhail has rather been stalled uh, by the fact that uh, Maxim Dirix is pressuring Kevin himself. So uh, that's probably uh, the 70 car inadvertently doing a favour. That's not a favour, though. The sausage curve sending the 70 car into a spin. So easy to go deep into turn seven, as we've already alluded to. And into the gravel goes Maxim Dirix. And now he's done quite a good job of not getting the car beach into the gravel. But as he tries to then leave it, Unfortunately, the car does dig its heels in, and that is going to need a recovery. Uh, which probably will mean a safety car, and we're approaching a pit window as well. So this uh, takes all of that strategy out of the equation, really, because if the safety car is out when the pit window opens, it's a no-brainer. You've got to pit, really. Replay of what happened, and as we've just been saying, it's a downhill approach. It's easy to carry too much speed in, which is exactly what he does. Misses the left-hand apex, and then rattles over the sausage curb. He'd have been okay, actually, if it hadn't been for the sausage curb, but that unsettled the car 
car looped it around. He did the right thing there by not hitting the brakes, actually, as he was rolling back into the gravel. That would have dug the car in if you locked the wheels. Uh, but sadly, very uh, low ride height on these cars, slick tyres as well. As soon as he applied the throttle to get back out, the car dug in. And we do indeed go safety car. So things are going to bunch back up at the front of the field, where some of the gaps had just started to creep up a little bit. But I'm intrigued, Adam, to see just how long this safety car's out for and what impact that might have on pit stops. Yeah, that's uh, going to be interesting. They do sometimes, but they do move the uh, safety car window around in the event of the safety car leading into the pit window. So we'll see uh, how that is managed. I'm yet to see the safety car confirmed anywhere. Uh, just local yellows ah. at turn eight for the time being. Uh, but that is probably the inevitable end game here. And we'll see when that is confirmed, if it is confirmed. But one would suspect it's an option. The other option as well, uniquely to this series, is a full course yellow as well. They do have that facility available to them in this, uh, this series too. So we'll see whether they maybe use that as a fallback option. All the while, Steve Parro has been fighting to try and get onto the rear of John Brownson. There you see the... Uh, number 70 car still beached unfortunately in the gravel trap uh, maybe they'll choose to keep that uh, FCY in 10 seconds has just uh, come up on the screen so they are going to use full course yellow uh, to manage this and these close battles now have to try and get that memo at the exact same time to avoid calamity indeed yes but I think that's a sensible way of doing this it's, there aren't a lot of cars on the track only uh, well nine or ten now so uh, it's not like we need to bunch everyone up to clear the track so marshals can get out if everyone's going slowly and is behaving themselves which it looks as though they are as the uh, full course yellow is now um, in effect um, so yeah it's not actually that difficult now for the marshals to get out there even with a recovery truck tow the car out of the way and hopefully get racing back underway but uh, it does give everyone a chance just to get a breather cool the tires down as well as i was just referencing tire management's going to be key in this race and a uh, couple of laps at low speed will give them the chance to look after their uh, michelin rubber uh, the recovery process already ongoing then as uh, boxing dirix prepares to be dug out of the gravel trap there on the exit of turn eight shouldn't take too long to do Anticipate another lap, maybe, of Full Course Yellow. We should be good to go once more. Yeah, the team very efficient here at the Circuit of Barcelona, Catalonia, already on the scene and ready. Uh, but it will take a little bit to pull that car out. Of course, the low ride height again makes this quite difficult on these cars because the splitter will dig in like a snowplow and, um, and potentially put uh, half of the gravel trap onto the circuit <laughs> as they pull it out. So that is something we have to consider. But uh, Danny Sufi uh, leading them then through the full course yellow. Uh, no information quite yet as to whether or not we'll see the pit window changed. Uh, that will probably be confirmed in due course, depending on if we're still under uh, full course yellow at the time of the full course, uh, at the time of the pit window opening, which is in less than three minutes' time. Twenty minute mark of the race is when the window opens i would suspect we'll see uh, the likes of john browns and steve parrow in fairly early doors um maybe fabian michal as well the respective bronze drivers of their lineups and uh, then also of course we have to uh, think about when someone like a danny sufi or a moritz kranz a solo driver will make their stop i would suspect somewhere down the middle of course uh, sebastian graveland will hand over to rick cohen uh, that's a, a fairly quick quick lineup a, a pair of, of silver drivers in that one uh, cohen uh, has done porsche carrera cup for the last couple of years in the benelux region and is now having a look at lmp3s using gts as the bridge between formula and prototype racing uh, over the last few years was previously a, a part of formula 4 spain which of course is uh, a partner uh, in the formula wind series along with gidlick racing so i'm sure there's some familiar faces in the paddock for him this weekend as he uh, gets into the world of uh, of lmp3 competition but some great team names i always find in this 
uh, as the full course yellow is about to be lifted into Europol, Molna and Conrad, your top three. That's three pretty heavy team names there. Uh, indeed so, and uh, this will give them the opportunity to recharge and go at it again. I think we're definitely going to see uh, some aggression, although a really good restart there for uh, Danny Sufi, as you would expect, I suppose. And uh, when the race gets back underway with him probably a bit further ahead now than he was arguably uh, when the full course yellow began. Uh, that's one of the tricky things with full course yellows. If it's a safety car restart, at least you know vaguely when the uh, leader's going to get back up to speed. Full course yellow, obviously there's a countdown, but uh, some people anticipate that countdown perhaps uh, a little bit better than others. Right, back out uh, onto the main straight we go. Steve Parro with John Brownson in front of him, but of course the car behind is the one that uh, was late on parade. A bit of bodywork there flying off the uh, Steve Parro machine. What was that? Something off the back of the car? Oh, it's the, yes, well spotted, Adam. It's the bodywork just uh, below the windscreen on the front of the car. Um, quite why that has detached itself from the car, I'm not so sure. I've not seen any contact, Adam. No, but I've seen that happen two or three times across the weekend uh, with the LMP3 cars uh, just above the, uh, the suspension. Uh, bushes there. I have seen that happen a few times. Now, Clement Moreno just behind Brownson and Paro is very interesting. Yes, he's a bronze-rated driver, but usually he's exhibited a bit more pace than both of the guys ahead of him. Uh, so this could be a bit of a, a dogfight now between these three. Uh, Paro will be well aware of uh, Moreno in the mirrors. You can't miss that livery uh, in the rear view very Honda 2007 Earth Dreams in some respects. <laughs> the pit window has opened as well, so we'll see whether or not any of these three peel in this time. I think Moreno handing over to a fellow bronze in the form of Julian Lemoyne, I think they'll go for the equilateral method and go halfway through the window. Uh, as for Brownson and Parra, I would suspect they might get it done early. Moreno dives to the inside at turn 10. Very nice move from him. Uh, Fabian Mikal is into the pit lane, uh, so as expected, he hands over to to Hadrian David at the first opportunity. Let's see if any of these three drivers follow suit. Uh, the battle for sixth place coming through the final corners now, and sure enough, both Brownson and Paro pull in. Uh, they will hand over and have a 115 second stop from pit in to pit out, uh, which will be uh, a little bit uh, shorter than some of the cars ahead. Uh, of course, uh, the number uh, 85 car, the RS GP machine, that's got 113 seconds as well since uh, Adrian David is technically a silver rated driver. I thought he might have just touched gold by now, but he is a silver rated driver after his efforts in uh, Formula Regional and Formula 4 competition and uh, now moves uh, into these prototypes. He will have a slight uh, short pit stop than these two cars, but of course he came out ahead of them anyway. The big story, I think, is going to be where... Uh, where Hadrian comes out relative to our top three. I think that's going to be the big one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is, in a way, the key moments of the race now, isn't it? As certainly once the leaders start pitting, we know they'll be here for uh, quite some time. We've got the number 88 car in, so that was Graveland from third position. Uh, so the first of our leaders uh, heading into the pit lane. They will have 144 seconds to serve in the pit lane, so among the longer of the pit stops, and uh, that is what will bunch everybody back together. That leaves only Danny Sufi and uh, Moritz Kranz out in front. Now three seconds apart, those two. Uh, so that gap definitely has grown since the Full Course Yellow restart. Action down in the pit lane then. Driver change ongoing. Rick Cohen jumping into the Ligier uh, that uh, Sebastian Graveland has piloted very solidly in the uh, opening half of the race, nearly half of the race. And a fairly lengthy process this. It's one of the good things, I suppose, about having a longer mandatory pit stop time. You can take your time over making sure you're following all the protocols, the belts are all done up properly, the driver is comfortable, all of the systems are fired back up again, and then send your car back on its way down the pit lane, as has happened uh, for the number 85 car there. Rejoining the race in a very close pair of cars, heading out after him as well. Yeah, that's Paro Ooh. and, uh, well, that's the three in the 66 cars. Now, quite why there's moving, shaking, overtaking and contact uh, on the way out of the pits, I'm not quite sure. But seemingly, well, the speed limiter for Lawrence Hur was a little bit faster than the speed limiter for Daniel Kalvitz. He goes through, Kalvitz loses out in the pit lane, and he will not be happy with that. 
No, understandably, really. I mean, <laughs> it's one thing to overtake someone in the pit lane, but then to try to squeeze them towards the wall was a tad unnecessary, I think. But anyway, uh, they sorted it all out. They got out on track, and uh, they can continue battling now. But yeah, the uh, number three car, uh, very bullish about getting through. But hey, we've seen the trap position is a premium. You know, if you can get in front of somebody, you've got that clean air, you can unleash your pace. So <laughs> when he realised he was going quicker down the pit lane, uh, he decided to take advantage of that. Well, 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 that's uh, certainly an interesting approach, isn't it? Uh, both of those pit stops uh, were 116 seconds in length. So that means they're both just a second over the minimum time, which means they are A-OK -okay safe and uh, within the rules. Now, the 88 car of Gravland will now be taken over by Rick Kuhn. Uh, let's see how his time is. Just looking for him on my timing screen, a 2 minute 26. Uh, that is 146 seconds, so that is fine as well. Uh, so we have seen a couple of drive-throughs because of short pit stops. Doesn't look like we're at risk of that for any of the teams that have done so thus far. Moritz Kranz is also in the pit lane right now, which means Danny Sufi is uh, soloing it around the circuit. I expect him to come in perhaps this time. I think traditionally Conrad slice it down the middle. And we'll see if that is the case this time for our race leader who comes through turn 13 and uh, does indeed peel off into the pits, into the final corner. Already, of course, our championship winner, currently, at least pre-pit stops, our race leader. Let's see if that's preserved at the end of this window. Indeed so, and, uh, well, that is going to be interesting to see, isn't it? Down the pit lane he goes then, Danny Suvi. Uh, going solo, as we've said, so no driver change to be done here and no, uh, you don't get that lap or so after the pit stop as well, where the driver has to sort of get up to speed. Danny already knows what he's doing, pulls into his pit box towards the very end of pit lane as the car behind requires a bit of a push start. That's the 18, I think, isn't it? The Mulder Motorsport car, Moritz Krams, that didn't want to get going under its own steam. Also in now is Kevin Rabin. So uh, Kevin had inherited second place with everybody else pitting. And uh, Kevin in the number 71 car with, again, 144 seconds. So uh, no advantage going to be gained from him. This is definitely an issue, isn't it, for Bull Motorsport, though? They can't get that car going. And it's now sort of stuck halfway towards the fast lane. So sensibly, they're uh, pushing it back towards its garage. But that looks like a car that simply would not fire back up after the pit stop. That is sometimes a bit of a recurring issue with these LMP3s on firing back up. You often do see them struggle with that part of the process. And Moritz Grands on this occasion, unfortunately, being wheeled back towards the Molnar Motorsport Garage. Hopefully they can get it out there, but the bid for victory is more than likely completed, more than likely over before uh, the second stint of the race has begun as Moritz Kranz now gets the car back out there. Clement Moreno in as well. Now Moreno is typically the driver that ends up uh, as he hands over to Julian Lemoyne, uh, seeing, oh, well, we'll come back to that in a minute because Daniel Calvert is making life very hard for Lawrence Herr uh, in the battle further back in the field, currently for seventh place, but it will shake out, of course, in the wash. Uh, during this uh, pit window. Uh, this is Lawrence Herr versus Daniel Carvitz, Gold Driver versus Gold Driver. Two very impressive resumes. Two drivers we've seen fight each other a couple of times already uh, in the season, and we've seen them fight in the pit lane as well. And that incident is currently under investigation, you'll be unsurprised to hear. Um, but uh, Daniel Carvitz really dancing the car through turns two and three. Uh, I was just going to say about Clement Moreno and Julian Lemoyne. Typically, they come out of this pit window as the race leaders uh, because their pit stop is so much shorter than the likes of a Danny Sufi. However, of course, starting from the pit lane means that might not be the case on this occasion. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Sufi exits and indeed does mm. exit in front of Moreno. Uh, so Sufi may well still have the race lead. Who is coming past him on the pit straight? There are a couple of cars that we've heard come past in the last few seconds. I don't see them. There is Gravland. So Gravland comes back out just behind Moreno. Gravland goes around the outside. I should, of course, say it is Rick Kern now at the wheel. And uh, Julian Lemoyne taking over Clement Moreno's machine gets uh, overtaken around the outside uh, on chilly tyres. And we'll have to worry about Hadrian David behind in short order as well. Indeed he will. A busy race trap that he rejoins into as well, right in front of Lawrence Hoare. And uh, manages to hold him off.
off for now, but uh, as we said, the car sat in the pit lane will have lost tyre temperature, lost tyre pressure. He's going to try and get himself back up to speed now if he can then. Round turn three, here they all come absolutely together. This has got disaster written all over it. A big squeeze onto the grass. Daniel Karlovitz does well to keep control of the car, but not for the first time in the brief stint that he's had in his race, Adam. Lawrence Hoare is proving he's not afraid to get the old elbows out. Dives up the inside now uh, down into turn number five. Uh, and honestly, I think Kevin Rabina would probably be well served to get out of the way. There's more contact now. Bits of carbon and fibre go flying and did that put to the left rear tyre of the 71 car. He does seem to be struggling a little bit. Maybe not a puncture, maybe it's just not the alignment out slightly, but uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Lawrence Hoare is not here to make friends, is he? That approach to turn four had a whiff of Rosberg Hamilton about <laughs> it, if you know, you know. Uh, Kevin Rabin there, the young 16-year-old Swiss. Oh. Uh, oh, he may have that problem you alluded to. Has the tyre started going down? Uh, or is it just maybe suspension? Yeah. I don't know, but that car certainly ailing now the 16 year old swiss was thrown into the lion's den there ahead of the two highly experienced gold drivers and uh, well he is going to have to more than likely pull that car into the pits because something is amiss eco sagre was briefly our race leader in the sole jsp4 lmp4 car out there on the circuit he has now pitted which now hands the lead back over uh, to danny sufi but he's only three and a half seconds clear of rick kerb and Hadrian David is only a further three and a bit seconds behind him as well. So I don't think Sufi has this one quite made yet. There is the Ligia JSP4 uh, being serviced and uh, more importantly taped. Uh, maybe they're having some issues keeping that particular panel on the car as well. They just want to make doubly, triply, quadruply sure that everything is all okay. And look at that, that's the mark of a professional team. They've got tape that matches the primary colour of the car. <laughs> as it should be. A little bit of thought went into that and uh, placing it pretty carefully as well to make sure it's doing the job that it needs to. But uh, yeah, interesting then that a few teams struggling with that uh, front bodywork coming loose. Car's definitely designed to run at these speeds on this kind of track for much longer than this without falling apart. So uh, clearly something uh, interesting going on out there in the conditions uh, that's making that a bit of an issue. But the car fired back up and will very shortly rejoin the race with Nico, of course, still at the wheel, uh, which he does now, albeit at the back of the now 10-car field, having uh, lost Maxim Dirichs a little bit earlier on. There goes Danny Suki then, across the line, three seconds the lead, and uh, at the moment, looking at his lap times, well, actually slower than Rick Kern on the previous lap by about half a second. So what do we think, Adam? Is there a chance that Rick could start bridging that gap? It's possible. It was three and a half seconds last time by, as you alluded to there. So Danny Sufi is slightly um, losing time. However, maybe he is uh, keeping his powder dry when it comes to the tyres as well. He's had a lot of running on these Michelins in this series across uh, the season. He's familiar with the format, whereas Rick Kern is joining us for the first time. Is this Sufi managing or is this Sufi being truly caught up? Uh, the gap equally has shrunk between Rick Kern and Hadrian David. That was also three and a half seconds. It is now also three seconds. So I think that top three battle is compacting together. And the fastest man on the track is down in fifth place, Lawrence Hoare. So again, not maybe adding his name to many people's Christmas card list today, <laughs> but he is going very quickly. A 136.9 was about 1.3 seconds, 1.4 seconds quicker than the race leader. So he is flying, albeit 25 seconds off the lead down towards turn seven we go though this battle continuing to rage on uh, this is Kevin Rabin just ahead of uh, Moritz Kranz and uh, they're battling over seventh place both technically running in different classes but they find themselves battling together on circuit uh, so as the regulations are designed to do Adam this race coming to life now after the pit stops Funnily enough, yes, but not because of the regulations, because they all had 144 true, second true. pit stops at the sharp end of the order. And that man, Moritz Cran, should have been involved as well. He'll yeah. be watching this back and going, I could have had that game with everybody else. That's annoying. Uh, the 18 car then uh, right there behind Kevin Rabin. Of course, we saw Moritz Cran struggle to get that car out of the pits uh, earlier on. That's why Moritz Kranz is now stuck behind Kevin and uh, should have the straight line speed advantage over the Nova NP02 based on what I've seen previously uh, between these two cars. Here comes the Duquesne. It's got a nose ahead. It's all the way ahead. Uh, Daniel Karlwitz 
uh, rather I should say Moritz Kranz past Kevin Rabin that is for seventh place did so up the hill they head then winding through this first sector really really satisfying set of corners to drive when you get it right very easy to overdrive into turn one and then through turn three as well which goes on and on and on you pick up the throttle a bit too early then you'll find yourself beyond the edge of the road before you get out of the turn but both of them manage that pretty well and the gap starting to grow now between the two of them as Moritz Kranz as we expected really starts to get away Daniel Karlwitz is about six seconds ahead of these two and uh, Daniel Karlwitz is going quicker than these two have been as well. But Karlwitz is on about the same pace, really, uh, as the race leader, which is still Danny Sufi by about two tenths less than he was a lap ago. And we still, of course, have 16 minutes of this race to go. In fact, they're about to complete another lap. Let's see what that gap becomes. 2.8 seconds becomes 2.3 seconds. So another personal best lap there for Rick Kern and uh, for David uh, Hadrian behind, too. So the top three definitely condensing as we head into the final third of the race. Hadrian David was eight tenths of a second quicker a lap ago and seven tenths quicker last time by on Rick Go Cohen. So I think Hadrian is uh, the form driver here. Uh, but of course, he could end up working into Danny Sufi's favour because if he distracts effectively uh, the driver of the number 88 with a battle for second place, that could allow Danny to start to uh, focus again on what he's doing rather than what's going on behind him. Lawrence Herr, meanwhile, has uh, gapped Daniel Karlwitz as we see there and is now closing in quite quickly on Julian Lemoyne for fourth position. Fourth is probably the uh, the ceiling for Lawrence Herr's race at this stage after taking over from John Brownson. But this man, Julian Lemoyne, uh, under some pressure. Yes, he is, isn't he? And uh, I don't think it's going to be long before Lawrence Hall catches him. <laughs> We've seen Lawrence getting his elbows out already. I hope that someone's pre-warned Julian that uh, it might be the best thing for you to do to just sort of sidestep out of the way here. It's not a racing driver's instinct, that, but uh, I think the mood that Lawrence is in today, <laughs> I wouldn't be standing in his way. Yes, he's, he's driving with, uh, with the vibe of a man who maybe got burnt toast at breakfast, <laughs> isn't he? He's, uh, he's not having a great... Uh, he's, well, he's having a very good race, to be fair. It's just one that's come with a, a little bit of bare carbon fibre being exposed on that DKR engineering car. Very pleased that's remained on livery door season. It looks pretty menacing uh, in this uh, minimalist livery as well. Here's the gap then, 3.6 across the top three. Hattery and David now just 1.6 seconds, well, basically 1.7 seconds away from Rick Kern. Of course, the Dirty Air will start to play its games very shortly, uh, but uh, Hadrian comes from the world of uh, junior single-seater racing. He knows how to deal with that. I wouldn't mind betting he keeps closing. Uh, no, absolutely, and he is he's closing on Rick at about the same rate that Rick is catching Danny Suvi, but of course Hadrian is a little bit closer, way out wide goes Julian Lamont. Uh, sensible driving there, Julian. He saw Lawrence Hall coming, and uh, I don't know if that was fully intentional, but either way, he left plenty of space between himself and car number three, and it's a clean pass then for Lawrence. 23 seconds behind the top three, though, and he's not going to be able to catch them unless there is some drama uh, amongst the, uh, the podium runners. Julian, meanwhile, is a good seven seconds or so ahead of uh, Daniel Karlwitz, who is lapping actually only about a second or so quicker, so he will catch, I think, but perhaps only in the closing stages. Yes, uh, Daniel Karlwitz's pace is most unlike Daniel Karlwitz, to be honest, so I'm, I'm betting that car is a little bit wounded from uh, the exchanges earlier on. Um, Julian Lemoyne, incidentally, turned three a year ago. He um, was in a Ligier JS2R in the GT Win Series race, didn't spot that there were two GT3 cars in his mirror and uh, got into it with Mikhail Yus, the team boss of Usport Wagen Technik. So a year later, he's learned his lesson and pulls well <laughs> off the line and just lets it happen. Um, he has come a long way in the last 12 months as a driver. That's been evident across the summer programmes as well as the winter series. Uh, Hadrian David is coming a long way to closing in on Rick Kern as well. That gap is under three seconds now between the top three uh, and it's under 1.3 seconds between second and third place. Uh, Danny Sufi is going to be feeling the pressure, uh, but Rick Kern has his own concerns. Yes, he does indeed, and uh, as you say, that could be the thing that lets Danny Sufi off the hook a little bit. Uh, but of course, the closer 
um, Adrian David gets to Rick Cohen, the more he contends with the dirty air, the less he will then continue to close. And of course, the same will eventually become true of uh, Rick Cohen. So really, you don't want to be stuck in the middle here, which is where Rick is uh, going to find himself before too much longer. Gets carries visibly more speed there through turn seven and eight. You can tell even just from that uh, distant camera shot. So his car working well. You speculated earlier on that perhaps Danny Sufi had been looking after the tyres and that's why the pace wasn't quite so good at the start of the stint. Maybe it was the other way around. Maybe Danny took too much out of the tyres in the first half of the race, pulled away to that pretty healthy lead, remember? And maybe it was the other drivers who were playing the long game. A green racetrack, not a lot of rubber down, high tyre wear. And uh, maybe Danny Sufi is now starting to, uh, to suffer from that. Maybe so. He's definitely being closed in, isn't he? That gap's going to be, I think, two seconds between the top three this time by 11 minutes and 15 to go, plus one lap. Danny Sufi is going to have to get those defensive shoes on. It's 0.8 of a second between himself and Rick Kern. So Kern is closing in. It's a battle of the USA uh, versus Benelux, or, well, for, versus Netherlands specifically in this one, in the, with Rick Kern behind in second place. Of course, into Europe, old competition. The team that took the LMP2 win last year at the Le Mans 24 Hours, Conrad Motorsport, the team behind decades of racing success in Porsches, in prototypes, in Celines, etc., etc., etc. Two very decorated teams, two very fast young drivers. This is going to be exciting. Daniel Karlwitz gets himself past Julian Lemoyne as well. Fairly rudimentary stuff there for fifth place overall. Karlwitz has probably reached his ceiling in the race with that, uh, although he might have to worry about Daniel Karlwitz, who isn't uh, uh, holding back in the slightest behind. And uh, we'll see if... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Moritz Kranz behind Daniel Karlwitz. We'll see if uh, Moritz Kranz can get to Le Moyne and maybe challenge Daniel Karlwitz from there. Fifth place, Daniel Karlwitz. Now Le Moyne in sixth. Moritz Kranz closing in on them. Sufi, though definitely feeling the pressure and Rick Kern uh, that 0.8 of a second is looking an awful lot more like 0.5 now it is isn't it but can he does he have enough excess pace over Danny Sufi to overcome the turbulent air that's coming off the back uh, of the leading Ligier uh, while well, he's closing still even through the final sector these final two corners are really where you would feel the effects of that dirty air Sufi's car sliding out of the final turn so definitely rear grip limited at the moment and of course he He's now punching a nice big hole in the air for Rick Cohen uh, to benefit from. Rick not really close enough yet, though. And as he takes a meter or two out of Sufi's lead, Hadrian David's doing exactly the same to him behind. They are literally closing in on each other at exactly the same rate. And it's all boiling together nicely now with nine and a quarter minutes uh, plus that final lap to go. But uh, the pressure now on, uh, on Danny Sufi's shoulders not to make a mistake under this sort of pressure must be immense because he knows that if he makes a mistake, not only will Rick come through, there's a very good chance he'll find himself on the bottom step of the podium as well. Big news coming from race control. Daniel Karlwitz to serve a drive-through penalty uh, for unsafe rejoin and uh, impeding another car. Uh, is the uh, is the word there? So that's gone to Kalvitz rather than Lawrence Her. Uh, the impact of the penalty. Uh, the 66 car is the one that's been told to uh, serve a drive through, and that is big for the championship as well because Kalvitz and Paro came in with about 0.4 of a point in the very <laughs> difficult point system uh, in the standings over oh. Lemoyne and Moreno. So Mar Lemoyne finishing ahead of Kalvitz would change second in the championship. And as you reacted to there, uh, Hadrian David isn't thinking about numbers right now. He's thinking about the cars ahead of him. And he's really, really trying to find the grip, find the pace and uh, maybe doing so in slightly raggedy fashion. Uh, well, I thought he was a goner then. That car was at, at an angle I didn't think was recoverable, but he did a brilliant job of gathering it together and actually didn't lose a huge chunk of time. He is still only a second behind Rick Cohen, who is stuck, I think, at around eight tenths adrift of uh, Danny Sufi. So to my point a lap or so ago, I don't think he has got that excess pace that he's going to be able to overcome the lack of grip he's now feeling in the dirty air in the wake of uh, Danny's Ligier. But he is still close enough to put that pressure on. Maybe the odd flash of the headlights here and there, a bit of a jink in the braking zone to try and create that flash of movement in the mirror might just be enough to force Sufi into a mistake. But Danny doesn't really get into the habit of making too many mistakes. He is a pretty steady driver. He's had his fair share of time in the lead of races this season already. 
He knows how to handle this pressure and only has to do so for another, what, nine minutes or so. And of course, uh, Danny Sufi uh, has been racing LMP3s with Conrad fairly consistently over the last couple of years. And there's something to be said for driver and team getting to know each other in the fashion that Sufi and Conrad have done. Uh, Sufi effectively lives at the Conrad Motorsport HQ uh, these days, moving over from Austin, Texas, as Eco Sigre is into the pits to serve a drive-through penalty for not respecting the full course yellow, so our only LMP4 car getting in a little bit of uh, trouble there. Um, but of course, for Conrad Motorsports, this season has been the first full season in the prototype win series in the Ligier uh, JSP320, they moved over from a Ginetta in the off-season and uh, it does seem to be paying off for them at the moment but will Danny Sufi's efforts in this race pay off? Will he be the man that uh, Andy McEwen welcomes onto the podium last on the top step? We'll find out as Andy is now dispatching himself over to the other side of the circuit. I suspect though that Danny Sufi's uh, time worrying about uh, being caught is now being superseded by realisation that Hadrian David is in fact playing the spoiler, almost playing the wingman to Danny Sufi because he's right there behind Rick Kern as they go through turn four and Hadrian David is going to do everything he can to find a way past Rick Kern over the course of the next five minutes, 35 seconds plus one lap. Hadrian David uh, communicating to me in the hospitality area over the weekend that uh, this move into PTWS, this move into an LMP3 car, probably quite indicative of what he's going to do next. No one was quite sure after he did two seasons in Formula Regional, two very successful seasons in Formula Regional, then went into Formula 4 in the Southeast Asian Championship. But here he is now. Right on the back of the 88 into Europol Ligier, fighting in a prototype. And uh, he seems quite excited about his move into this type of car. Sufi from Kuhn, from Hadrian David, your top three. Three very different drivers from very different backgrounds. Sufi, a former drifter from Austin, Texas, who also used to race uh, MX-5s and saloon cars uh, over in the US at a fairly club level. Rick Kern, who did F4 Spain in 2021, came sixth in the championship that season, two seasons of Carrera Cup cars, and now comes into the world of prototypes. And uh, Adrian David, who joins us from the world of single-seater racing, moving into LMP3. So Sufi with the most LMP3 experience, but arguably the least top-level racing experience of the three. So that's a, an interesting dynamic there. As anticipated, Moritz Kranz is there behind Julian Lemoyne. He has gained time and closed in uh, on the number 42 car. Daniel Culvitz has still not served that drive-through penalty, incidentally. He's still there in fifth place and not uh, through the pits just yet. We've got three minutes and 38 seconds plus one lap of this race to go. Moritz Kranz looks like he is not going to stay behind the 42 car for long. And will Hadrian David stay behind Rick Kern for long? The smart money says maybe not because uh, he is very close there through turn 10. Let's see what kind of run he can get through 13 and 14 as they power through these apexes. Of course, the chicane bypass these days, the former turn 13 and 14 stands. There you see Hadrian David definitely did get a fairly solid run there onto the main straight. Some lap traffic to contend with as well in the form of Philippe Mondelot in the second of the Nova MP02s. That could be uh, something to consider as well. Hadrian David with a massive move down into the first corner, maybe slightly catching Rick Kern unawares. That was a big lunge for the inside line. I wasn't quite sure he was going to get it stopped at the apex, but stopped it is. And the R-Race GP Duquesne is now in second place. And Danny Sufi will have seen potentially that happen in the rearview mirrors. Even if he didn't see the move happen, he will now see that it's the black and pink car, the 85 of Hadrian David in his rearview mirrors. 
And now he's going to have to roll the sleeves up with two minutes and ten to go, plus one lap. He's going to have to defend for a further two laps of racing at the conclusion of this tour of Circuit Barcelona-Catalonia. Sufi is going to be under pressure, I'm sure. Sufi has great pace, but Hadrian David looks like he's got, frankly, I think more tyres than anybody else more than anything. He said he was worried about the, uh, the tyre wear, and maybe he's gone a little bit conservative early in the race, and now has some more rubber underneath him. Moritz Kranz still not able to find a way around Julian Lemoyne in the battle for sixth position. Maybe Kranz is struggling a little bit with the car in this late phase of the race. His pace is well off what it was earlier on, two seconds a lap back in the dirty air, and possibly with something deeper going on as well. Sufi, David, Kern, your top three, come across the line in a new order. Adrian David is now right there with Danny Sufi and has already shrunk the gap down to 0.6 of a second. This is going to be a grandstand finish. Two different teams, two very different drivers and two different chassis. Ligier versus Duquesne, Conrad versus Race GP, sports car legends in Conrad Motorsport versus relatively newcomers to sports cars in Race GP. Can Sufi hold on? He's given the inside line there to Hadri and David side by side. They must have touched a little bit there. If not, they were just millimetres apart. Hadri and David has the inside line for turn number seven and he gets it done. He's past Danny Sufi who does very well to catch that slide coming out of turn seven. But Danny Sufi demoted to second place. Hadrian David, again, I think he's been conserving those tyres very, very well and has now pulled the pin and is now your race leader. Danny Sufi down to P2 then. Third place, Rick Kern now just behind him. I think that Sufi, while he was flashing the headlights at Hadrian, uh, he's going to have to worry more about Rick than David, uh, than Hadrian David. The clock has hit zero. We begin the final lap this time by, and Hadrian David crosses the line into the final lap with the race lead. Sufi with Rick Kern just six tenths back from him. Fourth place is Lawrence Herr. Fifth place is Daniel Kalvitz, who still hasn't served a drive through penalty. So that could end up being converted into a time penalty at the end of the race as well. Dropping Kalvitz behind uh, Lemoyne and Moreno, potentially dropping himself and Steve Parrow down to third in the championship too. As it stands, if Lemoyne and Moreno finish ahead of uh, Kalvitz and Paro. That means they'll take second in the championship, and I think that's the situation we're facing there. Adrian David has cleared off at the front of the order now. Danny Sufi just has to hold on against Rick Kern for second place. And equally, Julian Lemoyne, who's had a very strong stint in this race, has to try and hold off Moritz Kranz. Looks like Sufi has a workable margin here over Rick Kern as they head into the final few corners of the lap. But Hadrian David has shown his class and shown his potential. Was a runner-up in 2022 in Formula Regional. Oh, and Stanley Sufi kicks up the gravel. But Hadrian David has certainly kicked up a storm on his prototype racing debut. He crosses the line to win the race for RS GP. Danny Sufi taking second position and Rick Kern takes third place. Lawrence Herr will cross the line in fourth place, along uh, followed by Daniel Kalvitz, although Kalvitz uh, may yet face a penalty, or will more than likely face a penalty, uh, because his drive-through has not been served, which is always converted to a time penalty. Unless they manage to overturn the actual penalty, uh, then I think that uh, that is going to be 
um, and move down the order to the effect of about 20 seconds. And that will hand fifth place overall and second in the championship provisionally to Julian Lemoyne and Clement Moreno. They cross the line sixth on the road, fifth if the penalty is indeed converted to a time penalty and then not uh, redacted. I think Carl Witz and Rinaldi Racing are looking to plead their case, uh, but uh, fifth overall provisionally for Carl Witz and Paro, but that uh, drive-through means they'll drop down. Kevin Rabin, the last car across the line, he finishes in eighth overall, the last car on the lead lap, leading the Nova Proto class. But what a start to the prototype racing career of Hadrian David for RACE GP, the outfit with plenty of F4 and regional experience previously. A really strong lineup as well, Fabian Mikal uh, and Hadrian David. Mikal with a lot of experience in uh, GTs in racing in general, a few seasons of uh, LMP3 under his belt, and then you've got Hadrian David, who clearly seems to be able to take to this like a fish takes to water. Not even the duck, I, I went all the way to the fish. Danny Sufi will be happy enough with second place, and of course, he will also be our champion. That was confirmed yesterday with the cancellation of race one. Danny Sufi came into today as the champ, and he'll get to round out the season on the podium uh, with the number seven Conrad Motorsport Ligier team. And he will be delighted uh, with his season overall in the prototype winter series. Adrian David greeted by his teammate Fabian Mikal. I think we'll be all too aware of uh, the young talent that he's sharing with at the moment. And He'll be thinking, long may it continue. You see there the Michelin Le Mans Cup uh, motifs on the on the race suits. That's an indicator of where to expect these two to show up next. I reckon they'll be a force to be reckoned with in that series. They've certainly arrived in prototype wind series with a splash. Let's hope we see them again in season two when we, of course, anticipate uh, a growth in the series, much like in FWS, how we uh, grew it significantly from season one, season two. We're expecting a lot more uh, from season two of the prototype winter series. But what an addition they have made uh, to the Giedlit Racing winter series package. These cars are a spectacle on wheels. And uh, we have very much enjoyed welcoming them, welcoming them and their thunderous soundtrack into the winter series paddock. So then the drivers uh, debriefing in Park Ferme, walking their way towards the podium where a few of them will get to celebrate. And of course our most important three, the overall top three, have also uh, made their way under the podium and uh, are awaiting uh, directives to head up there. I'm sure that uh, Izzy Browning will hop in and uh, grab Hadrian David and uh, uh, Fabian Mikal before uh, they go down there and I actually I understand that Izzy has done that in record time So let's go down to our race winners with Izzy Browning now Hi everyone, I'm down in the pit lane with our prototype winter series race winners RSGP baby Michael Hadrian David that was absolutely fantastic to watch. How was your first stint out there? Yes, it's a good uh, It's a very nice uh, race for for us. I, I took uh, a a good start and I tried to, to keep the, the, the lead so it's difficult because a silver driver and uh, after that uh, uh, Adrian uh, do, doing a good uh, good uh, good start good scene. Adrian first race in LMP3s did you expect that? Well I didn't expect that to be honest but I didn't expect to stall on the on the restart as well uh, the stint was really good the pace was really strong uh, there was more dirtier than what I expected, so when I came back to the leading cars, I struggled to overtake them. But then as soon as I got some free hair for the last two laps, it was really nice. And yeah, I think it's a good start to the season. Uh, it was our first race ever with this car. We just received it uh, 
uh, last week. So, yeah, we are quite happy. Well, you look like you've got a lot of confidence. You were absolutely sending it in, in some of those corners, weren't you? Yes, it felt a bit like single-seater race. <laughs> it was a sprint at the end because we had to, I had to forgive my mistake in the pits, let's say. And uh, I think yeah, the stint was really strong and it's a good start for the season. And you two look like you're going to be a fantastic pairing. So where, where are we going to see you, see you now? Yes, it's a very nice. Uh, like the lineup, uh, the lineup is uh, it's okay for for the season. Yeah, I hope uh, to do the best for for the future. All right, congratulations. We'll let you get off to the podium. Have fun. All right, there's our prototype winter series winners. What a race and what a debut for Hadji and David. We'll go back up for all the replays. Thank you very much, Izzy. What a race that was in the prototype winter series. I think we'll take a look. Uh, at some highlights in a few moments. In fact, let's go to them now. It was a great start from Danny Sufi, but also uh, Mikhail did look like he was threatening into the first corner, didn't he? Happy and Mikhail to the inside, Moritz Kranz to the outside of Danny Sufi, and Kranz would briefly have the lead through turn two, but Sufi would ultimately head the field at the conclusion of the first lap. Some great scraps further back. Uh, unfortunately, Maxime Dirichs trying to chase Kevin Rabin pushed it a little bit too far. Safety car, or rather full course yellow, uh, was deployed as uh, and we went back to racing. And uh, Steve Paro lost some of his bodywork on the front end of the car. And uh, that didn't seem to hamper him too much, but still he lost out to Clement Moreno just before the pit window opened. And as the pit window opened, it seemed like there was some shenanigans going on between Daniel Karlwitz and Lawrence Herr. Lawrence Herr went bumbling past, and uh, Daniel Karlwitz then also tried to get into it with Lawrence Herr further back as well. There was uh, a lot of scrapping there in the lower positions between them, and Lawrence Herr seemed like a man on a mission as well. He got past Kevin Rabin, albeit with contact, and that unfortunately damaged uh, Kevin Rabin's car. Rabin would finish the race, but he would finish the race down uh, in P7 after seemingly struggling with balance a little bit after the initial contact. Moritz Kranz would find his way past him uh, as the race unfolded. Laurent Herr got past uh, Julien Lemoyne, uh, who took over the 42 ANS motorsport car, but uh, Lemoyne would ultimately end up ahead of this man, Daniel Kalvitz. Kalvitz goes past him here for what would have been fifth position but the drive-through penalty that was hanging over Karlwitz's head was never served, and that was then converted into a drive-through penalty. A great battle, or into a time penalty, I should say. Uh, Hadrian David having a great battle here uh, as he closed in on the top two. Danny Sufi and Rick Kern watched in the mirrors as the 85 driver launched towards them and then launched up the inside of the 88 and he then managed to find his way past Danny Sufi as well. A bit of a lock up into turn five, but fair racing room given by Danny Sufi. Side by side action and Hadrian David took the win with a plum in the prototype winter series. What a beginning to his prototype racing career. Winning the race by 2.6 seconds over Danny Sufi, Rick Kern rounding out the overall podium. And that was a very, very exciting taste of what's to come, more than likely with Hadrian David moving into the world of sports car racing. He wins from Danny Sufi and Rick Kern. Laurent Herr taking fourth place as Julien Lemoyne inheriting fifth after Karlwitz's penalty uh, converted into a time penalty. Moritz Kranz, Kevin Rabin, Daniel Karlwitz, Philippe Mondolo, Ico Segre, your finishers, Maxime Dirichs not taking the flag. Uh, of course, Segre, the only JSP4 Ligier out there. Kevin Rabin, first of the Nova's home in seventh. He'll win the Nova Proto class once again. But great racing, as always, in the prototype winter series. And uh, Hadrian David... Uh, for our race GP is our race winner along with Fabian Nical who took the start of the race now for uh, Kevin Rabin he will move himself uh, back up the point standings late on in fact he was only a, a few points away from the second place battle uh, in the championship points so I don't know quite where he'll shake out ultimately 
uh, in the championship fight, he might well leapfrog at least Kalvitz and Paro. He may, with that class win over uh, the other of the Novas, he may have done enough, you know, to actually be second in the championship. I'm unsure of quite what the permutations are uh, with the complexities of the point system, but Kevin Rabin may end up vice champion. I think it will go to Lemoyne and Moreno ultimately, uh, but Rabin will be very close, if not nearly tied, uh, with uh, Moreno and Lemoyne. Danny Sufi, though, came into this race as champion. He knew he didn't have to uh, do anything silly in this race. And as you saw, uh, when it came to it, he was willing to give Hadrian David the track space, give him the room he needed, and uh, press on. In second place, just knowing that victory was maybe a bridge too far with the pace. Uh, from the 85 car on that occasion. It was a very impressive showing from Hadrian David. Uh, as he said, he stalled in the pit lane as well, of course. Being a bronze driver, Fabian Mikal meant uh, 113 seconds in the pits uh, rather than 144 for Sufi, Kranz, etc., etc. Uh, so Hadrian David was always going to have a shorter pit stop than those around him. Uh, however, it was actually over time by about 15 seconds. So if it wasn't for the stall that he referenced in the pits, Hadrian David uh, would have actually been quite a way clear of Sufi and Kern uh, by the time uh, the pit window closed at uh, the 20 minutes to go mark. So if anything, the, the grandstand nature of that finish was uh, actually <laughs> in part facilitated uh, by the by the issue for Hadrian David more so than the pit stop handicap system. So uh, the starter motor doing us a solid there and giving us a great scrap for the lead uh, at the end of the race. So the prototype win series drivers expected up there very shortly. Uh, we will hopefully see them soon. Uh, some debriefing going on among the ANS motorsport teams drivers which I suspect might be the reason why we might be waiting uh, for the podium because I can see the ANS Motorsport drivers having a chat. <laughs> Hopefully uh, they are aware that I think at least one of them might be needed on the podium. I think uh, I think potentially Philippe Mondelor was among them there uh, but if they don't hurry up and come and get their trophy they might not get it at all. Although they'll get it at some point but they won't get it presented to them. Nonetheless we will hopefully have a podium before too long. Of course, we don't have to uh, particularly rush uh, at this point because we are just moving into our lunch break for the day here. Uh, the broadcast does not cease during the lunch break. We will have uh, a little bit of a look through the pit lane, uh, hopefully grab some of the drivers live and in person. We also have some uh, interviews from earlier of the week that we can show you as well, some insights from our various championships. Um, but uh, we will have, of course, three additional races in the afternoon, hour-long endurance race for the GT4 Wind Series. That will lead us into the afternoon's racing. Formula Wind Series with their championship decider uh, in race number three. They will be uh, following the GT4 Wind Series. And then the 55-minute enduro for the GT Winter Series will conclude uh, the season the Giedlick Racing Winter Series, the fifth year of the Winter Series project for Giedlick Racing, and it has grown exponentially this year, much to the delight of, uh, I'm sure, our viewership. We've had some great viewership this season. Those of you that are watching on, thank you so much for doing so. The audiences have been growing weekend on weekend. And, uh, of course, uh, with uh, not much racing going on, in the early months of the year. It is great to be able to uh, to bring you the live action uh, from these Winter Series events. Finally, a full season of live streaming for the first time as well, uh, which has been a big boost uh, to the profile of the various Winter Series run by Giedlick. Of course, we've also welcomed the likes of uh, Euro Cup 3 with their uh, 
little pre-season event uh, in Motorland. And prior to that, we had the TCR Spain pre-season event as well uh, down at the uh, Valencia and Jerez rounds. And they were very good entertainment as well. So welcoming external championships uh, into the paddock as well for the first time has been an exciting step for the Giedlisch organization. And I'm sure we'll get more of that uh, in 2025 as well. Exciting pros projects and prospects in the future for Giedlisch Racing as they continue to make improvements. The scrutineering end of things, the hospitality end of things, uh, all being ramped up year on year, just making sure it's as pleasant and as exciting of experience for the teams, for the fans, for the viewership alike. And we do appreciate the efforts that uh, some of our hugely important team members, I won't name everybody, but uh, they are all a huge part of it, be it uh, Mark Hilgenberg fronting the marketing side of things. Robin Selbach, of course, uh, along with Marcus Giedlick as uh, managing directors. Stefan Lehner, the nuts and bolts of the organization side of things as well. Uh, they and many other talented individuals doing a great job. Um, thankfully, that isn't my immediate future that you see on screen. I've not been booked with Ryanair <laughs> for this for this trip. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I've just been told that Alpha Live have. Sorry, boys. <laughs> but uh, yes, we will be all flying back to our various homes in some cases for the first time in a long time after the conclusion of today's running. A lot of the Giedlisch crew basically spend the first three months of the year here uh, in Iberia before heading back to Germany or wherever else they may be based. So it is going to be, uh, I think, many relieved faces by midweek once everybody is home and free but they'll be as excited as we all are as well for these final three races of course still a championship to be decided we know that uh, the gt4s have gone to facetti we know that gt winter series has gone to sr motorsport but what we don't know is the formula winter series title picture we also of course know that our second place man in the upcoming podium presentation Danny Sufi is the prototype win series champion, but FWS still hangs in the balance. It should still be tilting in favor uh, of the Griffin Peebles who won the earlier race. However, we can now focus on the race that just happened, prototype win series where Andy McEwen has managed to grab all of our drivers. So let's go to the podium. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Apologies for the slight delay there in getting our drivers ready for the podium, but we do now have drivers in place uh, for our prototype winter series podium. Two sets of podiums that we're going to do now. First for the race, and then our overall top three in the championship. So we'll start with our top three in the LMP3 class uh, for our race here today, uh, starting with our third place pairing of Rick Hearn and Sebastian Graveland. Out onto the podium they head and the third step of the podium for them. Uh, now, second place, he was leading until right in the dying moments, but a runners-up spot is what ultimately he has to settle for. Welcome to the podium, Danny Sufi. <laughs> can still be very happy with what he's achieved this year, as indeed can our winning pairing from a race GP. It is Hadrian David and Fabian Mikal. <laughs> Onto the podium they come then, the top step of the podium for them. Uh, Danny Sufi has uh, mistakenly, I'm sure, taken their place uh, on the top step <laughs> and moves aside. So uh, he was convinced he'd won that race. I think he'd started uh, writing the winner's speech already uh, on the final few laps perhaps explains uh, how he uh, maybe lost the lead in the closing stages trophies are uh, handed out then and 
great to see the drivers having a bit of a joke with each other up on the podium then i will try and have a word with danny sufi very quickly because i know we need to get down into the pit lane to chat to some, to some drivers as well but i'd like to get danny's side of the story uh, if i could they have bottles of champagne waiting as well we're going to try and intervene before they get uh, sprayed uh, and uh, get out of here before it gets really messy right photos i think are more or less done so let's see if i can dive in and have a quick chat with uh, danny just before the champagne gets sprayed stay where you are everyone because i want to get your thoughts uh, on the race to the top step of the podium which you thought you'd won <laughs> <laughs> i am a little bit tired i guess i don't know what i was thinking but uh yeah no it's it a tough race uh, right down to the end uh unfortunately tired dead got us and so the car was just kind of floating everywhere um so yeah it was a good race though had fun uh, massive thank you to the team you know it's uh we ended up securing the championship this weekend and i think team championship as well so huge thank you to all their hard work france daniel paul Marek, uh bertie klaus i mean the you know they all did a great job so it was a good weekend excellent congratulations danny right i'm getting out of the way because they've got the champagne ready uh, to celebrate their final race of the season give it up once more for our lmp3 podium finishers <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, the uh, cameraman up on the podium didn't have the option of getting out of the way, so uh, right in the firing line they found themselves. Uh, but our top three within LMP3 uh, get the chance to celebrate. We will be seeing a couple of them again uh, before the end of our podium presentation. So we'll ask those drivers just to make their way back inside for a moment. We'll see some of you uh, in a moment or two for the championship presentation. But we move on now to Class N. Just two finishers in the end in Class N, both run by ANS Motorsport. So we'll start with our second-placed driver in a moment or two. Just going to uh, redress the podium, get some fresh uh, bottles of champagne ready for them, and then we'll get them out onto the podium then. And like I said, starting with our second-placed driver in Class N, Philippe Mondolo. Congratulations, Philippe. Second place for him and an ANS Motorsport 1-2 because the winner in Class N was Kevin Rabin. He makes his way out onto the podium, then to the top step, a rather soggy top step now of the Catalunya podium. And the two Class N finishers both get to sit in the sunshine, which is just breaking through the clouds. I was worried a moment or two ago that the weather might be about to turn, but I think we hopefully uh, will escape the worst of that. Right then, I think photos are taken. You can let loose with the champagne uh, if you wish. And uh, we will then get our next uh, driver out on the podium. Uh, more photos, more photos to be taken. Ah, trophies first, trophies, apologies, yes. They haven't got their uh, first and second place trophies yet. Then the champagne will be sprayed and uh, they can really celebrate their uh, achievements here at the final round. Nice to see again, lots of people assembled down below enjoying the moment. Right then, now I am going to go and uh, hide around the corner. Photos are done. Champagne is yours if you wish to uh, save it for later or spray it. I think they're going to save it for later. Sensible thing to do, I think. So back into the room they go. For the team, says Philippe, and quite rightly so. The commentary team, I think he means, Adam. Uh, I'll expect a delivery up there in a moment or two. Right then, final uh, podium for our race today is for Class 4. Only the one car entered, but uh, it was great to see them get to the end with no problems again for ans motorsport welcome to the podium uh, uh, eco segre congratulations eco he makes his way to the top of the podium then and uh, celebrates on his own uh, to the crowd assembled down below so eco has a trophy yeah let's get the trophy out to him and uh, he will be taking that home with him then at the end of what has been uh, a tough weekend for all of our prototype drivers, really. Not getting their race in yesterday and then having to wait around to uh, get out on track again today. But at least they had some pretty perfect conditions really to enjoy. Eco, you can head back inside if you wish. Which means I think we're almost now ready to move on to our championship podium. Just uh, a few final checks of points going on uh, backstage to make sure we've got the right people. But I think we are ready to go with the championship podium. Yeah. <laughs> 
so they are still working out the points backstage for the uh, championship podium. So uh, that will be happening in a moment or two. So um, I will maybe go and try and find out what's going on. Adam, I'm hoping, is still in position and uh, able to uh, chat through, uh, maybe sum up what we've seen so far this morning, uh, because uh, this might take a bit of time. It's a rather complicated uh, point system, as Adam was explaining earlier on. And uh, it's not the work of a moment, it turns out, to figure out exactly who's getting which trophy. Yes, well, that's quite right, Andy. So calculations ongoing then. And uh, we wait to see. I think it's the team's championship that they're trying to uh, finalise. Driver's championship should be fairly much down. We know that Danny Sufi, as he said earlier on, is uh, confirmed as the driver's champion. And uh, very happy with that indeed. So what I think we might do is uh, head down into the uh, pit lane in a moment or two. Uh, whilst we just finalise everything up here, Issy Browning is uh, down the pit lane catching up with a few drivers, I think. And perhaps Issy can uh, sum up a little bit of what we've seen so far today. And uh, we will do our very best to get the uh, championship podium for the prototype winter series with you uh, in due course. So let's head down to the pit lane then. Izzy Browning waiting, hopefully, uh, with some of the drivers enjoying their lunch break here today. Hello, everyone. While we're waiting for the champions uh, podium, I've come down and I've got some twins with me, the Catfinger twins. And I will just quickly point out, all three of us are wearing the same shoes. So uh, we, uh, we didn't plan that, but it looks like we did. Guys, welcome back to the Winter Series paddock. You've had uh, one of your races this morning. So how's it been so far? Yeah, I had the first sprint race today morning. It was pretty good. The start was very good because I started from P7. Uh, I could make up some positions. And until the safety car phase, there was like a small crash. Um, I hope the drivers are okay. But after the safety car restart, yeah, my back tires were not as warm as I expected. Lost one place, but at the end still podium. And yeah, it was overall a great race to drive. And Johannes, you are the uh, G uh, GT Winter Series champion from last year. So how does it feel coming back into this paddock and seeing some of the competition from this year? Yeah, I must say the competition grows and grows. Uh, last year it was also pretty tight, but this year a lot of GT3 cars are here and they're a pretty good racer. And uh, yeah, as a champion with the number one, I think there's nothing better. And yeah, let's focus now on the endurance race and maybe we get up some positions. Let's look. <laughs> Michael, just coming to you quickly. I mean, it's not often that we get twins racing together. So just tell us how it is sharing the car with your brother. Yes, yeah, true. I think uh, to have my twin brother as my uh, co-pilot, I think it's the best thing I, uh, what can happen. And uh, it's, it's really good because he has like the same driving style than me. Uh, and with the setup, I think we are both really happy now how it is. And yeah, we just focus now for the endurance. I will start and uh, I think uh, we can get, go on the podium again. All right, well, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you for speaking to us. We'll let you go get some lunch now. And we're going to head back up to the prototype podium. Thank you, uh, Issy. Right, apologies for the delay, everyone. We do now have our championship points totaled up, uh, and we have four more trophies to be handed out in the Prototype Winter Series, beginning with our championship-winning team. Um, we have a representative from the team, Daniel Alt, ready to receive the trophy on behalf of Conrad Motorsports. <laughs> Congratulations to Conrad, dominant performance in the end this season. And uh, out they go onto the podium. There is the championship trophy. I believe that we have got uh, Jan from the Gedlich Racing Team uh, handing the podiums out. And it's his birthday today, I'm uh, reliably informed. So happy birthday, Jan, uh, and a good way to celebrate here in the sunshine in Barcelona. So Conrad Motorsport enjoying their moments in the sunshine as champions in the team's championship. Congratulations. Uh, we now move on to our top three drivers overall in the uh, prototype winter series. And we will bring them on in reverse order. So starting with our third place driver in the championship, uh, Kevin Rabin. 
back onto the podium for a second time for Kevin then and his third place trophy will be brought out in a moment or two as uh, he finishes on the championship podium at the end of the prototype winter series out comes the trophy and Kevin gets the handshake from Jan and uh, will once again have a moment to pose this time on the top step of the podium as third place in the championship so congratulations then uh, to kevin second place now we move on to and again it's a second appearance on the podium this afternoon for julian lemoyne And Clement Moreno as well with him. The two of them, of course, sharing the ANS uh, prepared machine. And they were second place in the overall championship. So two more trophies to come. There they are, the silver trophies uh, for championship runners up. And they smile for the cameras. GT4 cars heading down pit lane as well. We're not that far away uh, from getting racing back underway after the delays earlier on in the day. Uh, but we won't delay this moment any further. It is time to crown our champion. Congratulations to the 2024 Prototype Winter Series champion, Danny Sufi. Danny this time does uh, make his way onto the top step of the podium, uh, a place that he has found himself on many an occasion this season, and that is why he is confirmed provisionally, at least, as the prototype Winter Series champion. And with that, uh, with that, we can uh, head uh, down, I believe, to Issy Browning in the pit lane. We're done here uh, with our podium presentations. A fantastic season of racing in the prototype winter series. But for now, let's head down to the pit lane and see who we can find. Come back down into the pit lane, and one thing I did want to highlight is that obviously there's so many, uh, so many different people that go into the weekend, and one of those important roles is the role of a driver coach. So I've got James Keller with me. He is the driver coach of Ella Lloyd, the number 77 driver in the Formula Winter Series. James, you must be super proud. She has done an amazing job so far. Yeah, she's an incredible little driver, isn't she? Um, this is actually her second race weekend and a single seater ever. So I'm super proud of her. Obviously, I've been working with her since day one in a, in a car and she's only been racing it for a few years and to see her doing as well as she is doing is is absolutely incredible obviously we started the weekend off with a little bit of bad luck obviously yesterday wasn't the greatest weather for anyone out on the track um, and she got took and taken off in that last race so i'm hoping starting from 18th of the next race she's going to do a little bit better so uh but yeah the weather's good now let's see what happens and you're a driver yourself so just take us inside what uh what kind of tips you're giving her as a driver coach yeah well I've, i i race something completely different to what the, these guys are racing uh obviously these are single seaters and i'm uh, i'm racing a one makes a porsche series racing obviously carrera cup germany this year for me uh, but a race car is a race car at the end of the day uh, you are out to win uh, no matter what so um, obviously we've got the same goal and obviously my goal for Ella is to get her as quick as possible so um, whatever I'm going to do to make that happen is 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 my is my job really so uh, yeah like I said this weekend's been really really good um, and yeah we're going from there really so you've got experience in some of the cars we're seeing in the GT winter series then so is it kind of nice to be on the sidelines watching them or would you want to be in one of these oh i would do anything to be in a race car right now honestly i i haven't driven a race car for maybe five months now i've got my first test in a couple of weeks at hockenheim and i would give my left arm to be in these in the racing in, with these guys right now and even to be racing in the single seaters you know it's something i've never really done i've tested a couple of them but i've never actually had an opportunity to race single seaters like uh, ella has and uh, it's always been a dream of mine i mean from a kid obviously f1 is always your dream and single seaters is the closest you can get to, to doing that and i've never had the opportunity to actually do it and and i can see uh, i see ella she's got a great a great potential to be able to get to formula one and i, I think she can do it really let's do. hope so thanks so much <laughs> for speaking to us yeah, right. right we're going to go into the gt4 race now so uh, we'll head back up to adam for commentary Thank you very much, Izzy. The GT4s are then heading 
on to the grid for their hour-long race, the GT4 Wind Series cars just heading around the circuit now on their way to the grid, which is already full of personnel. Now, as you can see, uh, there is a picture up on top of the grandstand. Now, that is because at 2.30 p.m., in other words, in about eight minutes' time, uh, we will be having a minute silence. So 2.30 p.m. minute silence for a, a marshal, a long-standing marshal here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. That is David Hill uh, that we can see up on the top of the uh, tower there. Uh, he sadly passed away at 52 years old uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, the team at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia, uh, will be commemorating his life with a minute's silence at, th at 2.30 p.m. And so we will fall silent on the air for that, of course, and join the team here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalunya, in remembering him. So then the cars making their way to the grid at the moment. And uh, we will... Very much look forward to this season closer for the uh, GT4 Winter Series. A reminder that the championship is sewn up, of course, for SETI Motorsport have done what they do best and hauled themselves up into the championship that little bit early at their first attempt, lest we forget. We're so used to them being front runners here in the GT4 Winter Series that it is almost a bit absurd of as, a, of as a concept at this point that they are still such a new team uh, but in their relative infancy they have done absolute wonders and do now sit uh, at the top of the championship they will be uh, the winning team in the series and Jamie Day and Mikey Porter look to celebrate their championship with a race win. But in order to do that, they have to start from second on the grid. They have to try and beat the very, very fast McLaren Artura of Meekin and Leban. That car has been sensational uh, this week here in the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia. As you can see, they've uh, prepared a lovely slideshow there uh, commemorating David, Hill, uh, David Gill's life there uh, on the top of the tower, which is really lovely. Nice to see that uh, these uh, people that make racing possible here uh, at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia, as with most circuits, uh, being immortalized and memorized with that uh, really wonderful uh, that really wonderful slideshow. Now, the grid walk is ready to go, I understand. So Izzy Browning has hot-footed from pit to grid. Let's go down to Ernhel. Yes, hello everyone. Welcome down for the final race of the season for the GT4 Winter Series. As Adam has already said, we will be observing that minute silence at half past two. But until then, let's see if we can talk to some drivers. They have got the door open on the Elite McLaren. Can I quickly jump in? Oh, you know the drill now. Okay, so pole position, final race of the weekend, final race of the series. So we get, we're going to send it? Yeah, definitely are. Um, it's going to be difficult. We've got a lot of good people around us, but hoping I can just get my head down and get away. But the speed this morning looked pretty good because uh, even though Tom had that had that incident, he managed to get way back up there, didn't he? Yeah, the speed's there, so hoping we can just get a clean start and we can disappear. And once again, championship rivals starting behind you, so the hope is to uh, keep them there, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, hopefully, and hopefully we can have a good battle. All right, wish you best of luck for the final race. All right, we are going to continue down the grid. You can probably just hear the music behind me because we are about to have the minute silence. So I probably won't jump in with another driver just yet, but we do have our champion's car along on the front row, the number 19 for SETI, as we, as we have already seen. Okay, we do have three minutes until the... Um, until the minute silence so i will jump in as the door is perfectly opened for me for mr mikey porter hello mikey how are we doing bad, you? yeah not too bad thanks for asking um final race of the season i mean you guys are already already the champions so is it just a case of let's have some fun yeah i think so we've still got a, a championship but 
We've got quite a big lead there, so I think, yeah, just go and have some fun, then hand over to Jamie and, yeah, have a good race. And it's very, very different conditions to yesterday, so um, is this uh, conditions that you think are going to suit your car? What, what do we think of the track? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the boys always set the car to be as good as possible. And, yeah, these, uh, as Jamie showed, his pace was amazing in the first race this morning. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we have a really good car. It's been an absolutely fantastic season for you, so just what's the confidence going into, into the last race? Yeah, confidence is pretty high. As I said, it's just going to have fun again, go out there, do it best job, be chill, and, uh, yeah, have a good one. All right, wish you best of luck. Have fun out there. Thank you very much to the 430 boys. They got me that interview perfectly lined up. I must have done something nice for them. All right, so we're going to continue down the grid. I do believe we have just enough time to carry on before the minute silence. So we've just come on to row two. We have got the number 11 Schnitzel Alm car. Marcel Marshevitz is going to be in that car this time. So Joel had some great battles this morning. Marcel, final race of the season. So you're in that championship with the guys ahead of you. So what's the plan going to turn one? Yeah, the good thing is that we don't need to find against them. We have a little bit of an advantage with the points. Um, so yeah, I just tried to have a clean race now to hand, out, uh, hand over the car to Joel in one piece and then I think everything should be fine. All right, wish you best of luck. Have a fabulous final race. OK, we are going to go to a quick ad break and then I believe we will have the minute silence and into the race. So as you know, David Gill uh, had his ceremony there at the start of that uh, pre-grid. Uh, we were expecting a minute silence at half past the hour. The circuit observed that uh, just a couple of minutes ago. We will now also fall silent for a minute in the commentary box as the circuit de Barcelona Catalunya remembers their own David Gill. So then the GT4 Winter Series race number three begins now. A formation lap between us and the final 60-minute enduro of the season. And it will start with Zach Meakin from Elite Motorsport on pole position. Mikey Porter will line up alongside him, the 78 and the 19 at the front of the order. Marcel Marshevix will line up third position alongside Raphael Renhofer. Max Huber in the AM class will line up in fifth place. And look at that gap, one thousandth of a second further back. Mikhail Sander from sixth place on the grid. Max Krumberg in the first of the Pro-Am cars. He was quick yesterday. He'll have some work to do uh, in order to make his way up from seventh uh, further into the order and maybe get some other cars between himself and Charles Dawson, who's next in Pro-Am. Alex Papadopoulos starts from ninth place alongside Alberto Di Martin. That is an all-NM racing team, row number five. Nicholas Malloy and the CV performance car being started by Mikhail Maquez lines up on row six. Row seven of the grid, Dennis Byrne lining up in the Cirque Team Rennsport Porsche alongside Franz Linden in the Speedworks machine. Wilhelm Kuna, Willi Kuna starting from 15th place. And unfortunately, the Razoon more than racing Porsche not taking any further part in this weekend after their incident in race one. So then the GT4 Winter Series cars are readying up for their final race of the season. It has been a stellar 
inaugural season in the GT4 Winter Series. We are very excited to see how this last one pans out. The championships are all but determined. Uh, it is, of course, for SETI Motorsport as champions. The rest of the top three, it's 23 points between Schnitzlaum Racing's Joel Mesh and uh, Zach Meekin and Tom Levin uh, in favour of the Schnitzelam car. So it would take a big issue for Mesh and Marshaviks in order for Elite to have a chance of securing second at the very last breath. But anything is possible over the course of the next hour, both within the championship and within the race. Will it be the new GT4 Winter Series champions for SETI Motorsport that end the season on a high? Or will it be Levin and Meekin that make a statement victory in the final race of the 2024 GT4 Winter Series? We are racing. And it is a very good launch away by the looks of it from the Facetti Aston Martin. Yes, Mikey Porter leading into the first corner. And one of the Porters has followed him through. That is Raphael Renhofer in the 22 car. Joel Mech has also gotten a better start than Zach Meekin. Meekin's down in fourth place then in the early going from pole position. That was not in the script that Steph and Elite Motorsport wrote, I'm afraid. But they are down to fourth position. Raphael Renhofer uh, then up ahead of the pole sitting car in fifth place is a big scrum of cars but it's Mikhail Sander with a nose ahead in the first of the Cayman Trophy machines Mikhail Sander very very high up the order in the not quite GT4 spec Cayman Max Huber in sixth Kronberg in seventh eighth place is Alex Papadopoulos by the looks of it here comes Meekin, though, back on the charge, up into third place at the first, almost the first possible opportunity. The door was open and he went through up into third place, but he's now got to do some work to close in on Porter and Marshaviks. It is, of course, Marcel Marshaviks starting this car in this race. My apologies, I do think I referred to him as Joel Mesh erroneously. Uh, at the start there, there's Max Huber getting into it with his own teammate, with, uh, with Alex Papadopoulos. And the 16 car has gotten through there into sixth position. Kronberg also now having a look at Max Huber. So Papadopoulos in sixth place now from Huber, from Kronberg. And then the Pro-Am car, oh goodness me, the Alberto Di Martin car there getting a bit loose through the final corner or well, through the penultimate corner towards the final corner and uh, a bit of bodywork flying off the Mercedes AMG GT4 as well that rear diffuser on all of them seems to go missing very quickly in fact I think that might have been a smaller piece of trim but the Mercedes lightening program as it were continues you see there the battle scars on the 85 car of course with a bare front end on the car of Charles Dawson your order then is Mikey Porter leading from Marcel Marshaviks, Zach Meekin, Raphael Renhofer and Alex Papadopoulos. Sixth place Huber, seventh place Krumberg, Mikhail Sander losing out here as he continues to be pressurised now by Charles Dawson and Nicolas Malloy simultaneously. To the inside goes Dawson of Sander. Sander gives racing room there, knew he didn't have a horse in that race and just allowed Charles Dawson through. 24 car goes through as well, so I think uh, Mikhail Sander airing on the side of caution, wanting to hand the car over to Tim Neuser in one piece. Of course, still leading the Cayman Trophy critically as well. Now, Franz Linden briefly turned on the windscreen wipers there. I'm hoping Franz just fumbled a button on the steering wheel and that wasn't an indication of uh, any potential pre precipitation around the circuit. 31 of Max Krumberg. Going deep into turn 12 there as Mikhail Sander now under threat from uh, the 84 of Mikhail Maquez. He's gotten around the 111 has the Czech driver Maquez and now Alberto Di Martin uh, also trying to find his way by the Cayman Trophy cars a little bit underpowered compared to full fat GT4 cars so no surprise that Sander is falling back there we see the order coming across the start finish line then once again and it is uh, Mikey Porter 
ahead of Marcel Martovic at the front by just four tenths of a second. Those two are going very fast indeed. And in fact, not only are they lapping quickly, they're lapping quicker than Zach Meekin. Meekin, who we expected uh, to be extremely fast in the early stages of this race, didn't get the launch off the rolling starts and uh, has subsequently not quite got the race pace compared to the Mercedes and the Aston Martin up ahead of him either. Marcel Martovic, of course, would love to end this season with a win, as would Joel Mesh. And Martovic may be thinking that uh, the best path is to try and get a, a lead in early, get to the front and then try and build a gap for Joel to take over. But getting past Mikey Porter is never the easiest task. We've seen that on a few occasions in the GT4 win series this year. Comes from a Ginetta Junior background, of course, knows how to defend. The top two accelerate towards turn 12 as the rest of our field come down the back straight. You see there uh, the 24 of Nicholas Malloy now behind Charles Dawson. That's still there for second place in Pro-Am. This is the Pro-Am leader that we ride on board with, Max Krumberg. Uh, once again, Max Huber is up there ahead of everybody, including the Pro-Am drivers uh, in sixth overall. And he's shadowing Max uh, to Alex Papadopoulos as well. Papadopoulos, the... Uh, Pretty experienced American racer who's moved over to Europe for GT4s over the last couple of years. Previously raced in a Michelin Pilot Challenge and similar series to that over in the USA. And the fact that Huber can keep up with him is a very good sign for Huber's future. Um, bronze rated driver, yes, but a very handy one at that. And Quick bronzes, currently arguably one of the more valuable commodities you can have in a GT team with the World Endurance Championship. Now, of course, mandating bronzes in that LMGT3 class. Here's the battle for second then in the Pro-Am class, the Charles Dawson machine. Of course, Seb Morris, the driver coach to Charles Dawson, saw him again this weekend. They've been getting themselves up to speed across the year. I think Seb and Charles are intending to share a car elsewhere in the summer months. And uh, Seb Morris relishing the opportunity to get involved in this after a winter spent watching Charles play. Max Grunberg flashing the headlights as he tries to find his way past Max Huber. He'll be aware of the Pro-Am second and third place cars behind him as he dives to the inside of Huber. He wants to try and put the NM Racing Team Mercedes between him and the second and third place Pro-Am cars. But Max Huber isn't going down without a fight. Huber in sixth overall. Uh, yes, he's the AM class leader. Yes, Alberto Di Martin is about eight seconds further back from him but he wants the overall positions. He got a podium earlier on overall uh, in race two. And those dizzying heights are a thing he wants to achieve once again. Huber going defensive down the main straight then. As Max Krumberg again sizing up what opportunities may wait for him. Krumberg to the outside at turn one. Carries the momentum nicely through the corner. Up on the curbs at turn two. Now, powers his way. Out of turn three, you saw the Mercedes there getting a little bit loose as well, just bobbling around a little bit under power. Huber a bit deep into turn four, but I don't think that's going to open up the opportunities for Max Kronberg in the manner he would like. The WNS Motorsport team. Be willing on their driver. Of course, they have Josef Knopp in the back pocket. We know Josef is quick enough to win overall. He's done it already in the GT4 win series back in Jerez. Of course, if Josef receives the car from Max Krumberg in a strong position, who knows what heights they may achieve before the end of the race. Porter, Marshevix, Meekin, your top three. Of course, if things were to finish as they currently are out there on the circuit, it would be in that battle for second in the championship. 
Joel Mesh that takes it in the driver's standings and Schnitzelalm that takes it uh, in the in the team's affair. So currently Meekin not doing enough. Frankly, once again, Meekin and Leben would need a problem for the 11 Mercedes to have much of a chance of claiming second in the championships. I was just watching Charles Dawson's car through turn 12 a while ago and it did look quite low at the rear. Whether that's just a quirk of the setup or not, I don't know, but we've seen that car, its suspension collapsing at Motorland Aragon. Hopefully there's no issue on the 85. Certainly Charles Dawson is still driving it very quickly, but it does look quite low at the rear. Again, that could be a setup preference. We'll have to see. But Charles has been very quick in recent events. Is he currently performing with a car that's maybe not A1? Of course, already some bodywork loose, but otherwise, hopefully, all is okay underneath him. Nicholas Malloy, though, making life very difficult for Charles Dawson. Of course, Mikhail Makas maybe fancies a bit of this as well in the other CV performance car. The battle for second in Pro-Am is the one that we're seeing here at the moment. And then the Pro-Am leader is just ahead fighting with the AM class leader. So lots of scrapping here in the midfield. The top three are within a second once again. So Zach Meekin is closing in on Marshavix and Porter. He is now lapping quicker uh, than the two cars ahead of him, it seems. He's the only driver on the field to go sub-150. Zach Meekin, which is promising for when Tom Leban takes the car over later on. 24 of Malloy has been shadowing the rear of the 85 all race long. Here is your top three. Gap is out to 1.2 across the three cars this time. That still, in the grand steam of things, is effectively nothing. Through they go at turn three once again. That third corner really is the tyre killer on this track, and the front left bears the brunt. Under braking into turn four. This is certainly a uh, circuit dominated by right-handers which means the front left in particular, but also the rear left, do take a pounding. And that might be a factor towards the end of this hour-long race. Who's going to hand their car over with already spent tyres and who will give their teammates something to work with? Charles Dawson still defending hard against the advances of Nicholas Malloy. Max Huber still holding on to sixth overall, as well as, of course, the AM class lead. But... Max Kronberg getting past doesn't affect that, uh, that AM class lead either way. The inside there goes Nicholas Malloy. He's, I think, a bit more cognizant of the fact that uh, Mikhail Makas is closing in on him. Uh, Makas in a pro class car, of course, but still, I don't think uh, Nicholas Malloy much wants to be getting overtaken. He wants to do the overtaking. And it may be a strategical error as well to allow a CV performance car to act as a buffer between yourself and the Pro-Am rival ahead of you. Through turns 13 and now 14 they go for the seventh time in this race to start lap number eight. And look at that right to the outer extremities goes Mikhail Makas out of the corner there. Dawson staking his claim to the inside very, very early. And around the outside goes Nicholas Malloy. That's the inside for turn two. But the outside for turn three. And Charles Dawson just about holds on. But Nicholas Malloy might get a good run 
towards turn four as a result of that. Charles Dawson with a shallow entry into the corner and sure enough, the inside beckons for Nicholas Malloy who dives through into second place within Pro-Am unless Charles Dawson can get an exceptional run towards turn number five, which it doesn't look like he's going to do. So Nicholas Malloy takes second in the Pro-Am class with that move. Yegor Hishin, of course, will take that 24 car over later on. We have had a couple of warnings for track limits. Three warnings already uh, for the driver of the number 15, Alberto Di Martin. So Alberto has been just uh, gently informed that he might want to stay within the lines. And he can't really afford too many more track limits violations either before the penalties start to rack up. Through turn 12 goes the 84 car as well. And Marcel Marshevix is under significantly more pressure now from Zach Meekin. He's fallen back a few tenths from Mikey Porter. Uh, and Mikey Porter will love this, the view in the rear view mirror, as Marshevix and Meekin begin racing each other for P2. Zach Meekin with, in theory, the quickest car out there by the looks of it. And he's to the inside and he's through into second place. Zach Meekin making up for lost time, making up for the poor start, moving his way back up the field, much as Tom Levin did in the sprint earlier on. And Zach Meekin just holding off Marshevix, who's trying to fight back. But is it in vain? It certainly looks like that McLaren has something right going on underneath it today. The elite McLaren team have maybe just found a little bit of extra setup wiggle room here. Of course, uh, Joel Mesh fully expected this car to be strong here, the McLaren, and that was something he alluded to in an interview earlier on today before the second GT4 race. He knew that was going to be a car to watch. Joel doing his homework, watching the GT4 European Series race from here back in October to, uh, to glean what he could. Well, he's going to have to do a lot of footwork to try and move the 11 car back up into the battle for second place. Now that Marshevix has lost out to Meekin, he's going to have to try and chase both Jamie Day and Tom Leban, potentially from third position when he takes that car over. The Schnitzelau Mercedes AMG GT4. Just watching the aggression with which we're using the curbs and some of the inner runoff at turn 13 there. Oh, goodness me, again, just clipping the gravel there is Mikhail Maquez. That is um, an uncompromising racing line that we're seeing out of turn 14. The inside line goes the number 85 driver. Powers out of the second turn. Very well placing the car, Charles Dawson. Grunberg, meanwhile, getting, I think, a little bit frustrated. He's been there behind Max Huber for the, pretty much the entirety of this race so far. And I think Grunberg potentially has a little bit more pace if he can get released into clean air. But getting into said clean air is proving to be an extraordinarily difficult task. Meanwhile, Mikhail Maquez is uh, trying to get past the other CV Performance Mercedes without incident. Obviously, the directive through the radios will be, boys, careful. And, well, moving side by side into turn nine isn't my idea of careful, but that's what Mikhail Maquez is doing right now up against Charles Dawson. Dawson comes out just ahead. And through has gone Kronberg in the AM battle, but did he get the car stopped for the corner? No, he didn't. So it is still Max Huber that uh, is ahead in the battle for sixth overall. Kronberg was ahead, but he went deep into the corner. And Max Huber holds on for a little bit longer. Charles Dawson continuing to hold on against Mikhail Maquez as well. 
Porter, Mikin, Marshevich, uh, now split by 3.2 seconds. So now that Marshevich has been overtaken uh, by Zach Mikin, the driver of the 11 is really struggling for pace relative to the McLaren. Uh, the last laps equal, though, between Porter and Meekin as Krumberg looks to the outside line at turn one. Huber again defending nicely. Bouncing across the curb at turn two. A little bit of a, a squirrel there as they hopped over those curves. Quite a tall curb at turn two. Which means you can't uh, make use of it without uh, being confident you can catch the car. Catching the car, of course, will get harder as the race goes on as well. With the tie wear in play. Grumberg has certainly got himself a good view of Mercedes AMG GT4 headlights, but he'd much rather just see the apexes of the corner. Goes to the outside at turn seven. That's very brave. Has he made the move stick? I think he might have done, you know. What a move from our number 31 car. The WNS Motorsport Machine. Now, can Max Huber fight back? Oh, he got crossed up there. Compromised his run through the corner. And with Nicholas Malloy, the second place car in Pro-Am, closing in on this scrap too. I think Krumberg has made that happen for himself at the most important moment because if he made any more unsuccessful attempts at Max Huber, then potentially he would have lost the Pro-Am lead in the process to Malloy in the 24 cap. A reminder, the pit window is due to open in uh, just over four minutes with 35 minutes of the race left to go. Oh, and once again, Maquez very wide at the final corner. We've seen that time and time again. Max Huber looking to the inside, but more so, I think, defending as they head towards turn one. Around the outside goes Malloy. He's carried a lot of speed there. He's trying to get past Max Huber so he can try and chase this Pro-Am lead down, but Huber not making it easy. Very respectful driver. He fights hard, but he usually stays out of trouble. Unfortunately, with the inside line granted to Nicholas Malloy, Huber will drop a position here. Max Huber then has to settle for eighth overall. Still, of course, the AM class leader. It changes nothing about the AM class. In fact, Huber is very effectively gapping the rest of the AM field. 14 seconds clear of Di Martin in the sister NM Racing team car. Across the sausage curbs they go. A little bit of bodywork flying off, I think, the Cayman there. That looked like quite a sharp shard of plastic or carbon fibre there, and it was picked up by Charles Dawson's car. Hopefully, everyone's tyres remain intact, because that looked uh, a little bit uh, sharp and raggedy as an object to have on the circuit. Shards of debris. Certainly no one's best friend as Dawson powers out of turn 12. The ident almost identically liveried uh, CV performance cars. Of course, they're now a little less identical with the front end of the 85 car being bare. Here comes Mikhail Makas then. Can he finally find his way past his CV Performance Group colleague? He's to the outside line. Dawson with the high ground then, the inside for turn one. Will Makas try and hold it around the outside? No. Dawson a little bit deep into the corner, but effectively covers off both apexes. Makas will now be looking for a good run out of turn three. And he may well have it. Uh, in fact, not quite. It's not quite the run that he needed. But Dawson is certainly having to work hard here to hold on to this position. Alex Connor will be watching on with interest, of course. He'll take that car over the 85. Emil Yerdrum will take over... Oh, sorry, the 84 will be Alex Connor. Emil Yerdrum will take over the 85. The CV Performance Group cars for now in the hands of 
Charles Dawson and Mikael Makers respectively, and they are putting on a bit of a show. Debris still down there at uh, the approach to turn nine. It does seem to be just slightly off the racing line now, which is good news. Zach Meekin's last lap, a 150.865. Mikey Porter's last lap, a 151.276. Uh, so the gap is out again to 1.4 seconds, where previously it was at one point under a second. But maybe Meekin is just starting to circle back into pursuing Porter. If that's a sign that Porter's tyres are starting to struggle, that might be quite the point of interest for Tom Leban in the latter half as he goes up against Jamie Day post-pit window. Speaking of pit window, it's open in 15 seconds. We may well see the likes of uh, Franz Linden and Willi Kuna pit very early from the Cayman Trophy class to hand over to Anna Hofmeister and Enrico Ferdera respectively. The pit stop window is now open. As the CV Performance Group battle continues on. Predicted, as predicted, the number 660 car of Franz Linden is into the pit lane. Lily Kuna may well follow suit as well. Some more track limits warnings have come through. The latest is for Nicholas Malloy for his third violation of track limits. And will anyone from the front end of the order elect to make an early pit stop? Mikey Porter and Zach Meekin just coming through the last couple of turns now. I'd be surprised if either of them decided to make a stop this early in the stint. But Mikey Porter has pitted in from the lead. Mikey Porter pulls in at the far end of the pit lane. Meanwhile, and Marcel Martovic's also coming in. You see there the Schnitzelau lollipop man waving the green square. Rectangle in the direction of Marcel Martovic's. Seat insert in the hands there of Joel Mesh. A much larger of the two drivers. As he said earlier on, don't really fit in uh, the Porsches and some of the smaller GT4s. We'll see how he performs as he takes this car over. Arne Hofmeister now takes over the Speedworks car then. Back out onto the circuit once again. Zach Meekin now leading the race with the pit stops for the top, uh, for the leader and the third place car. Which means Renhofer has assumed P2 for the time being. Here comes Jamie Day to take over from Mikey Porter. Here comes the number 19 for Seti car then. Back out onto the circuit. Our former race leader. Once the pit stops shake out, will that car still be our leader? We'll have to see. It's going to be the Elite McLaren that's going to be the factor in determining that. So I wonder if Elite will pull their car in this time. I think they may well choose to split it down the middle, in which case one more lap for Meekin. And sure enough, Meekin through turn 14 now. Starts one more lap. Could this be the in lap? for Mikey, uh, for Zach Meekin. I think it might well be. Tom Levin will be prepped and ready to go. Heading out onto the circuit is Emil Yerdrum as well, so he's taken over from Charles Dawson. Josef Knopp has already taken over as well from Max Krumberg, so the pro elements of the Pro-Am drivers lineups are uh, already hopping in. Nicholas Malloy may soon pass over to Gegel Hishin as well. Renhofer is in the pit lane. So the second place car has pitted. Here is the former race leader. Here is Jamie Day. The driver who has really set himself apart at times in the 2024 GT4 Winter Series. Of everybody on the grid. I think uh, Jamie has 
been the most consistently quick out there. Bit wide there at turn 13. But I think just about within the defined limits. Out onto the main straight. Now where is the AM class second place? There it is, Alberto Di Martin uh, coming in. We'll see where Neil Montserrat can get that car now. The team boss will take over and go Max Huber hunting. Zach Meekin may well decide this is the time. This would be the exact halfway point of the race. And yes, into the pits comes Meekin in the 78 McLaren. That means that Tom Leban will take over. There is Joel Mesh back at the helm of the number 11 car. There's Meekin. Hosts the... Elite McLaren in. Leban and the Elite crew burst into action. Zach now helping Tom with the belts, getting him all ready to go. And based on Tom Leban's pace in the earlier GT4 Wind Series race, I suspect. There's good cause for optimism down at Elite, but they've got this man to go up against, Jamie Day. Where will Jamie be relative to Zach Meekin? That's going to be the big story here. What will the gap be, if anything, between Meekin and Jamie Day? Meekin waits in the pits for the good to go. And the car is released out onto the circuit. Where is the number 19, it comes around the final corner now. I think that Mikey Port, uh, I think that Tom Levin is gonna come out ahead. He does come out ahead, but it's not gonna be by a great margin. Jamie Day uh, is gonna be right there on his tail, but Elite McLaren have retaken the lead through the pit stop cycle. They were behind, they're now back to the front, but Jamie Day has temperature in the tires. Jamie Day has the momentum and he's right on the back of Tom Levin. This is the battle for the lead then, and it is extremely close. Levin with the high ground, he's done the important thing. He's got out ahead of Jamie Day and he's not let Jamie through while the tires were at their coldest on that McLaren. But now the work begins. Jamie Day dives to the inside. What's happened with that move for second place? They were side by side. It's Jamie Day into the race lead. Jamie Day has taken what will be the race lead, currently second on our timing screen, but that's because we've got one car yet to pit. It is Jamie Day who has moved into the lead of the race there, dove to the inside. Whether or not they uh, collided at the apex or not, I'm, sure, I'm not sure, but uh, Tom Leban has had to concede to Jamie Day. We saw the two CV Performance Group Mercedes there side by side as well, and I think that uh, Alex Connor has lost out to Emil Yerdrum. Yes, he has, but now Zach Meekin is going to try, uh, sorry, Tom Leban is going to try and get back around Jamie Day. Levin, if he gets a good run through the final corner. By the end of the straight, the more sleek McLaren may have a couple of kilometers of an hour extra over the 19. Jamie Day goes to the inside, Levin to the outside. You see Levin fighting the wheel there in his distinctive white gloves and Brilliant scrap between the two parties as they go through turn three. 0.15 of a second between Day and Leban. That was at the line. It's been a little bit closer at times through the first sector. We have got what I think is going to be a titanic scrap here between Jamie Day and Tom Leban. Leban looked so dialed into the car this morning in the sprint race. But if anybody is going to best what we saw from Leban 
earlier on, it would be Jamie Day in the Facetti Aston. Both of their cohorts, Porter and Meekin, did great jobs in the first stint to get them into this position. And now the fighting begins. Got an interesting battle developing for third as well between Joel Mesh and Ivan Echelschik, who of course is racing within the pro class for the first time. Having previously entered a, a pro-am car with Vimmer Verk. So even if this battle does cool down, and it doesn't look like it will do imminently. There's also the battle for third to watch as well. They're about equidistant, as uh, in fact, I can tell you. But it's Jamie Day who will come out of the final corner. With just a few tenths over Tom Levin. I think a few tenths might be overstating it somewhat. As we look back to the second place battle, sorry, the first place battle in Pro-Am, where Josef Knopp is going to make short work there of Jaeger Kishin. The inside has a look, does Tom Levin. Jamie Day can't uh, allow him the inside line, does not allow him the inside line. Around the outside goes the 78 of Levin. He's trying to find any which way he can to get through. Yerdrum and Connor continue to fight as well, not for class position, but for team honours. And Josef Knopp did get past Jaeger Hishin as well to take the Pro-Am class lead. So Josef Knopp has gotten past the Pro-Am lead. We got a brief look at them through turn 10. The top two. Head out into seven and eight. Up the hill they go once more. Both of them fairly bold with their use of the sausage curb. You sort of have to be to be quick, but it's a fine line. And while Leban certainly has the pace to match Jamie Day, I think the question mark is, will he have the pace to past Jamie Day, do both of them have the tyres to continue this battle for the next 24 minutes as well? That's an equally pressing question. The 94 team uh, Sir Gren Sport car was briefly on screen there. That's a way further back in 14th, third in the AM class. The leaders come together pretty much as one. Still less than two tenths separate them as they come across the line. Jamie Day still having to defend every inch of the way towards the end of that straight, knowing that if Levin gets the inside, he could lose the lead. Levin has the outside at turn two, but that's the inside for turn three. Wheel to wheel, fender to fender. Who will come out of turn three in the lead? It will more than likely be the elite McLaren. It had the high ground, but no. Jamie Day found the inside line somehow, coming out of turn three, and he does continue to lead this race. But I'm very surprised he found his way back to the inside. Jamie Day doing a fabulous job here, cutting back across to the inside to make sure Levin couldn't make a dive on him. But he's compromised his run there through the exit of turn five. If Meek, if Levin can hold on through seven, he could maybe convert the inside for eight, but he couldn't quite do it there. Great racing between both of these drivers. This is the grandstand finish that the GT4 Winter Series season deserves. We have had some of the best racing of the year in Winter Series from this category. And what a way to go out with two of the hottest shoes. And there are many very warm shoes in this championship. Jamie Day and Tom Levin going head to head. Aston versus McLaren, front engine versus mid engine. Elite versus Forsetti. And it's the Forsetti car, the number 19, that currently sits at the top. 
but Tom Levin once again gets a good run out of the final corner. Jamie Day once again has to be on his toes defending as they come across the line. It's clear to my eye that Levin is the quicker of the two out there, but Jamie is just about able to fight back every time. Even when Levin has got a nose ahead, he's cut that nose off, put it in his pocket and said, not this time, Sunshine. There goes uh, Enrico Ferdera past Dennis Byrne. So that's further back between the Am and Cayman Trophy cars, respectively. Where are Day and Levin, though? They'll be coming through shot in just a couple of seconds. There they are. Lap traffic could be a factor then before the end of this, too. They're only about a dozen seconds or so back from the likes of Byrne and Ferdera, although Ferdera. Uh, very, very fast indeed. May not be caught by these two. Mesh and Eccleschick are also having a great battle for third place, which Joao Mesh is just about controlling for the time being. But Jamie Day is having to do the harder work right now. Mesh is having to just make sure he stays out of the firing line. Jamie Day is in the firing line and hasn't stopped being a target since he got in the car. Drifts wide there at turn 10. It gets a nice run out of the corner as a result. And Ivan Ekelschik has gotten past Joel Mesh at the second timing loop. Yes, Ekelschik has gotten past the uh, number 11 Schnitzelown car as we see Max Huber under pressure from uh, two of the Mercedes. So Emil Yerdrum, Alex Connor behind the number 10 car by the looks of it. Here comes Levin to the outside at turn one once again. And still Jamie Day holds it off. I was just trying to work out exactly who the cast of characters were in that battle we cut to briefly. It's Alex Connor and Emil Yerdrum fighting Max Huber. So this is for seventh overall. It's not for class positions, but we do see Emil Yerdrum get through. Alex Connor will more than likely follow. Uh, Max won't worry about that. He will worry about his uh, team boss, Neil Montserrat, though. He will be coming for the ad lead. And oh, no, keep it in the throttle, Max. Nicely done. Max Huber losing time there. Jaeger Heeshin goes past as well, and Nil Montserrat just a few seconds down the road in the AM class battle. Our leaders will just be approaching turn nine now, and they are still in the same order. It is still Jamie Day from Tom Levin, but it's a battle that I don't see letting up before the end of this, shy of drama. Levin a bit deeper there into turn 10, carries the speed better through the corner as well. I just think that McLaren looks a bit more poised in the current situation. Whether Jamie has slightly less tyre to work with, whether the McLaren just has the edge around this circuit, which Joel Mesh certainly seems to think it does. Remains to be seen. But Jamie Day and Tom Levin are having a wonderful scrap. And that was a notably better run through the final corner for Levin, to my eye. Can Levin finally find his way to the inside or play his chess move one way or the other to get ahead of Day? Day once again covers the inside. Levin once again having to fight the car under braking. Trying to stay out of the ABS where he can. Getting it stopped with your own control is usually better than the ABS taking over. Jaeger Heesch in there, under pressure from Max Huber. But of course, Huber in AM, Heesch in Pro-AM. So only a battle for ninth overall rather than a battle for uh, any class positions. Huber lost out to Heesch in with his off-track moments and Looks like he wants to try and get back through. Ivan Ekelschik and Joel Mesh, of course, the sister Vimavert Motorsport car, the number 22. They're still in that battle for third place also. Jamie Day is now coming up on traffic as we anticipated. 
flashing the headlights there uh, up against the Sir Gren Sport Machine of Dennis Byrne. Headlights flashing. As Day and Leban continue this really wonderful scrap that we're seeing for the final race victory of the GT4 Winter Series for SETI Motorsport came into today knowing they'd sewn up the overall and the team's championship. And what's Levin doing? Tom Levin. I mean, that was all four wheels over the circuit, no? That was very, very interesting as a way of getting by. We had a rolling roadblock there in the form of Dennis Byrne. And that certainly looked like an interesting move there from Tom Levin. Jamie Day then now has to do all the fighting again. Now, not only has Levin gotten through, but Jamie Day has lost a car length or two. And is that the difference maker? Does this now mean that Jamie Day is too far back to try and fire back? I don't know. Again, I had the suspicion that the McLaren looked faster. It was just that Jamie Day was defending well. I guess now we get to find out. We're going to take a, a look back, I believe, at that move for the lead just to see uh, how far off track it was. It was certainly a very tight run through turn 13. Yeah, that was all four wheels off the track comfortably there from Leban. Now, all four wheels off track to the outside is one thing. All four wheels off track to the inside feels like another. That's just my analysis. Whether or not it's investigated or looked into at all is uh, in the power of smarter and more credentialed people than myself. But uh, Tom Leban is your leader. That's the... That's the thick of it at the moment. And you saw Jamie Day leaving those big black lines coming through turn 10. He's clearly pushing on to try and chase Tom Levin, but Levin does look like he has the pace advantage now. We'll see how this battle continues. If Jamie Day can rope in Levin, but the gap is out to almost a second. And that's about as big as it's been at any point since the pit window. Levin still really having to fight to get that car stopped into the first corner. That time, I think, went a bit deep into the turn. Looks to me like the AM class lead is under contest coming through turn 12 now. And Nil Montserrat, I think, has gotten through into the AM class lead. The Vimavert Porsche, the orange and white machine, followed by the 2NM Racing Mercedes, just coming up to turn 13 now. Jaegor Kishin is a pro AM class car, of course. And Nil Montserrat has gotten past Max Huber and now gets past Kishin as well. So while Max Huber has been trying to get past Jaegor Kishin, Nil Montserrat has sidled up to the back of, he, of him and Heeshin and got past both. However, look at that Porsche again. Draws alongside at the end of the main straight. Mercedes just about holds on for now. And while this battle continues on, there is an investigation overtake outside the track under investigation, car 78. So Tom Leban is being looked into for that moment that we saw there at turn 13. The 24 car of Heeshin there with the high ground over Max Huber, however, Huber will now be more frustrated than ever because his team boss, his AM class adversary, is up the road and driving away. And this pesky pro AM Porsche, I like alliteration, is getting in his way. That battle is for 10th overall as well now that Nil Montserrat has gone past them. Mm -hmm. 
to the inside goes Max Huber. I said he was getting frustrated, and that was a very frustrated lunge, and it didn't quite work for him. It didn't sound like there was any contact, but um, Yegor Hishin played his cards right there, stays ahead of Max Huber as Huber battles away at the wheel of the Mercedes AMG GT4. Gets a better run there through turn 13. Surely not going for it at 14. That's ambitious. Uh, both parties survived that. Oh, and the Aston is back ahead. Jamie Day has gone back through. Now, I think Tom Leban may have given that up with some level of intent because he was 1.2 seconds ahead at the start of the lap. And now, with the previous overtake under investigation, Tom Levin has effectively reset the record. He has allowed Jamie Day through and now has to do it again. I think that might have been a strategy call there from Elite Motorsport to say, look, we don't want to lose this in the stewards room. Let him through, do it again. Keep the car within the track limits. And we once again resume then with this battle Jamie Day once again in the defensive position that he seems to be so good at. If he was playing football, he'd certainly be a right back because he's got defensive qualities and he's got pace. And can he use that to preserve the lead that he's now regained over the next 10 minutes and 15 seconds? Leban to the outside. He'll be frustrated, but I think he will know deep down what he did as Jamie Day defends every which way he can up against Tom Leban. We've seen historic and brilliant battles here before in the GT Wind Series with GT3 cars. And now that the GT4s are separate, we get to spotlight their battles. And they are as exciting as always. Jamie Day versus Tom Leban at the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia, and Jamie Day is defending with purpose, but wide there into turns, uh, turn five he went. Levin didn't quite capitalize, he's flashing the headlights. You can see in the, the uh, screen there, you can see the yellow and black McLaren getting closer and closer to the rear of Jamie Day. That McLaren is uh, getting its uh, time on camera regardless with how close it is behind Mikey and uh, behind Jamie Day. Jamie doesn't have to look in the rear view mirror. He's got it in picture there. He knows just how close Tom Leban is. What a great view we have here from on board. The number 19 for SETI Motorsport team. No further action in the investigation into the previous move for the lead from Tom Levin after Levin allowed Jamie Day through. So that has been nullified by Elite Motorsport telling Levin's part let him back through. At least that's what I assume happened. Tom Levin appearing closer and closer and closer once again in the screen. As they head towards turn one, once again, Jamie Day putting the car exactly where he needs to. But look at the apex speed from Levin. You can see every detail of the car on the uh, Facetti dashboard. Later on the power, I think, as well as Jamie Day as they approach turn four. And again, Levin seemingly with the quicker car. But getting the overtake done and done right has proven to be a very difficult task to this point. Oh, and a big defending again from Jamie. He always does that seemingly at turn five, just jinx to the inside at the last minute. Make sure that both the inside and the outside are both basically covered. The rest of your order, Ivan Ekelchik in third, Joel Mesh in fourth. They're about a second apart now. Ekelchik building that lead for third place. Luke Ibanez in fifth in the Pro Class NM Racing Team car, rounding out your top five ahead of Pro Am leader Josef Knopp for WNS Motorsport. But it's Jamie Day and Tom Levin who have been playing chess at 200 kilometers an hour for the last 20 minutes or so of this race. And it has been a joy to watch. Mikey Porter, his father, J 
Joe Holloway. And the rest of the Vassetti Mode Sport team will be watching on and willing Jamie Day for that last bit of success, that last sip from the Chalice of Glory. But Tom Levin fancies a free drink of his own. Looks the outside once again at turn one. Just trying to square off that corner entry at turn one. And this time it's worked. He's on the inside at turn two. Jamie Day has the inside for three. But Levin has the better position to try and get the apex of turn three nailed to then get a run through turn four. Where is the McLaren? It's still behind Jamie Day as they run towards turn four. This is epic racing. This is wheel-to-wheel -wheel stuff. This is GT4 Winter Series at its finest. Respectful, exciting racing between two talented youngsters. And Jamie Day is doing just about everything right, but I'm sure he's now really starting to struggle with rear traction. We've seen a couple of wobbles. We've also seen some debris down at turn 10 on that uh, cut a minute ago. But that shouldn't be a significant enough piece of debris to cause any issues. Day and Levin separated by half a second. There's the debris. I don't think that's a big enough chunk to uh, necessitate a pause at all. Eccleschick and Mesh separated by one and a half seconds in the battle for third place. That battle's been fairly anonymous in terms of the broadcast because, I mean, look. Look at this battle for the lead. How could we look away? Tom Levin has made this one unmissable so far. The second half of this race has been a thing of beauty and joy for anyone who likes GT racing. And every single time we see this, Levin quick out of the final corner, clearly carrying a little bit more apex speed than the Aston. But Jamie Day with the high ground, with the elbows out, says absolutely not, through I go. I will hold on. However, to the outside that time goes Jamie Day. He's changed his strategy. He's gone deep into the corner, slow apex at turn two. I think they will just about hold on, though. Jamie Day will just about hold on to that position. Actually got a better run through turn three as a result of that uh, alternative strategy. Four minutes left in this race. The clock is ticking away. I think two more laps after this one for Jamie Day to withstand the pressure of Tom Levin. These two are starting to hold each other up. Ivan Ekelschik is actually closing on them. Not that it will have any impact on the battle. But they're certainly more preoccupied with each other than lap time. Up the hill once again towards turn nine. And then through turn nine, as you exit the corner, you also crest a hill. And that can sometimes catch people out on power application. But these two, Day and Leban, well rehearsed. Of course, lots of track time in the GT4 wind series as well. They know this track at this point like the back of their hands. You see there Leban fighting with the wheel, hoping to find a little bit more grip in those Pirellis on the front axle. Now 57 minutes old. Less than three minutes left to go, and we will begin at the penultimate lap this time by. So it's two to go. Two laps of the GT4 Winter Series season left. And if you're just joining us for the first time, pull up a chair and watch, because this is what this series has provided us all year long. Great battling. Heart in the mouth stuff and more than a couple of very close finishes, and we're going to get yet another one of those in this race, I have no doubt. The question is, will it be the 19 or the 78 that comes across the line first? For now, Jamie Day is the one on top, but Leban has shown that he has the superior pace when he got past and started building a gap. However, with an investigation looming over the way he got through. Going all four wheels off track on the inside of turn 13. He decided to allow 
Jamie back through as Max Huber again goes rally crossing. Jaeger Kieschen not allowing Max Huber past no matter what. That now allows Arne Hofmeister to get to the inside. Hofmeister running second in the Cayman Trophy class. The leading Cayman Trophy car is only a few seconds ahead as well. Tim Neuser. I don't think Neuser is going to lose out to Hofmeister in the remaining three minutes. But Jaeger Kieschen under increasing pressure from both. Uh, Arne Hofmeister and Max Huber. Your top two are coming through the last couple of turns now. No changes there. As we watch Max Huber across the curb there at turn two. Arne Hofmeister to the inside of Jaeger Kieschen. That could be the move made then on Kieschen by Arne Hofmeister. And Max Huber will, thinking, will be thinking, why is it so easy for you? I've been trying to overtake that orange and white thing for the last 20 minutes i can't do it you've gone past me and then gone straight past him as well max huber will be frustrated tom leban also maybe getting a little bit frustrated as well trying every which way to get through and he's got less than a lap to do it now this will be the final lap of the race the final lap of the season the final p1 trophy hangs in the balance as Jamie Day fights the wheel coming out of turn three, trying to get that power down as early as possible. 20 minutes ago, he was laying 11s down at turn 10. He's been taking life out of those tyres just to try and reach the flag first, do everything he can to match Leban. Goes defensive again into turn five. Can Leban pull out a trick in the last few corners? Realistically, two more braking zones of significance, two more overtaking opportunities. This is one of them. Turn seven. If he gets a good run out of here, he could maybe do something at eight or nine. And then it's turn 10. And frankly, from turn 10, it's difficult to see a way through. 11, uh, 12, 14, 13, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, all fairly quick corners. And Levin is not close enough at turn 10. That is 10 that we go through now. Then the long sweeper becoming turn 11, turn 12. And realistically, very little braking left to do. Very few opportunities left for Leban. Can he find a way by at the very last corner? He tries to get a good run again. He's all over the outside of the corner. And he dives. He dives for it at the final turn. Tom Leban gets through into the race lead. And he will cross the line first. The checkered flag flies. And Tom Leban crosses the line first. He wins the final race of the GT4 Winter Series season ahead of Jamie Day. Ivan Ekelchik takes third. Joel Mesh taking fourth place. And Luke Ibanez will round out the top five overall and in the pro class. Leban pulled a similar line to what he did earlier on in the race, albeit this time he didn't do the overtake while off the track. And that might be enough of a differentiator Oh, we'll have to see what happens with that one. Josef Knopp crosses the line to win in the Pro-Am class. Emil Yerdrum crosses the line in seventh. Alex Connor in eighth place, making it uh, a photo for CV performance as they cross the line. Neil Montserrat is going to take the final Am win of the year. Here he comes across the line in ninth place. Tim Neuser should just about hold on to the Cayman Trophy win. Yes, he will, although Arne Hofmeister has been closing in very quickly. Here they come now through the final corner. And Neuser just ahead of Hofmeister. That gap was three seconds a couple of laps ago. It was down to just over one second by the flag. And Max Huber did eventually get himself past Jaeger Hieschen, also taking second in the AM class on his way there. I think he'd be quite relieved, though, to have gotten past the 24 Porsche eventually. Enrico Ferdera, the last car to finish on the lead lap. He will cross the line in 14th. I believe we can have a little look again at the move that sealed the deal for Tom Leban. Again, you'll see as they come through turn 13, cuts to the inside. Now, was he all four wheels off again? I think both of them were to an extent, but Leban absolutely, yes, was. It looked like he was trying to take the uh, chicane layout, bounced across the runoff area, got a good run out of 13 as a result of that, was still, though, behind 
Jamie Day going into the final corner and then made the move at the final corner. So again, I can see the nuances. I can see the differences between him going past Jamie off the track and then rejoining and cutting the corner kind of along with Jamie uh, into the last turn. But that's certainly something that's going to get discussed. I can't imagine that's not going to have any conversation attached to it. But Tom Leban crossed the line first. He will be pulling up to the top step of the podium. And provisionally, at least, Leban and Meakin will claim the final endurance race victory. He got a third warning for track limits, I think because of that move. And that might be the extent of it. We'll see. Levin and Meekin embrace a race victory. And uh, to Zach Meekin explaining his experience over the course of the last uh, few minutes to his teammate Tom Levin. And uh, exchanging information as. Uh, Charles Dawson congratulates them as well. Well, well, what a race that was. Great fighting. And certainly both drivers, Leban and Jamie Day, were fully committed to that scrap. Tom Leban had to do it once, then twice taking a similar line through turn 13 on each occasion, but on that second run through, on that second time, he didn't pass strictly off the circuit. So you couldn't tell him off for the same thing because it was a different circumstance. Will he get a telling off at all? That's a different question, and that's not one I'm qualified to answer. What a race, though. What a battle between Leban and Day. I will share this because I don't think you'll mind me sharing this. Damien Smith, who is uh, the reporter here on behalf of Motorsport Network uh, at these events, he has been around motor racing paddocks for many, many moons indeed. And he said, that was one of the best races I've seen. Epic. And I think I can echo those statements as well, as will Izzy Browning. Let's hear what Tom Leban thought of all that. He's getting ready to talk to Izzy down there. My gosh, I'm a little bit speechless after that, I have to say. What a race. I am down with our race winners, Tom Levin and Zach Meakin. Tom, oh my God, that was the lap of your life, really, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of lost hope of it because he started to pull a gap as the tyres fell away. Um, but I thought I got one opportunity, so I might as well go for it. And it worked, so... Um, yeah, good to, good to win in the end. Overtook him once, then gave it back because it was a bit questionable. But, yeah, good to, good to come across the line first. Yeah, nice way to end the weekend, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Like, it's the best place you can finish, so I can't really complain, to be honest. And, Zach, how were your nerves uh, watching the end of that race? Well, I was shaking like a wet dog to begin with. Um, at the end, I thought they won it, turned around and all of a sudden I heard shouts and everything and looked around and Tom went past first, so I was ecstatic with that, so it was all good. And we do believe that uh, Schnitzlam managed to uh, take P2 in the championship, but still a valiant effort from you two. And, I mean, it's been an absolutely fantastic season, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been, it's been a good season. Shame we couldn't get the uh, second in championship, but everything happens as it should, so all good. P1. <laughs> and are we going to see you two uh, back again together very soon? Uh, it depends what his dad writes in the email. <laughs> Everyone at Elite will get that. Um, I don't know, we'll see. We're good teammates, aren't we? He's mega. Yeah. Hi. There we go. You're pretty average. Oh, oh, he's pretty average. There's the inside scoop, I guess. There's our, uh, there's our winners. They're going to head off up to the podium and we'll go back to Adam. Thank you very much. Well, well, Tom Levin, Zach Meakin with the race win. Replays of that one. How are we going to condense that down? Let's find out. Let's take a look at the race that was the GT4 Winter Series decider. And it was... Jamie Day and Mikey Porter with the pole. Mikey Porter, of course, starting the race. He would head the way 
In fact, they weren't on pole, of course. They were second, but Zach Meekin had an appalling start, had to drop down to fourth place early on, got back to third fairly quickly at the expense of Raphael Renhofer. Some great fighting further back as well as uh, Max Krumberg tried to find his way past Max Huber, who was never not in a fight over the course of the last uh, hour or so of his life. Some great scraps among the pro-ams, the ams, the Cayman Trophy competitors, as always. While the pro-class fight for the final win of the season definitely took the limelight. Battles like this between Kronberg and Huber were also absolutely brilliant to watch. And Kronberg really did have to fight hard to get himself past. Charles Dawson, Jaegel Hieschen, and Alex Connor having a good scrap there further back as well as Zach Meekin made it past Marcel Martrovic just before the pit window. Martrovic would hand over to Joel Mesh, of course. And Mesh, unfortunately, not able to claim a podium in his last race of the season, along with Martrovic. Some great battles, though, further back as uh, Kronberg finally got it done around the outside of uh, Max Huber. Really enjoyed that scrap. An onboard camera in both of them as well was great to uh, see from both of the POV angles. Around the outside went Jaeger Hieschen as he got himself ahead of Max Huber. That would be a battle that then lasted for the rest of the race. And then this became quite a big story as well. Uh, Zach Meek, uh, Tom Leban and Jamie Day. Jamie Day got himself past Tom Leban. Leban was just coming out of the pits when Jamie Day struck. And then once Day was ahead, it became a real epic one of the best races I've seen. One of the best races a few of our media team have seen. A fabulous scrap. Leban trying to find any way he could to get through. He managed it here at turn three, leaning on Jamie. But Jamie Day then managed to get back to the inside on the approach to turn four and held on for a little bit longer. Max Huber just about held on to the Mercedes for NM Racing Team. Lesser drivers could have lost that and hit the wall. But then this was the first point of controversy. Tom Leban bouncing across the inside of turn 13, cuts the corner and uh, gets through off the track. Uh, Jamie Day would eventually get let back through and would resume his race lead in the interim time between gaining or between Leban getting past and then giving the position back. We saw he was quicker, and so he then had the high ground and the confidence to try and continue fighting Jamie Day as Jaeger Hieschen leaned on Max Huber as their fight continued. Last time through the final corner, both drivers cutting the corner to an extent, but Leban getting a very, very good run by uh, launching it across the inside of turn 13. He was on the inside by turn 14 and led the way across the line to claim the final GT4 Winter Series win of 2024. A great scrap. One that I think we're going to remember for a long time. One that was going to be in many highlight reels to come. Leban wins by 0.3 of a second from Jamie Day. Ivan Ekelschik takes third. Fourth place, Joel Mesh. Luke Ibanez takes fifth. Josef Not wins Pro-Am from sixth overall ahead of Emil Yerdrum. Alex Connors, 84 car, taking eighth place. Neil Montserrat and Alberto Di Martin claim the final AM win of the year. Tim Neuser taking 10th place and second within Cayman Trophy. Arne Hofmeister taking 11th place along with Franz Linden. Huber 12th, Hieschen, Ferderer and Dennis Bunn rounding out our order in the final GT4 Winter Series race of the year. Incidentally, we spoke a bit at the start of the race about what would happen in the battle for second in the standings. Schnitzlam Racing effectively needed to not score in order for the championship to go, uh, the second in the championship to go to Elite Motorsport. And with a fourth place finish, Joel Mesh and Schnitzlam Racing have secured second place uh, in their respective championships. Of course, Marcel Martrovic wasn't with us in Estoril, so isn't second along with uh, Joel Mesh in the team's championship, or in the driver's championship, I should say. But Schnitzelaum have secured second in the team's title ahead of Elite Motorsport. Elite Motorsport, though, with 
a real, real high at the end of the season. Leban and Meekin taking the win in that race and uh, a really fabulous scrap between Day and Porter. I don't know what more I can say about that other than I think it's worth another watch <laughs> at the end of the broadcast. What a day that was and what a race that was between those two. And of course, we've still got a championship to decide next up in FWS as well. Um, quite how the next two races are going to top that, it remains to be seen. But uh, what an incredible display between those two sets of drivers. You can see discussions going on down in the uh, driver green room at the moment and uh, we'll no doubt see them onto the podium soon but of course we will see I believe a championship podium also here for SETI Schnitzlaum Elite your top three teams in the overall GT4 winter series and uh, there is a prize pot as well going to uh, the top three teams as well which I'm sure provided added incentive uh, to all of our parties. A uh, uh, 60,000 euros worth of prize money total, 30,000 for the championship winner. I believe that was in the, uh, the well, for the winning car, so the winning number. So in this case, number 19 for SETI, Aston Martin. 20,000 euros for the second uh, entry. That is, of course, the uh, Schnitzlaum Racing Mercedes AMG GT4 number 11 and then 10,000 to third that of course being the 78 elite McLaren so they will all walk away with prize money as well at the end of this not a bad day at the office for our three parties in the championship great to welcome the GT4 winter series in for this year when we announced that move to have uh, both the GT4s separate from the uh, from the rest of the GTs. Uh, it was one that excited me because I knew we'd be able to focus more on the great battles we had been seeing in the GT4 class of GT Winter Series. And now they have their own standalone championship and it's a bit of a show stealer. believe that uh, in the next few moments we will hand down to the podium we're just waiting uh, to make sure that everybody is present correct ready to go and then we will start to run through our podiums of course there will be a few of them uh, as always in the GT4 winter series it certainly look like uh, we're getting ready to go down there and uh, it will be quite the festivity uh, once we do head on. So then we will, of course, celebrate the race. And we will also celebrate the championship, uh, I believe, as well. And uh, these GT4 teams will, I think, in quite a few cases, be back in Barcelona during the season, be their primary summer campaign in the uh, Iberian Supercars or in the GT4 European Cup for Facetti Motorsport. I don't think they'll be here until they come back next year. And I have been reliably informed. Joe Holloway is, uh, has been saying he'll be back next year. And that's, uh, that's really exciting to hear. Uh, the Facetti team have been very good to watch. OK, I understand that we are ready to hand down now to Andy McEwen. So let's dash on with the podiums. Well, here we go then, our final podium of the season for the GT4 Winter Series. Once again, we will do a podium for the race result, followed by our championship trophy presentation. So let's get through this as quickly as we can, starting with our top three drivers from the pro class in that final race of the season. In third place, Ivan Ekelschik and Raphael Renhofer. Onto the podium they will go. In second place in the pro class, Mikey Porter and Jamie Day. Congratulations, guys, but after that last gasp effort to snatch the lead, the race victory goes to Elite Motorsports' Tom Leban and Zach Meekin. 
On to the podium we go, our top three drivers then in the uh, Pro Class Championship. The trophies are very quickly making their way uh, to the drivers. Handshakes all round. And uh, what a race that was, going right down to the wire, right down uh, to the last couple of corners of the final lap. And it kept us guessing all the way. Fantastic stuff. So photos being taken on the top step after which the drivers will have the chance to let loose with the bubbly if they wish to, and I think they probably will be. I'm getting nowhere near them whilst the champagne is still in play. Photos taken, bottles raised, and for at least a couple of drivers, they're saving them for later, don't blame them, but the rest of them will celebrate with the champagne after a long, hard winter season. <laughs> and even when I think I'm far enough away, I'm still in the splash zone, it turns out. Um, congratulations to our pro class drivers, our top three from that final race of the season. So, once the podium is ready, we'll move on to the second class then, the uh, Pro-Am category. And uh, again, six more drivers to be brought onto the podium. And we will begin with the third place uh, Pro-Am pairing uh, from Vimmerwerk. It is Igor Kishin and Nick Malloy. Out onto the podium, they will go. Uh, second place in the Pro-Am class, Charles Dawson and Abel Yerdrum. But the race victory in the Pro-Am class goes the way of WNS Motorsports, Josef Knob and Max Kronberg. Trophies make their way out to the top three drivers. Terrific effort from uh, all of them within the Pro-Am class and uh, several of them uh, up there inside the top five or six in the overall running order too. In the background, the Formula Winter Series cars heading out onto the circuit, but we'll stick with the podiums for the time being, let them all enjoy their moment of celebration as uh, they gather together on the top step of the podium. And there is a crowd of not only team members, but photographers downstairs as well that the drivers have to be aware of. They will take their drinks uh, to enjoy later on in the paddock party that I'm sure is going to be taking place uh, after, as I said, what's been a hugely successful winter series for the Gedlick Racing team. So two more class podiums to go through from that final race of the season. Next up, uh, we will have our top three teams from the AM class in that race. We'll start once again with the third place AM finisher, Dennis Bowen, who once again sprints out onto the podium full of energy is Dennis. Hopefully the same energy we will see now from our second place finisher, Max Huber. But the AM class victory, once again, it was a 1-2 finish for NM Racing. The victory this time goes to Neil Montserrat and Alberto de Martin. The all-Spanish pairing atop the podium in Spain and their final round of the championship. Up onto the top step go Alberto and Neil. Very solid finish to the season for NM Racing. They've been dominating in that uh, AM class really all weekend long and continue that into the final race of the season. It's always fascinating to see some of these AM drivers throughout the course of a season getting stronger, getting more competitive uh, in the overall running order. And we saw that even over the course of the three races, sort of, this weekend. So, photos taken, they will head backstage. Some of them we'll see back out again in a moment or two, but we now finally move on to the Cayman Trophy class in our GT4 Winter Series race. And uh, the Cayman Trophy cars, not necessarily right at the front of the field, uh, but having their own very entertaining battles nonetheless. We've got six drivers from three teams uh, to move up onto the podium. In fact, six drivers from two teams, really, because we will have both of the SR Motorsports pairings, including the third place team, Enrico Forera and Billy Kuhn. In second place in the Cayman Trophy, Speedworks Automations, Arne Hofmeister and Franz Linden. But as I said, it was another solid performance for SR Motorsport. They have the race-winning team as well. And the drivers are Tim Neusser and Michael Sander. 
and they look very happy with themselves. Nice to see they're getting as big a cheer uh, from the crowd down below as our overall winners did. So on top of the podium will go our class winners. Trophies head out as well. And a huge congratulations to all of the drivers who have made it onto their class podiums here this afternoon. So once these photos have been taken, we'll then move on to our championship presentations for uh, this is the final round of the championship as we've been discussing of uh, congestion on the top step of the podium uh, this time around. A very slippery podium it's become now as well after a couple of champagne showers uh, through the uh, day. So a big congratulations. Oh, they're going to spray the champagne. That's my cue to get out of the way. And there goes, oh, impressive uh, cork skills there, flying straight out into the crowd. One or two of them, a little bit slower on the uptake. <laughs> and I think it's now safe to come back outside. So if we can get the drivers backstage, we'll move on then to our championship podiums uh, and crown some champions at the end of the tough winter season. Drivers very keen to swap stories after that race, but uh, we will eventually get the podium cleared. Let's get you all backstage, guys. We'll have some of you back out again in a moment or two, uh, because we will, of course, have representatives who are championship winners who also managed to finish on their class podium in this final race of the season. Right, so I think the way this is going to work is we're going to get all of our champions out onto the podium one by one. They'll all stand there for their pictures and get their trophies at the same time. So we can start, I believe, our championship presentation with the winning team. Uh, hopefully we have Matt George here representing Forsetti Motorsports. Matt needs to fight his way through what feels like the entirety of the grid. There we go. Uh, out onto the podium he goes. Uh, the entirety of the GT4 Winter Series grid are uh, hidden away backstage behind the podium. But uh, Matt makes his way onto the top step as the uh, representative for our winning team for SETI Motorsport. All right, then, now on to the overall Drivers' Champions. We're going to bring the top three teams out. Third place in the GT4 Winter Series Championship, Tom Lebon and Zach Meekin. Once again, they make the familiar trip onto the podium to be joined very shortly by the second place driver, Joel Mesh, <laughs> who moonwalks onto the podium. A man of many skills, as it turns out, but uh, our champions, arguably the most skillful of all, because they came out on top at the end of the season. A cracking campaign it was for Jamie Day and Mikey Porter. Well done, guys. Back onto the top step. They could look happy. I'm not going to lie, I think it's maybe been a long and tiring few weeks and uh, probably looking forward to getting back to their beds tonight. They've had some hard work to do, but it's all worth it when the championship goes your way. So trophies for top three. We will next have our pro class champions. Actually, I think they're going to do this at the same time because the pro class, of course, was won by Jamie Day and Mikey Porter. So they should hopefully have received two trophies, which I think they have. So they will have their photos taken. We don't have any Pro-Am class. Oh, we do. I'll get those in a moment, actually. But next up, it will be, uh, in fact, let's do Pro-Am now. So Pro-Am champions uh, for the GT4 Winter Series uh, was Emil Gerdrum and Charles Dawson. Out they go once again. We're almost there, everyone. I promise. Green flag lap underway uh, for the Formula Winter Series. Uh, but we will very shortly be able to get to the race. Right, Am class champion was Max Huber. Max Huber to the podium as the Am class champion. And I think we have one more driver, hopefully hidden around the corner, our Cayman Trophy champion for the GT4 Winter Series, Michael Sander. And here comes Michael out onto the podium. And we can breathe at last. Right then, our next race coming up very quickly. Green flag already underway. It's the final round of the Formula Winter Series. Okay, great, great. Uh, let's run you through 
the Formula Winter Series season finale. I'll tell you about some of the storylines as we go. The Formula Winter Series pole position, the third and final race, Nathan Tai starting on pole position. He's gonna have a great chance here to try and claim a win. Griffin Peebles taking second, Kabir Anarag third, and Jan Pusharovsky in fourth place. Griffin Peebles, of course, with the advantage in the championship. He could be on his way to the title. Cardenas in fifth, his closest title rival, Dawa Decker in sixth. Row four of the grid, Olivieri and Hideg. Row five, Fry and Gianmarco Pradell looking to avenge his spin earlier. Strauven and Ferreira on row six. 13th and 14th, Reno Francot and Lucas Flucher in 13th and 14th places. Arthur Dorizon and Preston Lambert in 15th and 16th. Lloyd and Rivera, 17th and 18th. 19th and 20th, Fornia and Alazari. He'll have to work from behind once again, as will Jack Beaton. Peter Bazinelos in 22nd. Bora and Castillo, 23rd and 24th. Row 13 of the grid, Enzo Tarnvanichkal and Machai Gwadish. He's going to have some work to do. Maxime Reem, Francisco Macedo, Lenny Reem and Rene Lammers round out the top 30. Finn Harrison and Mikel Pedersen, 31st and 32nd. 33rd and 34th, Fiorentino and Savinkov. Dobzanski and Berebi round out the 36 starters. Juan Cota, uh, unfortunately not here. We did briefly see his name. Unfortunately, Juan is recovering from a broken hand he sustained in Aragon. He'll be back fighting fit soon. So then Griffin Peebles comes into this race with, to my understanding, a 15-point lead uh, over his closest adversary, that, of course, being Andres Cardenas. Race one of the weekend was scrubbed from the history books. We only completed a lap under safety car before a red flag. Not enough for the race to count for anything. So yet yeah, this morning's second race of the weekend, or second scheduled race of the weekend, was a big moment in the championship and Cardenas is now firmly on the back foot. For Griffin Peebles, this one is going to be about survival and just scoring something. And from there, he just has to hope that Andres Cardenas doesn't uh, score maximum points. Cardenas needs to finish second or higher in order to win the championship. If he was third position, they would tie on points, but I believe Griffin Peebles would win it on countback. So second or bust, second or higher or bust for Cardenas. He starts from row three. Griffin Peebles starts from the outside of the front row. Well, the inside of the front row in second place. Nathan Ty is your pole sitter. But another formation lap has just been declared. The cars are rolling out once again. Now, we didn't see exactly why the safety car, or rather why the formation lap has been sent back around again. I suspect somebody was wildly out of position. In fact, somebody is stopped completely. That looks like one of the Technica machines. Uh, that could well be Dobzanski. In fact, Dobzanski would be on the other side of the grid, so I think that's Lorenzo Castillo, actually. Lorenzo Castillo being pushed away by the diligent Circuit de Barcelona Catalonia Marshals. So then that gives us a little bit more time to reflect on the championship. Machai Guadish is fairly comfortable in third in the championship however if Ferreira has a mega race from 11th uh, from 12th on the grid um, he could still uh, fight back but I think it would basically again be top two or bust for Ferreira in order to try and go back to third in the championship and that seems unlikely from his starting position This race, the final 30 minute plus one lap account encounter in the second season of Formula Winter Series. It will be Nathan Tai 
that starts this one from pole, Nathan Tai, who had a poor start from second on the grid earlier on. Be looking to right the wrongs and try and claim an inaugural victory in car racing. The former factory Sodi kart driver, a driver that made huge impact in the world of go karting, is now on his first steps within circuit racing in cars. And he has a great, great opportunity that should not be overlooked. The championship battle. Obviously, the overarching story here. But Nathan Tai has a great opportunity. Kabir Anarag, as well, has had lots of consistency, but not an overwhelming amount of uh, headline grabbing results. From third on the grid, he could yet show out in the very last race of the weekend and the season. Certainly one of his best opportunities of the year. Pusharovsky from fourth as well. You know, a lot of eyes are on that number eight car. Much like Maciej Gwadish, an Orlen backed Polish youngster. Two very good young talents developing here in the Formula Winter Series. So then, the cars are. Lining up on the grid. The final Formula Winter Series race of 2024 begins now. We are racing for 30 minutes plus one lap. 28 minutes plus one lap after the first lap issues. Look at that start from Flavio Olivieri. Olivieri on the outside to the inside is the championship leader. Griffin Peebles on the inside line. Will it be Olivieri that leads? It looked like it might be. Cars scattering across the curbs at turns one and two. I'm hearing that Olivieri may well have had a full start there. He certainly started from quite a way back. He's dropping down as well. Maybe he knows it too, uh, but we didn't quite see it. But we are hearing he may have had a full start. It would certainly make sense as he started quite a way down the order. They head through three, four wide at turn five, and it is Griffin Peebles that leads Nathan Ty, our championship leader. Heads the order. Andres Cardenas is there in fourth place behind Ty, who didn't have great race pace earlier on, it must be said. Oh, and the Yenza Motorsport car bouncing across the curbs there. I think that may have been Dorizel trying to find some room or potentially Enya Fry. I think it might have been Enya actually from 12th place. Gianmarco Pradell in the 12th going past Kabir Anarag. Anarag didn't get the best of starts. He's in fifth, make that sixth now as Jan Marco goes past him. As I alluded to there, just spotted it in the corner of my eye as they went down to the first corner. Uh, they have reduced the distance down to 28 minutes to compensate for that uh, first or for that extra formation lap. Side by side further back there as Ella Lloyd and Lenny Reed go wheel to wheel. Lenny going past Ella there for 23rd place. Ella started within the top 20, but has fallen back early doors. The inside goes Jack Beaton of the two Yenza cars as Andres Cardenas tries to get around Flavio Olivieri as well. Olivieri there in third place, starting procedure under investigation, jump start. Car 35 is the bulletin on the board, so Flavio Olivieri is at least under investigation for a jump start. Oh, and to the inside there goes the driver of the 57, Reno Francot in the GRS car, trying to get past Enya Fry. Tom Vanichkel trying to get past one of the uh, other Yenza cars further back as well. He's been uh, straight lying the first corner on both of the first two laps, I think. He's gone the other side of the bollard as is the protocol. Ella Lloyd, oh no, Maxime Ream that is, getting tagged by Lenny Reed. Reed left the uh, nose in the door, and unfortunately it was slammed shut. Lenny Reed pointing the wrong way. 
He manages to loop the car back around, but uh, hopefully neither car is damaged. Pusherovsky there down to 10th place after a good starting position. He's stuck behind Adam Hideg, the first of the Yenza cars. Hideg, who would love a good result at the end of this race, especially because, lest we forget, he was on pole for the race that never was on, uh, on Saturday. And he will feel he missed a golden opportunity there. Drive-through penalty for Flavio Olivieri. That's been confirmed. Drive-through penalty for Olivieri. And Andres Cardenas will be hoping that penalty is served immediately because he needs to go Peebles hunting. Never mind, he says. I won't wait for the penalty. I've got the inside line through into third place. Again, he's only going to win this championship if he far outscores Griffin Peebles, who leads by 15 in the championship but at least he's on the way up there. I'm joined once again by Andy McEwen in the box. Drama already at the start. Lots of exciting racing as Gianmarco Pradell now makes his way past Flavio Olivieri. And we have a car off. It is uh, the 27 Yenza machine. And um, that is a very frustrated Edouard Borgna into the gravel. And we know what typically happens when a car is stranded in the gravel. I arrived just in the nick of time, I think, didn't I there, Adam? It was just all kicking off, but uh, yeah, that would be a shame if we had to uh, neutralise the race. In a way, well, actually, we are going to neutralise it. The safety car is being scrambled, but what this does, of course, is it bunches the lead group together, and it just uh, it means that Griffin Peebles' advantage at the front of the field is going to disappear. And as we've said, that is really where the tension is in this race as far as a championship point of view. He needs to try and make sure that he's outscoring his title rivals. Right now, he is doing that, but a safety car gives them all an opportunity to get back onto his gearbox. So this could be a really nervy restart for Griffin. He handled all of the restarts that were thrown at him in the earlier race perfectly, but there's some real pressure on his shoulders now. There's a championship on the line, and he can afford no errors. Exactly. Both parties with a lot of pressure on their shoulders. For Cardenas, it's not just a need to score as many points as possible, of course, though. He's kind of got to rely on the lap of the guards. That's always the uh, unfortunate... Uh, factor of being second in a championship battle you've got to rely on first having a worse race than you and right now Griffin Peebles out there at the front in a situation he's well used to safety car restarts with race pace that looked rather unimpeachable in race two that's strong ground to be on. By no means is this a guarantee for Griffin Peebles. We have seen some strange things happen in FWS this year but Peebles definitely is on the high ground and it's going to be quite the challenge for Andres Cardenas, the 15-year-old Peruvian. Moved over to uh, Italy initially for the sake of karting when I think he was 10 years old along with his parents. Now lives in Spain, of course, as he is competing in the Spanish Formula 4 Championship. Still within his first 12 months of racing a car and uh, already facing some very high-pressure situations. And, of course, we talk about it as if he's an anomaly. Griffin Peebles turned 16 last week. <laughs> uh, it is terrifying, isn't it? Oh. The skill that they have at this age, the ability that they have, some of them anyway, to jump into a car at this level uh, and immediately be competitive. What I meant by that, Adam, is that it's not easy to do, and it's only the really exceptional ones who are able to really make a good go of it straight away. So, uh, yeah, always super impressive. And I really do think this is why I say that eyes are on championships like this, because you can tell the special ones, can't you? They are the ones who can jump into this and just immediately have an affinity to it. And, uh, you know, this is the place that the big Formula One teams will be looking for the stars of the future. And, uh, you know, it's such a crowded market. You've got to do something very special to stand out from the crowd. And that's absolutely what we're seeing. And the interesting thing about Formula Four is you see differing stories. Enzo Tarnvanichkel straight in from the World Karting Championship uh, victory in 2022. His first car races coming with us in Motorland and here at the Circuit de Barcelona Catalunya. He's already got the might of Red Bull behind him. He's the Red Bull liveried car you see out there on the circuit. You've got someone like Matthias Ferreira who was an Alpine, Alpine junior last year and now comes in with a point to prove wanting to shop window himself again and uh, Lots of other drivers, if not on the shopping list already, uh, on the books of uh, a few different major motorsport teams, including Formula One teams. Of course, we had the F1 Academy drivers 
uh, with us in previous weeks as well, the likes of Bustamante and Leah Block and Carrie Schreiner. Into Ooh. the pits comes Olivieri. Now, that's quite clever. He does have a drive through for a jump start. I guess no time like the present, but I've seen this backfire before as a strategy. <laughs> yes, well, if nothing else, they may close the end of the pit lane because he's going to get to the end of the pit lane before the safety car queue has gone through. Uh, is that a red light? I think it might well be at the end of pit lane. So hopefully he's paying attention to that and doesn't try and just rejoin the circuit. He probably right now thinks he's pulled an absolute <laughs> masterstroke, but uh, I fear his world is about to come crashing down around him when he realises he can't actually get back out onto the circuit just yet. So uh, he will likely go to stone dead last. Uh, the good news there, as you can see, is that they've more or less completed the recovery of the AKM car of uh, Savinkov Alexander, uh, the Italian uh, who was off in the gravel at turn two. So that car well out of the way and uh, that should mean we're going racing again at the end of this lap with what something like 17 minutes plus a lap to go and obviously the car we saw in the gravel initially was the uh, Yenza car there of Edouard Borgne uh, so it does seem as though two separate or, 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 or two parties within the same incident I'm not sure but either way there was a few gravel extractions to do Flavio Olivieri, who has been really coming on strong in the last couple of meetings, has been flying the flag for Cram a little stronger each weekend. He now, unfortunately, is consigned to the rear of the field. And realistically, when you've got a 36 car grid, he's going to struggle to find his way anywhere near the top 10 before the end of this in the next 18 minutes plus one lap. Gianmarco Pradell, who started on the very fringe of the top 10, is up into fourth position as the first of the US Racing representatives on the order. He, again, has a point to prove, I think, coming out of the disappointment of race number two, ending up in the gravel at the first corner. Um, but, of course, he's going to have a very, very determined Andres Cardenas as his buffer uh, between himself and a podium. Yeah, two good starts today, though, for uh, Pradell, haven't they been? He really rocketed up the order in race two. Uh, did the same again in this third one. So he's obviously very good off the line and on cold tyres and uh, has brought himself some trap position. But yeah, Cardenas, you know, is going to be on his toes here. Needs to try and find a way past Nathan Ty and chase after the race leader if he can. And uh, the restart could be his opportunity to do that. What will Peebles do as well? I seem to recall on the previous restarts, he was accelerating more or less at the same time, just somewhere around the apex of the penultimate corner. I wonder whether he'll now choose to mix that up a little bit. If you keep doing the same thing, you become predictable and the others get a little bit better at second guessing you. So uh, let's see what his strategy is. Of course, Nathan Ty, I don't think has ever found himself in this exact scenario before of being the second in the queue, the one that has to time it well uh, behind Griffin Peebles as well. So big test for him. And of course, dependent on how his res his result is in that, uh, that's going to affect Andres Cardenas too, because if Ty doesn't get the launch, then uh, Cardenas is also going to end up stuck behind him. We've got one more lap under safety car, at least the light's still out as they circulate. We're just looking out of the window. I think you and I are both looking at the same thing, which is how they compact at turn 12. <laughs> just looking at it with a slight side eye, as if to say, no further instance, please. Um, obviously, turn 16 at Aragon was another one for that because they all compact together at the final hairpin. But uh, the drivers keeping themselves at a distance as they drive on around behind the, uh, the safety car. Again, those of you who maybe have come across the Winter Series through last week's viral clip of a Fiat Panda might be a little bit disappointed to see a Nissan GTR at the front of the queue. Uh, but uh, it's, it's something different at every track, isn't it? Griffin Peebles won't care what's ahead of him. He's worried purely about what's behind him and purely about getting some points on the board. If he can win it, fine. If Nathan Ty starts to look a bit leery in his pursuit of victory, I think Griffin is wise enough to know that maybe the win isn't be all and end all on this occasion. You presumably have done the maths on this. How but how easy can Griffin Peebles afford to take this? Is there a position in which he must finish or there or above in order to guarantee that things go his way? Obviously it has to it has to depend on where Cardenas of is, of course. Um, but if Cardenas were to win it he would need to score at least. Uh, well, he would need to score at least ten points. Oh. Uh, but from there, it obviously gets a lot more complicated. Uh, Peebles 
in general, it's going to depend on what Cardenas does. If Cardenas is third or lower, the championship is Griffin's regardless. OK, so a top five, basically, for people more or less guarantees this. So he can afford to let one or two go. The problem is, as we've seen, the further down the order you get shuffled, <laughs> the closer you are to the danger zone, really. That's where a lot of the action has been taking place. There's always the chance that Cardenas might try and, you know, back uh, Griffin up into that sort of trouble as well. So uh, the safest place to be, definitely, uh, out at the front of the field. And that's where Griffin Peebles has found himself all day long, really. Uh, lights are still on for the time being on the Nissan GTR safety car. Now they go out right on Q, heading down in towards turn 10. So restarting coming. And just to quickly say as well, if Peebles does allow people through, if Cardenas finishes second, Peebles would need to be ninth. Okay. So it is quite a small window uh, of opportunity uh, for Andres Cardenas, but there is opportunity there. And let's see what happens as Griffin Peebles gets this race back underway. Will he pull the pin at the same time? Will Nathan Ty have done his homework? Peebles pulls off, and I don't think Nathan quite anticipated that well. There's a car length, maybe two, that's formed between them. Not a bad launch from Peebles, but not the launch that Andres Cardenas would have hoped for from the driver directly ahead of him. Will Cardenas try and find a way by of course campos racing teammates i don't know quite how much that's worth in this situation nathan's got his own career to consider got his own spotlight to try and get himself into cardenas to the inside line oh. though and nathan ty made that look quite easy there uh, i think that might have been uh, a please just make this uh, not as hard as it needs to be or as hard as it could be from the campos pit tom vanichkel again struggling with turn one he goes the other side of the bollard but uh, Andres Cardenas then threw into second place, and that means our championship battle is now the battle for the lead as Matias Ferreira gets his nose cut off there by Gianmarco Pradel, who's lost out there to Kabir Anarag. Well then, what can Andres do? Can he chase down Griffin Peebles? Big dive up the inside, further back from uh, Mateus Ferreira there. It's, oh, and there's contact coming off the corner. Ferreira goes around, crunch into the barriers. Uh, I think he thought he was clear of the car that he'd just overtaken, but wasn't quite merged over onto the racing line. And unfortunately, it is car number 10 that bears the brunt of that off into the barriers. And that is his day done. And he's not that far from the edge of the circuit. And if he's got damaged suspension, it won't be an easy car to push out of the way either. You can see where I'm going with this. Uh, there is, oh, there's another car way off into the gravel up at the top of shot at turn nine. I was distracted by trying to identify the car with whom uh, Ferreira tangled. We'll get to that in a moment. The uh, yellow flags are out. I believe we're about to go safety car again. They're three wide up at the top end of the circuit. Good luck sorting this one out, race control. Yes, um, good luck indeed. I'm not quite sure who that was. It might have been the Yenza car. Well, one of the Yenza cars that went straight across the gravel there coming out of turn nine. Um, Matias Ferreira, with his troubles, means that uh, Machai Gwadish basically can now sit back in his chair and go, OK, I have third in the championship, almost, almost sewn up. Pradell, if Pradell wins, if Pradell or Juan Cota, well, Juan Cota's not here, so Gianmarco Pradell <laughs> wins, uh, this race, then maybe he could be third in the championship, but uh, Machai Gwadish uh, in a fairly strong position now, even though he's quite a long way back for third in the championship. Ella Lloyd has just come into the pits or is now coming into the pits for a front wing change. The cap fingers watch on closely from their garage. Uh, but a new front wing on Ella Lloyd's car. We also had one of the uh, cars from Campos in. Now that was a car further up the order. That was Pischerovsky who was in. So uh, Pischerovsky was into the pit lane as well there. We just saw that at the uh, in the foreground of the shot or in the background of the shot I should say. So two cars in with broken wings and Pischerovsky out of the top ten. Uh, yes, so I suspect Ella Lloyd was the one we saw going through the gravel up at turn nine. I think it was about where she was in the pack. Uh, that that car appeared from and then the other car I think was the one that tangled uh, with Mateus Ferreira potentially so uh, that would probably account for the two broken wings uh, quite frankly could have been a lot worse really uh, because uh, that uh, contact occurred just towards the back end of the top 10 so uh, yeah safety car out once more now as and when we go racing again Adam we will really have a bit of a showdown because Andres Cardenas 
Cardenas knows really this is his championship now, isn't it? The only way he's going to win this is by nailing the restart, going after Griffin Peebles and attack, attack, attack. So I think we could see a fairly feisty restart here. Cardenas did exactly what he needed to do before and now he needs to try and do it again. There is Mateus Ferreira then off the side of the road. I think we can take a look at uh, exactly how he got there, Adam. Yes, so Ferreira side by side with Pusharovsky and indeed almost Pradel as well. As you said, it was Pusharovsky, the other half of that Ferreira just trying to squeeze him. And unfortunately, I think uh, Ferreira rather thought he was further past Pusharovsky than he was. Yeah, connected with that front wing of the number eight car. Ferreira, once that contact was made, had no say in the matter other than to end up in the wall. And that number 10 car is unfortunately retired for the final time in this season. The end to what at times has been a very strong year uh, for Matias Ferreira in the Formula Win Series. Missed out on Motorland Aragon, but still came into this weekend with a shot at third in the championship. Sadly, not to be. No, that is a shame. Bit of a clumsy moment, that wasn't it, really, coming out of the corner. But uh, visibility very limited uh, in these cars. You really can't see anything uh, sort of outside of your peripheral vision. So uh, understandable, I suppose, why these sort of incidents happen, but a bit frustrating nonetheless. Shame that we're now having to sit behind this safety car for at least another lap, uh, but uh, hopefully not too much longer. Cars weaving around then to generate some tyre temperature. Well, they've got the crane attached see the damage there to the the rear suspension in particular it did make frontal contact with the barrier but it's the rear of the car that took the brunt of the impact and it is just a straight up concrete wall there no tires no armco barrier so that would have definitely done a lot of damage but uh, luckily uh, that is a fairly common place to have an accident and so they had the uh, crane there in place uh, ready and uh, waiting so uh, that car almost out of harm's way already Yes, uh, the National Circuit cut through is there, of course, as well, which is a nice bit of tarmac to park uh, emergency vehicles on. So that's uh, always, if you are going to have an area, that's uh, an, an incident. That's the most convenient area to do it here at the <laughs> Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. Griffin B. Peebles continues to lead the way then with seven minutes and 40 seconds left on the clock. Let's quickly run you through. Let's say the top 20. Andres Cardenas is second place. First and second in the championship are first and second on the road, separated by 15 points in the championship in favour of Griffin Peebles. Nathan Ty sits third ahead of Kabir Anarag. Gianmarco Pradel follows him in fifth. The first of the GRS cars is Dawa de Decker in sixth. He'll be looking to match his podium from the Valencia round of the season. Adam Hideg in seventh. Jack Beaton, 8th, Thomas Stralven in ninth, Enya Fry rounding out the top 10 ahead of Keanu Alazari, who started outside the top 20. He's already up in 11th place. Reno Frankot in 12th place. Lucas Fluscher in 13th. Enzo Tarnvenichkel in 14th. Arthur Dorizon in 15th. Ernesto Rivera, P16. Akshay Bora in 17th. Machai Guadish in 18th. Bazinelos and Francisco Macedo, Kiko Macedo, rounding out the overall top 20 as the safety car has been declared in this lap. So the lights are out on the safety car. Griffin Peebles is once again in charge of the situation at the front. Six and a half minutes plus one lap left to go. And Griffin Peebles is in control. He'll be watching through the rear view mirrors, sizing up Andres Cardenas. Cardenas now is in control of his own destiny. He can get this right. He can get this wrong. If he gets it right, he could maybe challenge Peebles down into the first corner. Peebles holds a bit longer than he has previously. He is going for the different strategy. Variety is the spice of life. And acceleration is what racing drivers Ooh. crave. Oh, and contact further back in the pack. That was Stralven into the rear of, uh, I think, Adam Hedeg. And Hedeg is slowing. Hedeg with a problem. That car, if it's not accelerating, is going to be a potential issue for race control. But we've got uh, the 99 car down a front wing. Stralven down a front wing. Peebles leads. Cardenas second. Tie in third place. Hedeg not going forward at all one of the other cars from Yenza locking up did he make contact it looked like he might Ernesto Rivera in strife as well and oh. didn't even make the corner the number 25 car Yenza Motorsports 
uh, with a lot of issues in this one and he's now dug himself into the gravel as well as everybody's fighting for track space there is the askew front wing of Thomas Strauven. He was back up into the top 10, but now he is falling through the order and the safety car, predictably, is out again. Oh dear, uh, last day of school, isn't it? I think that's very much uh, the case today. I was about to say the good news is Adam Hedek's car is in the pit lane. They actually pulled it through a gap ah. in the uh, pit wall. Uh, the problem was that the other car uh, was stuck in the gravel at the same time. So uh, well, as much as I was looking forward to joining you for some racing up here uh, in the final uh, Formula Winter Series race of the season, we haven't really seen a lot since I've been here. So maybe I'll remove my bad luck charm. I'll head back down to the podium and uh, hopefully you'll be able to talk us through a grandstand finish. Let's see what happens. Thank you very much, Andy, for joining me up here uh, for what has been a frenetic Formula Wind Series race to this point. Well, no change. You know the situation with the championship. Peebles is doing enough to win the title. Cardenas needs to do a lot more and hope Card um, Peebles... Uh, well, Cardenas needs to do a lot more. Peebles needs to do a lot less for Griffin to lose the championship. Arthur de Rizon is into the gravel trap. As we saw... We saw Rienza car go very, very deep into turn one. We weren't sure if it would make it to turn one. Well, there was your answer. Into the gravel, tried to get the car going. And once the car dug in at the rear axle, we knew what was coming next. Adam Hidegg's car coming to a halt as Thomas Strauven is in. New front wing for him, of course. We saw that car lose its front wing as the race went back to green for all of about 30 seconds. <laughs> Strauven sadly not going to end this race in the points. Peebles, Cardenas, Ty, Pradell, now your top four. So Anarag has lost out to Pradell once again. Gianmarco managed to work his way up to fourth place. Keanu Alazari and uh, Reno Francot are now both in the top ten. So they're now in a points paying position. Of course, Frankot in his first weekend in the series. Keanu Alazari in his second weekend has claimed wins, but none of his qualifying sessions have worked out brilliantly on uh, this particular weekend. Came into FWS after really putting a spotlight on himself in the F4 UAE Championship battle, ultimately won by Freddie Slater. Peebles. I don't know actually whether he'll be willing the lights off on those safety car or whether he'd just like to drive it home at this point. He did say earlier on in the interview uh, with Izzy, you know, I don't mind doing laps behind the safety car. I think that's probably the official party line right now. But unfortunately for him, he's going to have to do some more laps under green flag because the safety car is in this lap. You see there Thomas Strauven rejoining the field all the way back in 31st after his new front wing. But Peebles and Cardenas once again will try to out one another. Peebles, I think, by and large, isn't terribly bothered by what's going on behind him. He just tries to time it well. Give himself the optimal opportunity of a good run into the final corner above all else. And let's see if Cardenas can anticipate it this time. He goes, Peebles goes, and Cardenas didn't quite uh, anticipate it properly. Loses maybe a car length, maybe two, as they come onto the main straight. And that is the cushion that Peebles needs as they head back out into racing conditions once more. A minute and five seconds plus one lap means that this is the penultimate lap of the race then. The penultimate lap of the season. Enzo Tarnvanichkel trying to go around Reno Frankot for 10th place in the back of shot in the Red Bull liveried car. He may have Reno here. No, nope, he goes straight on at uh, turn one and two once again. But Reno Frankot uh, in the points. Can he stay there? Peebles, Cardenas, they're fairly secure. Not secure, though, is Nathan Ty. He wants that podium, but Gianmarco Pradell may want it a little bit more. Let's find out who does want that third step. 
Bradell to the inside. He really does go for a dive there. And Nathan Tai uh, doesn't try and cut the nose off. I think that would have ended in disaster. So Pradell now in third, but Nathan Tai will try and fight back as they approach turn number seven. Pradell is through. Now a Dedeka past uh, Jack Beaton, I believe, there. So Dedeka has gotten past Beaton, and actually Alazari has followed him as well. So Dedeka up to sixth, Alazari up into seventh. Pradell under pressure from both Nathan Tai and Kabir Anarag. Beaton following Keanu Alazari as he's side by side with Enya Fry. This is for eighth position. Beaton drifts outward there, goes a bit understeery through turn 12, gets onto, oh, onto the gravel and then loses his front wing on the back of the Yenza car, completely loses the front wing and is just going to have to limp it home from there. You can see how much he's struggling with no front downforce. He's going to fall through the pack. Meanwhile, uh, into as another car in the back of shot, one of the cram machines, Fiorentino, also losing his front wing. Everybody scattering around. Lucas Flusha now into the top 10 ahead of Enzo Tarnvinichkel. Machai Gwadish uh, from well down the pack has now moved up into P12 at the expense of Akshay Bora. But it's Griffin Peebles that leads the way at the front of the order. Peebles, who had a 15-point lead coming into this last race, is set to extend that lead out to 22. And in the process, secure himself the 2024 Formula Winter Series title. Keanu Alazari has gotten past Dawa Dedeka for sixth place as we Continue to watch the midfield. But Griffin Peebles is just a few corners away from securing the championship here. Everyone single file through turns nine. Peebles up through turn 12 for the final time. As our race leader. Penultimate corner now. And Griffin Peebles has just one more corner between himself and the line. It is a checkered flag, it is a championship, and it belongs to Griffin Peebles, your Formula Winter Series champion for 2024. He has secured it for MP Motorsport, who also win the team championship. Andres Cardenas second and Pradell taking third place. Everyone else scattering their way across the line too. In the end of term, ends with some very exciting racing in the Formula Winter Series. Peebles, Cardenas and Pradell, your top three. As far as I can see, no major penalties as well through the order. The 35 car got a stop and go penalty, uh, but that car was away down the order. Of course, that was the Cram Racing entry of Flavio Olivieri. I think maybe getting a penalty uh, for trying to serve a penalty under safety car, but that aside, it is going to be celebrations long into the night for MP Motorsport, I'm sure. They have won the Formula Winter Series, the second team to do so, of course, after us racing clinched it with Kasper Stuka last year. And for Griffin Peebles, it's his first championship in car racing. What a performance from Griffin. All season long, he has looked very calculating. Even when he hasn't had the quickest car underneath him, I think back to uh, Jerez uh, race three, where he looked like he was really struggling with the car. He finished ninth in that one, but kept himself out of trouble, scored some points rather than fought for positions that he didn't necessarily need. I've been very impressed by Griffin.
and either of those two young men would have been deserved champions but griffin peebles will finish the season 22 points clear in fact 23 points clear because he also will get a point for fastest lap and he is elated he's usually quite a reserved young man but a championship means a lot and griffin peebles celebrates with the team jen in the back of shot there documenting this moment for the mp team and there you go number one Griffin Peebles has done it. And he will receive plaudits from everyone as he celebrates. Heads off, I think, to go get weighed. But Griffin Peebles celebrating a win, not just in this race, but also in the championship. Funnily enough, the final weekend of the season, Griffin's strongest as well. He won it in commanding fashion, the Winter Series title. Didn't have a great run of it in Motorland Aragon, but of the two races that actually took place, he won both, and he can't get much better than that. Andres Cardenas with a lot of positives to take away from a very strong season, and Gianmarco Pradell, I'm very happy for him as well, managed to get that podium back effectively after losing it uh, with the error in race number two. He will end the season on the podium. Dawid Decker gained a five second penalty for track limits at the end of the race there as well. So his, um, his position will be affected by that. But that aside, I think everyone just about kept within uh, the defined track limits. Hopefully Within the next moment or two, we will hear from the 2024 Formula Wind Series champion. I can see that Griffin has emerged back from the scales. And we'll soon hear from him, uh, along with Izzy Browning down under the podium. Izzy is there and ready to go with Griffin Peebles. Let's hear from the champ. Yes, I am with our Formula Winter Series champion, Griffin Peebles. Congratulations. That must feel good. Yeah, it was tricky again. Last race, we had three safety cars. They were very long. I had to try and do something different on the restarts. But luckily, uh, the team gave me an amazing car. I was quick all weekend in the dry after a bit of a wet start to the weekend. But I'm so happy to bring it home and I can finally relax and celebrate. And you gave me a safety car count this morning, but then that added a few more to the tally, didn't it? Yeah, I, I lost track now, so, but anyway, we had a very good race. Uh, the initial start wasn't that good, but I got tied into the first corner. We were three wide, and from there, I just tried to manage the gap, manage the tires, and try to do good safety car restarts, and it was just amazing. And what a way to seal the championship with, with a win in the final race. We saw you with your parents. Uh, seemed quite emotional. Yeah, it's just good to wrap it all up now and focus now on testing and everything for Spanish F4. Yeah, you're ready to go again soon, I'm sure. So we'll let you thank your uh, your team and your parents one final time. Thank you very much. All right, you head on up to the podium. That's our Formula Winter Series champion, Griffin Peebles, for MP Motorsport. We're going to go back up to Adam, who will give us all the replays with all of those safety cars in that race. There you go, Griffin posing for the pictures in the back of shot. He is the 2024 Formula Winter Series champion, clinching it in a fairly disrupted third race of the weekend. Race got underway after a second formation lap. Distance reduced down to 28 minutes plus one lap. Flavio Olivieri suspiciously high up the order coming over the crest of the hill. He would briefly be fighting for the podium positions up there in second place. However, he would later be found to have jump started and would be moved down the order. Before that could even happen though, Andres Cardenas took to getting past number 35 car fighting his way to try and get through all while Griffin Peebles set off in the lead of the race and of course Cardenas knew that he needed to be up there too Ella Lloyd or rather Maxime Ream and uh, Lenny Reed found each other at turn seven Reed leaving the nose in and Maxime and Lenny both having issues but the far bigger problem would come moments later 
as uh, the 27 car ended up in the gravel, as did Alexander Savinkov in the AKM machine. That was our first safety car. Of course, it wouldn't be our last. Griffin Peebles mastered the getaway, though. Did a great job, and on that first lap under green, Ferreira and Petrovsky found each other, making contact as they came out of turn five. And that would be the end of the race for Matthias Ferreira and also the end of his challenge for third in the championship. Ella Lloyd scuttling across the gravel in the back of shot there. She would have an issue. Uh, safety car back to green, but even before we got to back to green, Thomas Strauven lost his front wing. And three wide further back as Ernesto Rivera had some issues. And while Rivera had problems, Dorizon went straight on. He ended up beached in the gravel. And yes, another safety car. Uh, we went back to green for what was the final time. And Gianmarco Pradell got to the inside of Nathan Tai on the penultimate lap to secure his final podium of the Formula Winter Series season. Beaten, trying to find his way around the outside of Enya Fry and ended up losing his front wing in the process, ending his season on a bit of a low in the Formula Winter Series. But he'll regroup for the summer. No such dramas, though, at the front of the order for Griffin Peebles. He is your 2024 Formula Winter Series champion, a title that he takes with a win. Andres Cardenas following him home, 1-2 in the race and 1-2 and in the championship. MP Motorsport winning the championship with Griff. Campos Motorsports having to settle for second in the drivers and the team standings. But Griffin Peebles securing the race win. What a result for him. Andres Cardenas and Gianmarco Pradell will be on the podium alongside him. Ty, Anarag, Alazari, Fry, Franco, Flusha, and Tom Vinichkel round out the top 10. Mark that down. Enzo Tom Vinichkel's first points in car racing. Not his last. Machai Guadish in 11th. Akshay Bora in 12th. Peter Bazinalos in 13th. Maxime Ream in 14th. Moving into the second page, Finn Harrison rounds out his year in Formula Win Series with a 15th. 16th place, Dawa De Decker. Kiko Machado in 17th. Mikel Pedersen 18th. Rivera and Lammers rounding out the top 20. Jan Pesharovsky, after his moment, finishes 21st ahead of Preston Lambert and Thomas Strauven. Lenny Reed 24th. Dobzanski 25th. Lloyd and Castillo 26th and 27th. Berebi in 28th place. Fiorentino, Beaton and Olivieri, the rest of your finishers. Dorizon Hideg, Ferreira, Borgna and Savinkov all not reaching the flag. So that concludes the 2024 Formula Winter Series. Drivers currently being herded up to podiums. Maths currently being done to make sure we have the correct picture of the championship standings. But uh, it will be a celebration, I'm sure, of uh, all of these young drivers' successes. We expect to see a lot more from all three of our uh, top three in the championship, from Cardenas in second place, from Gwadish in third place in the title ultimately as well. And you also have to consider the young man that is Griffin Peebles. He is uh, such a well-rounded driver already at this early age. He is our champion. Gianmarco Pradell, incidentally, third in that race, scoring 15 points, of course. Um, now, how far back was he uh, from Machai Gwadish? That could be a change maybe for third in the points. Uh, no, it won't be. Uh, not quite. Machai Gwadish had enough of an advantage to secure third in the championship, despite a very strong end from Gianmarco Pradell. But nonetheless, a uh, really, really good finish to the year for Pradell. I'm happy that he got that because uh, he would have been very disappointed. You could see that he was very disappointed earlier in the day. And Griff Peebles will be welcomed onto a couple of different podiums. Of course, we will be doing, uh, I'm sure, a championship podium as well as the ones relevant to this race. And so we expect them out there very shortly. I think we might have got all of our drivers. And I'm now being told that Andy McEwen is ready. 
So let's go down there. Well, uh, thank you very much for gathering down below the podium for the final Formula Winter Series podium of the season. We're going to get through this as quickly as we can by first introducing our top female driver in that final race of the season, Ella Lloyd. Well, Danella onto the top step of the podium. The Road in Motorsport driver gets a warm reception from those down below and will receive her winner's trophy for her class. The Ginetta graduate moving up into Formula 4 racing had an eventful uh, weekend, an eventful race as well, uh, but ultimately comes out with a class win. Congratulations, Ella. We'll let her get out of the way now and then move on to our top three in the rookie uh, class. Uh, the top three in the rookie class, they will start with third place, Enea Fry. Enea is fighting through to the podium. There we go. Uh, the Jens Sport driver finishing third of the rookies. Now, second of the rookies, please welcome Kamir Anurag. But up there on the overall podium and at the front all season long was our rookie race winner for Campos Racing, Nathan Tai. And that's possibly the biggest cheer we've had all day for Nathan. So up onto the top step, he will go. And trophies ready and waiting, I believe. So out we come with the trophies, guys. For our top three rookie drivers in the final race of the season. And as always, rookie drivers in a junior single-seater category uh, always have a lot of eyes on them. And I think those who have been picking up podiums regularly are the ones we're going to be seeing for years to come, that's for sure. All together on the top step of the podium then for some pictures. And then we'll move on to our top three within the race. We also have our championship trophies uh, to be handed out as well. So once we're done with the photos, <laughs> and another round of applause, go on, you can all make your way back into the uh, backstage area. And we'll then move on to the top three drivers. In fact, first of all, our winning team for the final race of the season, uh, MP Motorsport. Matt Sweet should be waiting. There we go. <laughs> it might take Matt a while to get out onto the podium, in fairness. Out he goes. MP Motorsport victorious uh, in our final race of the season. Now, third overall, then, in that final race of the Winter Series for us racing was Gianmarco Pradel. But all eyes really were on the top two. They were the two fighting for the championship. And in the end, a valiant effort was made by our runner-up driver. It is second place for Andres Cardenas. But once again, the man they were all chasing, our champion for the 2024 GT uh, Formula Winter Series, was Griffin Peebles. Huge congratulations to Griffin, who withstood all the pressure, all the safety cars, all the restarts, and some threat from his championship rival right at the end, too. Well, let's pause for a second, shall we, for the national anthem of our winning driver. series race of the season and he will now receive his winner's trophy then uh, and for the final time this season he is a race winner but it will not be the final trophy that he picks up today because we do still have the championship presentation to come so congratulations then to Gianmarco Pradel third place Andres Cardenas second and Griffin Peeble for um, MP Motorsport the winner the corks are already flying off the bottles but we're not quite ready uh, for that yet up onto the podium they will get for their pictures in fact i don't see any champagne bottles that's good news it's safe to <laughs> keep ducking my head out of the door uh, that was the noise of one of the gt winter series lamborghinis heading out into the pit lane we of course have one more race to come uh, for the gt cars 
And that will be coming your way shortly. Right then, off the podium, guys. We will move on now to our championship presentations. And again, we'll be seeing a couple of those names back up on the podium again uh, in a moment or two. So four championship trophies to be handed out. Uh, and in first, we will go with our championship winning team for the Formula Winter Series. Welcome once again, MP Motorsports. Ilkan Erkanen comes out to collect the champion's trophy for MP Motorsport as the best team of the season. Now, our rookie champion and overall third place driver in the championship was Maciej Gladysh. Congratulations, third place overall and the rookie championship for Maciej for MP Motorsport once again. Second place in the championship, so close to grabbing a victory in the last race of the season. It's the runners-up spot for Andres Cardenas. But once again, it is our champion who still needs to come out onto the podium. Uh, he's uh, been a welcome and familiar sight up here all season long. Give it up one more time, everyone, for our champion, Griffin Peebles. Well done, Griffin. Back out again, uh, this time for the big prize, the Champions Trophy, which now I think uh, can be taken out and handed over to our drivers. The best team, the team's championship going to MP Motorsport. MP Motorsport also claiming third place in the championship and the best rookie. Second place for Campos Racing's Andres Cardenas and Griffin Peebles of MP Motorsport is your Formula Winter Series champion. So that is it for the single seaters. We've got one more race to go. Hard to believe, really, that we're at the end of this Winter Series season already. But it is the turn of the GT Winter Series drivers to round things out in style. Hello everyone, welcome down to the grid for the final time this weekend and the final time of the Winter Series action. We've got our final race of the day coming up now is the GT Winter Series race. So, it does look like it might rain a little bit as we've already had some spitting in the pit lane and it's definitely got a lot, lot colder. One person I am going to try and speak to, if I may, is Mr. Marcus Giedlig. Hello, how are we doing? Hi, I'm fine, how are you? Good, final race of the season. I mean, it's been yes. quite the successful season for, for Gielek Racing, hasn't it? That's right, yes. Uh, we've been undergoing a lot of changes. We took out the GT4 uh, out of the GT Winter Series field and created the new prototype Winter Series. So a lot of new stuff going on. But uh, besides being the ramp season, uh, it's been really successful, I must say. It has been successful. Thank you very much for speaking to us. We're going to go and see if we can speak to our drivers. Yep. All right, there's Marcus Giedlick there, the head of Giedlick Racing. So on the front row, we have got the number four of Finn Wiebelhaus. He won this morning's race. And we've also got his teammate, Kwanda Makawena, in the number three helped racing team car. Um, hmm, who shall I start with? I think if we could get the door open on finn vibelhaus's car i will just try and open the door myself might as well finn final race of the weekend how are we feeling uh yeah quite good so far and it has got a lot lot colder down here and we felt some spitting in the uh, in the pit lane so is that something that you're worried about oh uh, not really uh, it's uh, more cool cool down in the car so Nothing to worry about, just a bit more, uh, let's say, less physical. So it's uh, quite a, not a big deal. Less physical, so we're hoping for a rinse and repeat of, of this morning, get another win under the belt. Uh, can you repeat the question? You're hoping to get another win under the belt for the to sign off the season nicely. Ah, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, there will be a long race. A uh, lot of stuff can happen. The weather can change. Uh, there will be, for sure, some safety cars. So I guess uh, we will see. But. Uh, Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> I would love to have another win. All right, best of luck for the race. The other thing I just want to quickly mention, if Johnny and I can swing around a little bit, is we do have two birthdays that they've uh, put up on the little sign down there. That is Jan and Leah. I believe Leah is one of our team personnel on this grid, and Jan is one of our Giedlik Racing um, personnel as well. So as we come back round, I'm going to see if I can grab a quick word with Kwanda Mokoena, who is also starting on the front row just ever so quickly. Quickly, just grab that door. Quand 
Linda, starting on the front row, final race of the season. How are we feeling? You've got your teammate alongside you. Yeah, um, to be honest, uh, after this morning, we're not really, after yesterday, sorry, we're not really expecting to be on the front row, but uh, super happy. Uh, more just, we try race our own race, try hopefully get ahead of the others, open a bit of a gap, and then uh, towards the end of the race, we see what happens, yeah. And I did just speak to Finn and he said that he's not too worried about the uh, the chance of rain that we might we might get in this race. What about you? Uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> no, um, no rain, but uh, you never know. Anything can happen, but it's the beauty of racing. That is the beauty of racing. Good luck. Enjoy it out there. We'll see you later. Yeah, that is the beauty of racing. You never know what's going to happen. And I'm getting a little bit of deja vu from yesterday. I would say I'm going to take a pretty safe bet that we are going to get some rain. OK, we're going to continue down the grid. We've got the number 111 Schnitzelalm of Luca Arnold. He will be in that car for them. And then alongside, we've also got the beautiful car of the Capfinger Twins. I uh, spoke to them during the lunch break, if you're around four hour broadcast then. And uh, they're really excited to be to be back in this paddock. So it's uh, definitely nice to welcome them back and in such a nice livery as well. I always like to talk a little bit about the liveries and about the cars that look very beautiful. And if we just continue, we have got the bonnet up on one of our cars down here. This is a, this is a fabulous car. I believe this is, yes, it is the GTX entry, the KTM GT2. Now that is a beautiful machine. We won't speak to the driver as they are just being strapped in there. So we will continue down the grid. One thing I would just like to quickly mention is our Alpha Live guys. They have done a fabulous job all season. It's only right to thank them and they were out very cold and wet last night after the races. And with that, we're gonna go to this race. We'll go to an advert break first. So then the GT Winter Series is approaching its final race of the season and it is Finn Wiebelhaus who heads a Haupt Racing Team lockout of the front row. Juan de Mokowina alongside him, Mikhail Kapfinger and Luca Arnold on row two. Then it's an all cup class row three, Amri Bonjuel, the cup four leader, and then the GTX class car, not technically cup, Thomas Anderson in the KTM GT2. Both of those cars are a bit of a dragster in a straight line. Expect them to maybe make up some places towards turn one. Lewandowski seventh ahead of Piotr Rivera. Leandro Martins, the first of the Cup 2 cars on the grid alongside Ibrahim Badawi. A couple of cars struggling to get off the line at the moment. Christian Hook and Jamar Hartling round out our first six rows of the grid. Row seven, Jörg Dreisov and Morten Stromsted, who'll hand over to Sun Noah later on. Alfredo Hernandez and Joachim Balting on row eight. Darmetko and Lavati on row number nine. Row 10, Sebastian Daum alongside Stefano Marazzi, Marcel Van Berlo and Kalle Bergman on row 11. John Dillon and Mark Speaker was on row 12. Row 13 of the grid is Talal Shair alongside Alessia Rafini, although well, Talal was actually there. We did see a car out there. I think Talal might be back out after the huge incident he had earlier on. Uh, Alessia Rafini in 26th, Yves Goddard in 27th, Frank Kivitz in 28th place, Kazmarski I don't think is taking the start, and Rahid Al Saheli also, I think, possibly missing from this race. Igor Klyer is uh, not looking like he's out there either, but we still have a hugely strong grid for this final race. And um, I don't know if uh, Izzy Browning is an amateur meteorologist, but I do have the word wet race on my timing screen. And Andy McEwen is also signaling to me that the rain has indeed starting, started falling. So on one last light note, I will extend the uh, previously seen happy birthday wishes 
uh, to Leah, the team manager of HRT, and Jan Jurger from the Gienlich Racing Organization. Those are the bright spots out of the way. Let's hope it doesn't get too dark and cloudy overhead. So then, the Haupt Racing team pair, Finn Wiebelhaus and Quanda Mokoena, leading the way at the sharp end of the order. Mikael Kapfinger and Luca Arnold on row two of the grid. Four very fast young drivers in GT3 cars on the first two rows. But I think that Bonduel and Anderson in the Super Trofeo and GT2 spec cars uh, respectively on row three, they could be the spoilers going down to the first corner. They're very quick in a straight line. Uh, exactly, and they've got a long gold drag downhill into that first corner to really stretch their legs. So I think they're going to be on their toes to try and make some ground up. It is just a little bit of moisture in the air, but not a huge amount. So it will uh, start, uh, hopefully, to uh, it won't start to get too wet. Uh, just a bit of psychological rain, maybe, on the windscreens. So then the Haupt Racing Team Mercedes AMG GT3s are the cars at the front. Will Finn Wiebelhaus make it yet another win in the GT Winter Series or will Mokoena beat his future teammates for the first time? We're underway and it's a good start from Bonduel from further back. He's gaining places. He's got the inside line. He might have second. He might even have the lead. I think Wiebelhaus just about has P1. Yes, he does. Mokoena around the outside of Bonduel for second place and uh, Capfinger has also gone side by side with Bonduel. He's got more downforce in the GT three Porsche he should have third place is Mikhail Kapfinger there in P3 we'll see in just a moment Oof. yes he is Almri Bonjuel uh, down to fourth place then momentarily held second or oh, as the 11 car almost gets its nose cut off our champion car uh, of course uh, starting all the way outside the top, twen uh, top 10, Jamo Hartling has some work to do before handing over, I think, to Kenneth Heyer, although he's been notably absent so far today. Thomas Anderson losing time in the KTM there as Jamo Hartling goes around the outside of him. Well, frantic stuff at the start, as we expected, but uh, in the end, all of that extra power will only get you so far if you can't stop it at the end of the straight. Two cars off in the gravel up at turn four, Adam. One, I think, is going to be the Mertel Motorsport 81 of Tommaso Lavati. The other one is Stefano Marazzi. Uh, one of them getting going, but sadly, one car, I fear, stranded trackside. Yeah, third car there involved as well in that second shot. Yeah. Marcel Van Berlo in the Porsche Cup machine. But uh, one look at that rear axle, and you know that's not going any further. That, my friends, is yet another safety car. What is it that Finn Wiebelhaus said in that interview a few minutes ago? Oh, we know there's going to be safety cars. Well, I don't know <laughs> if you knew there was going to be one quite so early, uh, but there has been. And now uh, we are under safety car control. Once again, Finn Wiebelhaus, Quanda Mokowina, and Mikael Kapfinger, your top three. But Almarie Bonduel uh, had a brilliant start as this race began. Just looking through this uh, shot, uh, on board with Almarie Bonjuel. Uh, there's dirt on the windscreen. I'm not seeing active raindrops on the uh, on the windscreen, but you can see the kind of sheet of water approaching from just ahead of turn one by the looks of it. So, uh, yeah, again, I, I, I don't want to um, buy into Izzy's forecast, but I'm afraid the circumstances tell me I have to. And that, of course, will be hugely complicated for all of our teams. If that is the case, they will have to change over if it gets too bad out there on the circuit. Uh, we've seen some scrabbling for tyres before uh, in the GT Winter Series and the GT4 Winter Series this season. But uh, I think, again, with this race neutralisation, um, perhaps not for the lead, but again, second, third place, Bonjuel chilling behind them. Uh, he could be a factor. I think it's going to depend when... F oh, I, oh, I thought that was another car. Uh, the Rosso Corsa car still not recovered. Uh, a sad debut, really, for the 296. I think they've had issues in all three of their races, Rosso Corsa, unfortunately. So not the uh, debut in GT Win Series for that car that they would have wanted. The, uh, the specific chassis debut, of course. We have had 296s racing this season on several occasions. But... Uh, yeah, for Bonjuel, depending on when Finn Wiebelhaus pulls the pin, I suspect that once again he's going to be um, 
out dragging Catfin, Gurren, maybe even Mokowina towards the first corner. Yeah, but as we saw on the initial start, when he gets to the first corner, especially if he's on the inside three wide, he can't break as late as the GT3 cars around him, although he sort of scoped it out, I suppose, the first time. Maybe he's realised there's a bit more grip down there and uh, he might give it a slightly better go this time around, but uh, certainly awesome power uh, off the uh, rolling start there. Interesting to see what uh, Jamo Hartling can do. Hartling can do. Seventh place for this restart as well. He picked up, I think, a place or two uh, from where he initially started. Uh, but yeah, Amri Bonduel, he's the one to uh, watch out for, I think, when we get back to racing. The KTM up there as well. Nice to see, I think, just outside the top 10. And I uh, wonder how that car will uh, compete against some of the GT3 cars around it when we get racing. It's about the highest up I think we've seen that car today, certainly. Uh, I don't think it made it into the top 10 overall earlier on. Maybe by the end of the race, you're looking at me like I'm talking rubbish, Adam. Six overall in the second uh, race earlier on. That's inside on, the I'm top afraid. 10, isn't yes. it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, it was, it was a long way down at one point. Uh, started at the back of race number two. Uh, Simon Birch did a really good job in that. Uh, second race to bring the car back up there Thomas Anderson has lost positions early doors um, but uh, as long as he keeps it within that kind of top dozen range I think we could see Simon Birch again on the ascent later on yes to claim hopefully his second top finish top 10 finish uh, of the day but uh, that car clearly has good pace to have been able to race through from the back of the grid so uh, we shall see what he's able to do Weaving around, keeping heat in the tyres. That's going to be all the more important if the weather does uh, change around. And the, the headache that really gives the teams is if it gets very wet before the pit stops, because then you find yourself in a position where you have to make a tyre change pit stop and a mandatory pit stop a little bit later in the race. Some teams may then try and just tough it out. You'll lose some time out there on the wrong tyres, but uh, as long as your driver can keep it on the black stuff, you won't lose as much time as you have to make two pit stops. And, and a tyre change is not the speediest of processes either, so they'll try to avoid that unless they absolutely have to. The wind is not terribly strong, though, in fairness at the moment. It's died down over the course of the day, so I'm hoping those dark clouds are not going to get to us in any hurry. No, hopefully not. It's been a fairly still uh, day here. It was a bit windy at times on Saturday. It was also just about every other horrible kind of weather on Saturday as well here uh, at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. Let's hope this one stays dry, but again, those clouds don't fill me with optimism. Finn Wielhaus also didn't have much optimism for the amount of green flag running we would have. We will, I'm sure, be itching to go racing again, but the recovery is still active down there. Uh, on the turn four so we'll have to see quite when it does launch back into life this race uh, bon Joel in fourth position is uh, the first of the cup four runners cup two is being led by leandro martins who uh, is on course for second in the championship this season in fact he's secured second in the championship already hubert darmetko can't beat him there um, third in the championship is Hubert Darmetko, who also runs in Cup 2. He's currently third in the class. Uh, the Cup 1 class for the Ferrari Challenge cars is being led by John Dillon, just going through shot the shot there in the tricolor colours, the Italian flag colours. Safety car lights still on, no confirmation of the car being in this lap, so one more lap uh, of safety car conditions. And uh, Another car that I think one should uh, keep an eye on is the uh, 992 GT3R from Proton Huber competition, Jörg Dreisov at the wheel at the moment. That car in 14th place. It's been a little bit anonymous so far, I think that's fair to say. However, um, Manuel Lauk has got a proven track record of being spectacular in Huber Porsches in GT Winter Series, and he will be taking the car over. Uh, when the pit stop window begins 25 minutes into this race. In other words, when the, when the clock hits 30 minutes to go. So I expect him to be uh, quite the factor as well. Uh, Manuel Lauk, a pro driver that we saw, of course, last week in the Motorland Aragon GT4 races. Uh, now in a GT3 car, he's been itching for this all year. Um, actually uh, <laughs> told me about it as far back as Estoril, so he's known this was coming uh, since the season opener. And last year, he had a brilliant scrap with uh, Youth Sport Wagen Technik team boss Mikael Jus in the season decider. And we'll have to see whether or not we get another grandstand finish on track. Of course, the championships have been won, 
But uh, wouldn't it be good to see one last battle for uh, the big positions? Stefano Marazzi's Rosso Corsa Ferrari 296 is now back out there at the back of the queue, incidentally. So the Ferrari is back underway, albeit two laps down at the back of the field. So they will get uh, a complete run out, hopefully, over the course of this race. Now, we'll see where progress is this time with Tommaso Lovati's Myrtle Motorsport car. A big shame for them, actually. Started on the Cup 1 pole position, did uh, Lovati uh, in the 488 Challenge Evo. Was expecting uh, maybe to see a good result for them, but not to be uh, on this occasion. And uh, that's one of the more striking liveries on the grid. The 177 of Alfredo Hernandez. And nothing says understated like a gold Lamborghini, no? His exit from the pit lane was anything but. He was the car directly <laughs> below the podium yes. who did a huge burnout after revving the watsits off the car for quite some time, uh, all whilst we were trying to introduce uh, the Formula dri Winter Drivers uh, out onto the podium. So he certainly made his presence felt long before the race had even started. But yeah, it's a car that uh, uh, attracts your eyes from a distance and you can hear it from quite a distance away as well. Uh, but that's one of the great things about the GT Winter Series. It's something I love about GT racing anyway all of the cars look very different they sound very different you can stand trackside shut your eyes and if you're reasonably well educated on which car sounds like which you can tell them all apart without even seeing them and then you throw in some of these cup cars as well which have their own very distinctive engine notes and it really is a beautiful mix of very exotic machinery out there on circuit there aren't actually a huge amount of places really on an international level where you can see this mix of GT classes racing together. Uh, always a treat when you do get the chance to do so. That Ferrari mm. isn't <laughs> quite on the flatbed. It's, it's mostly, <laughs> mostly on the flatbed. Um, assuming that it's strapped onto it in some capacity, we... Whoa! I don't like that lateral movement. Um, hopefully the Myrtle Motorsport car gets back in one piece but uh bouncing away that is not a comfortable sight is it can you can you feel the pounds and euros i can uh, yeah out of it as well uh that is a little bit alarming but hopefully the myrtle motorsport car makes it back to a safe position um to your point though regarding grid variety that's something that i somewhat miss from international level major gt races if you go back 20 years in the Spa 24 hours. You had Porsche Cup cars in the race. You also had GT1 Vipers, Listers, etc. in the race as well. Lotus Elises, Renault Spiders even uh, in the 2000s in those, in those races. Obviously, the fact that we've got such a quantity of GT3 cars out in the world with so many high-level drivers in them is amazing. The Spa 24 hours is a very different spectacle, but still a spectacle. There is a bit of me that likes the fact of the old days where someone could pound around all day in a cup car, keep out of trouble, and end up in the top 10 at the end of a 24-hour race. Exactly. You don't really get those giant killing performances now because uh, everyone's in the same class. I mean, it, it's a nice problem to have. As you said, it just really alludes to the strength of uh, GT3 racing in particular. But, uh, yeah, a healthy reminder this, that those other categories are still alive and kicking and still very, very popular indeed. Right, good news, everybody. The safety car is heading in this lap. With the greatest of respect, I'm a huge fan of that car. I hope it's the last we see of it this <laughs> afternoon. It has done more than its fair share of laps this weekend. We've got just under three quarters of an hour on the clock. I would like to see this race develop nicely under green flag conditions. Is that too much to ask, Alan? I don't know, but I think it was my fault the safety car was called in. They heard me starting to get rose-tinted about the FIA GT <laughs> from 20 years ago and said we need to get this race back underway. <laughs> the safety car will be in this lap then. Finn Wiebelhaus will assume control of the field once more. Safety car lights go out as anticipated. And Quanda Mokoena will now have his BDIs locked on the rear wing of the Mercedes AMG GT3 ahead of him, the two Haupt Racing Team drivers at uh, the top two on the order, of course. And we once again face the proposition potentially of Mikhail Kapfinger going at it with Kwanda Mukuena, uh, as we did in Valencia. But for Kwanda, he'll be more focused on trying to hold on to the leader. The lights are out, the safety car is in, and Finn Wiebelhaus has already pulled the trigger. Here comes the leading cars now approaching the first corner. Everyone 
Well, we're approaching the last corner. Everyone already up to full speed. Now, Bonjuel getting a poor run through the final corner, of course, with his lack of aero. Might not be a factor for Mikhail Katfinger. He's closing in, but isn't going to get there. Jamo Hartling, though, very much a factor for Piotr Rivera. They're side by side into the first corner. And it is Jamo that gets through Piotr Rivera. Uh, loses out then that sixth overall to our championship team. Of course, they'll be so keen to prove a point in the final race. It's not been their strongest weekend thus far, but they would love to end on the highest of highs. Uh, that was uh, interesting. That was Omri Bonduel really sort of weaving around again. He did that on the opening lap of the race too, but he seems to be losing pace a little bit. Jamo Hartling now immediately onto his tail. Uh, Bonduel very late on the brakes, heading downhill into turn five as well. So I'm not sure he's fully got those tyres up to temperature, hence the weaving around uh, to try and generate some uh, last minute heat. But uh, I fear for his sake anyway, that it won't be too long before Jamo Hartling is trying to slip up the inside. We ride it on board with the awesome Lamborghini heading up through turn number nine again. Doesn't really make friends with the apex there. Drifts wide over the exit curve. And does that give Jamo Hartling the run? We're defending down the straight. There we go. Jamo Hartling blasts through. We know the Lamborghini's usually pretty handy in the speed traps. I know he didn't get a great exit from turn nine, but uh, that still looked a little too easy. Yes, whether that was strategic, allowing Jamo Hartling through. Jamo, a very quick driver in a GT3 car, was always going to get past, or whether something deeper is at play. We'll have to see. Piotr Rivera and Christian Hook will now be just behind Bonjuel. Uh, we'll see what the case is there. Uh, oh, you see the sparks flying as uh, Jamo Hartling comes within a literal inch of the uh, gravel going through the final corner. He's going to be determined to get this car onto the podium at a bare minimum. Headlights flashing from Christian Hook as he challenges for seventh place uh, up against Piotr Vera. Of course, Vera's car in this endurance race is to be taken over by Dan Arrow, and that means that thing will fly in the second phase of the race too. So keep an eye on that number 14 Matrix Media backed uh, Good Speed Racing Team car. There goes our Cup 2 leader through shot as well there, uh, Leandro Martins, in the unfamiliar livery from Villico Motorsport on the Lacar machine. As I noted earlier in the weekend, chassis number three of the season uh, for Leandro Martins. Uh, car number 62 is under investigation for an additional reconnaissance lap. That is Ibrahim Badawi from DL Racing. They're only allowed to head out of the pit and then go to the grid in this series. It's not like the formulas where you can come back through if you uh, feel the need to. So that is why that's happening. We ride on board with Thomas Anderson in the KTM and to the inside goes Christian Hook as Piotr Clavira defends against him. Indeed he did, an interesting place to defend as well really into turn nine, that just backs everything up, heading down the back straight and here comes the lunge from the KTM, surely can't get it stopped and there is inevitable contact and around I'm afraid will go the Ferrari Christian Hook's day, not getting any better and has he stalled it on the apex as well, more cars dodging and diving around to avoid contact and thankfully managing to do so and he does mercifully get that Ferrari out of the way but that was an ambitious lunge up the inside. The door was always likely to close, uh, but unfortunately for Christian, the aggressor sort of got away with that, and he's the one who's now got work to do. Yes, Christian won't be best pleased with that, but he'll make up some more places uh, over the course of the rest of this race. Pierre Ellett, of course, taking the car over a little later on. There you see uh, the GT3 Poland Lamborghini making its way up the order, currently with Adrian Lewandowski at the wheel. We're expecting to see his father Andrzej at the wheel later on in the race. In fact, Adrian is solo by the looks of it. Andrzej was on the initial entry list, but uh, Adrian is racing this one solo, so uh, he will at least be able to stay in the car for the distance. And of course, that can be an advantage later on uh, in the race. When new drivers get in, you already know what's going on as uh, Joachim Bolting uh, goes defensive there. We're seeing, as we did uh, at Motorland, that the Joachim Bolting Porsche's uh, bonnet is coming up. It was doing that as well uh, on the back straight at Motorland too. So the number 38 car, um, they haven't quite figured it out how to, to keep that down, but it seems to happen with a couple of the Porsches. I think if you just slightly dent in the front uh, bodywork, the it starts to uh, 
try to take its own adventures. Uh, yes, let's hope it doesn't get any further loosened than that as the race goes on. The sun very much now breaking through the clouds and sort of glinting off the cars. It's a quite a low winter sun and so late in the day now, what is it, half past five nearly local time, that could start to present a bit of an issue for the drivers heading uh, in towards the sun as they are here actually heading out of uh, turn number 10 into turn 11. The number 38 Porsche turns through the right hander there, the plus line racing team car of Jurkin Bolting. Here, though, the fight for second place. And as you very correctly predicted, these two won't leave each other alone, will they? Quanda Makuena uh, and uh, Michael Katfinger in third place. Mercedes AMG versus Porsche, two completely differently designed GT3 cars, both capable of running within a tenth of a second or so of each other per lap. The big difference is that Makuena has got the track position advantage. Where, if anywhere, can Katfinger? and make his move. Plus line racing teams Marcel van Berlo has a drive through penalty for causing a collision. That was the collision at turn four on lap one. Uh, so Marcel will have to serve a drive through penalty for his role in that. But yes, two very different cars uh, in this battle for second place. Of course, the Mercedes AMG GT3 has been around uh, since 2016 at this point, and that car was debuted to take over from the SLS. Uh, the 992, though, just in its second season of racing as well. So contrasting amounts of data available as Adrian Lewandowski gets past the Cup 2 leader, Leandro Martins. We'll have half an eye on what's going on behind him now with Joachim Bolting and Hubert Darmetko right in his rear view. So the Cup 2 lead could be at stake. He won't mind so much about Adrian getting past as long as he doesn't now get in his way. Yeah, Lewandowski was that nice little buffer, though, wasn't he, between uh, the class leader and the rest of the podium runners. Here they come, the three Porsches, well, four Porsches, actually, uh, coming down towards us directly, but that is Jörg uh, Dreisar behind, changes that for second place in the class, I believe, but the inside, yes, that was Hubert Darmetko. He's got past Joachim Bolting with a lovely, nice outbreaking manoeuvre up the inside into turn number 10. That is how you do it without contact. That. Both drivers uh, judging that perfectly. And, uh, well, that forward momentum, will that now carry him to the class lead? He's got the class leader in sight. Needs to gain a few cars lengths that were lost with that little side-by-side -side exchange. But it looks as though car number seven is the one on the move. Hugely impressed by Hubert Darmetko. Hard to believe that he made his very first racing appearance with us at Estoril. In his second racing appearance, he won the cup class. Uh, in race two at Estoril, Joachim Bolting's... Uh, Bonnet continues to catch the eye. Again, it has been doing that for a while, but uh, it does look like it is getting worse too. So uh, hopefully it doesn't cause any dramas. Uh, there is the 115 car recovering as well through shot. Christian Hook up into 15th position now, as Marcel Van Berlo is just serving his drive through penalty. Hubert Darmetko wiggling there under breaking into turn four. He's pushing to the limit to try and get past Leandro Martins. He will be thinking, I need to get past Leandro and then build a gap before, before, Dieta, uh, before Dieter Suepes uh, takes that car over. The 911, the driver coach of the, uh, the 911 Rakar Motorsport lineup, he will be fast. The top two then in cup two, head up the hill through turn seven and eight. Darmetko uh, doing his best to keep the driver of the 911 car watching through the mirrors, keep Leandro busy. And of course, Joachim Bolting, we've seen him make some audacious dives so far this season and previously in other categories. This is an audacious dive from Hubert Darmetko, however. Gets to the inside, almost a carbon copy of what he did to Joachim Bolting a couple of laps ago. He's now got the outside line, though, for turn 12. Will Leandro hold on? Yes, he does on that occasion. But Hubert Darmetko, again, competent in wheel-to-wheel -wheel situations, far beyond his uh, vintage in racing. Absolutely. He was just that length further back that time, though, so he couldn't quite clear uh, the other car by the time they got out of the corner. That's why he wasn't able to make the move stick. This will all now be uh, further complicated by the uh, charging Christian Hook trying to come back through in his GT3 Ferrari, and he'll want to try and make as short work of this as possible, but they're not really going to be watching for him in the mirrors, and because it's for position, they're under no obligation to move out of the way either, so uh, this is a genuine five-way scrap now 
uh, for 11th place overall. But really, it's the three cars at the front of the group we're focused on. They are fighting for the class honours, and it could not be a lot closer as they head out of turn three and towards the braking zone at four. In the background, that looks like Hook coming up the inside, but no, not late enough on the brakes. His first target uh, is the Jörg Dreisau uh, Porsche GT3R. And uh, he's actually not being able to find a way past him particularly quickly. There comes the latest challenge from Hubert Darmetko. Not necessarily trying to go around the outside, but trying to cut back to the late apex. Well, he made his own apex there, clambering over the inside curve. And actually, Adam, I don't think that really benefited him. I think he lost traction as a result, although he hasn't lost a lot of ground. Last time these two went to wheel to wheel in uh, racing, it was at Motorland Aragon. What happened? Darmetko got tagged at the rear by Leandro Martins. Martins broke his suspension and had to withdraw from the rest of the weekend. Let's hope it doesn't quite go the same way this time. It's now Darmetko attacking rather than Martins attacking in this Cup 2 scrap as we go into the dusk here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia, Joachim Bulting in third place, an interested observer, and he might become a protagonist before too long. Dreisov and uh, Christian Hook just chilling behind, waiting for their opportunities. Christian would like to make up some more places, as you alluded to, might be driving a little bit frustrated after that collision with the KTM a few laps ago. Onto the main straight goes this massive scrum of cars once again then, Christian Hook I think is alongside Dreisov in the Porsche GT3 car. He's not quite alongside. Darmetko also isn't, but uh, tried to get there anyway. And Christian Hook does get past the number 73 Hubert competition machine. Uh, while all of this is going on, Finn Wiebelhaus is rather predictably building a lead. Four seconds clear now at the front of the pack. In second place is uh, Quanda Mokoena, who has Mikhail Kapfinger right on his boot lid. I think they've been caught out by some traffic on the previous lap, hence they've closed up together. In fourth place is Jamo Hartling, one half of the 2024 GT Win Series champion. Luca Arnold for Schnitzlam Racing, the sister team to SR Motorsport, running in fifth place. But all eyes on this Cup 2 battle. Hubert Darmetko's move for the lead has a whiff of inevitability about it, but the pit window is open. Uh, which is why Finn Wiebelhaus is in the pit lane. That had me panicking for a moment, but the race leader in to serve his pit stop. That's quite early, but I guess he was in clean air. He felt that maybe it was maybe he was catching the back of the pack and decided that was his time uh, to make his way into the pit lane. Meanwhile, back to the cup battle, a late lunge around the outside almost was the plan of action there for Hubert Darmetko. That didn't work. There he is Finn Wiebelhaus there, the Haupt Racing team going to work on car number four and making sure that he uh, is fully prepared to head back out into the race. Out towards the uh, end of another lap we go, though. This fascinating battle going on just outside the overall top ten. Uh, Christian Hook very much a part of it now, actually. It will become a battle in the pit lane. The top two in class both dive for the pit lane at the same time, and they are not the only ones. No Piotr Rivera in to hand over to Dan Arrow. Thomas Anderson in to hand over to Simon Burke as well. Uh, the hit window in earnest begins. Of course, all the drivers who have uh, a rocket ship waiting for them in, in a co-driver uh, will be coming in. Frank Kiebitz, of course, is one of them. He's in the pits at the moment. He's handing over, of course, to Timo Glock uh, for this endurance race, but he is already a lap down, uh, but could still make some more places up in Cup 1. Can Timo Glock, the ex-Formula 1 star, former three-time podium finisher in F1, race winner several times in the DTM thereafter as well. The driver with impeccable credentials, very exciting to see him in this series. Juanda Mokoena is your erstwhile race leader, uh, while the pit stop cycle uh, weaves its uh, chaotic magic over the next 10 minutes or so. Mokoena though has just come into the pit lane. Mikhail Kapfinger therefore assumes the lead as Dan Arrow assumes the seat of the number 14 car. He rejoins the race and this car will now start to fly. How racing team judged that to perfection. They'd only really just sent Finn Wiebelhaus back out into the fray uh, when they received the number three car of uh, Makoena. So they are busy down in the pit lane right now. Uh, this period of the race where uh, everybody now just tries to get themselves up to speed. It means that this car now leads the way. That is Mikhail Kapfinger. And uh, I think maybe the prettiest car on the grid. Not that we have favourites, but that is a very, very well-prepared Porsche. 
And it is uh, trying to sign its way through some of the traffic. I do suspect this is why Veeble House came in early. I think he saw some traffic on the horizon and realized that was probably going to slow him down anyway. Might as well pit. I hope that by the time you can uh, they, uh, come back out of pit lane, the traffic will have cleared them uh, out on the road. It's uh, that finger. Not putting a foot wrong at the moment in fairness and he was putting pressure on uh, this car for the pit stop under Macarena back out into the race that gap had come down to about four or five tenths at last check so it'll be fascinating to see which order they find themselves in once they both stopped yes it's going to be a matter of uh, who and how far behind Finn Wiebelhaus I think as Quanda Macarena heads out back onto the circuit in the number three car uh, the pit window continuing on for another uh, six minutes so you've still got some time if you're cap finger if you're jmo hartling out there i'll be interested to see if jmo does indeed hand over uh, to kenneth higher as scheduled higher was meant to be racing this morning but then backed out of it hopefully we do see kenneth on the last weekend of the season it'd be a shame if he uh, wasn't out there once all is said and done lights flashing on uh, finn Wiebelhaus as he rejoins, or as has rejoined the race, about five or six seconds clear, uh, I'd say, of Kwanda Mokoena. And Kwanda will be encouraged by that. And maybe has a little bit more in the back pocket for the second half of the race. Who has done, who has done better by their tyres, I think, might be a big question. Uh, yeah, exactly, because uh, it's now going to start getting warmer out there again with the sun beating down on the circuit. So quite the opposite of what we thought might be the case uh, when the cars were rolling out of the pit lane half an hour or so ago. Uh, but right now, track conditions are pretty much ideal, if a little toasty. So looking after the tyres is going to be a bit of a challenge. There, though, is the number four car, Finn Wiebelhaus, not leading at the moment, but uh, we really expect him to inherit the lead. Although, I have to say, he's not that far ahead of his uh, Hout Racing uh, teammate. And so that gap, I would say, is maybe a little bit smaller, actually, than it was uh, before. Oh, now, lots of debris just on the racing line down into Turn 1. I wonder from which car that has emanated. And uh, is that going to attract the attention of the clerk of the course in a way that might lead them to uh, summon the safety car? Because that is uh, definitely carbon fibre right on the racing line. Back into the race goes the triple Walton car. That's the Schnitzelam racing car of uh, Luca and Roland Arnold. So Roland, I think, taking over after the pit stops. But there is a car out on track that is a little bit lighter than it was a few minutes ago. And I wonder which one it was. We may well get some clues if we see uh, a slightly wounded car coming into the pit lane. But uh, right now, not uh, covering that under any source of caution. Just uh, hoping that the uh, track will be swept clean by the cars making their way through. Riding on board with the number 28 car, BDR competition by Grupo Prom Lamborghini. Of, uh, Murray Bonduel. He was a bit of a star of the show in the early race. Has actually been strangely anonymous in this one, really, um, so far. But uh, in clean air, what can he do lap time-wise? He has uh, made his pit stop, so he, uh, again, interested to see how this all shuffles out with 24 minutes plus one lap still to go. And a real mix, Adam, in uh, pit strategies, really, as we sort of expected. Some drivers coming in right at the start of the pit window, others, I suspect, waiting until the very end. And it means this middle part of the pit window is actually pretty quiet. Yes, exactly right. The likes of Morton Stromstead out there at the moment. I think Noah's not going to say to him, well, I want every minute of track time I can get because I suspect Dad probably has some role to play in making sure he can keep going junior single-seater racing. So, OK, Dad, you take most of the race in the enduro if you like. Uh, Adrian Lewandowski has just come into the pit lane, as has Ibrahim Badawi. Now, Badawi's already been through the pits. We saw him exiting but that was a drive-through penalty for the extra reconnaissance lap that was under investigation. Uh, so both of the Cup 2, or two of the Cup 2 front runners, Cup 4 front runners are in, and uh, the Armory Bonduel car will assume the Cup 4 lead once again. I think we're hearing there that the uh, debris has moved around a bit closer, further into the braking zone as well, according to our camera op down at Turn 1. So uh, that is a consideration and a concern as well. Jamo Hartling has taken over the lead as Mikhail Kapfinger comes into pit lane. And what that means is that uh, Jamo is going to push it to the limit. Next time by, he has to uh, make his pit stop, lest he be outside the window. And there's some chap called Timo uh, we just saw going through shot in the Cup 1 Ferrari on the back of Roland Arnold. 
Uh, Roland Arnold in the triple one schnitzel and Mercedes. Now, he's not fighting Timo Glock for position, uh, but uh, Timo, of course, XF1 driver. He'll be the secret weapon for Kivitz in the 88 JVO team. And uh, we'll see if Timo can make up some positions in Cup 1, but telling that he's right there on the back of a GT3 already. Uh, yeah, exactly. We sort of expected that kind of pace from him, really, didn't we? There on the insert is the cap finger driver change. So, Mikhail uh, getting out of the car now after a solid opening stint. Johannes, who we saw out earlier on this morning, uh, jumping into the car. Now, where is he in relation to those that that car was fighting with before? This is actually the perfect camera shot to demonstrate this to us. We're waiting for Convival House. That, I think, might... Uh, no, that wasn't Finn yet in the background. Uh, so, uh, there he was. I think the black car at the back of the queue. So, there is Finn Beeble House, even better, uh, who will now move into the second place. But that's a net race lead. The white Mercedes in the background. That is uh, Quanda Macuena, which means that he is ahead of the... Uh, Porsche and uh, that will mean that uh, that second place net second place for the Mercedes driving the Porsche a bit further back now and struggling perhaps on this outlap to keep pace so this gap is going to be quite a bit bigger than it was uh, before the pit cycle began I think uh, yes but I suspect that Johannes will soon make that up uh, he is very very quick indeed and very good around this circuit in particular I think he likes Barcelona quite a lot in comes J-Mo Hartling then just 38 seconds of the window left to go so anyone that hasn't yet made their stop really needs to get on with it Christian Hook has made a pit stop too but there is the uh, number 11 car with the driver change on going so J-Mo Hartling uh, is getting out of the car. Kenneth High is getting into the car, which is what we were anticipating, what was scheduled. And uh, Kenneth High will resume the race and see what he can do in the second phase as Quanda Mokoena puts a few lap traffic uh, items between himself uh, and Johannes Kapfinger. And traffic management is going to be so critical uh, as this race unfolds. Indeed, there is the number 11 car in the pit lane, out of the pit lane, it will head. And uh, that's sort of the final piece of the puzzle now that needs to fit into place as far as the lead group is concerned. We ride on board uh, with the number 11 car as they head out of pit lane, back into the fray, and Kenneth Hire showing on the timing tower as being in that car, which is good news, but also showing as being back behind now. Wiebelhaus, Makoena, and Capfinger. Did he beat Bon Duel out? I think he did, so that'll be fourth place. Uh, for Kenneth Hine. There he is in the background. Bon Duel actually quite a bit further back than he was, and a big lock, but in fact that might be damaged to the left front corner of the 992 Porsche, which buries itself in the gravel trap. That's Sebastian Daum and Keanu Bloom's car. Keanu, I think, is in the car now, having made its pit stop. But was that a puncture? Was that damage? Or was that just a car that was really struggling to stop for the corner? He's back on the road, Adam. I can't see any tyre smoke, and I can't see any obvious damage, but that car is clearly not driving right. No, that wasn't the most confidence-inducing start to his stint. It does look like that tyre is going down uh, on the left front, so I think it was a puncture more than a driver error, although he is going at a decent lick of pace, but look, straight on there at turn eight. Clearly, that tyre is going down. So the former Sebastian Daum car now in the hands of Keanu Blum really struggling. He's going to need to limp that one back to the pits and hopefully not take the bodywork off with the carcass. Yeah, I think I could see it there as he bounced back onto the road at turn nine and there from the head-on shot, you really can see it. Uh, the tyre billowing out at the side of the car. So what caused that? I'm not so sure. Of course, we do have all of that debris down on the road at turn one. I was pondering the possibility that that could... Uh, cut a tyre down a few minutes ago. I'm not saying that is what's happened, but it seems a little bit of a coincidence. And uh, the lock-up then won't have made things any easier, I suppose, up at Turn 4 either. But that car will limp back home, and that is the danger of having bits of carbon fibre lying on the racetrack. This can sometimes be the result of that. And unfortunately, whilst they will get the car back out on track, that's their chance of a good result ruined. Quite possibly. Just to recap on the class leaders, then Almarie Bonjuel in fifth overall is the Cup 4 leader. Cup 2 lead is with Hubert Darmetko. That's the Porsche 992 Cup class. Of course, GTX is being led by Simon Birch in the number 55 KTM. That's the only car in that class. 
uh, Cup 1 being led by Matt Griffin in the Ferrari rankings. Uh, Timo Glock, I think, is already up to second in class there. Yes, he is, but he's got some 30 seconds to make up on John Dillon. To be honest, uh, with all due respect to, uh, to John, in fact, he's third in class with Matt Griffin uh, leading and second in class is uh, Maurizio Sirisoli. So touch and go really there, at least the second in class for Timo. I think Matt Griffin is probably a bridge too far uh, with a big gap uh, between himself and Timo. But uh, JVO Racing may celebrate a podium at some point. There is Timo Glock in the number 88 car. Uh, the JVO Racing, of course, that JVO stands for Jörg van Ullmann, the uh, former DTM racer, one of the biggest uh, racers in Germany going into the early 90s. Uh, has been running racing teams with great success in more recent years. Collaborated with the Zakowski family of Zach Speed fame uh, for a combined effort a few years ago. But uh, Timo Glock uh, joining us in the GT Win Series for the first time. Third in class for now. Let's see if he can improve upon that. You can see there under braking, the, the brake rotors glowing on the uh, uh, right front corner of the Ferrari. As the light starts to dim now, things start to become uh, visible that aren't always visible and uh, just adds to the feast to the eyes and the ears that is GT Racing. But uh, yeah, Timo Glock sliding the car around and uh, looking pretty comfortable out there already. That's the 83 uh, Porsche, the plus line racing team car of uh, Marcel van Berlo. And there, Glock dropping down into the final turn. In fact, the final of the Porsche heading into the pit lane, I think, just ahead of him. So, drama's there, perhaps. But Timo Glock heads down the main straight in blissful isolation, really, at the moment. Nothing particularly going on uh, around him. In fact, there's not a huge amount going on at the front of the order either right now. Those gaps are growing rather than shrinking. So, uh, I was with you. I thought that perhaps Johannes Kapfinger might have an answer for Quanda Makuena uh, in the uh, second half of the race. Actually, the opposite proving to be true. Uh, and that gap now up to uh, four seconds. Although, they're in amongst traffic, or they will be shortly. This is for Beeblehouse, the race leader, negotiating some back markers. And that, as we know, uh, can make quite a big difference. Yes, it can. Ibrahim Badawi there just drifting wide. I think not what Finn Wiebelhaus expected him to do, but he anticipated it nicely, made sure he didn't end up in any strife there. Yeah, he's already lapped up to uh, 16th place. That's uh, Simon Birch just ahead of him. In fact, up to 15th place because Birch has overtaken Badawi on the previous lap. Uh, and actually just ahead of Badawi, third in cut four. Uh, now is Milos Pavlovich. So Pavlovich, he's taken over the Autosport racing car, a former Lamborghini Super Trofeo champion, uh, now sits third uh, in the Cup 4 ranks. And Pavlovich uh, coaching Alessio Ruffini, the other driver in that car. You can expect that thing to fly. Not sure that he's going to make up any positions, though, on Andrew, uh, Adrian Lewandowski and certainly not Almery Bonduel in the time that's left. No, I suspect that you are probably right. Through goes uh, the Mercedes on the inside line at turn number three. And uh, we'll tighten up more once again, looking at what is still a very moody sky, but yeah. uh, so far uh, that rain not arriving with us here at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. We only have to survive another quarter of an hour or so. Uh, we can call this a pretty perfect end uh, to the GT Winter Series. Uh, Fantastic racing round on round. The 52 team, 52 invented name. Uh, Porsche is in the pit lane, and that is uh, Guillaume Gjortza, uh, who is going to be jumping into the car, or is in the car, uh, I suspect, for the second half of the race. Mercedes about to lap. Ferrari, which is uh, not exactly <laughs> getting out of the way, uh, heading in towards turn number 10. That's the last thing you want to see as the race leader, isn't it? A lapped car almost actively defending. It can be difficult, though, for the lapped drivers, unless they're being told on the radio, that is the leader behind you. Blue flags, get out of the way. With the low sun especially, it can be difficult sometimes to see the flags and uh, to know exactly who it is that's coming up behind you, whether they are someone battling you for position or someone that you really ought to be jumping out of the way of. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, for the driver of the number four, Finn Wiebelhaus, if anything, this is good training for him for any multi-class racing he might want to do in the future. Any teams that want an extra young hand in the N24 might be taking notes and saying, Lee seems to be able to deal with lap traffic. Can we see if he can uh, manage the zenith of lap traffic? <laughs> this is the Nürburgring 24-hour race. Uh, side by side for position there, I think. In fact, no, because Samuele Buttarelli 
is a long way down in Rosso Corsa's 296, but you do see the Ferrari 296 is going at it there. Butarelli a couple of laps down on Pierre Ellett after the dramas for that 74 car earlier on. But uh, what a treat to see two of these 296 GT3s going at it. The uh, second year for this car just coming in now, of course. Uh, the first of the Orica built Ferrari GT3s after many, many moons of Michelotto controlling all things Ferrari GT building. Uh, Milos Pavlovic has just gone past there, Joachim Bolting, that's for 12th overall in the race. So uh, the Cup 3 third place driver just getting demoted there as Finn Wiebelhaus uh, tries to find a way past both of them. Uh, look at Milos Pavlovic uh, in that all carbon fibre Lamborghini though, that car looks absolutely incredible. We do have a yellow flag on the straight as well as a drive-through penalty for two of our cars but one of them's a 52 that's already in the pit lane. The Team 52 car of uh, Guillaume Giorza. The other the 56 is Villico Motorsports Caleb Bergman. Uh, both instances for a pit stop time infringement. I believe it was 72 second minimum for this weekend and uh, both of their stops fell short of that marker. Indeed so. Should point out as well, we were following quite closely that Cup 2 battle before the pit stops. Well, after the pit stops, that's resolved itself very much in the favour of Hubert Darmetko. Uh, he is now something like 14 seconds, I think, up the road, 13.3 uh, seconds up the road, from the Rakar Motorsport car due to Speppers. Uh, but Speppers on the previous lap, yeah, was about half a second slower, so that gap growing rather than shrinking at the moment which is a shame because that was a very entertaining battle whilst it lasted in the early stages. One gap that is coming down in traffic though, Adam, is the one between Makawena and Catfinger. I suspect that it is traffic induced, but even so, uh, we could still be in for a grandstand finish once more between those two. Just to quickly circle back around to Darmetko, he has unannounced, I will add, uh, they didn't declare this on Friday with the driver nominations, uh, they do have Matthias Lozowski in the car, a former uh, Blancpain Silver Cup champion, a former Trocker R Cup champion who we've seen every weekend. Thought it was weird that he wasn't on the entry list, but he's in the number seven car for this endurance race, for the last half of the endurance race. So he is the one leading Cup 2 on behalf of Hubert Darmetko. They're sharing a car like they did in Aragon. Again, that wasn't on the entry list, but fair enough. And uh, he is more than capable of going lap for lap, blow for blow with Dieter Sveps is just managing that gap. We ride on board with the KTM as it follows uh, some of the fighting further back, uh, the number 55 car. But uh, to your point regarding Mokoena, uh, he is certainly on the move, as is this man Dan Arrow, who's moved up into fifth place now. He's gotten past Amory Bonduel uh, for fifth overall. And uh, obviously was always going to be the case, a Trofeo car up against a GT3 with two pros at the wheel. That is always going to be how it plays out. Um, but I do think the closest battle out there on circuit is the one you're alluding to between Mokowina and Catfinger, albeit with Catfinger registering a slow lap, again, traffic. Uh, yeah, it's so difficult to read, isn't it, for us and for the drivers. You know, the drivers start to gain a bit of ground, they see that car in front of them getting closer, and then suddenly all of that hard work are done because they've come across a, a car on an apex somewhere where neither one of them really can do anything about it. Big slide coming out of uh, the penultimate turn there for Amuri Bonduel. Uh, the Lamborghini driver slithering his way out of the final turn as well. I think the rear tyres on that Lambo are uh, probably past their prime, uh, and that maybe explains why he's losing pace in the uh, latter stages of the race as well. But uh, he'll be enjoying himself out there. Drops down into the first corner, maybe just snatches the inside brake slightly. Such a steep downhill drop. I think only really the onboard camera does that justice. You can see just how steep it is and just how cambered uh, the first couple of corners are as well as you wind your way uphill through turn three. Again, the car wandering out towards the edge of the road. I don't think that was the intended line for a Murray Bonduel. He's sort of going where the car wants him to at the moment. Yeah, I think, I think the raging bull is dictating direction, <laughs> isn't it, at the moment. Roland Arnold is under some pressure from Manuel Lauk out there on the circuit. Lauk was a, a good five seconds a lap faster uh, than Roland Arnold on the last lap. So the green and black Schnitzelau triple one car is likely about to lose out on seventh overall as Manuel Lauk uh, recovers his way through the back after taking over from Jürg Dreisov. Uh, that for seventh overall, just a little way further back actually from this car, the 28 machine. 
Uh, but uh, Manuel not quite fighting for the lead in the manner that he did this time 12 months ago. But still enjoying his race out there. In fact, I say just behind, just behind on the timing screen, yes, but over 30 seconds back from Henri Bonduel on the circuit. So once Manuel Lapp does pass Roland Arnold, and it looks like he will, uh, that is probably going to be all the overtaking he gets to do for position. The gap between second and third comes down again that time around. Quicker lap for Johannes Kautfinger. Uh, quicker by about half a second or so, so lost half a second the lap before, gained it right back again on the very next lap, but he's running out of time really, seven minutes plus one lap still to go in this one, and uh, can Johannes Kapfinger get there, even if he can, he's not really giving himself an awful lot of time to uh, to make the move stick, so we'll wait and see whether he can get one back over on uh, Quanda Makuena, who uh, pipped him earlier on today. Uh, I'm sure he's extra motivated to try and do so after that race earlier on this morning, but it's not going to be the easiest of things to do. No, absolutely not. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Manuel Lauk has gotten past Roland Arnold out on circuit, so seventh position has changed hands. This is for ninth overall, then Hubert Darmetko leads Cup 2. Wouldn't mind getting past uh, Adrian Lewandowski. These two have gone at it a few times. Two of our more consistent entries across the season, the GT3 Poland Lamborghini and Hubert Darmetko in the PTT racing car. Uh, my thanks to Andy McEwen, who now heads down to the podium for the final time. I believe I'm following suit during the ceremonies to come and uh, uh, wrap up with yourself and Izzy. Andy, I look forward to that as the sun goes down. There's Kenneth Heyer in fourth position, just behind the 992 car, which seemingly has a new tyre on it. So they did recover uh, the 992 car back to the pits after it was uh, limping back around earlier on for Keanu Bloom. Uh, the 11 car just behind of Kenneth Heyer on the move. We also have one car going wide there through turn nine. That is the 56 Porsche. So the... Villico entered car, just going a bit wide. Kalle Bergman has had a bit of a mixed weekend here, uh, but will be happy to reach the flag in this one. There, once again, is uh, the other Myrtle car. That is the 830 machine running currently second in class. This is the car that is the target of Timo Glock. Uh, Glock is about 10 seconds back at the moment, lapping four seconds faster, so he might actually... Uh, get through into second in class before the end. Out wide there goes the Cup 3 car of Noah Stromstead. He runs 18th overall. Ibrahim Badawi may have just had a bit of a moment uh, coming out of turn four, but continues on his way. Stromstead all the way down in 18th place, but uh, showed some real pace well within the top 10 in the sprint races earlier on. So Finn Wiebelhaus leads the way by 12.6 seconds here in the season finale of the GT Winter Series. It's a race that he uh, leads over Kwanda Mokowena, his own teammate, much to the delight of uh, the birthday celebrator, that being Leah, the team manager, and, of course, uh, their driver coach, Manuel Reuter, their mentor, now, Panda Makuina there in second place. Johannes Kapfinger in third. Kenneth Heyer in fourth place, although Heyer is being outpaced uh, by Dan Arrow. Dan Arrow is closing in uh, on Heyer at quite a rate, actually. They're just coming through the final corner now, so if we stay uh, somewhere around here, we will see the battle for fourth place as it develops. Um, we'll just see them in the back of Scott. There's Dan Arrow now as Adrian Lewandowski goes rally crossing. Looks like turn five. Yes, it is. He rejoins the race, albeit now probably behind Hubert Darmetko and possibly a couple of others as well. There is Dan Arrow. He's now within three seconds of Kenneth Heyer. 2.9 seconds is the gap. The number 14 Mercedes AMG GT3 is on the hunt for this man, Kenneth Heyer. Heyer wants to end this season strong. Obviously is champion along with J-Mo Hartling in the GT Winter Series. But uh, a good solid finish would do him the world of good going into the summer, as it would all of our drivers, of course. You want to end the winter season on a high before focusing in on the summer. And Dan Arrow with some lap traffic between himself and Hyatt, with two minutes and 50 seconds left to go in this race. It's more than likely going to be 
Oh, there's a Porsche sliding behind him. But Dan Arrow is more than likely to be on the tail of Kenneth Heyer before the end of this race, I'm sure. Question is, can Kenneth Heyer hold the elbows out and keep him at bay? Dan Arrow allowed through there by Ibrahim Badawi. We're going to find out who's going to come out on top very, very soon. The gap out to 14 seconds between Wiebelhaus and Mokoena. As Badawi's Lamborghini sings into turn 13. Here is your battle then for P4. Dan Arrow certainly pressing on the driver who has had great success in uh, GT Open and uh, in GT3 racing generally marking himself out as one of the young Dutch prospects uh, in GT3 racing at the moment and the rate of closing on that uh, number 11 car is plain to see while that's going on the 115 uh, of Pierre Ellett has been given a drive-through uh, for overtaking under safety car. I think that would have been earlier on when Christian Hook was at the wheel, but the penalty has been assigned nonetheless. Dan Arrow right on the back then of Kenneth Heyer with a minute and 20 seconds of this race left to go. We should be on the penultimate lap of the race uh, right now. I think Finn Wiebelhaus will cross the line to begin the final lap very soon. So Dan Arrow not got much mileage to play with here if he wants to make the move. Kenneth Heyer defending as they go through turn seven and eight. Wiebelhaus has just broken the timing beam to begin the final lap, and Dan Arrow has only a few more shots to try and get past Kenneth Heyer. Hubert Darmetko leading in Cup 2, and just behind him is our overall race leader as Dan Arrow looks to the inside at turn 10. Kenneth Heyer there wanted to avoid contact, went deep into the corner, focusing on missing Dan Arrow. And uh, he gets uh, fifth place for his troubles. Arrow up to fourth place with that move then in the final moments of the race. Kenneth Heyer uh, drops down to P5. Finn Wiebelhaus, had he been a full season entrant in this GT Winter Series, who knows quite what the results would have been. But even with his limited participation, he has made a huge impact uh, on the GT Winter Series. In fact, uh, with his results in this race, I believe he will potentially uh, move up to fourth in the standings. Uh, he will be celebrating another race victory in just a few corners as he closes in on the fellow GT3 of Roland Arnold and puts a lap on Cup 2 leader Hubert Darmetko. We once again have to take a step back and really take note, remember the name, uh, the number four car, Finn Wiebelhaus, is going to make it eight wins in the GT Winter Series. In fact, my apologies, seven wins in the GT Winter Series from nine attempts. A hugely impressive scorecard coming out of his season. He claims the final win of the year. Kwanda Mokoena will cross the line in second place. He'll be about 16 seconds down the road coming through the final corners as we speak. There is Mokoena and there is Johannes Katfinger who couldn't quite close in on Mokoena over the course of the stint. Uh, Johannes Katfinger will take third place. Dan Arrow will take fourth position after that move we saw on Kenneth Heyer. They're just going through the last few turns at the moment. Uh, Almery Bonjuel behind them in sixth place. We ride on board with Almery as he turns into turn 10 for the final time. Championship winner in the GT Win Series, Kenneth Heyer, will round out the final endurance race of the season in fifth place. Here he comes through the last corner now. Hartling and Heyer taking fifth place. Uh, car number three, I must say, just after crossing the line for second, is under investigation for driving on the pit exit white line um, as he came out of the pit. So that could be a twist in that tail as the Cup 4 winner, Almery Bonjuel, comes flying out of the final corner to secure sixth overall. Manuel Lauk will come across the line in seventh. He will be one of the last cars to cross the line. And for JVO Racing, Timo Glock 
has moved up into second in Cup 1. So the 88 Ferrari coming around the final corner now will take second in Cup 1 behind Matt Griffin. Timo Glock recovers to uh, second in Cup 1, moving up the order rather than down the order as he so famously did about 15 and a half years ago. Great result then for Finn Wiebelhaus to once again uh, secure a victory in the GT Winter Series. You can see why the uh, DMSB have chosen Finn Wiebelhaus to represent Germany in the FI Motorsport Games uh, in the GT Sprint element of that event uh, in Valencia later in the year. Finn really comes off like someone who is going to be quite the special GT racing talent. He will be heading into pit lane as we speak. There is the number four car heading back at the conclusion of a hugely successful race and a hugely successful part season in the GT Winter Series. Mokoena and Catfinger, the rest of your overall podium. Hopefully they see that uh, the number four car is meant to come to the podium. This time they do indeed realize that. And uh, the number four car heads under the podium now. Another win for HRT, another win uh, for Finn Wiebelhaus. Team manager Leah will be celebrating with P1 trophies uh, on her birthday. We've had a little bit of archie-bargy as everyone tries to get themselves into Park Ferme. Eh? Uh, have we incidentally caught Quanda Mokowena? Yes, we have. Mokowena will come down to the podium as, of course, will Johannes Kampfinger. There we see Wiebelhaus uh, being helped out of the car by the Haupt Racing team crew. Haupt, a big organization. AMG are using them to develop some of the promising young talent that they have their eye on. Wiebelhaus, Mokowina, two chief among them. Cup finger twins, of course, landing in the same destination in the summer uh, as Mokowina and Wiebelhaus. They'll both be competing in the summer in the ADAC GT Masters. Uh, but in terms of the GT Winter Series, Finn Wiebelhaus has certainly left a big impression uh, on the paddock. There's his dad congratulating him. There's Manuel Reuter also congratulating him for that effort. Finn Wiebelhaus with a near unblemished record in the uh, GT Win Series. Seven wins from nine is quite an achievement. Of course, one of those races was up purely under safety car, so he couldn't actually do much about it. That was race one yesterday. The other time he didn't win, he was right behind J-Mo Hartling in his very first GT3 race in Portimao in January. Van der Mokowena celebrates as well in second position. Continue to see the debrief ongoing with the Haupt Racing Team mechanics. Bieber House will be elated with that result, and we'll hear from Izzy Browning for the final time down in the uh, interview pen at least uh, with Finn Wiebelhaus in just a few moments. He's always quite reserved, but I think he has a lot of reason to be buoyant coming into the summer. A lot of exciting announcements. That FIA Motorsport Games announcement came, uh, I think, on Friday, uh, that he'll be representing Germany in that and uh, really is a very promising young talent, as is Marco Ena, as is uh, the Capfinger family as well. Uh, expect both of them to make some uh, big appearances and big steps over the years. Um, of course, Johannes Capfinger, the outgoing champion in the GT Winter Series, high and heartling this year's champs. But this race's winner is Finn Wiebelhaus, and he's down with Izzy now. Yes, for the final time, I am with our winner, Finn Wiebelhaus. Finn, you've done it again. That looked lovely. Yeah, it was a good dry drive, I guess, yeah. And uh, you looked like you were dealing with a little bit of traffic coming through there at, at one point, but you still managed to take it with a pretty pretty big gap at the end. Yeah, it's uh, it's good training to manage the, the traffic. Uh, also for the Nordschleife races uh, later on, maybe, if I do some of these. Uh, so it's a good practice, yeah. 
And I mean, you haven't done a full season in this Winter Series paddock, but you've still taken seven wins, I think it is now. So that's pretty impressive. That would look like the uh, the record of someone who has done a full season. So you must be very proud. Yeah, uh, the season went, uh, the, or the three race we did went uh, really good. So yeah, uh, it was a perfect preparation for the GT Masters. So yeah, now we focus on the GT Masters and uh, yeah, it was a perfect season. Yeah. I'm sure you'd like to thank your team quickly. Yeah, for sure. The whole team did an amazing job. Uh, yeah, we did a one, two in two races, so the car was really good. And uh, yeah, big thanks uh, to the guys. Yeah. All right, we'll let you get off up to the podium for the final time. We'll see you soon. There's our final winner of the day. I'm a bit sad we've come to the end of the day and the end of the season, but for now we're going to head back up to Adam in commentary. Thank you very much, Izzy. Uh, yeah, great result there from uh, Finn Wiebelhaus. Great to hear from him. And uh, he and I are on the same wavelength. Did you note that he mentioned their uh, Nordschleifer races? I said that that traffic management training might come in handy there one day. That day might be sooner than I was thinking. Uh, so then... We will, in a few moments' time, of course, focus in on the podiums, but I believe we'll have uh, some highlights to look at before that, in theory. Uh, we'll go there in just a second. In fact, we'll go there now. Let's take a look at the highlights of that race. It was a perfect start to what would be a perfect race for the Haupt Racing team Mercedes AMGs, albeit with one spoiler, the car with the big spoiler, the Lamborghini Super Trofeo entry of Amri Bonduel briefly had second place, but fell to fourth by the first corner. Uh, under braking, that Trofeo car not quite as strong. Jamo Hartling making his way up the order early doors as he tried to recover from outside the top 10 on the grid. Rosso Corsa's 74 car, the Myrtle Motorsport 81, got involved with Marcel Van Berlo. That caused the first safety car of the day. Van Berlo was judged to be at fault. Meanwhile, Amri Bonduel let Jamo Hartling through to focus on his own race, knowing that GT3 car wasn't going to stay behind for long. Uh, into a spin went Christian Hook as Thomas Anderson tagged him. And the Cup 2 fight for the class lead at this point had some interlopers, including Adrian Lewandowski in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo car. A puncture for the 992 machine. Unfortunately, not a great weekend for them, but we hope to see them back before too long. The uh, Capfinger car under some tra uh, pressure in the traffic as we continue to see uh, the car struggling back uh, to the pit lane with the puncture, the 992 Cup 2 entry. Uh, Kwanda, Mokuena and Finn Wiebelhaus were dominating at the front of the order, though. Mokuena was managing the gap back to Mikhail Kapfinger in third, Johannes Kapfinger in the second phase of the race, all while Finn Wiebelhaus disappeared up the road and number 28 of Amri Bonduel uh, continued to valiantly fight in the top 10. Not quite able, though, to match the GT3 cars. We had a few sloppy moments in the sunset as drivers tried to find grip and towards the end of the race, maybe some of them started to come off the boil. Adrian Lewandowski made an error. Kenneth Heyer's pace was allowing Dan Arrow to claw back the gap. And on the penultimate lap of the race, he would dive to the inside and get past Kenneth Heyer for what would be fourth position. But no one could get anywhere near Finn Wiebelhaus, who showed a dominant display and a clean pair of heels to the rest of the field for his seventh win of the GT Winter Series season. So then, the Haupt Racing team delighted with the efforts of Finn. They will have a lot of cause for optimism with how their two young chargers have competed in the GT Winter Series. I believe we'll now take a look at the results of that one uh, in just a moment, uh, hopefully. And uh, of course, it was Finn Wiebelhaus that uh, took the win. Kwanda Mokowena was second place. I'm quickly running through the top 10 since it was on the screen. It was on the screen anyway. But Mikhail Katfinger was the third part of the overall podium. Cup four uh, went, of course, uh, to Almery Bonduel. Cup two uh, went 
to Hubert Darmetko along with Matthias Lizovsky. Cup one uh, going to Matt Griffin and John Dillon. The Cup three class going to the Stromstead family and GTX, a class of one. That, of course, was the Razoon Racing KTM number 55. Uh, no graphic available for that one, but those were your class winners and your important positions at the end of a brilliant GT Winter Series race number three. Of course, the drivers being shepherded to the podium, not just the drivers uh, for this race, but also the championship podium to consider as well as we wrap up this GT Winter Series season. Uh, our first full season of live streaming this championship and of course all the other Giedlick Racing Winter Series uh, categories uh, along with the live streaming partners Alpha Live. It has been incredible so far and we are going to celebrate in this paddock I'm sure and we're going to celebrate on the podiums in just a few moments. We'll be Andy McEwen, the Master of Ceremonies for that final podium bash. Uh, of course, Anna Estevens, or Mena as I should call her, uh, is from uh, is working hard to get everybody up onto that podium as we speak. What a way to round out the season, though, at the circuit Barcelona Catalunya. This circuit always attracts big entries, uh, especially in the GT Winter Series. A lot of drivers want to have a go on this circuit. It is, of course, popular on various summer calendars in southern Europe in the months when normally it's too cold to even dare tread on, tread on the tarmac. Speaking of uh, treading on the tarmac, you see our marshals there walking home at the moment, and we thank them uh, for their efforts this weekend. And we once again uh, pass on our thoughts to the family uh, of uh, David Gill, who we had a minute silence for before the GT4 race. Uh, he was a big part of this circuit for a long time, big part of the marshalling team, and great to see that he was memorised today and memorialised today uh, coming into the afternoon's racing. The marshals, no matter where we are uh, in the world, are a huge part of what makes motor racing happen, and we absolutely could not do it without them. So our thanks to them as the sun starts to go down over the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia. I can see that uh, various people in white jackets are uh, doing some liaising with drivers at the moment uh, down near the podium. So we should have a full quota of drivers before too long as the sun sets here over the circuit. And for the last time as the sun sets, Andy McEwen can have the spotlight with our drivers to the podium. So for the final time this weekend, then we're gathered on the podium for our final podium presentations of the 2024 GT Winter Series. Once again, we have got our race podium and then our championship presentations to make. So let's begin with our top three in GT3 for our final race of the season, starting with the third place finishers, Michael Katfinger and Johannes Katfinger. The cap fingers busy chatting to other drivers backstage. We'll uh, get them out very shortly. Not sure if you're hearing this in the grandstands at the moment either, but hopefully you are. We'd like to get you all involved in the celebration. The cap fingers, third place in GT3, out onto the podium they go. Uh, second place in GT3 for our final race of the season, making part of a HRT 1-2 was Quanda Makoena. <laughs> And our race winner for the final time this season, also for the Haupt Racing Team. Welcome to the podium, Finn Wiebelhaus. He punches the air with delight as the race winner for the final round of the 2024 GT4 Winter Series. Uh, now, already the cap fingers are readying the bottles of champagne. We've got trophies to be handed out first, boys, so just bear with a second. The trophies, I think, are on their way to you, and uh, then we will be spraying the champagne. Uh, hopefully the trophies are on their way anyway. They've earned a trophy, they've earned a drink as well, but we need to just wait a moment on that uh, until the trophies make their way out onto the podium. 
it's honestly I wish you could see how busy it is in the room behind the podium here we must have about 30 people all queuing up waiting to come out on the podium it is barely organized chaos but here come the trophies uh, for our top three in the GT3 category uh, for the final race of the GT winter series so third place for Michael and Johannes Capfinger second Quanda Makawena and the race victory for Finn Wiebelhaus so a uh, very, very strong day for the Haupt Racing team. They judged that one to perfection. Wiebelhaus dominant. Uh, Makoena had to fend off the cap fingers, particularly in the opening half of the race. But after the pit stops, came out with a handy little margin and was able to bring home the HRT 1-2. Now I am going to make my way very quickly off the podium because the champagne flies uh, here at the Circuit de Barcelona Catalunya as our GT3 drivers celebrate for the final time in 2024. For the time being, they've for many of them got a full season of GT racing still to come. Uh, but for winter series action, that is everything. I think that might be Finn Wiebelhaus who has very quickly made it down to the bottom of the stairs to go and soak his team and the cars as well. Uh, quick on and off the track our hrt race winner right then we are able i think in a moment to move on to the uh, cup one category a fresh set of uh, bottles of bubbly uh, will be brought out and uh, a couple of interesting names to be welcomed onto the podium in the next moment or so <laughs> we need two more bottles of champagne otherwise we'll have two very disappointed drivers on the uh, third step of the podium it may be the bottom step of the podium but they've still earned themselves their reward which is now in place so i think we can now welcome our top three in the cup one category uh, for the final race of the season in third place Maurizio Serasoli and Mark Spikabas onto the podium they go the third step for you guys third in the cup one category uh, which produced some fantastic racing all season long in second place we've got uh, Frank Kevitz and Timo Glock Congratulations, guys. Second step of the podium for them. But for the second time today, the race victory in the Cup 1 class goes to AF Corsa, Matt Griffin and John Dillon. And on to the top step, a familiar uh, place for the AF Corsa pairing, who have been racing together for an awfully long time now. They've built a brilliant relationship and they work incredibly well together. As the case for the other teams up there, though, Mark Speakerhouse and Maurizio Tierra Soli. Uh, third place, Timo Glock, who uh, is a very welcome addition to the grid this weekend with Frank Kevitz and John Dillon and Matt Griffin on the top step, which is where they will pose for the photographs. and smiles all round for the big crowd that are based uh, down below and indeed the spectators who have been here all weekend long even weather was truly appalling we had lots of spectators in the grandstands enjoying the show i think we're saving the bubbly no we're not saving the bubbly timo clock almost gets me uh, as he pops the cork off and uh, yes i think they do now decide it's time for celebration on the podium as the champagne sprays once again here at catalonia so well done for our Cup 1 drivers. We'll let you go uh, and prepare the podium for the next of the five classes that we have uh, in the GT Winter Series. The Cup 2 category, which produced some of the very best racing, actually, particularly uh, through the first half of that race. The Porsche Cup cars uh, were almost inseparable and uh, some brilliant overtaking manoeuvres were made uh, in the early stages of the race. And... Uh, that is the kind of racing you expect to see really from such a competitive one mate category really nice to have them incorporated uh, within the gt winter series and we can now welcome our top three teams then third place in cup two went the way of joachim bolting joachim i think was taking a seat resting his legs he'll be with you all in a second let's try that again third place in class joachim bolting <laughs> Back out onto the podium, he will go then in second place in Cup 2, Dieter's Feppers and Leandro Martin. Second place, nice runners up position for them in the Rakar racing car. Uh, but the race victory went to Hubert Darmetko and Mateusz Lizowski. Hubert not able to make it out onto the podium, unfortunately, at the end of the day. But Mateus will be here uh, to collect the trophies on their behalves. And also we'll see him again a little bit later on uh, for the uh, champion.
celebration too. Again, eager with the champagne. They're preparing the champagne before they get their trophies. That's the big prize, the trophy, uh, not the bottle of bubbly. But they're making their intentions known. We know exactly where this uh, celebration is going to go within the next moment or two. But they've earned it after putting on a brilliant show uh, in all of the races this season, but particularly that uh, final race of the season. The Cup 2 battle uh, was among the most competitive. And they gather together on the top step of the podium. The air horns, or horns are blasting down below. And now, once again, time to vacate the podium. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay that was a fairly brief champagne shower actually oh no not safe to get out just yet a staggered start to the champagne shower that time around now they've all got it going <laughs> and Joachim Bolting uh, is the last to get a good soaking <laughs> as he's chased around the podium uh, by Leandro Martins fantastic camaraderie between the drivers uh, within the cup two division so back off the podium they'll go and uh, we get ready now for the cup four class and again some uh, cup four cars that were troubling some of the gt3 machines uh, in that race particularly off the line we almost had one of the uh, cup four cars breaking through into the lead of the race but in the end uh, that uh, wasn't to be but they were still very much a factor as they have been all season long so let's get our third placed cup four driver out onto the podium please welcome once more adrian Lewandowski. Again, a familiar sight on the podiums this season. Second place pairing, Alessia Rufin and Milos Pavlovic. They head up onto the second uh, rung of the podium. But as we saw earlier on today, it's BDR Competition who are doing the bulk of the celebrating in Cup 4, courtesy of their race winner, Amari Bonduel. And a second victory of the day for Amori, uh, who wanders up onto the podium, poses for his pictures. Solo driver, of course, as was the case for Lewandowski, going the full distance, two full races actually today, uh, with not a huge amount of rest in between. So a busy day for the drivers. Perfect training, therefore, uh, for a busy 2024 season that I'm sure they have ahead of them. So they all should know the drill by now. They bunch together on the top step of the podium. There's just about space uh, for them all to fit on there. They pose for the cameras. And then who's going to win the race to open the bottle of champagne this time? They've missed a trick. None of them have pre-prepared their corks this time. So uh, it's going to be a real race this to see who can unbottle, uncork the bottles first. And rather suitably, I think, it's a very bon duel who wins that particular race and uh, is the first to soak his fellow uh, Cup 4 competitors. So well done to the Cup 4 drivers then. We'll let you get off the podium. We'll see uh, our champion, of course, out onto the podium in just a few minutes time. But we've got one more uh, race podium to complete, and that is for the GTX category. Once again, just the one car uh, entered, but it continued running flawlessly until the chequered flag. And they therefore, uh, both of them this time, uh, will make their way deservedly onto the top step of the podium. Sorry. <laughs> Once again, a bottle of champagne will lie in wait then for our GTX class winners. Welcome to the podium, please. Thomas Anderson and Simon Birch. And this time, Simon not alone up on the podium. Thomas uh, putting his fair share of the driving in that time around. Now, they've got one bottle of champagne to share between them. I don't know how that's going to work. I say you share it in the hotel later on, personally, uh, rather than waste it uh, up on the podium. If nothing else, that means I might stay safe and dry just for a little bit longer. Posing for pictures, and then it is almost time to move on to the champions. But there we go, sensible stuff. They're going to keep the drink uh, for the uh, end of season party that is to come. Right then, so we've got uh, just the three more trophies to present. They're the three big ones, really. This is the final round of the GT Winter Series Championship, after all. And we have our top three drivers, uh, top three teams for the 2024 GT Winter Series almost ready uh, to head out uh, onto the podium after a, a very condensed season of racing. We've only been racing for a month and a half or so. We've built, uh, packed some really brilliant racing in. And we have a deserving champion who two 
two champions, in fact, who will very shortly uh, be making their way out towards us. <laughs> So let's start then, shall we, with the uh, third placed team in the GT Winter Series for 2024. It's PTT Racing and uh, up here on the podium on his own today, Mateusz Lizowski. Who has run downstairs? <laughs> I hope he's he's on his way. He's on his way. We're told. Didn't get the memo that he. This is the this is what he's been fighting for all season long. This is the big prize, and he'd forgotten about it. So uh, Mateus, hopefully, will be there. He is, Mateus Lizowski. <laughs> Which place? Third. <laughs> Which place, he asks me. <laughs> Did he finish in the championship? Excellent to know that he was keeping score all along. Right then, second place overall uh, in the GT Winter Series Championship for Rakar Motorsport, Dieter Sveppers and Leandro Martins. Yeah. <laughs> who are ready to accept their prize for second place. They head over and congratulate Mateus, who is receiving the third place trophy on behalf of Hubert Darmetko, his teammate as well. But our champions at the end of a long, difficult season, they wrapped it up actually yesterday afternoon in the race that really never was, but they are still deserving champions despite a difficult day here today uh, in Barcelona. Welcome to the podium for SR Motorsport, Kenneth Heyer and Jamo Hartling. And an enormous cheer from the crowd down below and the Schnitzlaum, Schnitzlaum racing Mercedes AMG pairing head to the top of the GT Winter Series podium. And now the big trophies are brought out. Uh, first of all, actually, to our second place finisher, Jesus Peppers and Leandro Martins. Hubert Darmetko not able to make it to the podium, but Mateusz Lazowski here to collect both of their trophies. And Jamer Hartling and Kenneth Heyer, of course, uh, are your 2024 champions. So once again, a big round of applause then for our champions at the end of the GT Winter Series campaign. And uh, I suspect once again, it's almost time to go and hide around the corner. Uh, they're already pretty wet and sticky at this point. So what's one more champagne shower? The perfect way uh, to round out their season. They're not waiting for any more photos. There goes the champagne as the 2024 GT Winter Series comes to a close. Again, a bit of a staggered start. The corks are off. The champagne's flying. Everyone in party mood here at the Circuit of Barcelona, Catalonia. And uh, rightly so at the end of a brilliant, brilliant season of racing. <laughs> A very lengthy champagne shower, this one as well. The Schnitzel Alm racing team getting every drop <laughs> out of the bottle. And uh, Jamo Hartling bearing the brunt of that, courtesy of his teammate Kenneth Hyatt. Uh, but uh, the party, I suspect, only just beginning up here uh, on the Barcelona to Catalunya podium. So congratulations once more then to our drivers. Thank you everyone for uh, gathering down below to make the podium ceremonies as special as they have been. Uh, we are very much nearly at the end now of the winter series, but the season only just beginning as we move into what is a busy year of racing in 2024. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to the podium for the final time of the Winter Series season. It's a little bit soggy down here, a little bit covered in, uh, covered in champagne. I am delighted to say that I am joined by both of our commentators from today. Adam Weller and Andy McEwen. Guys, it has been a fantastic season finale, hasn't it? Adam, you have been here all season, you must have thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, Barcelona is always a bit of a festival atmosphere within the GT Wind Series paddock. I think all of us know it's, it's end of term before we all 
go off into our various summer plans. And yeah, there's, there's great camaraderie in this paddock, always really good camaraderie. And yeah, I, I'm sure that the festivities aren't done yet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure as well. Andy, your first time in the Winter Series paddock this weekend. Only joined us for one weekend, but it's been an eventful one. So how have you found it? Uh, yeah, pretty eventful, I think, is a good way to sum it up, really. I've really enjoyed myself. It's, as Adam says, a really friendly paddock, really well organised operation as well. And, uh, you know, it's not the easiest of jobs herding the drivers up to the podiums, but I really enjoy it because you get to sort of witness that raw emotion at the end of the race. And as Adam said, the camaraderie, they all really genuinely seem to get on quite well, even at the end of the season, where normally there's a, a few rivalries brewing. Doesn't really seem to be the case here. So uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Great racing. My first visit to this circuit as well. And, uh, yeah, very impressed. That is absolutely true. And today we have, I'm pleased to say, been blessed by the weather. I uh, I will correct myself from earlier. I was very sure we were going to get some rain because I was seeing some very dark clouds, but the rain never really came. So it has stayed dry for us. OK, you know what's coming. Let's do highlight of the day first and then we'll do highlight of the season. You've got time to think. <laughs> OK, highlight of the day. I'm not going to take the obvious one, so Andy can potentially take it. Uh, <laughs> highlight of the day, I would say, uh, was probably Amory Bonjuel for me, actually, in that Trofeo car. It's one of my favourite elements of the GT Win Series in general, that you have those multiple cars, uh, multiple specs of cars all together. And Amory was, once again, a brilliant example of that. He's a very, very quick racing driver. He was fighting the GT3 cars, and at least on the straights, winning. All right, perfect. You've had some time to think, so you know I'm coming to you. Highlight of the day? To be honest, I didn't need that long to think. I'm going to take the low-hanging fruit that was left for me by Adam and say the, the final GT4 race of the season. I mean, what a battle that was. Uh, the elite motorsport bearing, doing quite literally everything they could think of to try and get that race victory. And uh, do you know what? I, I talk quite a lot about track limits and I, how it sometimes over-sanitizes racing. It was sort of nice to see them just going absolutely hell for leather and uh, throwing everything at it. A bit of pre-season fun for them and... Uh, some cracking cracking racing when we got the racing underway today in all of the categories it was hugely entertaining well you've taken the one that i was uh, gonna say as well but i will just say i was on the edge of my seat for that gt4 race i mean my heart was beating after the interview which i don't usually get so i went up to that team and i was like wow that was something special to watch so highlight of the season come on hit me with it I mean, to be honest, it might have just happened. PTT Racing just tried to sell a fourth Porsche to Leandro Martins down there off camera. I just watched that happen. Uh, highlight of the season in reality, I think, is probably the Formula Wind Series as a whole. Um, last year's Formula Wind Series, inaugural season, it all came together quite late. There was a testing ban in place in Spanish F4 that meant category people competing in that couldn't do FWS. A partnership was created during the off-season between the Spanish F4 organisers and Gidlick Racing, and that has blossomed FWS into this incredible category where we had no fewer than 35 cars starting in every single race of the year. That's special, and I can't wait to see how it goes in 2025. I have to say I do agree that FWS grid has been incredible, and like you've said many times on commentary, so amazing to see so many young drivers just just absolutely, you know, hammering home the laps and, and having their first times in, uh, in FWS four cars i know you haven't been with us all season but i'm still gonna put you on the spot a little bit highlight of the season or you can give me another highlight of the day well i could really shock you by saying something that happened at hereth couldn't i but I, that's <laughs> i'm not gonna say that i mean i do agree about the the formula winter series actually i'm not always a huge fan of single seat racing but that field it, it just really gets you on the edge of the seat when they're all pouring into that first corner together but for me GT racing is my thing and seeing the biggest grid I think that we would had for quite some time uh, certainly for most of this season racing here and such an eclectic mix of cars myself and Adam were chatting about this during the race it's rare that you get to see the cup cl class cars a GT2 spec car on the same grid as a, a grid of GT3s competitive grid of GT3s as well so that for me was the highlight I love a good GT race and we had a couple of good ones today and agree it's been very special to see all of those cars down there i've had quite the field day walking up and down the pit lane uh, enjoying looking at the different cars but that does bring to the end our season of winter series action i myself have only been here for aragon and barcelona but it has been incredible and uh, thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed the racing that the Giedlik, uh, Giedlik racing organization have put on so a big thank you to them and also a massive massive thank you to alpha live 
the camera ops have worked tirelessly all season through some pretty treacherous conditions it's fair to say and also a big shout out to johnny behind this camera currently he's been looking after me in the pit lane and he's done a fabulous job so a massive thank you to alpha live gaelic racing and of course to all our viewers that tuned in so all that's left to say is thank you very much and we'll see you next year